a disillusioned gamer found himself on an unfamiliar path, devoid of memory regarding his arrival. Progressing through an unusual encounter, he emerged in one of the most brutal sci-fi universes revered by geeks, the Imperium of Man, set in the grim darkness of the far future where there is only war, and inherited an identity with world-shattering secrets. Chapter 1 Into the Grim Dark I was walking down a long and winding road in a dense fog, the echoes of my footsteps my only companion. Strangely, I can't recall how I got here. The last thing I remember doing was reading another newly released FAQ document for one of my many armies of miniatures on my computer. Now that I think about it, I don't remember much of the details on that document either, only the vague residual feeling of annoyance from another wave of adjustments. These changes used to be exciting, but eventually, like most things in life, they cease to be so. The world seemed to get grimmer as one aged. The thrill of gaming and the fickle glories it entailed faded to dust over the years. These thoughts were running through my mind as I continued to walk forward in a semi-consciousness state, and slowly a realization came to me. Wait, am I lucid dreaming? Being an indoors-type person all my life, the current scenario of walking down a long, winding road in a dense fog with no destination in mind just doesn't make any sense. What is going on here? I looked back, only to be greeted by the same road that disappeared into a fog that shrouded everything. I shrugged and continued forward. Something was compelling me to walk forward, and I got a feeling that answers would be found at the end of the road. This was beginning to look like a setup for a horror movie, but I felt at peace. The lone walk continued for a while until something was visible in the distance. There at the edge of the fog was the silhouette of a person. As I got closer, that person came into view. Okay. I thought to myself, I must be lucid dreaming. Appearing out from the dense fog was the prettiest girl I had seen in my life. As someone who had spent a large chunk of my time surfing the internet and as a result, got bombarded with an endless stream of advertisements and media featuring pretty ladies, it was a really tall order to top that list. She was a girl about 165 centimeters in height, and underneath a head of straight-flowing platinum hair was a face of idealized perfection, and a simple yet elegant-looking white robe completed her angelic look. She had this paradoxical quality about her that made guessing her age an impossible task, looking youthful yet ancient at the same time. Hello, I said not sure what to expect from this encounter. She stood perfectly still, observing me with her large, soulful silver eyes and a dead neutral expression. After a period of awkward silence, she performed a hand gesture I recognized but least expected to see in these most unusual of circumstances. It was the hand sign of Aquila, a universal greeting gesture of humans in the grimdark universe of which as a hobby I had invested too much time and resources into. I really have to cut back my spinning on that front, I thought to myself. Evidently, even my rare occasion of a lucid dream had elements of that universe seeping in. Flustered, I responded in the only way that made sense to me by making an Aquila sign myself. There I was, responding to a very pretty girl by making a geeky hand gesture on a road surrounded by dense fog. It was very surreal. We stayed like that for a while, maintaining the Aquila hand gesture while looking at each other. Finally, she seemed to have made a decision and reached out to me with her right hand. So we are playing handshake now? I obliged and took her hand. It felt soft and cold. Her expression softened and she closed her eyes. I had no idea what she was up to but since this seemed like a dream, I was not about to refuse any chance of skin contact with an attractive potential target. Suddenly a distinctive feeling came to me as if I was being asked specifically for permission to know more about me. While this lucid dream was getting weirder by the minute, it was not unpleasant. So I said, yes, let's get to know each other better. Immediately after that, the mysterious girl seemed to glow with a soft, radiant light. All right, this is getting too weird. I concluded and tried to let go of her hand, but she held on tight. She opened her eyes, and to my surprise, they now glowed with a faint golden light. Then she spoke for the first time and made the most ridiculous statement I ever heard in my life. Help me, she said, her voice a whisper, help me and the others. In exchange, my abilities, my body, and my soul are yours. I was like, whoa, young lady. We just met. We don't know each other and have yet to even exchange names. Talk about instant escalation. I tried to let go of her hand again but stopped after having another proper look at her face. She was dead serious and seemed so full of sincerity it made me pause. I knew the old saying never stick it into crazies. Even a 12 out of 10 won't be worth the endless troubles ahead but I felt torn between refusing or accepting to help a pretty stranger. I hesitated again but by then her golden glowing eyes started to well up. Hey, this is unfair. 
I am weak against this type of attack. It was then my logical mind proposed listening to her first. Maybe, just maybe, for once in my unfulfilling life I could be a hero for a fair maiden. After all, this is a dream, right? Sighing, I said. All right, I will do what I can to help. You promise? She asked. I promise. Two streaks of tears went down her lovely cheeks. Darn, she cried anyway. I am sorry, she said. This is the second time I cried in my life. Well, that was oddly specific but hardly possible. What's your name? I asked, trying to switch the topic. Serene. She answered, now beaming with a bewitching smile so bright it seemed to break the fog apart. I must admit, this surreal scene of a radiant pretty young lady smiling and crying at the same time during a heavy fog was mesmerizing. Thank you, Serene finally said. Her next words hit me with a wave of foreboding and farewell. My world exploded, a flash of white light swallowing everything. Serene, the fog and the road were no more. Up and down, space and time became irrelevant as I battled the worst case of vertigo I experienced in my life. In the blinding white light, I felt myself moving forward, slowly at first, gaining speed gradually. Without any distinguishable means of locomotion, I was being pulled forward towards something or someplace. After that my world became nothing but pure blinding white. The world of pure white receded. When my vision finally came back, it was all blurry and took me some time to realize a person was standing in front of me. I could not see properly yet, but it was definitely a female. Was it Serene? Darn it, girl. You should have warned me of that. I reached out with my hand, feeling disorientated from the experience. A gloved hand caught my arm to stabilize me, and someone I guessed was the owner of it was saying something, but I couldn't catch any of it. After I gained my footing, my vision and hearing slowly returned. Then I saw it. In front of me was a person wearing a rather faithful replica suit of power armor belonging to the famous Adeptus Oritas, aka Sisters of Battle. My jaw almost dropped as I got a clearer look. The number of details and material quality was leagues beyond any attempt I have seen in photos or real life. A low humming can even be heard coming from the supposed power backpack generator. Really nice details. The wearer of this fine suit was not serene. This new lady here was quite young, probably just over 20. There was this perfect mix of youthfulness and soldiery about her, a perfect candidate for a perfectly faithful replica of what a battle sister should look like in real life. She was a pretty brunette, but a far cry from the previous girl I met. No offense to any ladies who had cosplayed as a sister of battle, but compared to this fine work of art in front of me all previous renditions would just be crude imitations in comparison. My only critique would be that the color scheme of her suit was too lazy. Just dull silver overall with elements of white cloth finished by golden embroidery decoration. I laughed a little inside at all this. First an Aquila lady, then a sister of battle cosplayer? Well, at least this lucid dream was consistent in its theme. Expecting to be in a geeky convention setup of sorts, I looked around. We were in a dimly lit large chamber with unconventional futuristic decoration. We were standing on an elevated end of the chamber. I could see a slight slope going down. Nice place but the lighting was not optimal for a photo session. More battle sisters were seen scattered around the chamber. I counted ten, they were all wearing the same color scheme but had less decorated power armor. The thing that struck me was none of them was laughing, having fun, or doing any sort of goofy selfie-taking activities one would typically expect to see in a convention. The brunette sister in front of me, who must be the leader of this bunch, was looking at me with a concerned face. An uneasy feeling welled up inside me. They all looked far too serious for this to be in a squad cosplay session, and the way they were handling their supposedly prop bolters exuded a type of practice to ease that can only be the result of countless hours of drills and training. Something buzzed, the leader-looking sister said a single word. Contact. It was not English nor any other language I knew, but somehow I could understand it. The eerie implication of it almost made my skin crawl. The air tensed up. Everybody either donned their helmets or closed the visor of their helmets. The pretty brunette was the last to put hers on. It was a more decorated variant that had a huge chrome-finished fleur-de-lis symbol on the forehead. I observed up close the reflective sheen on the helmet in the dim light, the complicated light refraction on the helmet's lens pieces, and the weight of it as it slid down to completely cover her head. This, this is no prop, I realized, and my skin crawled. There was a commotion happening at the far entrance of the chamber. Two people ran in. But the sisters did not react and let the two cross half the chamber hide behind a cover piece. Sounds of footsteps came thundering down from the entrance. From the shadow, a mob erupted into the chamber. 
I watched in disbelief as a horde of gunmen rushed towards us with their guns blazing, their silhouettes lit up by muzzle flashes. In an instant, the serenity of the chamber was shattered by deafening gunfire. Tracers and lost bolts filled the air. My faintest hope that this was all some elaborate prank shattered after I witnessed the shower of plaster and shattering of stonework in the wake of weapons impact. Amongst the cacophony of weapons discharging were some louder, heavier sounds followed by actual explosions that landed far off their mark, but close enough to make me wince and feel their impact. Heavy weapons, the mob had heavy weapons and soon they will have the time to aim. This lucid dream had officially turned into a nightmare. Chapter 2 Gunfight I wanted to scream. There was a gunfight happening right in front of me. This supposed lucid dream session was turning into a real nightmare. Being a lazy pacifist who resided in a relatively peaceful country all my life, I had never been anywhere near a gunfight, let alone a gunfight involving futuristic heavy weapons. But no voice came out from my throat. Weird messages kept appearing in my vision. Regulus, action override. Regulus, action override. Regulus, action override. Protect the Holy Daughter. The leader-looking sister ordered and tackled me. The holy daughter who? No time for any question. We went down on the floor just as another round of enemy fire was let loose. Everything seemed to be in slow motion. I could see the tracer fire flying past above me and actual bolter rounds flying and spinning in the air. Wait a second. The world around me really did slow down to a crawl. In a mind-numbing state, I began to look around. Everything around me appeared in exquisite detail. It was only then I noticed the new messages that had appeared in my vision. Combat detected. Cogitatio acceleratio auto-activated. Auspex auto-activated. Then the most peculiar thing happened. I felt an expansion of energy burst forth from my body to the surroundings. As the energy expanded forward scanning everything on its path, I gained a clear understanding of the chaos around me. An indescribable feeling of clarity reached my mind, and I could read the whole battle as easily as the back of my hand. We were cornered but benefited from cover and elevation. Eleven battle sisters with three fighters of unknown origin against thirty-five enemies, two of which were enormous. I froze at the distinctive silhouettes of the two giants amongst the hostiles. No mistake about it, mixed within the mass of incoming gunmen and towering amongst them were the familiar shapes of hulking armored individuals with huge pauldrons. This setting, this universe, these can only be the transhuman space marines. As a long-time player myself on the grimdark tabletop miniature game, I personally had over a hundred space marines under my collection and instantly recognized these as the main threats. As if the situation wasn't dire enough, one of the hostile marines was holding a weapon that looked too large to be carried by a human, a heavy bolter. The other marine was barking orders. As he did so in slow motion, one of his minions with a flamethrower stepped forward towards two of our fighters that were hiding behind a cover. Flamer. I screamed internally at the hapless duo who were about to be doused by fire. Then the time dilation effect stopped. The cacophony of a close-quarter gunfight hit me like a truck. Real-life gunfire was much louder than I had ever imagined. My ears were hurting as I felt the resonance of the discharge of every weapon near me. The sound of firearms being fired indoors had a distinct quality to it. They hit you like a solid hammer. Again, I wanted to scream. Again, that message appeared. Regulus, action override. I tried to slow down my breathing, only to discover I was breathing at a normal pace. What is this? My mind was a mess, but my body was calm. The incongruity made me dizzy. Suddenly, another weird sensation came to me. Mixed within the chaos of the gunfight was a distinct pattern calling. 0101000111100111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111000111
I need to see it again to confirm if there was really no other place to run. What was it called again? Ospex, was it? Come on, come on. My consciousness expanded in the next second. Ospex activated. Another blast of scanning energy expanded forward. With my readings, I saw the battle from a god's eye view. The duo that was approached by the enemy flamer had relocated further back. The piece of cover they were hiding behind just a moment ago was in flames. I wondered if they had heard my warning. The enemy flamer had garnered himself a lot of attention. Soon he was fed with a dozen bolter rounds and exploded into a huge fireball. The blinding flash and explosion robbed me of my hearing. Nothing but constant ringing in my ears. But I could still see the enemies from the residual readings from my last scan. Banking on the new experience, I tried to do the same action as before. Hostile, 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 hostile with a grenade launcher. I marked out the closest batch of enemies and tried to project their positions to the people on my side. To my amazement, the Battle Sisters switched from random suppression to discipline, burst zeroing in on the targets I marked in the smoke-filled chamber. The first enemy to go down was the grenade launcher user. He was standing around apparently still dazed by the fireball. A bolter round lodged into his head and blew it off like a watermelon hit by a speeding truck. The rest of his marked companions soon followed his fate. The unfortunate gunmen briefly danced like ragdolls as they were hit by a hail of bolter rounds. Then they literally exploded, showering blood and body parts freely before fading from my readings. I wanted to vomit. The air had a hint of metallic taste added to it now. Deprived of sight and sound, I became conscious of the stank of blood and sweat. 0101010011101010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010011010
Finally, its meaning reached me. The binary canticle faded and a name appeared in my mind. Serene, the hooded figure was directly addressing me. Where its eyes would be were several huge lenses. On all their reflections I could see but a single person, the Aquila young lady I met at the long winding foggy road. Chapter 3 Arch Tech Priest Dominus A hand was reaching out, trying to touch the many reflections of a pretty lady on the many lenses belonging to a metallic monstrosity. It was a very delicate looking hand with fair, flawless skin ending with really feminine fingers and the final touches of perfect, methodically kept nails. It was not my hand but yet it seemed to obey my every command. Every little twitch of fingers, any slight turning of the palm was reflected in those lenses. That hand never reached said lenses, a metallic appendage that was shaped into a perfect imitation of a human hand intercepted it. I felt the coldness of the metallic palm. Despite its outward human form, the hardness of its surface confirmed its non-organic nature. No signs of external injuries, but I detected your brainwave to be 70.865% deviant from your standard pattern. Are you well, Serene? This thing was asking me questions in binary beeps. How was I able to understand binary? Nothing made sense anymore, but the reflections on the monster's lenses told a cold truth for reasons beyond my comprehension. I... I am searing now. Then a realization struck me like lightning. This metallic monstrosity is acquainted with the Aquila lady. What if it learned I was not the real Serene, but someone else who just took over? Severe stress took over and total panic was just a hair's breadth away. I needed answers and a way out. Do I have anything to fool this monster just for a while? Information. I need information. Do I know anything about it? Anything? Anything? Severe stress detected. Cogitatio acceleratio auto-activated. The world slowed again. The gunfight was still raging on but seemed so distant in the background. Another line of words appeared in my vision. Run analytica? Yes slash no. With almost teary eyes I looked at the prompt. Is this salvation? Yes. Readings popped up in my mind displaying information for the monster before me. Name, Crypto Recycle, Post-Human, Archtech Priest Dominus. I remembered now, this ginormous grotesque cyborg was definitely looking the part for an Adeptus Mechanicus Tech Priest Dominus. His overall appearance resembled a hooded and hunched gigantic man with multiple pairs of robotic arms. One of his many hands was carrying the signature omniscient axe of his order. Over what was left of his body was a hooded robe that was typical for a tech priest, and completing the package were his non-human legs which looked like a combination of inverted claws dangling with a bundle of random wires. On his back, a myriad of antennas and unknowable instruments stuck like pikes. The release of the Adeptus Mechanicus Plastic Range was a relatively new event compared to a lot of the armies of the Grimdark Universe. If I recall correctly, the initial start collecting box package was a particularly generous offer. In my zeal to quickly start up the army, I bought multiple boxes and ended up with a few redundant copies of Tech Priest Dominus figures laying around. As for those tracked monstrosities with human torsos and huge guns as arms around the Tech Priest, they were a mix of heavy combat units of the Adeptus Mechanicus known as Cataphron Breachers and Destroyers. These killing machines came in an expensive kit of three per box during release and were spanned by the Power Gamers. But enough reminiscing about my hobby, the current situation needs to be resolved. Digging hard into my mind, I reviewed my options given the absurdity of the current circumstances. Betting on the information gained from the reading, I started by saying his name, Crypto. I flinched at my own voice when it came out and did not manage to finish speaking his name. Unlike the one I was used to for decades, the voice that came out from me was elegant and feminine, and it startled me. Old Crypto is here for you, omniscient princess. Please tell me, are you hurt or experiencing any discomfort? He can't it. Eh? Not finishing saying his name was kinda a jackpot? Apparently, Sirian was close enough to the tech priest to address him with a shortened name. Calling him by his full name might actually arouse suspicion that something was amiss. That was close, too close. But the next part made me shiver internally. I need to speak in low gothic. If this was my old body, I swore I would have been sweating by the buckets. But there was no going back. The tech priest was waiting for me. One way or another, this charade will end with or without my answer, and I rather take an active bet. I had a hunch as earlier when the sister spoke in the language, its meaning came automatically to me, so I dug deep into my mind for the low gothic tongue. 
As if answering my prayer, the language suddenly bubbled into my head and the words came naturally to me, putting in as much anguish as I could, I pushed them out. Where am I? My head is hurting. There, I said it in fluent low gothic. To complete the act, I lowered my head to avoid his gaze and put my other hand on top of my head. The tech priest Dominus made a sound that was halfway between gasping and machine gear grinding to a halt. A slight pause later, a single word escaped his vocal synthesizer. Unacceptable. It was a crispy metallic voice laced with hints of age. I tensed up and waited, not knowing what would happen next. Wordlessly, he raised his massive omniscient axe and struck the ground twice with its end knob. Heavy resonance echoed throughout the whole chamber. All the breachers and destroyers stopped firing their weapons on his cue. The tech priest then turned his back to me to face the chamber, standing tall to his full imposing height and completely blocking my view. Then he roared. Unforgivable. Inconceivable. You dare? You dare. None of you. Not a single one of your misbegotten kind or even worth her single brain cell. The volume of his words, amplified many times by overcharged vocal synthesizer, drowned out all the combined sound in the chamber and everything paused. There the arch tech priest Dominus stood tall at the edge of the elevated platform. He was looking down at all the hostile forces below like an apex predator surveying a herd of helpless lambs, one of his many hands pointing an accusing finger at them. I gasped internally at his blatant taunting at an armed and hostile crowd. Hey, we are still in a gunfight. You are asking to be shot. As expected, since he made himself stand out so much the tech priest soon attracted a whole lot of hostile fire, but he was completely unfazed as an energy field flickered to life around him to block most of the incoming fire. Small rings of light flashed on each impact on his protective energy field making it a dazzling sight even when viewed from behind. The geek inside me cried out with joy and disbelief at the sight of a supposedly physically impossible force field in action. However, it appeared to not be foolproof as some rounds did make it through. However, those lucky shots merely bounced off him like rain hitting a stone wall. It was then I recall the tech priest Dominus has some of the best defensive stat lines in the miniature game. Outperforming even the premium power armor the Imperium provided for its elites, and I was merely witnessing that stat line performance live in action. With all eyes in the chamber on him, the tech priest continued, As a devout believer of the glorious Omnisia, I apologize for my unsightly outburst of emotion. He bowed and waved one of his many hands, dropping judgment with a voice cold with contempt. Now, I consign all you unworthy unbelievers to eternal entropy. As one every breacher and destroyer fired their heavy weapons, I realized with horror the tech priest must have done some serious trajectory calculations for his killing machines when he was trash-talking just now. For an undetermined amount of time, an endless stream of deadly shining projectiles was homing to the enemies below, and a scene of butchery happened right before my eyes. Cries of defiance soon turned into despair, returning hostile fire dwindled, then fell silent, and finally the Mechanicus heavy combat units ceased firing. I took a peek at the carnage and saw the aftermath of the onslaught. Down there was a scene of sheer brutality. Scores of charred mass vaguely resembling human forms with twisted limbs littered all over the chamber. Some of them were still moving, but I was not sure if it was because they were still clinging to life or due to the random ammunition rounds and lost gun power packs that were still going off from the remnants of superheated weapon impact. The smell of ozone and burned meat filled the air. Wordlessly, the battle sisters started walking forward into the charnel house and executing anyone who might actually survive that hell. My civilian brain froze with the sight happening before me. Holy daughter. A female voice called to me. I turned and noticed the sister leader was behind me with her helmet removed. Blood was pouring down from the left side of her face. My brain started to move again. The scene of her courageously trying to shield me from grenade impact surfaced and made me instinctively look down at myself only to see a flawlessly white robe and my hands were lightly dusted but otherwise in pristine condition despite surviving grenade attacks and rolling on the ground. How is that even possible? I, I am alright. Thank you for saving me. But why do you call me Holy Daughter? It was the best reply I could come up with as my mind was a mangled mess. Further adding to the difficulties of my mental processing was the eerie sensation of talking in fluent low gothic tongue which I have never learned. What the sister did next boggled my mind. She went down on one knee and knelt before me. Revered Lady, I am Alicia Sabadith, probationary palatine of Order of the Shining Beacon. You must be the prophesied true daughter of the emperor that he on holy Terra has sent to lead us in our darkest hour. Please honor us with your leadership and wisdom. Guide our order and the people of Imperium in this testing time. I was rendered speechless, 
but she continued to speak. The uprising suppression is at a critical stage. Revered lady, please lead us. She looked up. Her face was a full display of hope and reverence, but my mind started numbing again with her revelation. Chapter 4 Nobody Expects the Uprising I murmured. Overwhelmed by what was happening around me, I merely echoed what Palatine Alicia was saying. The truth was my mind had blanked out a while ago. Around me was this supposedly real version of the grimdark universe of the far future where I heavily invested in its miniature games as my hobby. I was awestruck by the sheer intensity of what I had seen, heard and felt. The smell of blood, sweat, gunpowder, ozone, and charred flesh in the air. The sound of each and every gut-wrenching bolter discharge as the sisters continued their grim work in the background executing armed thugs. Indescribable feelings rose inside me. A part of me wanted to shout, awesome, for what must have been a wet dream for any fan of the grimdark universe, to be able to see and experience the universe itself in person. Another part of me just wanted to scream and hide from all these as the very core appeal of this universe laid in the fact it was so utterly horrible and dystopian. And frankly, I wasn't sure this was a lucid dream session anymore. My mind just wasn't in the right state to answer the palatine. Then someone cut into our conversation. This is no mere uprising. A deep and stern voice came somewhere behind. The owner of the voice walked up and appeared beside me and immediately I knew who he was by appearance. Standing close to six feet tall was a man who looked to be in his mid-forties. He was fully geared up with a trench coat overall. On top of his head was a really solid-looking capitaine brandishing a stylized eye on the center. Beneath the shadow cast by the capitaine, a pair of blue eyes glittered with sharpness and wisdom. Overall, the man was handsome but slightly rough around the edges and had the look of a model who would most probably be hired to represent a certain classic tobacco brand back on Earth. However, unlike your run-the-mill models, this man exuded an air of unquestionable authority even just by standing still. Inquisitor I said reflexively before realizing my mistake and swiftly ran Analytica on the newcomer. The readings came back. Human, Inquisitor. Inquisitors are one of the highest-ranking agents of the Imperial Inquisition. Relentless and deadly, they are the most important arm of the Imperial government dedicated to ensuring the security of the Imperium of Man. Every Inquisitor in theory possess near-unlimited authority. Thus most have access to an almost limitless variety of imperial resources that allowed them to act against any threats they perceived to the Imperium. Think of them as a mix of James Bond and Judge Dredd with a blank check to carry out their missions. Unlike Cryptor or the Arch Tech Priest Dominus, no name came back. Which meant Thabrus Thorn, Ordo Hereticus. He introduced himself and fixed a firm gaze on me. You would have to excuse me for skipping pleasantries. Quickly now, can you tell me who you are and what you are doing on this planet? Honored Inquisitor, the Palatine voiced her displeasure. I must protest the way you are addressing the revered lady, and what do you mean by saying this was no mere uprising? The man scoffed. First, before I can verify the outrageous claim you just mentioned, by the decree of the Holy Inquisition everyone here will be under my personal scrutiny. Second, when has a simple planetary uprising ever involved renegade Astartes? He finished his statement by pointing somewhere below the platform we were all standing on. Astartes, aka Space Marines, were transhuman super soldiers of the Imperium of Man. These genetically altered superhumans were usually clad in their signature power armor and engage in an endless battle with the horrors of the galaxy. Widely known as the poster boys of the grimdark universe. But these supposed guardians of humanity can go bad, becoming renegade or something much, much worse. Speaking of which, whatever happened to the two Space Marines that were present in the enemy rank? I followed where the Inquisitor was pointing and found the answer. The heavy bolter marine ended up in a pile of rubble, apparently melted together with his choice of cover after being subjected to hails of direct plasma fire. His hands were still twitching as a sister executed him with point-blank shots through the helmet lenses. Just when I thought things couldn't get any more gruesome for the renegade space marine, another scene was unfolding and it made my jaw drop. There a short distance away a dismembered figure of a giant armored man was being dragged along the ground by an unknown female figure clad in a skin-tight black operative suit. Her sudden appearance sent chills down my spine as I had absolutely no idea when this person had entered the fray and chopped off all the limbs of a space marine. She was dragging the limbless renegade marine towards us. Her every movement suggested highly trained lethality. From my knowledge of the grimdark universe, only one type of character fits her profile an officio assassinorum operative, or an imperial assassin. Unlike all the operative miniatures I collected, she wore no headgear and exposed her pretty face to the world. 
The assassin was a cold, foxy beauty with her black hair tied into a warrior's knot that extended into a long ponytail. This seemed like a really popular hairstyle in the miniature range. As I was dazzled by her appearance and couldn't help myself from looking at her, she glanced back, sizing me up, making my core shivered with her stares. Sir, target acquired. She addressed the Inquisitor and pushed the hapless Marine forward as if casually delivering a mailed package. Right, we should get this done and over with. He nodded to her. The assassin did something to the Marine's armor and then yanked the helmet off them. Underneath the helmet was the face of a scarred warrior with a bald head, but thankfully no signs of chaos corruption. Massive amounts of blood was pouring all over the place, but it did not stop the Marine from dropping a tirade of profanity and low gothic. In the name of the God Emperor, do you repent and cooperate, Space Marine? Thebris asked. The assassin held the Marine's head, so he was facing the Inquisitor. Ha! Huh. The Marine snarled. When my brothers arrive, they will give you all mortals a death not even worthy for street dogs. Then he spat, the classic acidic spit attack I read in the lore. As if anticipating this action, the assassin turned his head at the last second and his spit hit the floor and sounds of acid burning hissed on the spot. In a swift motion, she quickly followed up by dislocating his jaw to prevent further similar incidents. Now limbless and with a broken jaw, the Marine was making unintelligible angry sounds. It was at the same time the angriest and most helpless thing I have ever seen in my life. Not happy with his behavior, the assassin delivered some brutal palm strikes on the Marine's head to silence him with a knockout. Now then, Thabris continued as if the events just now were an everyday occurrence. Put him away. Shall we continue where we left off? He turned his cold gaze and looked at me again. I wanted to take a step back, but my body couldn't move. All these individuals were just so casual about brutal violence. I had just witnessed more violence in person for the past hour than all my decades of peaceful life combined. A deep understanding of the laws of this universe was imprinted on me. Regardless of who you are here in this place, violent death can and will come to you any time should you cross the wrong people or be at the wrong place at the wrong time. That realization seemed to have triggered some primal level of fear inside me. My mind had reached the threshold for the emotion, but strangely my body did not tremble. But mentally I was utterly spent and just wanted to surrender, so I came clean with the Inquisitor. I. I can't seem to remember anything. I just know my name and recall that Arch Dominus Cryptor is my acquaintance. The really surprising part of my statement was that my voice wasn't shaking, but inside I just wanted to cry. Well, judging by their reaction, that bombshell wasn't well received. The Inquisitor did not move and his expression could not be read, but that couldn't be a good thing. The sister had a surprised and devastated look on her face. Just as when it felt like things were about to explode, something buzzed, it was the same sort of sound I had heard a while ago. This better be good, the Inquisitor said, but his mannerism indicated he was not speaking to me. As expected, he appeared to be listening to a Vox report via an earpiece and replied to someone a while later. No mistake about it? Very well keep me informed if anything changes. Thabris out. With that, his attention returned to me again, and his level of hostility rose. Quit playing games, lady. Tell me what you did and why you did it. My patience has its limits and the latest development just escalated the whole situation. This was bad. Really, really bad. My instinct was urging me to do the totally illogical action of running away. They all had guns, and the assassin was just beside me. I was on the very edge of a nervous breakdown when a voice of reason came to my rescue. Inquisitor Thorn, Archtech Priest Dominus Cryptor stepped in, physically putting himself between me and the scary man. As the highest-ranking representative of the Adeptus Mechanicus on this planet, I formally request you not to further burden my main benefactor of this holy expedition. The Inquisitor turned to face the Tech Priest, and they started to stare down at each other. I gulped silently looking at the two Imperial powerhouses. My old habit as a gamer kicked in, and I quickly deduced with a small comfort in the scenario if a fight indeed happened now. Crypterer and his killer machines had a slight edge over Thabris' side. It was Palatine Alicia who broke the stalemate. Honored Inquisitor and Dominus, due to the unfortunate incident just now, the revered lady might have suffered from amnesia or brain damage due to the impact of the direct grenade attack. I had shielded her as much as I could, but it might not have been enough. The sister said apologetically. Both the parties she addressed looked at her bloodied face and contemplated her statement. It was at this point more people came forward and gathered near us. It was three people, two men, and one woman who looked like what you would expect as the hired guns of the Inquisition. Thabris glanced at the group's most senior-looking individual, and the latter nodded silently verifying Alicia's statement. 
Kryptor pointed at the impact craters near us and said, Direct grenades impact. Even with her level of protection, there might be complications with her delicate condition of just finishing the activation rituals. Inquisitor Thorn, we should put aside my benefactor's curious case of memory loss under review for the moment. In the meantime, what is this latest development you speak of? Archdominus. The Inquisitor turned to face the tech priest. I suppose my party does owe you gratitude for your cooperation on apprehending the renegade Astartes. As for that development, he said his next words slowly. This will affect every Imperial subject in this sector. Billions and billions of souls are at stake. I was just informed by my crew that the Astronomicon can no longer be detected. The light of the Emperor is lost to us. Chapter 5 Sorting the Mess The Astronomicon, a giant psychic beacon located on planet Earth, was the one thing that binds the Imperium of Man together in this grimdark universe. It was the symbol of unity both spiritually and literally for the galaxy-spanning Imperium of Man. Without the psychic light of the Astronomicon to guide the starships of the Imperium, faster than light warp travel between the vast distances of Imperial worlds would become so impractical the Empire would cease to function. Palatine Alicia gasped at the unspoken implications. So we are cut off from any chance of outer reinforcements against what that renegade Marine mentioned was coming? Intriguing. Kryptor voiced his thoughts and turned to me. Was that why you were so adamant about immediately activating this psychic beacon when we just arrived? Omniscient Princess? Wait, what? Serene did that? This place is the heart of a psychic beacon? And why the princess title? The Archdominus statement made everyone look straight at me, and of course, I didn't have the answer. My mind was flooded with an alarming amount of warning sirens from what I just heard. A psychic beacon alone was already a huge deal in its own right, plus the Astronomicon going offline now of all times? This had all the hallmarks of a world-ending event looming on the horizon. Severe stress detected. Cogitatio Acceleratio auto-activated. It was then that the thought acceleration power automatically activated again. From my experience, every time it happened, I would have like 20 to 30 seconds of extremely dilated time to look around and organize my thoughts when it was just the blink of an eye in real time. From my brief respite, I realized my immediate concerns were not the doomsday scenario, but to bullshit myself out of this soft interrogation. Working on a hunch, I quickly ran, Analytica, on all the people around me to confirm something I noticed. As expected, only readings from Alicia, Crypterer, and Thabaris came back with their respective names. The three newcomers that looked like inquisitorial hired guns in the Imperial Assassin all came back nameless but confirmed their human status, except for the Assassin, her reading returned as transhuman, confirming my suspicion of her being an officio assassinorum operative. Deducing from what I knew, Crypterer and Syrian were acquainted, and that was why the first, Analytica, readings returned with his name even though he had never mentioned it. Thabaris' initial reading came back nameless, but the Inquisitor's name appeared on the second reading after his self-introduction. Likewise, Alicia's mannerisms definitely indicated this was the first time we met. By rounding out all the information gathered thus far, I saw an opening and tried my luck directing the conversation. Crypto. You. You left me all alone during the activation ritual? I asked, carefully tuning my voice to just the right mix between curiosity and outrage. My probing question made the Arch Dominus jolted despite his massive size. Allow me to explain, a seemingly agitated Crypterer quickly offered, it was five hours into the activation and you were still in the state of trance when the Inquisitor's party and the sisters showed up. New information. I looked at him silently, buying time to digest what he just said, but that seemed only to make him more desperate to defend his actions. After verifying their identity and waiting for another two hours, the whole system was acting up, so the Inquisitor and I decided to venture further into the chamber to see what we could do while the sisters offered to stay behind and look after you. I took all the Cataphron units with me in case of the presence of ancient dormant sentries. Without your authorization to pacify such entities, any such encounter without overwhelming firepower would be catastrophic to the function of this marvelous technology. The Arch Dominus was talking so fast he was giving me the impression of a child explaining himself after being caught red-handed doing something forbidden by his parents. In hindsight, Thabris said, we were probably being monitored. The timing of their attack was impeccable. So the insurgents attempted to murder the Holy Daughter? Alicia asked, fuming with righteous fury. That remained to be seen. All we know is the Arch Dominus party arrival on this planet had threatened the rebels' plan enough for them to reveal their assets including the presence of renegade Astartes amongst their ranks. Thabaris said before turning his attention back on me. Now, lady, 
He looked at me expectantly. Serene. I handed him the only accurate information I knew. Lady Serene, would you care to enlighten us? Who are you? How do you know this place, and why did you activate this massive psychic beacon? He was trying to be civilized about his questioning now, but seriously, that did not put a din on his intimidation value one bit. So much for diversions. I my mouth opened but no answer came to mind. Desperate for a way out, I ran cogitatio acceleratio. Again, and tried to use the small period of time dilation to dig into my mind like the trick I did before with the low gothic tongue in search for an answer for my predicament. The world slowed again. I closed my eyes to cut off distraction and my consciousness looked inward. Nodded. Why was Serene here? Tell me. I probed inwards and felt a sense of resistance. Tell me. I need to know. A sense of unspoken understanding rose inside me. You are not ready. No. An inquisitor is breathing down on my neck. Tell me. At first, nothing happened, then slowly a hint of a vision flashed for a split second and my mind registered something so terrifying it broke my trance. When I opened my eyes, my face was merely inches away from the floor. Apparently, the assassins in human reflexes had rescued me from a major self-inflicted embarrassment by stopping my body mid-collapse. I turned my head to the assassin only to see her eyeing me with a cold stare. It was still embarrassing enough, and I could only thank her with a wry smile. Sister Alicia quickly aided me back on my feet and protested. Lady Syrian is not in the condition for this. Inquisitor Thorn, I would like to reaffirm my request to you to not further burden my benefactor. Crypterer backed her up. The atmosphere tensed up again. While still somewhat dazed, I looked around and noticed for the first time the individuals gathered here could probably affect the fate of billions of people with their actions. An Inquisitor, with theoretically absolute authority on imperial matters, an Archdominus who proclaimed himself as the highest ranking of his cult on the planet, a palatine sister of battle, whose rank was below a canonist of the Adeptus Sororita's order, and Serene. Me. Whoever Serene was, she was not your ordinary girl next door seeing how Crypterer treated her with a degree of veneration, and that was even before looking into that ridiculous, prophesied true daughter of the Emperor's story sister Alicia spoke of. Within a heartbeat, I somehow got a solid hold of the current situation. What's up with this superhuman level clarity of thinking? But my concern was on the rapidly developing situation, so I cut straight into the main current issues at hand. My memory is not good for now. But correct me if I got this wrong, we are now cut off from the wider Imperium and more renegade marines are coming. Did this world request for reinforcements yet, and what was this uprising suppression you spoke of, Sister Alicia? Finally given the chance to talk, Alicia was only too happy to quickly brief me about the plight of their world. A local lord who was the brother of the current planetary governor had taken up arms against the ruling regime with the help of questionable factions and a full-blown civil war was happening even as we speak. The minor order of Adeptus Sororitas stationed on the planet initially stayed neutral in the family dispute. But later through their support to the incumbent governor when they received numerous reports about unknown and sketchy forces that were operating under the usurper lord's faction. The uprising faction then showed their true colors by massacring the psychers of Adeptus Astra Telepathica Chamber to a man, almost cutting off any off-world communication entirely. By then what looked like a power grab at the planetary governor's seat had become a separatist movement in all but name and a full-scale war soon followed. Even with the aid of the Adeptus Sororitas, the governor's forces had a hard time dealing with the rebels, further proving the latter had help from unseen players. The fighting was so fierce that a sizable portion of the order had martyred themselves in it, and Alicia was made probationary palatine despite being relatively young for the position. Now according to the lore I knew, power grabbing is something the Imperium would usually turn a blind eye to as long as whoever won the seat of power cooperated fully with the Empire. But a separationist movement with the aid of renegade space marines? That would open up proper reasons to request urgent reinforcement from the wider Imperium and usually... Loyalist Astartes chapters would be racing over to curb stomp the usurpers in such circumstances. That was when Thabris broke the bad news. The lone surviving astropath was under his care in a secure location, but the psyker had since failed to send out any messages due to unusual warp activities. Unacceptable, Cryptor declared suddenly. The instability caused by this war threatens the wondrous work of the Omnisia. I looked at the Arch Dominus and suddenly recalled how obsessive their kind was to treasuring technological wonders and had a really bad feeling about this uprising consisting of renegade marines, so I put my theory to the test. Crypto, if they win they might destroy all this. Can you help? Cryptorer turned his massive body to me and spoke. Affirmative, 
12 hours ago, I had tapped into the main information network of this planet and have been conversing with the local adepts of my order, appraising the situation. He paused, then continued. From my analysis, the opposition appears to have a Stardis level background support in key logistics, electronic, and communications warfare. That was why they were having the upper hand. Sensing his confidence, I followed up. Will that be a problem for you? Inconceivable. He made a sound that was halfway between scoffing and air expulsion. For the others, it might be difficult. But electronic communications warfare happens to be one of my primary research topics, and we have the support of a whole starship's worth of advanced cogitators in orbit. My analysis shows that a key breakthrough development can be conceptualized within the next 72 hours if my resources are deployed to aid the governor. It was at this moment a skull probe, literally a drone built into a human skull flew in from nowhere and dropped something into the Dominus hand. He opened his metallic palm for everyone to see the item. It was a boxy spidery thing no bigger than a matchbox. This device, he said with his metallic voice, is an Astartes grade sentry probe utilized by some of the stealthier chapters and how they knew when to attack just now. I have erred in underestimating our opponent and caused harm to you, omniscient princess. He bowed to me. Allow me to atone by securing victory for the governor and thus safeguarding the glorious work of the Omnisia. I nodded. With that secured, I turned to Thabris. Will you allow us to help, Inquisitor? Well, they had renegade Astartes on their side, so their heresy was all but confirmed. In the light of the Emperor's domain being threatened here, I would allow it for now, and we'll be sorting out your case later. Palatine Alicia, you should take the Arch Dominus to the Governor and Canonist Deke Dinah immediately and update them on the situation. What about Lady Serene? Alicia asked. Without a valid reason, she should never be anywhere near the front line. Only Omnisia knows what will happen to this psychic beacon should something happen to her. Crypterer said. Thanks. I said internally to Crypterer as the front line was the last place I wanted to go. That said, I surveyed the carnage left behind by the gunfight and didn't feel like sticking around either. Maybe I can try helping with the call for reinforcements that the astropath was having problems sending out? I inquired simply for the heck of it. To my surprise, Thabris. Chapter 6 Getting Acquainted So we were to split up after that. Cryptor would join Sister Alicia to make haste to the front line, and there they would link up with the other battle sisters and the governor's forces to hopefully put a stop to the uprising. Whereas I would follow Thabra's party to the location where the last astropath on the planet was kept secure. Please take care of yourself. I will leave some units to secure this site, and will be sending your belongings over once I have received the arrangement from the Inquisitor. Cryptor told me in binary canical. Not knowing what to say and deathly afraid of blowing my own cover, I merely nodded. Seemingly satisfied with my response, the Arch Dominus then turned to Thabris. Inquisitor Thorn, I will now leave Lady Serene's well-being in your capable hands. Please see to it that no harm would come to her while she is in your care. Fail to do so, and I guarantee you will receive more than just a formal protest from me and my order. Now he just sounds like a nagging old dad. Wait, did he just threaten an Inquisitor? I will do that and meanwhile await your good news within the next 72 hours, Arch Dominus. Thabris simply replied. With that, we parted leaving a whole chamber of burned bodies and wounded behind. I followed Thabris' group down the route where the gunmen came from and walked through a seemingly endless amount of corridors and strange indoor interiors. We were a party of six. The Inquisitor Thabris himself was leading at the front. Right behind him was Interrogator Amel, followed by Acolyte Herlindia, then me and Ranter and finally the fear-inducing assassin Neand regarding our back. Ranter Crane was a rough-looking man who looked to be in his late thirties. He was what you would expect of stereotypical inquisitorial henchmen with a massive amount of war gear hung around his carapace armor while carrying a large hotshot volley gun as if it was the easiest thing to do in this world. A male freed in the interrogator was quiet and reserved. He seemed to be in his late twenties, had dark blonde hair, and could be considered quite handsome. If this was a story about the rise of a promising imperial agent, he would fit right in as the protagonist. Herlindia Winson, the female acolyte, was a nice-looking brunette with shoulder-length hair who also seemed to be in her late twenties. She too was reserved in her mannerism, but seemed friendly enough. I had to emphasize the part of seemed to be for their respective ages, from my understanding of the lore of this universe being agents of the Inquisition meant that these individuals would have access to life-prolonging rejuvenat treatments. Coupled that with faster-than-light warp travel between star systems making accurate age guessing a much messier process than I was accustomed to. Then there was Neandra who was behind my back, no doubt to keep an eye on me. I knew she was there, 
but no footsteps could be heard from behind. Every time I remembered she was behind me, the memory of her dragging the limbless marine with a massive amount of blood dripping everywhere would resurface. She was just horrifying. Speaking of the amputated marine, Thabaris had decided he was to be temporarily left to the sisters to be imprisoned inside their monastery nearby. Ranter was the most talkative individual among the retinue members after we got acquainted, thanking me openly once he had the chance. Hey, back then it was you who warned us of that flamer, right? A male and I would have been toast if it wasn't for your heads up, that was much appreciated, and I owe you one for it. The large man then laughed heartily and continued, Usually, it is my job to hurt people and get thanks for it, but I had my hands full just trying not to get shot back there. Both the male and her Lindia remained distantly neutral after their brief self-introduction. As far as I could tell, Thabaris neither encouraged nor forbade his retinue from interacting with me. The Inquisitor himself was always leading in the front and never once looked back since we left that chamber, ever marching purposefully forward. We walked and walked, finally exiting from a seemingly impossibly huge complex to the outdoors. The sky was a weird dirty purple instead of the classic blue. Just nearby was a landing pad with a huge black and dark red colored gunship of unknown pattern resting on top of it. My old hobbyist self kicked in as I gawked at the unfamiliar black and dark red armored bulk and pointed at it. What pattern is that gunship? That looks too long for a storm raven, but too tall for a fire raptor. Wow, someone knows her gunship patterns. Remarked Ranter with a chuckle while the rest of the group stayed quiet. The gunship was much larger at close-up inspection than I imagined and definitely looked like a hybrid variant between a storm raven and a fire raptor. A huge stylized eye was prominently displayed on the side of the gunship and I could just envision the folks excelling at Kid Ash and going to town to create this beautiful machine. The pilot must have known we were coming as the rear hatch opened up without prompting and we entered the gunship through it. Cool, temperature-controlled air greeted us, and some of the retinue members sighed with relief. The interior of the gunship was more spacious than I imagined, probably due to the initial schematics which was meant for armored space marines that could reach 8 feet in height. They even had a washing closet installed inside the gunship. It was then I remembered the Storm Raven gunship of the space marines could serve as an orbital dropship which probably meant this thing could break orbit and link up with any starships orbiting the planet, thus the presence of such a facility for long transits. After settling down on my assigned seat, I was hit by a massive wave of mental fatigue, so I dutifully strapped on my safety harness even as I longed to doze off immediately. Just as I finished fastening the centerpiece of the harness that straps to my chest, I felt the sensation of solid material pressing against my skin. Puzzled, I dug beneath my collar and pulled out a necklace with an Aquila pendant attached to an exquisite piece of metallic string chain of unknown material. The Aquila pendant itself was shaped into an old-school symbol of Imperium, a stylized double-headed eagle with circular curve wings. Both the string chain and pendant had a glorious golden finishing that was just screaming, I am exorbitantly expensive from its appearance. Curious, but on the verge of dozing off, before I realized it, Analytica was run on the pendant. I am just so tired. I wanted to laugh out loud at myself for running the ability on an object. Then a line of words appeared. Imperial Authority Rosette. Gene Lock to Serene. My sight froze on the words. Didn't Cryptor mention something about needing my authority? So this is no mere jewelry? It looks gorgeous. I turned in my hand, marveling at how it reflected all the lights from the interior of the gunship. While I was drowning in thoughts, the gunship started moving. Soon the motion with the monotonous ambient sound inside the gunship combined with mental fatigue hit me like a rock and I felt myself drifting off while holding onto the pendant. Accessing. 1. Responding machine spirit within the vicinity. Connect? Yes slash no plus plus. Yes. Connecting connection established. Accessing machine spirit via ethernet link. Authority confirmed and accepted. We are ready to serve. Welcome on board Inquisitorial Gunship, Flame Raven, Hashtag Machine ID. Glory to Omnisia and him on Earth. We await your command, authority. Command? Show me. List show, 1. Ship status, 2. Weapon status, 3. Auspects reading for ship log, 5. Weapons, hmm. Show me your weapons. List weapons. 1. Front-mounted twin multi-melta, system functional. 2. Left spawns and twin heavy bolter, system functional. Three. Right spots and twin heavy bolter, system functional. 4. Left underwing twin loss cannon, system functional. 5. Right underwing twin loss cannon, system functional. 6. Chaff flare launcher, system functional. In my dreamy state, I selected the twin multi-melta listing, 
suddenly a video feed popped up in my vision, and it was showing the front view of the gunship where the weapon was aiming. The moment I focused on the video feed, another mental prompt popped up. Manual override. Huh, why not? Yes. Additional interfaces appeared on the video feed, showing the estimated projectile path and the guns were obeying my command pointing in the direction I wanted. Huh, this definitely feels like a certain battlefield game I played. Since all I could see were clouds on a dirty purple sky, I soon got bored and exited the weapon video feed. Next, I tried the aspect section. Immediately, a three-dimensional image of the gunship's surroundings materialized inside my mind. Wow, so high-tech. Upon closer inspection, I could zoom in and out, pan the aspects reading around inside my head. When the view was zoomed out to the furthest setting, I could even see the details of terrain passing beneath us in real time. This is nice, but I am so tired. Priority alert. Aspects error. Priority alert. Weapons locked on warning. 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 Error. Something was not right. I broke from my trance-like light sleep and found myself still strapped to the chair with the pendant in my hand on a flying gunship. The air was still nice and cold, but a sense of unspeakable dread started to well up. While securing the pendant back inside my robe, I looked around and noticed only Neandra was still up and alert sitting in a corner. Thabaris was nowhere to be seen, but if I recall correctly, he went forward to the cockpit the moment we boarded, whereas the trio of henchmen were fast asleep just across my seat. After a moment of hesitation, I signaled for Neandra to come over. This was no time for subtlety. The assassin was slightly puzzled at first, but quickly came to my side. Yes. She asked with a mixture of curiosity and annoyance. Is the name of this ship Flame Raven? She slowly nodded. Somehow her pretty cold face got colder. Being a quick one, she might have deduced something was up since no one had told me the name of the gunship until now. But the shock I received was no less than hers. That she all but confirmed the name of Flame Raven meant the weird communion I had just now was not some fluke. A connection did happen between me and the ship. If this is a lucid dream, it just keeps getting better and better. Putting up a tone as serious as I could, I delivered my warning. In this case, I am afraid we might be under attack. There may be at least four weapon systems locking onto the ship, and the ship's auspex is probably being jammed. How do you know that? Right, pal? Thinking quickly, I told her the story in a way people in this world could understand. The machine spirit told me it called itself Flame Raven. To put a long story short, the basic understanding of technology had regressed so much in the grimdark universe the common explanation of machines having spirits, thus, machine spirit, was widely accepted for how advanced machinery works around here. I was just going with the flow to put my point across. Neandra looked straight at me for a moment before putting her hand on her ear to put a vox through, probably to Thabaris. Sir? Our guest warns of imminent attacks on the Flame Raven. Apparently, the machine spirit told her so. She then listened for a little while before suddenly started unfastening my harness with haste. Neandra, startled by her action, I inquired hastily. She gave me this long look before answering. We are going to the cockpit. The attack you mentioned is coming. Chapter 7 Unfriendly Sky Neandra was leading the way towards the cockpit when the interior of the gunship dimmed down and its interior lighting changed to a tactical setting, switching light energy sources from the main circuit to independent units and a low siren began to ring out as the air tensed up. Following Neandra, I crossed a door hatch. Since this was a void-capable ship meant for space marines, the cockpit compartment was spacious enough for four people. There were two pilot seats at the front of the cockpit. Inquisitor Thabaris occupied one of it without his signature Capitaine hat. Beside him was a lady in a smart, blue Imperial Navy uniform with a pair of cool shades. A constant chime of warnings could be heard coming from the instruments and the panel lights were reflecting off nicely on the lady pilot's shade. We might be in trouble, Thabaris cut to the chase and looked at me. Neandra mentioned the machine spirit was telling you something, can you elaborate? I quickly tried to recall the message log I saw. Amazingly, it came back to me with absolute clarity. About 60 seconds ago, we were hit by severe system jamming followed by four suspected readings of unknown weapon systems locking onto us. I quickly summarized. Well, that certainly explained why our aspects had gone haywire. The pilot lady pointed to a radar-looking screen. On it was a jumbled-up-looking mess of readings. I got a really bad feeling about this. My feeling of unease rose exponentially as I threw out my next question. Are we flying over hostile territory? 
No, we were going through the green zone held by the forces of the governor. We deliberately chose the safest flight path to our destination. Thabaris replied. Somehow, his answer only added to my feeling of foreboding. We needed answers and fast. Thankfully, I got this cheat ability right here and... Cogitatio Acceleratio activated. The world slowed down again around me. First, I took a closer look at the panel of instruments and immediately gave up. Too much to learn and not enough time. I then ran Analytica on the lady pilot and nothing came back suspicious. Looks like my only weapon here was thinking. Something about this scenario felt amiss. Flying through a friendly area and getting the Auspex system jammed before being attacked? Why would the enemy go through that trouble unless... Are there any notable supposedly friendly anti-air assets situated around here that could take down Flame Raven? I immediately asked. There was a slight pause before Thabaris realized the purpose of my question. The Flame Raven was a huge gunship of Astartes' usage, origin, and design. Nothing short of some serious firepower could threaten it from the sky. That meant the enemy knew the only way to take us down was that we did not know what was coming. Tasia, He turned to the pilot, urgency in his voice. Already on it, sir. The pilot lady accessed a touchscreen data panel and quickly found the information she was looking for. Records showed four operational Mandacore anti-air platforms nearby, about 60 kilometers away. Mandacore? Those things with the dreaded Storm Eagle rockets? Just the mention of the term Mandacore conjured up memories of mass devastation during my tabletop gaming days. These weapon platforms carry the notorious Storm Eagle rockets that can absolutely wreck their intended targets from an extreme distance and the anti-air version of it existed. That meant, I said before my mind was suddenly flooded with all the relevant information about the weapon in question. Manicar anti-air platforms were usually armed with the Sky Eagle rocket variants which were heat-seeking warheads that targeted enemy aircraft's power signatures and engine exhaust. The standard rocket is divided into five sections, a fuse, the control and guidance equipment, the electrical unit, an explosive warhead and a propellant container for the two-stage solid fuel rocket with a top speed of 1,080 km per hour. By calculating the speed of the rockets and distance of roughly 60 kilometers, assuming the weapons were deployed at the time of jamming, the estimated time for rocket impact on Flame Raven is about 30 seconds. Since each platform can have up to 4 rockets, up to 16 rockets could be heading our way right now. I heard a calm and soothing female voice conveying the information before realizing it was my own. I looked up and saw Thabris staring straight at me. As our eyes met, a split second later his face somehow turned grimmer than usual as the implications of my words hit him. Throne's blood, he whispered. Neandra sprang into action, pushing me into a back seat on the wall of the cockpit and securing my harness with inhuman speed before doing the same for herself. Be advised, we are going on a full evasive maneuver, Tasia announced on the intercom. The onboard alarm went into full blare as the flame raven picked up speed. I was pushed back onto my seat by the sudden increase of G-force. What is with this endless amount of action film-like events? This is still the same lucid dream session, right? I couldn't help but think to myself, wondering if this must be some overcompensation for my decades of mundane life, but the warning blares in the cockpit and G-force felt real enough. I felt the gunship climbing as it continued to pick up speed. Inbound rockets confirmed on Auspex. Tasia's voice came through on the intercom. Apparently, the rockets were so close now even the jammed Auspex could pick them up. Hold on. Tasia said before commanding the Flame Raven to go from a climb to a steep banking dive. For a second there I felt gravity leaving me, then suddenly the G-Force came back with a vengeance, pinning me to the back of my seat. Then a series of updates popped into my head. Less than 10 chaff flare discharged a chaff and flare are countermeasures used by military aircraft to help evade missile attacks. But why was I receiving these messages? Am I still connected to the gunship's machine spirit? Pinned and unable to do anything, I tried calling it. Flame Raven. Received and ready to serve. Authority. It replied. Seemed like I don't need to be in a trance state to communicate with it. Show me real-time Auspex readings. Complying. A three-dimensional image of the gunship surroundings materialized inside of my mind, and I could see the gunship was being chased by multiple flickering icons of incoming projectiles while dropping countermeasures. A second later, I understood that while Tasia was doing a great job getting the rockets off our tail, there might be too many of them for us to have a clean getaway. A huge explosion sounded from somewhere, coinciding with my Auspex redoubt of a rocket detonating on one of the chaff. The whole gunship shook and amidst the chaos, I could even hear her Lindia's cries of horror from way behind in the fuselage. 
A feeling of unsuppressed terror started to assail me. Can you die in your dreams? They say if you die in your dream, you might die in real life too, right? Wait, how could they know that if they died in their dreams and never woke up to tell anyone? The flame raven shook violently as more explosions were happening nearby, waking me from my silly stupor, and this time, I could even hear a male and Ranner joining her Lindia with their outcry of cursings. I could have sworn I was screaming too, but instead, a familiar message appeared in my vision. Regulus, action override. Wait, what? This message again? Whatever, I don't want to die. I put my attention back to the Auspex readings again. To my utter horror, I soon came to the dreaded realization that if the events continued to unfold as the Auspex was showing, we would be cornered by the mass of rockets in the next eight seconds. No, 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 no. I immediately activated my thought acceleration and studied the readings, staring at the impending death sentence. We were already doing a steep banking dive at maximum speed with full chaff flare discharge, and were out of cards to play. Hold on, this gunship has two fully rotatable twin heavy bolter sponsons, right? I closed my eyes and tried to communicate with the machine spirit of the gunship again while in the state of thought acceleration. Flame Raven, calculate intercepting firing solution for incoming rockets with left and right twin heavy bolter sponsons. Was that too complicated? Unable to comply, Auspex error. That darn jamming again. Manual override. Give me the control for both twin heavy bolt responses. Complying. Two video feeds popped up inside my vision, directly showing me where the twin heavy bolters were aiming. Everything happened in a painfully slow manner while my thought acceleration was active except for those darned incoming rocket icons, they were fast approaching. I immediately rotated the guns to point at the rough direction for intercepting fire while consulting the flickering Auspex readings. These. These inaccurate readings won't work. I wanted to cry as despair was setting in, then it hit me. I had my own Auspex, just that it might not have enough range. Still worth a try rather than being dead though. I concentrated inwards on that feeling again and a moment later, activated Auspex as hard as I could. A massive sensor net burst forth from me towards the swarm of approaching rockets and registered their true locations to me in real time. I got you now you bastards. A brief moment after I consulted my Auspex reading, a transcendent level of calculation took place inside my head in slow motion as the ideal path of intercepting fire appeared in my mind. Putting my faith in what was revealed to me, I adjusted both the left and right sponsons to the exact position and mentally triggered the firing mechanism. For streams of mass reactive rounds burst forth from Flame Raven, hitting some of the incoming rockets at the last second and the resulting chain explosions pushed the gunship just enough to escape the massive impact zone from the rocket's crossfire. Even protected by the solid hull of the gunship, I felt the huge shockwave. The massive gunship groaned, spun and tumbled uncontrollably for a while in the air before the advanced avionics stabilized itself. The pandemonium ended abruptly, and we continued on our journey as if nothing ever happened. I gasped and looked around, confirming we were all still alive as evident from the screaming still coming from the passenger section. Flame Raven, thank you. I sent. Unknown command, unable to comply. It sent back. I wanted to laugh out loud, only to be stopped by a message appearing in my vision. Regulus, action override. Utterly flustered, I resigned myself to the fate of sitting quietly on my chair. We continued our flight in silence until Tasia spoke up. It seems like Flame Raven took out a few rockets with the heavy bolters at the very last second. But this is weird. I had been trying to engage the ballistic interception protocol, but it would not boot up probably due to the heavy jamming and here the system records indicate those guns were on manual control at the moment it fired. I might as well come clean again before incurring any unwanted misunderstandings in the future, so I raised my hand like a dutiful citizen and declared. It was me, Flame Raven didn't want to die either, so we cooperated to get out of that tight spot. Everyone in the cockpit turned and looked at me. Just who are you again, Lady Serene? Thabris finally asked. Seemed like the Inquisitor was showing me some respect. But, Lady... Lady, lady, lady. It was so cringy being called that my skin started to crawl. My male soul cried out in protest. I don't remember, but please, just call me Serene. Thabris did not reply and his face was unreadable. I insist on it, I said, surprising even myself. The rest of the short trip was uneventful other than the trio at the back of the gunship finally crammed into the cockpit asking what just happened. By then I had closed my eyes and tried to get some rest, but found it impossible to sleep again. It continued to be so right up until we reached our destination to meet the Astropath. Chapter 8 The Astropath Approaching Landing Pad 
Tasia's voice, which was dripping with the professionalism of a military pilot, broke the serenity inside the gunship's cockpit. Where are we? I asked absentmindedly. Why not try asking your machine spirit friend? Neandra replied flatly from beside me. That caught me by surprise on two fronts. First, this was the first time the assassin had actively talked to me. Second, is this supposed to be a test or friendly banner? I shot her a side glance before trying my luck checking the active flight log with the machine spirit. There mixed within all the updates was the identification, friend, or foe exchanges with air traffic control. After a brief moment, it concluded we were friendly and held off multiple anti-air turrets from shooting us just minutes ago. I checked the details on the IFF exchanges and read the digital signature of the air traffic control. Hmm. Fortress Endurance Sigma? I read it out loud. By the throne, you really can speak to the machine spirit, gasped Tasia while the rest of the crew looked at me like witnessing a ghost. Not a word of this to the outside. Thabris dropped his warning, thus everyone refrained from further commenting, and we finally got to see the last astropath on the planet. What surprised me more about the astropath was not the astropath himself. I've read about them as a hobbyist and had this mental image of what a stereotypical astropath looks like. Blind, pale skin, balding hair, wielding a staff with a stylized eye on it, wearing a stylish eye shade, and probably has a few random wires sticking out of their head. Aratus Ray in the astropath was all that, but with some crucial missing details from the lore I read. He also enjoyed a level of security, health care, and comfortable living standards rivaling that of the planetary governor. The layers of security checkpoints I went through reminded me of what was depicted in some of the superhero movies on how they kept really dangerous supervillains on lockdown. We passed through multiple blast doors and checkpoints manned by stormtroopers with hotshot loss guns ready, and even heavier guns like heavy bolters and plasma cannons mounted on gun servitors were ever present on all strategic locations in the building. It was clear they were not taking any chances on the security. As usual, Thabaris' inquisitorial rosette opened all doors, and we made a steady pace towards the innermost sanctum. In a way, it made sense. To put it bluntly, even the planetary governor can be easily replaced in leadership capacity if the unthinkable happens, but there was no immediate replacement for an astropath should Aratus be slain by the enemy. With the scheduled starship arrival on indefinite delay, he was literally the last link between the planet and the wider Imperium, the VVIP of the planet. It was no exaggeration to say his very well-being affected the fate of the billions of souls residing here. Hence the around-the-clock security measures and extreme precautions taken on his health management. Aratus, for his part, had an air of awkwardness about him like he did not know whether to stand or sit in our presence. Then again, it was in no way mundane for an Ordo Hereticus Inquisitor in full battle gear, armored fedora hat with a great coat, inferno pistol on the belt, and more to come visit you in your quarters. It was, however, plain for me to see that Aratus and Thabaris were acquainted. As expected of an Inquisitor worthy of his salt, Thabaris had apparently double-checked the integrity of the sole surviving astropath on the planet. Aratus, this is Serene. As always, Thabaris cut straight to the point, and I was glad he did remember to cut off the lady title when addressing me. Work with her to see if you can establish contact with any nearby Imperial world and send out a message requesting reinforcements citing renegade Astartes. Then Thabaris turned to me. Please see to it no harm comes to him in the process. His talent is sorely needed in this challenging time. Finally, he gathered his retinue. Neandra, you stay here with them. The rest of you, with me. Neandra turned her head, but before she could say a word, Thabaris made his point. Both of them are, as of now, of absolute strategic value for this world. Surely you are as indispensable? I asked. No, I am not. He answered matter-of-factly. If I am taken out of the equation, either a male or Neandra will take over command and proceed with a more defensive approach on what to do next. I looked at him. Finding it interesting that an individual can nonchalantly mention the possibility of self-demise, but he totally ignored my gaze. Inquisitor, you are leaving? Aratus asked. Yes, Mr. Ray. Unfortunately, heretics tend not to purge themselves. May the Emperor guide you on your work, Thabaris replied. With that said, he left the room. His retinue fell in behind him to their undoubtedly bloody inquisitorial business, their boots echoing down the hallway foreshadowing the violence to come. Neandra saw them off and then melted into the shadows. That left me and Aratus. I ran, Analytica on the astropath. His readings came back as expected. Name, Aratus Rain, Human, Psyker, Astropath. Hello, I said, greeting the Psyker. That was such an unusual way of greeting, 
you aren't from around here, are you? Oops, guess I did it by doing greetings in English instead of low gothic. Hello in English just felt so natural after decades of usage, it completely slipped through my lips. You are a sharp one, astropath. I jested in my awkward attempt to cover my slip up. Please, Lady Serene, just call me by my name. He actually looked kind of embarrassed, but he called me that and it hit me hard. If there was one thing I might never get used to it would be being called a lady. Fine, I said, in return, please drop the lady when addressing me in private, let us treat each other as peers. He paused slightly before asking, so how do we go about this? Pardon me, but I am at a loss on what is going on around here. I thought for a moment and decided to just get straight into it. Please brief me on how you do your work, and we will see what we can do from there. Everything considered we went off with a good start. Aratus began his lengthy crash course with me on the art of astrotelepathy while I paid full attention to him with ceaseless usage of cogitatio acceleratio between his lectures. With this incredible body that housed my amazingly sharp mind it felt like cheating. The moment he finished making a statement and describing a concept I would speed up my thought process with cogitatio acceleratio. Conjured mental notes and diagram to fully grasp whatever he said, pausing the process to ask important questions, rinsing and repeating until satisfied. After about two hours or so, I was beginning to have a good understanding of the whole process, though it must be mentioned with thought acceleration constantly in effect. From my point of view, it felt like I had been working on it for a full day. As for Aratus, he seemed to be getting more animated as the lecture went on. My crucial questions only added to his enthusiastic energy as the session dragged on. He must have found lecturing to be a very refreshing experience as evidently there was little to no chance to discuss his work if ever in his line of service. Even with all that enthusiasm pushing him I could see Aratus was reaching his limits, so after telling him to take a break and politely declining his invitation for a quick dinner, I continued the work alone. For unknown reasons hunger and thirst never seemed to cross my mind. I wondered about it for a moment before deciding to leave it at that. There were just too many unknowns in this new existence. With the freshly learned techniques, I went into a meditative state, rerunning the lessons with thought acceleration in the back of my head for the final wrap-up. The process continued until a feeling of sufficient understanding hit my mind, and I knew it was time for a small trial run of what I have learned. This feels so trippy. I felt my senses expand into the next realm. The world went weird for a brief moment as I attempted to send out a psychic message. Plus hello. Plus. Aratus who was having his belated dinner nearby jolted and apparently tipped over his drink on the dining table. I could hear the mess he was creating across the hallway. Plus was. Was that you? Lady Serene. Plus he sent back. Plus Astropath. What did we just agree on? Plus I returned. More sounds could be heard from across the hallway. The type of sound eating utensils made when dropped to the marble floor. A slight pause later. Plus, could you please turn it down a little? The intensity you were sending the message hurt my head. Plus, I gasped at the reply. After focusing on adjusting thought intensity as best I could by making it as light as possible and sent another message. Plus, sorry. How is it now? Plus, plus much better. Thank you. Plus, suddenly I felt his presence had a dramatic change. The best way to describe it was a great sense of fear started to flood from his direction across the hallway. Having just survived multiple attacks earlier in the day, my sense of alarm was cranked up to the maximum level in an instance. Standing up, my cogitatio acceleratio kicked in as I activated Auspex for an instant mind sweep around the area. In an almost painful slowness within my accelerated mind, my surroundings were revealed to me as information dripped in pace with my sensor net as it expanded outwards. There were three maids, two medics, two servitors, 18 armed guards with hotshot lost guns and 12 gun servitors with heavy bolters within 100 meters outside his living quarters. Also in the detection net were dozens of active security cameras, none inside Aratus living space. Neandra was in another nearby room checking on security details. Aratus had a lost pistol on him, a very typical setup. Glaringly missing was any kind of threat that would have spooked Aratus. Plus Aratus, plus I asked, being very careful with my intensity this time. Another slight pause later he answered. Plus wah. Plus he was practically trembling on his psychic message. Plus what are you? Plus. Plus Aratus. What are you even talking about? Plus concerned and confused. I asked while walking towards the astropath. What I saw stopped me in my tracks. Aratus had his pistol drawn and the gun was pointing in my direction. I could see my own reflection on the stylish eye shade that covered his blind eyes. The blatant hostility that was emanating from him was more of a mixture of fear than intent to kill. 
He was simply terrified. Aratus, what is wrong? Stop right there. Don't get any closer. He aimed his pistol in a threatening manner. The intensity of his emotion made me wince. How did you do that when you were not even a psyker? Are you even human? He demanded. His voice was starting to break due to the amount of duress he was experiencing. Caught by this unexpected turn of events, I was totally dumbstruck by his revelation. Chapter 9 Psychana Activa From the lore material I knew, psychers in this universe can easily distinguish their kin apart from the mundane masses with their psychic senses. Aratus had made it plain with his actions that I did not register as a psyker to his senses. Unfortunately, that could not explain my abilities nor my success in communicating with him via psychic means. It had spooked him so much he was prepared to shoot me with his last pistol. Being a civilian all my life, I was at a loss of what to do in this tense situation. Just as things were about to turn from bad to worse, Neandra appeared out of nowhere and took control of the situation. The Imperial assassin disarmed Aratus in the blink of an eye and sat him down back on his dining chair. Her frigid face had the slightest hint of exasperation as she was eyeing me the whole time while performing the incredible feat with a flawless motion. I could read her mind without even trying. In modern layman terms, it would be the equivalent of asking, what the hell are you doing? You noob. Master Ray. Neandra calmly addressed the distraught astropath, do not be alarmed. I can assure you Serene is not an enemy of the throne. After hearing those words, Aratus took his senses off me and turned to Neandra to validate how much he can trust her on that statement. It was at this moment someone opened the main door. A squad of stormtroopers stepped in, a grizzled man leading at the front as the sound of their military boots echoed in the living quarter. The squad's outfit and wardrobe was a match from the old Kazakhan box when one used to be able to get a squad of ten metal miniatures in the package, carapace armor drabbed over body glove and hotshot lost guns at the ready. The sergeant was a man who had the look of special forces written all over him, his squarish jaw, and the way he walked simply screamed elite militarism. Repeating one of the biggest cliches of the Grimdark universe, the man was the only one in the squad who was not wearing a helmet. Is everything all right? The sergeant asked, his tone of voice firm and respectful but unwavering. He was the only one who was not holding a weapon though his right hand hovered just above the hotshot lost pistol holstered on his belt. The rest of the stormtroopers fanned out behind him in well-trained tactical spacing. Master Rain, please explain the misunderstanding, Neandra said while stepping back from the astropath in her attempt to de-escalate the situation. Though from my understanding of her capabilities, a distance of a few meters might as well be face-to-face -face contact for the Imperial assassin. Aratus started talking with the sergeant, but my mind was fast drifting with the latest revelation. How is it possible I didn't register as a psyker from the astropath's point of view? All the abilities I used seemed psychic in nature. Dumbfounded, I raised my left palm and looked into it, and found I couldn't help myself from marveling at the flawless porcelain skin. Just as I was thinking of what I won't do to get a girlfriend with such fine skin in my previous life, an idea crept into my head. Wait, can I analyze myself? The sudden realization of such a potential struck me like lightning. With a staggering mind, I used Analytica on myself. The world seemed to freeze for a while before words started forming in my vision. Name, Serene, Primark Minoris, Psyker Passive, Abnormal Existence. Looking at the words and their implication, I felt like my body wanted to tremble, except it could not. As if rejecting an order from a lower authority, this body refused to convulse. The sensation of such incongruity triggered my instinct to vomit, but again, the action did not happen. Primarch Minoris. My mind went wild on that revelation. The Primarchs were genetically engineered transhuman sons of the Emperor of Mankind. They are a huge part of the lore of the Grimdark Universe. Twenty were known to be created. These beings were intended to be the immortal and superhuman generals who commanded the Space Marine Legions for Emperor's Great Crusade to reunite the scattered human race beneath his leadership. A memory surfaced into my mind as I struggled to organize my thoughts. It was from that shocking moment when Sister Alicia suddenly knelt in front of me. You must be the prophesied true daughter of the Emperor that he on Holy Terra has sent to lead us. The Palatine had said, so Serene was really a true bona fide daughter of the freaking Emperor level of existence? But there was never any mention of any Primarch Minoris in the lore I knew, let alone a female Primarch who was normal human size and stature. Since most Primarchs were basically super transhuman beings towering over the normal transhuman space marines averaging seven feet in height, that would render her looking like a doll in front of her brothers. Recalling all the information I had on the subject matter, the only loyalist Primarch that was still alive, 
active, and kicking at the end of the 41st millennium in the grimdark universe was none other than Robot Gilliman of the Ultramarines. Affectionately known in my gaming circle with funny nicknames such as Girly Man or Ultra Papa Smoth, the latter being a reference of his Legion heraldry color being an unfortunate match with a bunch of tiny blue creatures from a happier universe. Gilliman himself had actually been kept in a stasis field for 10,000 years after being fatally wounded in a battle and was recently resurrected to continue the plot, but that was a long story too convoluted to be told here. That said, having faced Gilliman himself multiple times on the tabletop game myself, one thing was very obvious to me. Written clearly on the Primarch's datasheet was Monster. That would indirectly mean whatever this Primarch Minori status entailed, I might not even come close to being a human despite this ideal female appearance on the outside. If this world was indeed the same grimdark universe that I knew well, it would be an understatement to say I was in a whole world of dire troubles. Syrian status as a Primarch Minori should be an imperial state secret of the highest order, and any wrong move going forward might seal my own worse than death scenario that comes in thousands of different flavors available here. The world seemed to spin as I pondered on my predicament, and my vision rested upon the second line of my inquiry result, Psyker Passive. As if answering my unspoken question, a new line of words popped up into my vision. Activate Psychana Activa? Yes slash no. With my limited knowledge of Latin, this seemed to roughly translate to active Psyker mode. What would happen if I went active? What about the perils of the warp? A part of me wanted to recoil just by thinking what could go wrong, but... I was really curious, and since all my abilities activation thus far seemed to serve me well I guess there was only one way to find out. It was then I noticed the stormtroopers finally left, it seemed like a radius got that matter sorted. No time better than now, this is still a dream, right? I held my breath and selected yes from the prompt. At first, nothing happened. Then, the surroundings went weird like some hidden locks were switched off, and an unworldly quality took over. I felt my senses grow and my feel of view for the lack of proper words extended. It felt paradoxical like being very trippy while maintaining your mental clarity at the same time. The sense of connection to the world kept expanding, and a feeling of many unseen windows were open beyond the senses. My mind struggled with these new sensations and there then I realized there was this strong resonance nearby, so very close. Like a submarine that just turned on its active sonar and received a huge ping reading, I turned to the source of resonance and saw it was a radius. He was facing me with his jaw dropped. The astropath's existence took on an extra-dimensional quality from my current point of view, rendering him more real than the surroundings, and I could easily pinpoint his exact position even with my eyes closed. So this is how psychers could tell each other apart. There is no hiding from this. Indescribable energy swirled around and inside me. It was gaining strength and seemed to obey my will, at least for now. Mindful of all the horror stories about the warp, I tried my best to keep it under tight control. When I finally got it stabilized, Aratus was still in his stupor gaping at me. That light, he murmured. Light? I asked. No reply. Was he looking at me, or behind me? While I understood Aratus was technically blind, I now knew his psychic sense more than made up for his sight, so I turned around and saw what he meant. Even when visually blocked by many layers of walls, a huge psychic beam could be seen, shining from beyond the horizon shooting into the heavens its psychic brightness transcending the material plane when one was psychically attuned. The huge, silvery golden beam was so beautiful and for some unknown reasons felt familiar. Wait, is that the massive activated psychic beacon they were all talking about? Instinctively I raised my hand trying to touch and feel it, but that was silly since it was so, so far away. Just as I was about to laugh at my own silliness, I felt an odd sensation of a connection established with the psychic light. Huh? Not knowing what just happened and with my hand still raised, I slowly turned my palm. Responding to my action, the massive pillar of psychic light actually changed its intensity. Oi, 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 this is bad, right? What have I done? Panicking, I adjusted the pillar of light back to its original intensity as best I could and tried to sever the weird connection. Luckily, it seemed like mental intent was all it took to get things to work with the psychic stuff. I felt the connection disappeared. I... I hope no one saw that. Wait. Aratus is here. Crap. Not knowing what to do, I turned to face the astropath. Only to see him on his knees calling to the emperor and apologizing to me in a semi-coherent flurry of speech. Dumbfounded again, I stood still as Aratus pressed his forehead down touching the floor, with tears flowing down cheeks as he begged for forgiveness in his whimpering voice. Eagerly wanting to avoid the stormtroopers barging in again, I turned to Neandra for help, 
The assassin was there looking at me with a complex expression, but she got the hint. She moved in and put her hand on his back. Master Rain, no one is going to hurt you as long as I am here. As I said, Sirene is not an enemy nor will she do anything to you. Her cold, authoritative voice and powerful presence did the trick and Aratus calmed down a lot after that. Maybe my psychic active mode has something to do with this hysteria? Thinking about that I tried deactivating Psychana Activa, the power responded to my will and shut itself off. The world went back to normal, which was a huge relief. Looking at the sheer absurdity surrounding me, suddenly I had an epiphany. That was it. Though very rare, this must be one of the extended lucid dream sessions I had read before on the internet. Thinking back, ever since I started role-playing as Serene, I never had any food nor drinks and had never gone to the toilet. Dream theory confirmed. Now that this was understood, I just had to let this session run its course and get back to my life. Finally feeling relieved, I knelt to face the weeping astropath at eye level. While he did look kind of pathetic, thinking back on my own experience so far, if it was not for Regulus, I might have embarrassed myself with openly screaming and weeping a few times just today alone. So, I did my best to join Neandra in comforting him. A good thing my current voice was so calm and soothing. Aratus, please. To tell you the truth, I recently just lost most of my memories and need your help. This planet and its people need your help too. Let's work together. He stopped weeping but remained silent. Does he still need an extra push for encouragement? He was calling to the emperor, right? Sigh, people of this world. I lamented internally and pushed forth with my final sales pitch. Come on, astropath, if not for this world, for the emperor. Yes. He finally responded by turning to me. Suddenly the frail astropath seemed invigorated with a new lease of purpose and he said his next statement with a calm conviction. For the Emperor. Chapter 10 The Light Aratus Rain was not a particularly gifted astropath. The few colleagues he had always seemed to outshine him both in talents and interpersonal relationships, resulting in him being mostly assigned to be the backup of the Adeptus Astra Telepathica Chamber. Ironically, that might be the very reason he was spared from assassination. Unlike his unfortunate colleagues who were at their workstation, Aratus was at his quarters when unknown assailants stormed the Telepathica chamber. An old reinforced panic room saved his life, and it took an Inquisitor to convince him to come out from the hideout. Despite being mediocre in raw talent, Aratus was not a foolish man. Even after being placed in a maximum security arrangement, a part of him was convinced he already was a dead man walking. The assassination of Astropaz was a clear attempt to cut off the planet's connection to the wider Imperium, and as the old saying goes, disruption of communication can only mean one thing, a pinning invasion. Further adding to his sense of ominous and pinning doom, Aratus was unable to contact any other Imperial world for reinforcements for reasons unknown. By then the lone Astropath had expected the worst. Any moment now, he believed, Hostile fleets bearing legions of the lost and damned would appear over a blackened sky to rain death and despair. Over the years of long service, he had caught glimpses of brief reports and tales to know such possibilities were real. Being the sole astropath on the planet made him a marked individual and even with all the securities provided he felt his days were numbered. Then the strangest thing happened. Half a day ago a massive psychic light shot up over the horizon. Aratus knew that non-psychers could not see it, but to him, it was as if a new sun had risen. He should have been more afraid, but to his amazement, the light felt familiar to him, like meeting an old friend again but being unable to recall their name. By this time, he had already given up on contacting other Imperial worlds and was just happy to stare into the psychic light over the horizon to escape from his troubles. That huge silver-colored pillar of light with a hint of gold made him feel peaceful and there was a strange sense of contentment knowing he witnessed this beautiful light before his inevitable demise. Aratus was in such a mindset when Thabaris, the Inquisitor who saved his life, visited with two others. One was a female agent who he recognized to never mess with. The other female was a peculiar newcomer who was introduced as Sirene. The Inquisitor soon left, dropping vague instructions before he did so. Sirene was soon asking questions about his telepathic craft, something a sanctioned astropath would never willingly share with any unfamiliar individuals. But at this point, Aratus couldn't care less. Following the few recent unusual events, all sense of normality had gone out of the window for him. That said, the teaching experience was refreshing since he was able to share his craft freely with a stranger for the first time. The truth was he had no idea of what was going on anymore. Sirene was not a psyker. He would know as psychers could easily tell one another apart from the rest of the mundane population. With that understanding, 
The futility of this exercise only served to further mystify him as this was akin to teaching a jellyfish to run, but he enjoyed her company. Even as a blind Psycheroratus could tell Cyrene was a special individual, her presence had a soothing effect on him and her voice was pleasing. On top of that she seemed very intelligent, the questions she asked from time to time cut right at critical points with a hint of a master's level of understanding. In the short time they spent together his appreciation for her intellect went up a few notches, he imagined her to be beautiful but regretted not being able to see with his vision to verify that hunch. Then the lessons were halted for a meal as his hunger overcame his newfound thrill of teaching. Serene politely declined his invitation to join him, so he went for it alone. The servers came with his food, everything was double-checked for poisons and toxins before he sat down to satisfy his hunger. Halfway through his meal, another unexpected event happened. Plus hello. Plus. Serene's voice came through via telepathic means, the strength and intensity of it startled him. Plus was, was that you? Lady Serene. Plus he sent back. Instantly he got a reply. This time the psychic communication came with overwhelming strength. It was akin to receiving a voice reply from a laud hailer while standing right next to it. The massive impact made Aratus drop his eating utensils. Flinching, Aratus quickly shot back another communication asking Serene to tone down the intensity of her message. Her next reply was an apology, and this time the volume was just right. What amazing raw talents his new student possessed, Aratus thought. Only a few hours after his lessons and she mastered telepathic communication. Just as he was beginning to feel proud of his teachings, only then he remembered. Cyrene was not a psyker. That realization shattered the serenity Aratus enjoyed that day. He felt like being rudely awakened from a sweet dream with haunting death cries of his former colleagues echoing inside his mind. Alarming questions raised one another for his attention as he instinctively took out his lost pistol. What sorcery is this? Is Cyrene an agent of the enemy? Is she a heretic that infiltrated this far to replace him from the inside? How can someone who is not a psyker send telepathic messages? His mind searched frantically and found no solid answers, and try as he might, he could not ignore the dark whispers of forbidden tales of demons nagging at the innermost corners of his mind. It was at this point Aratus realized deep down, despite all the pessimism he really did not want to die. By the time Syrian came to check him up he went into a full-blown panic and was ready to discharge his weapon despite his instincts screaming at him that it wouldn't do anything to his target. Then the female agent Neandra validated his guess of her skill by swiftly disarming him in a split second. To his surprise, she vouched for Cyrene's integrity. The commotion caused the stormtroopers who were in charge of his security to barge in. Even in a daze, Aratus realized he would have been dead or incapacitated by now if either Neandra or Cyrene had ulterior motives, so he cooperated and convinced the security to leave. As the stormtroopers left, Aratus was collecting his thoughts as he turned to his guests and what he sensed made him freeze. Serene, once a mundane human presence in his psychic sense, began to change. First, she was suddenly registered as a psyker to his senses, making Aratus wonder if he had gone senile. Then, to his utter bewilderment, he could feel her power growing rapidly. One moment, the level of raw power she exuded reminded him of his ancient mentor, then that quickly changed as she surpassed that and reached the power level of a Primaris Psyker he met years ago, but that too was surpassed and her power just kept rising. With his jaw dropped, Aratus witnessed Cyrene's transformation from being psychically inert to an overwhelming presence right before him. He felt the raw power difference between them and instantly understood that she could literally crush him like a bug if that level of psychic might was ever directed at him with intent to kill. Then, like a miracle, Aratus could see Cyrene despite being blind. Her psychic presence was so intense that the powerful resonance between them made her appearance solidify to his psychic senses. Appearing before him was a breathtakingly beautiful human female wearing a simple white robe. Arm-length straight platinum hair flowed gently over her petite shoulders. The most striking feature she had were her large, almond-shaped eyes, gray-colored irises with a tint of golden psychic glow were looking straight at him. Aratus could feel the unfathomable power that lay behind them. Her gaze seemed to pierce through him but carried no malevolence. Looking closer, he noticed Cyrene was surrounded by a familiar faint golden light. That light, he murmured. Light? She echoed his statement. Then, as if just noticing the huge psychic pillar behind her that was shining from beyond the horizon, she turned and looked at it. Wordlessly, she raised a hand and then slowly began turning it around by her wrist. Responding to her action, the psychic light changed its intensity. Watching the unbelievable scene unfold, 
Aratus finally understood the truth. Sirene was the link for that huge psychic beacon. She was the master of that light. Before he realized it, Aratus had dropped to his knees. Hot streams of tears flowed uncontrollably down his cheek. Emperor preserve us. Who, who are you? His shaken voice was soft but clear in the quiet room. Such power, Aratus thought. Sirene radiated so much power it reminded him of the legends he had heard of demons and saints about their otherworldly presence. Then to his utter horror, he recalled pointing a weapon at the individual before him. My, my sincerest, deepest apologies, I, I didn't know. Aratus pressed himself further down, his forehead touching the floor, his tears flowing down to the floor and his mind a panicking mess. Following the peculiar pattern that day, Aratus could not for his life understand what was going on but one thing he knew for certain, whoever Serene was, taking his life was but a trivial matter for her. However, not only that did not happen, she instead knelt to his level to talk to him, asking for his assistance and reminding him of his duty to the emperor while ignoring his transgressions. That deeply moved Aratus, he had personally known people who had lost their lives with much lesser acts of disrespect towards powerful individuals let alone pointing a weapon and dropping accusations at such a figure. Serene had spared him. He was convinced of that fact. And who was he to begin with? A mediocre astropath who had given up on his duties and lost his faith in the emperor. Such heretical thought, such sin. Yes, he will atone for his sins and his shameful actions later. Now is not the time for self-pity. Duty calls and Aratus the astropath will answer it. He turned to Serene. Astonished to find her presence had reverted back to a non psyker again, but this time he knew better. When he probed hard enough, he could still just barely feel a hint of that unfathomable might beneath her benevolent aura. The fact that such a powerful figure was in front of him was proof enough that the god emperor had yet to give up on this world. Aratus was sure of it. Now there was hope in his world, and that extended to this world as well. Stealing his resolve, Aratus replied the only way he could. Yes, he said affirming himself to his duties with a level of resolve he had never felt in his entire life. For the Emperor. Chapter 11 Intermission Thabarus was in a grim mood, grimmer than usual. Getting himself and people under his responsibility ambushed was rare for him, let alone twice in a day. Thabarus Thorn was an in-the-field type of inquisitor without being a psyker himself, and while it was true the ability to use psychic powers was never a mandatory requirement, and the vast majority of Inquisitors have no affinity for the warp. Its sheer advantage was glaringly apparent. A check on the list of who is who of famously celebrated Inquisitors amongst the Imperial elites and one could quickly deduce almost all of them were psychers. From the High Protector of the Formosa Sector Torquemada Kodias, the philosophical Gideon Ravener, and even the questionable Gregor Eisenhorn, all were known for their psychic prowess. In light of that, Thabarus had worked extremely hard to get to where he was and paid extra diligence to compensate for that disadvantage. That said, what happened a few days ago had Thabarus silently grateful for being a non psyker for the first time. Something massive was happening in the warp, and all the psychers in his war band were experiencing difficulties, citing constant nightmares, and constantly being affected by feelings of utter dread. The conditions became so bad the most severely affected individuals had to be put in a medically induced coma to prevent cases of self-harm. And thus Thabarus had been operating without his usual contingent of psychic aids in his field works recently. Would that have helped in not getting ambushed? He was not sure, and that realization only served to sour his mood further. Sir, we are done here. A male's voice woke him from his thoughts. Thabarus turned to his interrogator, silently asking the latter to proceed. A male continued his report. An order of unknown origin came through, authorizing the manacores to attack us, but the trails might lead to nowhere. There has to be a collaborator from the inside. Well, that was expected. The Inquisitor sighed internally, his mind lamenting at these predictable outcomes. After decades of working in the field, most things became tiresomely predictable, except for that lady. Thabarus found his mind turning at thinking about Serene and the fact that he could not get a proper read on her. One moment she was saying she lost her memory and had an almost civilian-like bearing. The next thing he knew she saved him and his retinue without even flinching at how close they were at death's door. He had secretly observed her expression and breathing aboard the flame raven and concluded she never for a second seemed worried during the tense moments. Serene was merely sitting on her chair, eyes closed with a peaceful expression when the heavy bolters were discharged at the exact moment it needed to get them out of that deadly predicament. What did that arch dominus call her again? Omniscient princess? Thabarus pondered on these questions and found no satisfying answers. At this point, 
He could not even be sure if the assassination attempts were aiming at him or her. It was at this time he received a coded message from Neandra. He took a quick glimpse and was stunned by what he read. Amel was quick to notice his master's reaction and politely inquired, Sir, Thabris did a quick mental check on the chances of their conversation being compromised before deciding it was safe enough to answer his interrogator. Syrian and Aratus have made contact with other Imperial worlds. Amel gasped upon hearing the news. While it was technically true Aratus' reign was the last known astropath on the planet, Thabaris' own warband had another skillful astropath who was on his ship orbiting the planet, and the Psyker had been trying for days without result. Sir, that is good news. Are reinforcements coming? Amel could not contain himself. I am afraid not, replied Thabaris. They could only contact planets within the subsector. These were of no use to us in terms of reinforcements. Something huge must be going on out there. So we are back to square one, sighed Amel. I thought she was just coming along to show us her sincerity and get the Arch Dominus to work with us. To think she actually was able to make contact with other planets, said Thabaris before asking, what is your reading on her? Amel looked at his master, his mouth half open, but nothing came out for a while. When he was just about to speak, Thabaris cut him off halfway, other than appearance. That kept Amel's mouth open for a little longer before he sighed again and answered, I don't know. Without witnessing what she did, she just felt like a civilian. So, a psychic civilian, who can pierce the veil of warp when our astropath has failed and she could even talk to machine spirits while keeping a pet arch dominus? Thabaris teased. Might be a transhuman too while we are at it, laughed a male. And you said that because. Just look at her. She has been with us for hours and never once showed any signs of physical exhaustion nor did she ever ask for any nourishments. So you were watching. Of course. Is she like Neander then? A male thought for a while before answering. Maybe and probably more dangerous. Why? If I met her on the street without knowing better, she would probably just come across as just being breathtakingly pretty. Whereas for Nien, well you can always tell she is dangerous. So you can't get a proper read on her too, remarked Thabaris. Sir, a male whispered, with all due respect, hypothetically speaking if you were to issue a kill order to Nien now, who do you think will come out alive? Hmm. Thabaris contemplated for a while before deciding to drop the difficult subject and asked another question. You said the trails might lead nowhere. Elaborate. They left so many digital trails behind that most are probably just feints. We have neither the resources nor the time to pursue all of them. I have shown the preliminary findings to our back-end team. They said it might take weeks to sort it out. Unless. Unless we somehow have a whole starship's worth of advanced cogitators and a capable mind to wield that at our disposal? I have just the contact here. Since that attack almost took her out, I imagine this would provide sufficient motivation for our new Adeptus Mechanicus acquaintance to expedite his efforts, said Thabaris, a hint of a smile appearing on his stern visage. Compile all the data you found together with Flameraven's flight log of the incident. It is time to contact the Arch Dominus for that luggage arrangement we promised. The Inquisitor ordered. Sometime later, inside a fortified command bunker somewhere near the front line. A high-level strategic discussion was interrupted by a statement uttered by a certain high-ranking individual attending the meeting. Deplorable. A massive hooded and hunched figure snarled as he struck the ground with the end knob of his giant omniscient axe. The impact created a deafening clang, and the primary holographic projector inside the meeting chamber flickered in protest. The figure's sudden outburst put the meeting proceeding to a grinding halt as all eyes were on him not knowing what to expect next. Being more machine than man, senior members of the Adeptus Mechanicus were known for their almost inhuman dispassionate disposition throughout the Imperium. The fact that such a high-ranking representative of the Order even broke basic etiquette to express his outrage had everyone at the high-level meeting stunned silent. Sitting around a huge table with a holographic projector in the center were some of the most powerful individuals on the planet. Present on one side was the planetary governor, Lord General and Generals of the Planetary Defense Force, sitting across them in their power armor was the Canonists and Palatines of the Adeptus Sororitas. It was Canonist D. Dinah who broke the awkward silence. Esteemed Dominus, what was that about? The words from the Supreme Leader of Adeptus Sororitas' order on the planet seemed to pull the spaced-out Dominus back to the meeting as the latter quickly apologized. Pardon me, Cryptor bowed. I must ask for forgiveness from all you luminaries for my lack of self-control upon hearing reports of the rebels' heresy. Now, now, came a cultured female voice, having righteous zeal is a virtue. Though I must confess I am inspired by your show of 
passion which is such a rarity for your kin. We were fortunate enough for you to come to our aid in this dire hour, for that we will be forever grateful, said Catalina von Cleus, the current ruling planetary governor. The governor was a gorgeous-looking blonde who looked to be in her early thirties but was in fact over seventy years old. Being powerful and wealthy she had constant periodical rejuvenat treatments to preserve her youth. Thanks to that she stood tall and her golden personalized power armor glittered in the meeting chamber. But upon closer inspection minor battle damages and scratches could be seen here and there. Little did Catalina know that Cryptor wasn't fussing over what was shown at the strategic meeting. The Archdominus had just received a message from Thabaris via his secured network and saw what had transpired. The outrage he experienced was so severe that it overcame his multi-layered emotional suppressor, resulting in his unexpected outburst. These damned heretics were so close to ruining his sacred mission again. For the second time in 24 hours, Cryptor was seething with a sense of anger that had last been experienced lifetimes ago. And how could he have not? He had caught glimpses of what was behind the blast door at the end of the activation chamber. There, what might be a true technological treasure trove awaited, and just when he was about to gain entrance to it, unexpected events kept delaying his access to it. Cryptor's cycle had lived for many thousands of years. What little remained of his humanity was locked away in a thrice reinforced adamantium skull, and his true personality was locked even deeper underneath an operating surface persona. Through certain past experiences, he had learned the hard way on the disadvantage of putting one's indifference on open display, especially when dealing with any powerful individuals who were not adepts of the Omnisia. Ever the practical soul, he had searched for a solution and came across a method that was borderline heretical by the reckoning of his order. Through advanced neuron and cogitator manipulation, he created a subcore of himself and wore it like a mask. This subcore persona was designed to be approachable by non-augmented humans for smoother interaction, and it had worked wonders for him, opening previously closed doors and negotiations. Ever since then he had been operating as such. His subcore would appear friendly and interact with the outside world while his true cold, dispassionate, and calculative self would withdraw and run computations on whatever he fancied, essentially running simultaneous thought processing. Very rarely, some event deemed by himself important enough would occur and his true self would surface to take over the autopiloting friendly subcore persona. Cryptor silently stood up as his subcore personality was recalled. As he did so, all pretense of subtle human behavior and speech pattern imitation was dropped as he spoke in a cold, flat tone. This conflict delays the great work of the glorious Omnisia and as such, warrant my undivided attention to end it as soon as possible. I have deemed it necessary to deploy all the resources at my disposal to prove the supremacy of the machine god to the heretics. My cult will be most grateful for the full cooperation from you all to see this through, as will the benefactor of my holy expedition. Though his words sounded courteous enough, all those present felt Crypterer's non-negotiable undertone and some eyebrows were raised. Who is this benefactor you spoke of? And what would be expected from us? One of the generals asked. Crypterer turned to the man deciding for a moment before answering. It would be better for her to tell it herself, but rest assured, she has authority over all the presiding here. Worry not of the parts you all will be taking. I promise you they are well within your capabilities. That created some murmurs amongst the crowd, but the Archdominus cared not as his attention was already elsewhere. Oh yes, she has the authority, his true core mused to himself as he reviewed the flight log of gunship flame raven over and over again, analyzing its details. Hidden within the record but plain for him to see was the telltale signs that despite suffering from memory loss, Serene still had the capability to use her authority, and that provided the key component for him to end this conflict as soon as possible. Chapter 12 Origin The first memory she had was looking up into the light from a place of darkness. It was bright beyond imagination and seemed to be observing her from the highest point in the heavens. Who are you? She asked, her inner voice seemingly echoing in the endless space. The light seemed to flicker by the merest degree at her question, but did not answer. She, in turn, understood she was being observed and continued to gaze into the light. It continued to shine on her for a long time before it finally communicated with her. I am your creator, the master of mankind. That was the first time she spoke with her creator. Little was directly communicated to her from the emperor, but she knew she had a lot of brothers and that her creation benefited from the accumulated experiences he gained from their creation. Consequently, while her creation was a lot less resource-intensive than any of her brothers, the master of mankind utilized some of the most advanced arcane techniques known to him. A proud little side project done with leftover resources, so to speak. 
She was given the name Serene by her creator, and she was to become an imperial heiress, with the term heiress used loosely to represent her status as a direct creation of the master of mankind. Such notions were hammered into her even while she was but a faint consciousness in her incubator. Vast collections of knowledge were imprinted into her very being so that she would help her creator and her brothers run the empire when the time came. The empire itself was on the verge of a brand new phase that promised eternal glory to mankind and her help was needed. She was to aid him on administrative tasks and be an anchor to the empire's internal affairs where brute force and legions of super soldiers were poor tools. This much was communicated to her by her creator, the shining figure who called himself the master of mankind, better known, as she eventually found out, simply as the emperor. Serene for her part was ready for a lifetime of service to her creator, to work tirelessly behind the scenes or in front of the masses as the situation required be it to follow one of the brothers to further expand the empire or devote herself to further illuminate the galaxy with her creator's light, she was prepared for any task assigned to her. But somehow she was kept in the incubator for maybe too long a time, a deliberate action that was done without her understanding. Serene felt she had spent an eternity basking in the emperor's light while growing inside her incubator. During this period, she learned about the world outside her incubator through a direct knowledge feed via an arcane data link. Sirian had the impression her creator was always extremely busy. She could feel his attention on her from time to time, but it always went by in a flash, a sudden brief supernova out of nowhere and gone before she could react. Inside the darkness, she continued to accumulate vast amounts of information and could rightly be considered a super sage before she even drew breath. She could recall an endless stream of information and perform hypercomplex mathematics inside her mind. But knowledge without context was sorely lacking and she grew restless, yearning for more. Once, on a rare occasion when she felt the light's attention lingered on her for more than a second, she took the courage to ask, Are you my father? And what am I? Both natural questions after she had reviewed her imbued knowledge countless times about humanity. The light stayed and decided to answer her question. You can call me father, he said and contemplated the second question for a while. Your brothers are Primarchs, and as for you, you are lesser than your brothers, but greater than the rest of mankind. Primarch, but lesser, so lesser Primarch, a Primarch Minoris? She asked. The terms came naturally to her. The light did not disagree and left it at that. Another rare time when she felt his attention on her during the long dormancy, she asked, Father, when will you let me out? Again, the light flickered by the merest of degrees before answering, Not now. Now is the time for might and brute force. Your talents will be needed later. Again, Serene was left in the black void for an indeterminate amount of time. We are almost done. One day, out of the blue the emperor communicated to her. Your skills will be put to use after this colossal mess is sorted. He said, sounding tired. That very notion brought great discomfort to her, for she could not fathom how someone as powerful as her creator could be under severe duress. What happened, father? She asked. The emperor didn't reply, but she felt a hint of melancholy from her creator. I hope the next time we speak it will be a happier occasion. It sounded so promising. Serene did not know that this was the last time she would be having a proper conversation with her creator. Much later, when she finally escaped the enclosure of her incubator, the empire was in shambles, unceremoniously gutted by the most brutal war known to humanity. All her brothers were missing after they turned on one another waging wars across the stars. Her creator, the entity who she had called her father, was technically both insane and eternally on the verge of true death, confined to the golden throne. The promising world that was shown to her was no more. In its place laid a grotesque shell of a fallen galactic empire where the dreams of eternal glory died. Consciousness slowly returned to me. I became aware of the sensation of lying in my bed and feeling mentally tired. The first thought that came to my mind, has that overly long and convoluted lucid dream session finally ended? In the said dream session I apparently took the place of the hidden true daughter of the emperor, who was in no way canon, and had adventures dealing with armed militias led by renegade space marines and later helped an astropath to make contact with multiple planets. In the dream, I had psychic powers and met with a lot of interesting people of the grimdark universe, from a squad of battle sisters, an arch-tech priest Dominus, an inquisitor, and even an imperial assassin. The unduly lengthy dream session even concluded with an origin brief of her story of how she was kept in an incubator the whole time during the whole Great Crusade and Horus Heresy era. Well, as interesting and realistic as it felt, it was time to get back to my mundane and uneventful life, 
Perhaps the whole thing was a hint for me to finally start working again on some of the eternally work-in-progress projects from my huge pile of shame. That was my thought as I sighed and reluctantly opened my eyes, only to be greeted by an unfamiliar ceiling. Alarmingly, it was not the ceiling of my own room. This ceiling had a luxury sweet feeling to it and had intricate designs filigreed onto it. Mixed within the intricate patterns were the distinctive shape of human skulls. Human skulls on luxury ceiling designs, to my knowledge, there could be only one universe that would go down that path. Startled, I bolted upright and looked around. A room of suffocating luxury surrounded me. On one of the walls was a huge mirror. On it, I saw the reflection of a bewitching white-robed girl with straight platinum hair sitting on top of a huge bed. Oh, the things I would do to get a girl like that into my bed. But, with a numbed mind, I raised my right hand and waved. The girl in the mirror did the same. A surge of indescribable feelings reached me. In my state of confusion and panic, I grabbed the closest thing my hand could reach and flung it with all my strength. Next thing I knew, the said object flew with an absolutely mind-boggling speed and hit the wall with a thunderous thud. Watching bewilderedly as paintings fell off the wall and a flower vase tipped over from the impact, I was rudely reminded of the fact this girl was supposed to be a mini Primark with a transhuman body. Or was it? I looked down at my hands. Instead of my usual pair of old large hands, I was greeted by a pair of delicate appendages covered with flawless porcelain skin. But I... I had to be sure. Analytica activated. Name, Serene, Primark Minoris, Psychopassive Mode, Abnormal Existence. I looked and looked again. The words didn't go away. I wanted to scream and cry but no sound came out and a familiar line of message appeared in my vision. Regulus, action override. On the verge of a mental breakdown and seethed with an infuriating amount of frustration, I screamed internally, just what the hell is this, Regulus, thing? Analytica, activated. Huh? I can analyze my powers? I watched in astonishment as lines and lines of messages appeared in my vision, giving me detailed descriptions of the ability. In a nutshell, Regulus was a complex, self-invented psychic discipline refined over time by Serene herself. The ability consisted of a myriad of passive traits focusing on etiquette, vanity, and glamour. A self-imposed subconsciousness-controlled mental lock was in constant self-policing on my etiquette, hence the reason why I could not scream like a sissy on more than a few occasions. Another major feature it had was the incorporation of user's psychic flow to maintain peak physical appearance. Looking deeper, it even had a more sinister-looking side effect of diverting a small portion of the psychic flow to subtly emphasize the most appealing aspects of appearance onto the viewers. The final effect differs from individual viewers with the same objective of endearment. As I focused on the details of each passive trait, options after options popped up one after another. Take the vanity trait, for example. Upon closer inspection, it was revealed none of Serene's appearance was left to chance, from the length of hair and nails to her skin condition. Her, or rather my, natural psychic flow had kept everything in constant check and control. This, this is the ultimate glamour spell all the female celebrities back in my old world would kill for. No wonder I still look like a supermodel even after just waking up from my sleep. At the very end of the long descriptions was a line of what seemed like a flavor text from the creator of the spell. It read, for the day when I served my father in the open. Well, that definitely did not happen for the last 10,000 years. Whatever happened between her and the emperor? Chapter 13 Morning Guests It was early in the morning when Sister Hospitaller Verita Kern walked tiredly towards the meeting point she obtained from Neandra. They were both members of Inquisitor Thabarus Thorn's retinue and had an amicable relationship within his mini-inquisitorial warband. Generally, be it infiltration or taking out critical targets, Neandra would be tasked with the most critical aspect of the missions whereas Verita would fix up any of their members who suffered injuries during their mission. It was also Verita's job to fix the occasional interrogation subjects to prolong the interview session when needed. It was a grim duty that she had answered fully with all her talents. Behind her were three servitors carrying the luggage of the mysterious individual Serene. As Verita turned a corner, she recognized Neandra's silhouette in the distance, the way the assassin stood signaled her to wish to talk, probably for a short mission briefing. Nien, Verita called out. Neandra nodded, acknowledging her colleague before replying. Took you long enough. Verita sighed. Complications with the luggage contents. Really? With that little amount of stuff? Neandra looked behind Verita, evidently not impressed by the paltry amount of material present. 
When the rich and powerful people of the Imperium moved between worlds, it was not uncommon for their personal necessities, amounting to what looks like a whole month worth of supplies for an Astra Militarum battalion. So, what is the deal with our little miracle lady? Verita asked. She is a complicated case. While she seems cordial enough, do tread lightly with her. But you are here. Verita scoffed. Listen. Neandra cautioned and whispered, if for any reason she went rogue, I am not sure I can stop her. Verita almost gasped at that statement. Her impassive face turned serious for the first time in the conversation. Working alongside Neandra for decades, Verita was well aware of her capabilities, so much so with the latter around as of this moment not even the sudden appearance of a heretical Astartes would phase Verita much. Throne? Are you jesting? Neandra did not reply as she never joked about work. Come on, tell me more. No one has ever mentioned anything about her being able to best you in combat? Verita pressed. No, she wasn't much of a fighter from what I had observed. Then, hmm. Neandra contemplated for a while before finally answering. Truthfully speaking, I am not sure. But somehow I have a feeling that if it reaches that point things will not be easy or pretty because I cannot get a proper gauge on her capabilities nor her personality. You are making this scary now. Verita protested. Let's go. The assassin signaled the sister to follow. They walked a short distance before arriving at the room where Serene had spent her night. Neandra stopped to look at Verita again her expression reading, try not to offend her, making the latter gulp at how serious the assassin was approaching this assignment. Just as Neandra was about to knock on the door, something triggered her instinct to jump back. A split second later a thunderous low thud could be heard coming from the room. Verita let out a small yelp at the sudden development and moved away from the door. They stayed silent for a while, standing completely still looking at the door. Finally, Neandra moved slowly towards the door. She produced a spying device pushed it on the door and listened. A moment later, satisfied with whatever she heard, the assassin knocked on the door and slowly opened it. The room had a typical interior set up for an important guest. Inside the room, she saw a girl with platinum straight hair sitting on a huge bed. She was hugging her legs, head on her knees as if in some sort of agony. Serene, Neandra asked. The girl turned her head and looked at the assassin before replying in a dreamy tone. Neandra, morning to you. Are you hurt or anything? No, I was just upset. I still can't recall most of my memories. My colleague is here with your belongings, and she will provide you with a basic medical examination. Neandra signaled Verita to enter. The latter entered the room hesitantly with the three servitors behind who put down the luggage bags then left. Neandra observed Serene seemed to flinch at the sight of the servitors, but her expression was so subtle even with her transhuman perception she could not be sure about it. Servitors are mindless humanoids of flesh and metal used to carry out simple, manual tasks. They can be either made of mind-wiped humans or the vat-grown variants. Servitors are programmed and cybernetically enhanced to serve some specific, rudimentary function and are ubiquitous throughout the Imperium. Considering most Imperial subjects wouldn't even spare servitors an extra glance, the whole observation just came out as odd for the assassin, further reinforcing her own assessment of being unable to read Syrian properly. Then there was the room itself. One side of the wall had a few paintings that fell off and were on the floor. Neandra was sure that was not the case when she did a quick sweep of the room yesterday. Other details she noticed that were out of place was a toppled flower vase and a single bolster pillow on the floor. Neandra walked over, picked it up, and took a closer look at it. On one side of the pillow the fabric appeared to be torn, suggesting the sleeping aid had been subjected to some brutal surface impact force. You threw this? Neandra asked. Sorry, Serene said as she buried her face on her knees. I did that just now when I realized my memories did not return after I woke up. This is Sister Verita. She also works for Inquisitor Thabaris. Ever the professional, Neandra pushed forward her agenda of the day. Verita stepped forward and performed the sign of Aquila. Well met, Lady Serene, the hospitaler said. Serene gave the hospitaler an apprehensive look before getting off her bed and properly returning the Aquila sign. Please, just call me Serene. She said before talking in a resigned tone. Sister Verita, I have to inform you in advance of an issue which I believe Neandra knew as much already. She paused for a while before saying her next word slowly. I'm not a normal human. Verita did a quick exchange of glances with Neandra upon hearing that statement. The latter indicated she should proceed with the planned examination so Verita pressed forward despite having her own doubts. Perhaps let me do a standard medical examination first? Serene did not reply but continued to look at the hospitaler, 
This was the first time they made direct eye contact, and suddenly Verita understood why her colleague of many years warned her beforehand of this meeting. Sister Hospitaller Verita Kern was not your typical citizenry of the Imperium. To put it into perspective, the ordinary has nothing to do with anything off-world, was a common saying within the Empire as almost all of the mundane masses of the massive Empire will never step foot upon a starship in their entire life, let alone travel between worlds and different star systems. In terms of exposure to the worldliness of what the galaxy has to offer, Verita Kern had seen enough to be ranked amongst the elite within the masses of humanity. In her line of duty, Verita had traveled to various star systems and frequently works in the presence of individuals who have the power to drop death sentences on an entire planet's population. Due to the unavoidable sinister nature of Thabra's work, she had seen enough behind-the-scene workings of the Inquisition to drive most of the ordinary citizens mad. Verita herself had garnered enough clearance level over the years to receive briefings on the dangers of chaos, sorcery, and demonic entities to know these were no fairy tales. Even the Emperor's mighty space marines, which some of the more backward agricultural world masses worshipped as angels of death, had lost their mythical appeal to her as she learned more and more about them in her line of work. Verita sometimes wonders how those masses would react if she had told them she personally had cut apart some of the space marines who had turned renegade and at this point had seen enough of these angels dead in the interrogation chamber for her to even care. So when the worldly Verita locked eyes with Serene, she found it strange her level of unease rising rapidly despite the latter showing no sign of malice and demeanor. It was as if just having Serene's full attention was enough to intimidate her. This experience reminded Verita of the time when she was on the verge of a panic breakdown when she met a transhuman space marine in person for the first time. The symptom of ordinary humans experiencing a high level of unease just by meeting a space marine was actually quite common. They call it transhuman phobia. One would not know this without ever experiencing it firsthand, but meeting an Astartes in real life was far from a pleasant experience. From an unaugmented human's point of view, a transhuman is stronger, faster, and generally smarter than you before even considering their usually far superior equipment. To look directly at a transhuman Astartes would mean the understanding of one's totally inferiority and near-total helplessness against them. Such realization could trigger a sense of survival crisis response at the primal level. Severe cases would render sufferers of said phobia to be non-functional in the presence of any transhuman. But her tendency to suffer from an episode of transhuman phobia was so long ago, it was bewildering that her instinct was giving her all the warnings not to slip up now. It was then Verita noticed Sirene was not looking at her but passed through her, and then Neandra's voice called out. Someone is coming. There are three of them. One is wearing power armor. Serene added casually. Verita felt surprised by that statement. She knew Neandra was operating on a sensory level much higher than a normal human. In fact, so far Verita had heard nothing at all which hinted on people coming their way. Much less about being able to discern one of them was equipped with power armor. Are you expecting guests? Neandra asked and started tapping into a small data slate. Not that I remember. Serene shrugged. The record shows representatives of Adepta Sororitas landed just moments ago said Neandra after consulting a security log from somewhere. Via an Aquila lander. I recognize these, added Serene suddenly with a seemingly misplaced sense of enthusiasm. Are you talking with the machine spirits again? replied a rarely flustered Neandra. Please restrain yourself from casually showing off your unusual talents. Arg, I am sorry. We'll observe these in future. Serene apologized by putting her palms together and doing a slight bow. It appeared almost comical to Verita, but she was unable to laugh. Neandra was right, she thought. Even the worldly Verita could not discern what was actually going on underneath Serene's weird antics. A while later, a knock sounded at the door. Neandra answered it, and three Sororitas entered as predicted. Good to see you again, Palatine Alicia. Serene cheerfully greeted the power armored sister leading the party. Behind Alicia were two more sisters, but of the non militant orders, one was another hospitaller. The other appeared to be a learned scholar of the Adepta Sororitas. Revered lady, Alicia bowed and asked, How is the situation with your memory? I have spoken with my order. They would like to confirm your identity. About that, Serene said apologetically, Not much progress. What do you need from me? The scholar-looking sister stepped forward, formed her Aquila sign and spoke, Greetings, I am Wellman Ameyo of the Dialogous Order. We humbly request your cooperation. On that statement, Serene took a look at all the guests in her room before saying, Very well, I would like to know for certain myself too. Chapter 14 Grim Prospect Alone in a meeting room, 
I was sitting on a huge chair waiting for an arrangement from the Adeptus Mechanicus. My mind was rerunning the events that happened a few hours ago with perfect clarity. So the medical examination happened, I had my body scanned by the medical devices inside the fortress, and the result was interesting, to say the least. Both the hospitalers went quiet after the preliminary scans revealed I had two hearts and a myriad of unknown organs inside my body, confirming my transhuman status. Head scans looking for brain damage were inconclusive as the core structure of my brain appeared different from that of a normal human. Verita's data slate was a property of the Inquisition, and it was unable to access certain inquiries of the scan results citing insufficient security clearance level. Acting on another hunch, I asked Verita if I could try to access the restricted information with the credentials on my pendant instead of looking for Thabrus Inquisitorial Rosette, which would take a lot of time. You could certainly try, replied Verita with a stiff smile. So I did. After a few trials of figuring out how to do that, to everyone's surprise, I was able to bypass the restriction using my pendant. Comparing the scan results with the information within classified data revealed an organ called the amortis gland existing inside my brain. The information regarding this gland was highly guarded, and its entry there was but a line stating genetically engineered organ existing within the cerebral cortex of each of the primarchs, with no additional information offered. Wellmana, the sister Dialogus who was among those present started trembling after reviewing all the information. Her previously impassive demeanor melted away as she struggled to reconcile with the implications of what she saw. Whereas Palatine Alicia was the complete opposite, she was ecstatic of the result and wanted immediately to kneel before me again but I stopped her. Well, I said, trying to defuse the unpleasant atmosphere which was getting very serious, there might be a mistake and I would like a second opinion. But Neandra was having none of that immediately ordering a complete data purge on all the medical devices and issuing a straight gag order on all those present. Representatives of the Adeptus Sororitas left hastily after that, citing the need to report to their order urgently. Verita went somewhere, no doubt to report to Thabris on the findings. Having nothing better to do, I went back to my room. Earlier, Verita had handed over several huge, solid-looking space-age luggage, which had belonged to Serene. Or me, this is so weird. After fumbling with them for a while, I managed to unlock some only to find mostly clothing stuff inside. I guess girls are kind of the same whatever universe you are in, but I have to mention the quality of these clothing where was out of this world. Even a total novice like me could tell by simply looking and feeling their texture. Incidentally, the white robes I was wearing all this time were of the same quality and never seemed to get dirty. Later I received news that a representative of Adeptus Mechanicus, probably working under Crypterer, was coming to see me, and some arrangement requests were made in advance for the meeting. There was some time until the appointed hour, so I decided to take a quick bath since I had all my spare clothes and was in this attire for a full whole day already. During the brief shower, I found myself spacing out and was unable to look at the mirror. By the way, the toilet bowl was so solidly built I wondered if the ceramic used was the same type to be found on a space marine's armor. It felt sturdy enough to repel small arms fire. And there I was, bathed and changed to another piece of wardrobe for an unknown occasion. Sitting on a huge, ornate chair in the assigned room alone, I finally had a quiet moment for myself. For the first time, I realized my senses could hear sounds and see details that should have been impossible for a normal human. When I looked with enough concentration, my vision could pick up the fine cracks on the ceiling, and I heard the footsteps of the Adeptus Mechanicus representative escorted by Neandra coming long before they reached the door. I am no longer human, the realization hit me like freezing water. By sensory data alone, I could even time the exact moment Neandra was about to knock on the door. Come in, I said before Neandra knocked. The door opened and a tech priest entered with the assassin. The tech priest stepped forward, bowed and candid, Lady Siri. I ran, Analytica on him, the reading came back. Name, Detailiad Ving, Posthuman, Tech Priest. Greetings. While I believe we have met before you will have to excuse me, I recently suffered from amnesia and can't recall my past. I have heard. It is the will of Omnisia. The eyes of the Omnisia are ever upon us. How should I address you? Just a tailiad. So you do remember my name. I am honored. Well, that was some easy brownie point. Dominus Cycle wishes to confirm your current condition and converse with you, Lady Serene. He is currently tied down at the front lines preparing for a major engagement, so I am here to set up secured communication. Dominus cycle must be how Cryptor's underlings addressed him. I nodded and the tech priest went to work, setting up a device he was carrying that was the size of a suitcase. 
A few moments later he was done, it came to life and a huge holographic projection of Kryptor flickered into existence. This scene was like the mirror image of a certain classic sci-fi movie scene when the Dark Lord was conversing with his master. Crypto. I greeted the massive hologram. Good to see you in good health and spirits, Serene. How is your condition now? The Dominus Canid. About the same, but I seem to recall some distant memory during my dream in my sleep. Unfortunate, but this might take time. De Taliad, secure the site. I have confidential matters to discuss with the princess. Moments later, I was alone again in the meeting room, but this time with an active hologram of Cryptorer talking to me. He had formed up with the sisters, and the planetary governor then surveyed the situation on the front. After doing so, he had come up with a plan to resolve the conflict as soon as possible. No doubt it was because he wanted to quickly get to whatever new toys he found behind the blast door in the activation chamber. Before we start, I said while holding up a hand, tell me what you know about me and what we are doing on this planet. Kryptor tilted his head slightly upon hearing my question, but proceeded to answer after a slight pause. You are a direct creation by the physical manifestation of Omanissia himself dating back from 10,000 years ago. We were on a secretive sacred expedition here to activate a psychic beacon to prevent this whole sector from being swallowed up by the impending events. What is the origin of this psychic beacon? Undisclosed. How can you be so sure about my credentials? I asked. I had personally verified that. Your DNA, the hyper-advanced level of your transhumanity, the primarch-grade internal organs inside you, and the imperial authority you wield. All that is without a doubt from the apex of Imperium. Did, did I ever mention anything about what we were supposed to do after the beacon's activation? I decided to risk it with such a question banking on his current willingness to talk. Unfortunately, no. You were supposed to reveal that after we assessed the situation, and you promised me access to the technology inside the vault. Kryptor replied. One last question, I said while taking out my Aquila pendant, what is this, and why was I able to take control over certain functions in the Inquisitor's gunship? To my knowledge from what you revealed before, that would be the Imperial Authority Rosette. If we think of the standard Inquisitorial Rosette as the key to open all Imperial doors, yours would be a master key. With it and your unique physiology, almost all Imperial Standard Cogitators and Machine Spirits in service will recognize you as an administrative level user. It also contains an advanced microconversion field emitter that provides a reinforced energy protection field. Kryptor's word brought me back to the time when I somehow survived direct grenade hits and scathed back then when Alicia tried to shield me with her body. Thinking back, there were weird light flashes happening when the grenade impacted on top of us, so that was the conversion field that saved me. I had received the report of the Flame Raven attack incident. Rest assured, the perpetrators will be uncovered and punished accordingly. Praise the Omniscia you still retained access to your authority, but kindly allow me to verify your current capacity to utilize it. He then proceeded to put three skull probes into view. Please, see if you can control these via the communication link. I specially prepared these to verify the viability of our stratagems for the upcoming major engagement. So, he received reports from Thabaris and from there he already deduced I can use my authority to access machine spirit. Very well. I closed my eyes focused my mental attention on my pendant, and reached out for any cybernetic connection. Accessing. 1. 1. Responding machine spirit within the vicinity. 3. 3. Responding cogitators via communication link hashtag network ID. Connect? Yes slash no plus plus. So. Cogitators are the term for computers in this universe, so I can directly access them as well. Interesting. Connect me to all three cogitators on the communication link. Accessing cogitators via communication link plus plus. Connection accepted. Plus plus ah. I opened my eyes and willed the probes to fly. They lifted and hovered in the air. Hey, this is kind of fun. I proceeded and had them fly circles around Crypterer and to my own amazement, I could actually simultaneously control all three probes with ease. Very good, Crypterer remarked. Now, a real test if you please. Kindly land the probes and we will proceed to the next phase. So I did as told and waited, Kryptor worked on a data slate and a new scene flicked into existence from the holographic projector. It was a composite of multiple scenes featuring military-looking outposts. Please see if you can connect to these, said Kryptor. Is this a drill or... I looked at the Dominus and he was waiting on me eagerly so I closed my eyes and tried again. Accessing. 1. 1. Responding machine spirit within the vicinity. 15. 15. Responding cogitators via communication link hashtag network ID. Connect? 
Yes slash no plus plus. Yes to all 15 cogitators on the communication link. Accessing cogitators via communication link plus plus. Connection accepted. Plus plus ah. Connection accepted. Plus plus ah. They all responded. I am connected. I opened my eyes and informed him. Excellent, said a delighted crypterer. Now, is it possible for you to shut down their sensor arrays and void shield for at least 60 seconds? A brief review of the options presented within the connections later. I think I can. Very well, please do after my countdown. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Cease all sensors and void shield operations. My command pulse went through the link. Complying. Plus plus complying. Plus plus. Done. Please hold that for at least 60 seconds. A timer appeared in the corner of the hologram counting down from 60 seconds. Just as it reached the 30 seconds mark, I started receiving updates with the data link. Initiating system boot up. Plus plus, huh? It appears someone was restarting the systems from their end. Cease all operations. I sent back. Complying. Plus plus out. Uh. Initiating system boot up. Another update came in. Cease all operations. I sent again. Complying. The cyber whack-a-mole scenario persisted for a while until all the outposts in the hologram feed suddenly exploded one by one in near simultaneous timing just as the timer hit zero. Looking at the montages of destruction, I suddenly understood what just happened. He had used the openings created by my authority to launch strikes at the outposts. Marvelous, simply marvelous, praised an ecstatic crypterer as he was making a sound that was close to laughter. The heretics had made a fatal mistake in their haste to forsake the Imperium. They did not have the time nor the expertise to hard reset all their war assets, so fundamentally all their primary assets are still subservient to your authority, he said and bowed. From the picked feet of the ruined outposts, I saw people scrambling out of the buildings and followed by more explosions. Though the images were quite small since they were taken from a distance and cramped into a composite display, my transhuman perception could still pick up the distinct impressions of humans being blown to bits. I had just unwittingly become a key component for a military operation that resulted in mass killings. The carnage continued on the feed for a while until it was abruptly cut off, but I could still somehow see it, my mind perfectly recreating the scenes of human body parts flying everywhere. With that done and confirmed, I humbly request your review on this upcoming operation. Cryptor continued as a map that must have been the front line appeared in the hologram. We will lure the heretics into a decisive engagement, and the Dominus talked and talked until I cut him off. Crypto, I said, noticing my change of mood, he stopped. My body started trembling slightly and the world slowed, thought acceleration activated without prompt. Is this rage or fear? But this is weird. Why is my thinking process not clouded with this amount of emotion? And why was I feeling confused if we were just killing heretics? I had been used as a weapon and it bothered me more than I expected. The ground seemed to shake as my inner feelings blared, but it was tempered by the cold logical side of my situation analysis. I soon realized the situation of my helplessness. I was so helpless without the people around me at this point in time, so boundaries have to be set. That's all I can do for now. I closed my eyes again and pushed down my emotions and planned my words. Thank the throne for thought acceleration. This would appear less than a second for Crypterer. After some deliberation, I spoke again. I appreciate your constant support and everything you have done for me, but Crypto, you have to notify me beforehand if my action will result in the loss of human lives. I delivered my conditions. The massive hologram of the Dominus kept utterly still for a few seconds before he bowed and complied. Understood. Please, continue with the previous topic. I said, so he continued with his presentation on how to draw out the rebels' main forces in a decisive clash in which a massive trap will be sprung by using my authority to cut off their communications and turn some of their best weapons against them, thus securing a victory for the loyalists. It was a foolproof plan on paper, so cunning even the cheesy power gamers at my old gaming club would concede in its diabolical genius, but this is not a game. That means many people will die, but how many? Estimated casualties? I asked, again surprised at my voice not breaking. By my best estimation, about 150,000 frontline personnel killed, 350,000 personnel wounded or captured, 3,500 tanks, 10,000 combat vehicles, 4,000 artillery pieces and around 400 aircraft will be destroyed, came his reply. My soul squirmed at the numbers, at the same time my mind caught on the keyword of wounded or captured, so I had to make sure and asked again, would that be on both sides? 
That is the estimated numbers just on the heretic side, not including the over 100,000 inevitable casualties on our side and the eventual fallout affecting civilians in the millions. Crypterer answered matter-of-factly. Chapter 15 Introspection Alone in the meeting room again, my head swelled with the idea of being responsible for the direct death and misery of close to a quarter million people and indirectly affecting the lives of millions more. On the flip side, logically speaking if we do not end this swiftly that number will balloon upwards with no end in sight, so this would be the best way forward. But, deep inside I was just a gamer geek not some imperial heiress of a galactic-spanning empire who might be able to casually disregard that sort of numbers with a contemptuous scoff. For reasons unknown, when Crypterer told me the number of estimated casualties, it made me recall the vague, horrible scenes I saw back in the activation chamber when pressed by Thabarus. Now that I think about it, ever since coming to this world, everything I had experienced could be recalled with absolute clarity, all except for that moment. The strange implications sent crippling fear down my spine. So many questions, so little time. I had promised Crypterer to get back to him within the next 24 hours should I want any revisions done with his plan, or he will just proceed with the planned massacre with me involved as the main catalyst. Somehow, my instinct was telling me that going down that path of mass casualties was to tread the path of eventual damnation. Getting a grip on myself, I re-examined my current predicament and realized I needed to know exactly where I was in the timeline to exploit my knowledge of the universe. Fortress Endurance Sigma I reached out, plus plus received and ready to serve, authority, plus plus. What is the current calendar year? 999.m41. As soon as I heard 999.m41, the reason why Astronomican went offline became apparent to me. This must be the time when Chaos War Master Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade had concluded with the destruction of the fortress world Cadia, resulting in the great rift known as the Cicatrix Male Dictum being unleashed unto the Imperium. It was a galaxy-shattering event with three books released in conjunction with it, foreshadowing the return of Robot Gilliman, Primark of the Poster Boys of the Grimdark Universe, the Ultramarines. I took a deep breath, organized my thoughts, and asked again, Show me our location on the galactic map. Plus plus complying. Plus plus. There was a delay before a three-dimensional map of the galaxy materialized in my mind, and my jaw dropped. I saw it an indicator on a slowly spinning galaxy pointing in the middle of nowhere at the edge of imperial space, at an area that seemed to be one of the farthest frontiers at the end of the Great Crusade. Location, Subsector Terminus Obscura, External System, Planet Nusquam. A speck of unremarkable dust on the edge of the imperial stage. We were so far off from any major imperial system that the whole subsector might have died off for centuries before any central administrative staff would notice. Those implications made my blood run cold. The Imperium will soon enter one of its most turbulent times in history. It will be so occupied by its troubles during this period. Even if we did successfully get a message out, no one will be coming. Cut off from the rest of the Imperium, suffering from a civil war with a decisive apocalyptic battle happening soon, not to mention a looming renegade space marines threat and more, even if we survived all that. This world will be so weak it will just fall over if any more horrors from the hostile galaxy came forth and my instincts were screaming just that, more horrors are coming. Running away was also out of the question, assuming I could even convince Crypterer to abandon the technological wonders just in front of him to pack up and leave. I questioned the odds of us getting back to any major imperial system in one piece with the Astronomican offline here. Why am I in so much trouble? What did Serene tell me on that foggy road? I searched my mind and her words came clear as day, help me and the others. In exchange, my abilities, my body, and my soul are yours, she had said the words with such sincerity when I promised to help but. I didn't know she meant it so literally. Darn it, girl, why do you run away from all these? Why did she ask for my help when she had this much power? Was there anything I can even offer up when compared to a literal minor demigoddess like her? I have got nothing but a heap of cheesy gaming experiences and a boatload of pop culture stuff to show for throne's sake. I felt cornered my core shaking at the looming crisis, a sense of existential dread started creeping over, making me want to curl into a ball and cry. This feeling was eerily reminiscent of a familiar anime scene, where this boy who was the pilot of the most powerful mecha in his world, despite the power he wielded, always succumbed to his emotional weakness and did not pull his weight. I remembered scoffing at such a scenario, but now that I was smacked right into one, it sure isn't fun, is it? Baka Shinji, am I losing my mind? What if I had been serene all along and my gamer geek life was a dream instead? 
Do I have any proof that my old self ever existed? Suddenly doubting both my past and present, I tried recalling the details from my gamer geek life and found that while my memories of them were vivid, they felt somewhat faded from my current point of view. Was it because of my current transhuman level of senses? This world seemed so vivid, so beautiful. A beautiful yet grim world. Wasn't there a song from that anime with the title of Beautiful World? Feeling depressed about the grim situation, I tried to mentally recall that song in my head. First, the theme came back slowly, then the melody. Bit by bit it gathered, and before I knew it the song was perfectly replicated and repeating itself in my head. Beautiful world, beautiful boy, the song went. Somehow hearing the music in my head calmed me down. Since this song exists, so should my past. Can I play it in the physical realm? Will this count as piracy across dimensions? Desperately needing a distraction, I looked for solutions for the technical challenge at hand, and the formidable intellect locked within me started working. It seemed like I had an instinctual level of understanding of the technologies in this world. After some tinkering, I linked up with the cogitators of the fortress and did the data processing of converting thoughts into sound, a myriad of tweakings and data conversions later. A digital record of the song was successfully created and stored in my pendant. Play sound data, beautifulworld.mp3 on local speakers. Plus plus complying. Plus plus. Will it play? Suffice to say this was not a real MP3 file. I just labeled it as such for ease of self-use. If this worked, it might be the first known case of plagiarism across dimensions and time. I held my breath. The speakers came to life and as if magic, a remastered copy of the music started playing perfectly in the meeting room. Beautiful world. It played. IT played. I sighed and slumped on my chair, losing myself in the familiar song that echoed in the meeting room letting my intellect work to passively optimize the acoustic quality until it hits the right spots. Warm tears would be flowing down my cheeks now if not for Regulus, keeping my composure in check. After calming down, my survival instinct kicked in and my mind started moving again. I realized now was the rare precious moment I could sit down and think. From my experience, once something massive in life starts you will just get sucked right into the center of the maelstrom without time and space to reflect on what to do. So I did exactly that, abusing my ability by spamming thought acceleration to review what I had known so far again and again. A lot of critical questions began to surface as I took an in-depth review of the current situation. Take the opposition forces, for example. Both the armed men and marines who attacked us did not look tainted by chaos by any stretch. I had also by this point dug into the available reports inside the database of the fortress on them and found no clear evidence of the rebels renouncing the emperor or pledging their allegiance to ruinous powers. So while working with a suspicious group of space marines might be their biggest sin here to label all the people on the opposition as heretics without, reserves might be too hasty of an action that left no room for any other recourse. As to why Cryptor was directly calling them heretics, well, he is from the Mechanicus, and anyone who deprived a member of the Mechanicus of new toys is a heretic from their point of view. I chewed on the situation, digesting and looked closely at it until a rough way out of this dire predicament could be seen, but it was riding on so many knife edges I winced by just looking at the end product. First, I will need to work on minimizing human and hardware casualties in the upcoming battle. As massive as this planetary civil war was, a sense of foreboding told me it will be nothing compared to what was looming in the future. My best odds of moving forward would be having as many layers of stuff between me and the cosmic horrors which were no myths in this universe. After all, being cut off from the rest of the Imperium with an active psychic beacon would be like walking alone in the middle of the night in a death world forest infested with apex predators with a huge lantern in hand. You are basically expediting your own demise. On the other hand, shutting down the beacon presented too many complex questions and would need a thorough review. I needed to leverage my position and knowledge of this universe to engineer an optimized outcome or else I might suffer a fate worse than death. That scenario was again not a myth in this world. With my mind made up, I accessed the Fortress Communication Network. After some guesswork, I connected myself to the Vox unit that most probably belonged to Neandra. It connected, but no reply came. Neandra? I asked on the Vox. Serene? How did you? Never mind. What do you need? Somehow I was enjoying the assassin sounding flustered more than I should. A good thing was with Regulus. None of my smugness will ever show. I need to talk to Inquisitor Thorn. Kindly arrange for me a Vox communication with him. That can be done. By the way, the representatives of Adeptus Sororitas are still here, and they wish to talk to you again at your next convenience. Neandra replied. 
Didn't they leave some time ago? They had a change of plans at the last minute. Only their shuttle had left the fortress to fetch more of their people over. So Alicia and her companions were still here. Guess I was blindsided by the message log their Aquila lander had left the fort. Very well. When can my Vox call with Inquisitor Thorn happen? Hold on. Attempting to get him now. A moment later, Thabra's stern voice entered the chat. Yes, asked the Inquisitor, as ever he cut straight to the point. Sir, Serene is on the line and she wishes to speak with you. Neander out. Her exit of the Vox was signaled by a system chime. Well, Inquisitor, I have some critical information regarding our situation and wish to discuss them with you. I said. Interesting. I am with the governor now to formally endorse her legitimacy as the sanctioned ruler of this planet and review their actions to regain control. That would mean he would be at where Cryptor would be. Are you aware of the Arch Dominus plan? I asked. We had a brief talk. I was pleasantly surprised he did have something concrete to show way before the promised dateline. Thank the throne for competent allies. This saves so much time. So, do we discuss what I have to share now? Better not. Security issues aside, I have a few matters to attend to now. Either way, I plan to see you tomorrow morning. In that case, I hesitated a bit before asking, may I inquire are those psychers orbiting the planet your people? If so, can I please ask you to bring one to see me? Preferably one who is familiar with the perils of the warp. There was a slight pause before he answered. Very well, I will see what I can do. That knowledge was acquired when Aratus and I were making contacts with other Imperial worlds. Back then I had sensed some peculiar existences that were too near to be on other planets. But then I disregarded it because of the this dream will end soon anyway mindset. A while later, it struck me that both Thabaris and Crypterer should still have their starships nearby, which meant the Inquisitor should still have a few psychers on orbit for whatever reason. We finalized the details before ending our conversation, then I went to look for Sister Alicia. With my direct access to the fortress digital map and security system, I located the young Palatine in no time. She was seated in an open area talking with her companions. Lady Serene. Alicia saw me from a distance and stood up, prompting the other two sisters to hastily stand up as well. Something about how they looked tenser just by my mere presence did not sit right with me, but there was little I could do about it. Alicia, I said, intentionally skipping her title in an attempt to make things sound more casual, you were looking for me? Alicia nodded before replying, yes, we wish to inform you that Canonus Diadina, the highest office of my order is coming to see you, she should be here before nightfall. Yet another appointment. I got a feeling things will get a lot busier before calming down. Chapter 16 Order Founding Five aircraft were speeding through a rapidly darkening purple sky in Delta Formation. An Aquila lander escorted by four Lightning Air Superiority fighters hinted how important the personnel it was ferrying was as it cut through the air with haste to its destination. Inside the passenger compartment of the Aquila lander were three senior members of the Adeptosauritas. Seated in the middle was a hooded woman wearing an ornate set of power armor covered by an elaborated cloak. The woman had delicate yet stern features. She looked to be in her early forties, but she had actually been serving her order for more than seven decades. Deep in thought, the woman's eyes were downcast while her right hand autonomously pushed on the beads of a set of intricate prayer beads with a shining symbol of the mini storm attached on a golden chain. Seated beside her were two of the best Celestian sisters the order had to offer. One of the sisters was carrying a long object wrapped in silk cloth and sealed with a myriad of ancient-looking purity seals. The hooded woman muttered in silent prayers as she moved the prayer beads with practiced ease even with a gloved hand. At times her sight wandered to the object covered in silk cloth. Just half a day ago, she had rushed back from the front line to fetch it from their monastery after receiving the coded message from Welmana. The sister Dialogus she had sent to accompany Sister Alicia to verify something very important after hearing her dubious report. Young Alicia was very recently promoted to the rank of probationary palatine due to heavy casualties and thus in accordance with the tradition of their minor order. Was briefed on the hidden legends of their order's founding and to be on the lookout for a certain prophecy. The Order of the Shining Beacon was an ordo militant minoris of the Adeptus Sororitas founded from a small splintered group that originated from the Order Majoris of our martyred lady around a thousand years ago. Legend has it the founder of the Order was an unnamed Celestian who ended up alone on the battlefield assaulting a stronghold during one of its many crusade wars. Cut off and surrounded by enemies, she vowed to sell her life dearly by making a last stand and fighting late into the night. Long out of bolter shells, the unnamed Celestian nonetheless fought on until even her chain's word finally broke. In the delirium of her supposed final moments, 
a shining figure with a sword appeared out of nowhere and fought by her side. It was said the radiant stranger fought like death incarnate and swiftly cut down all the enemies surrounding them, but yet more enemies approached. But the shining figure cared not. Like vengeful lighting, the figure went around and soon dispatched all of the enemies with contemptuous ease. After it was done with the grim task, the mysterious figure stood still and looked at the befuddled sister. Even in her miserable state, the Celestian still remembered her mission, so she pleaded to her mysterious savior for help to carry out the emperor's work. The figure contemplated for a while before asking her to fulfill a promise in return. The Celestian considered her odd circumstances. Putting her mission first, she promised the mysterious figure she would do any future biddings as long as it does no harm to the Imperium and only after they took down the enemy stronghold together. The shining figure nodded and agreed to her ridiculous proposal but asked her to rest citing her assistance was not needed. Wounded and totally exhausted, the Celestian fainted while watching the figure walk towards the stronghold alone. When she finally regained consciousness, the Celestian found herself on top of the enemy stronghold with a mountain of slain enemies below her and a large mastercrafted sword in her hands. After briefly returning to her order as a celebrated hero with a mysterious sword, the unnamed Celestian was soon receiving visions for the mission she had promised to fulfill. She was instructed to leave and start her own order at a faraway corner of the Imperial Frontier. Though she seriously doubted her capacity for such a monumental task, she kept to her promise and did her best by going through the proper channels and sent her request to found a new order Minoris at the far-flung corner her vision had shown, not expecting to hear anything back in her lifetime. None knew what really happened in the bottomless pit that was the colossal bureaucracy of the Imperium, but by the miraculous odds of less than a billion to one her request was granted by the higher-ups. In less than a decade after her application was submitted, the approval had come with the blessings of Adeptus Ministorum, the official state church of the Imperium of Man. So the unnamed Celestian set off with faith, a nameless sword in the approval of the church, and after many more years and overcoming more obstacles, finally founded the Order of the Shining Beacon in this world. The new canonist would receive many more visions during her life the contents of which were mostly kept as secret prophecies by the higher-ranking individuals within the order and their designated scholars. The founder was said to have regretted not being able to meet the prophesied figure that would one day deliver them from their darkest hour in her later years and decreed her own name was to be struck from the records for she had done little but to fulfill a promise and as such was not worthy to be mentioned. In the end, the sister preferred to remain unnamed, like the nameless sword she received that started off her life's incredible mission, leaving behind the Holy Daughter prophecy. Hence when Alicia, who was tasked with the protection of their monastery, came to the front line with an Adeptus Mechanicus Arch Dominus unannounced, it had surprised everyone and to top it off. The young lady had excitedly reported the possibility of the prophecy coming true. It had shocked them all since at this point in time, after a thousand years, the founder's prophecies were becoming more legends than facts. Canonus, a firm female voice called out in the confines of the compartment inside the Aquila lander, but lost in thought the hooded woman failed to catch someone addressing her by title. Canonus Dina, the voice called again. Ah, Sister Marquila. Pardon me, I was spacing out. The hooded woman looked up and replied to the Celestian who was not charged with guarding their relic. You look tired replied Marquila Moret, the Celestian Superior. She paused before asking the question that had been on her mind since the sudden retrieval of their order's most sacred relic, the Nameless Sword. So what did Welmana say in her report? Welmana Mayu was one of the designated dialogous scholars allowed to study the prophecies of their founder in this generation, thus she was sent together with Alicia to verify the claims. Didina closed her eyes and after a while, produced a data slate and passed it to Marquila. While the two women were separated by ranks, they had been friends in private for decades so Marquila did not hesitate and looked into the report that was meant for the highest office of her order. Match plausible, needs final verification. Marquila read the short report softly, feeling her hair stand on their end and asked her next question. Do you think it could be real this time? Only the emperor knows, replied Diodina, but we are certainly at our darkest hour. As if this unexpected uprising is not enough to test us, there are some concerning reports in the last 24 hours about weird things happening in the warp and unusual psychic phenomena. As a matter of fact, I just received reports that even the light of the emperor is now denied to us. The canonist retrieved her data slate, conjured out different reports and passed it again to her friend. As the Celestian Superior gasped at the grim reports, Dedina looked at her companions and explained, This matter for the moment is not public knowledge. Keep it confidential for now. 
Both Celestians nodded in compliance. Marquila read and reread the data slate before asking, Does Inquisitor Thorne know of this? Dudina retrieved her data slate before replying, Of course, he had personally verified it with me on this matter. Speaking of which, the Holy Daughter candidate is actually under his care at the moment. Thabarus Thorne had just very recently arrived on the planet in hot pursuit of several suspicious cults and found himself in a civil war. Trusting neither side of the conflict, Thabarus had instead contacted the Sororitas to work with them and had been operating clandestinely for a while before just coming out to endorse the governor of her legitimacy. To think, the rebels actually had renegade Astartes working behind the scenes for them, Marquila remarked with great distaste, righteous fury blazing in her eyes. It seems the arrival of the candidate had forced their hand, but, said Canonist D. Dinah before trailing off, unable to hide the grimace in her voice before continuing in a whisper. The most unfortunate thing had happened. A group of rebels led by renegade marines had successfully ambushed her, and it is said she is suffering from amnesia now because of it. Even with her many decades of practiced straight discipline in the order, Celestian Superior Marquila could not hide her shock upon hearing the terrible news and blurted out her thoughts, thrown on Terra. Have we already failed when it counted the most? That? I am afraid I have no answer. Canonist D. Dinah confessed. The fortunate news is she is reported to be still coherent and functional as a person. Lastly, there is this mention that she had gained access to the inner sanctum and an arcane device believed to be a psychic beacon was activated. Inquisitor Thorne had also verified this with me, but since most high-functioning psychers had been bedridden of late, this is still under investigation. Marquila went quiet for a while before asking, none of the Founders' legends and visions had ever mentioned of such a thing but it bears an eerie resemblance to our order's name. Could it be the true purpose of our order is to protect the beacon the supposed prophesied holy daughter had activated? That this happened right as we lost the light of the emperor could not have been a coincidence. Again, I know not, replied Dedina. I can only pray to him on holy terror this trip will grant us the answers to all these. The canonist involuntarily looked at the relic again and sighed softly. Join me in prayer, sisters. Let us seek strength and guidance from the emperor. Outside the armored compartment of the Aquila Lander, Fortress Endurance Sigma loomed on the horizon. Chapter 17 The Nameless Sword It was the first time I realized approaching me could be a daunting task for some people. Sister Dialogus Wellman Amayer looked apprehensive and nervous as she approached me to verify if my name was written correctly for a record. Wellmana herself looked more similar to the older metal model, which represented a Sister Dialogus than the newer plastic version. Sans the ridiculous scrolls hanging around her body plus missing a staff, her general hairstyle and the eyepiece she wore matched the metal model. After I verified my name i.e. Serene was spelt correctly, this still felt weird every time as I can talk and read low gothic like I have known them for life. Well, Manoa's next question boggled my mind on an obvious but little discussed matter. I am sorry, my lady, but your name is simply just that? Do you have a surname for me to complete my record? The scholar timidly asked. My thought acceleration activated upon hearing her question. Yeah, why doesn't Serene have a surname? Almost everyone important enough seems to have longer names, right? Like I had learned the name of the current planetary governor was Catalina von Cleus from the Fortress database and she was quite good looking. But wait, suddenly to my shock, it occurred to me amongst the Primarchs, a lot of them like Magnus, Ongron, Sanguinius, Fulgrim, and Alpharius seem to have always had a single name. Even Percherabo, who was disclosed in the lore to have known his own name since birth, had ever only gone around with a single name. I vividly recalled an audio drama featuring the Primarch going, I am Percherabo, when his birth pod landed near a mountain and he was surviving as an angry baby for a while. So I looked at Wellmana and replied sincerely, Yes, I have but a single name. Do we still have some time before the canonist arrives? Can anyone tell me about the prophecy Alicia mentioned? My easygoing attitude seemed to have eased the sisters a bit, so we sat down before Wellmana started telling me the stories and legends from the founding of the minor militant order of the Shining Beacon. It was a story that happened about a thousand years ago. An unnamed sister returned triumphant from an impossible mission with a mysterious sword. She later received visions from dubious sources telling her to travel here and establish the Shining Beacon order. Officially, that was where the story ended, Unofficially said sister had received more visions foretelling a prophecy about the coming of a true daughter of the emperor who would be their salvation in their darkest hour. It was known as the Holy Daughter Prophecy. My troubled senses were tingling just from hearing the vague details passed down as legends. The story contained a shining figure with no more description who could cut through the throng of enemies like paper mock-ups with a sword. 
Then the poor sister started receiving vague visions asking her to leave her home and the people she knew behind, bravely travel a large swath of the hostile galaxy to establish a new branch of Sororita's order in a backwater part of the Imperium, only to wait for a certain someone to save the day when cosmic shit hits the galactic fan. Be there salvation in the darkest hour? I doubt anyone but the Emperor himself is capable of such a feat. In the lore I knew even after Robot Gilliman returned it wasn't exactly sunshine and roses awaiting the renowned Primarch, and he was the real deal. This story had all the hallmarks of some powerful entities laying down the groundwork for their schemes and letting the lesser people toil till they dropped written all over it. I was contemplating the story when the corner of my mind registered multiple incoming aircraft through my link with the fortress machine spirit. It was the same Aquila lander Alicia was riding in earlier, and it now had four fighter escorts. Alicia, will your cannonist be arriving in the same lander you rode? Probably. Why? I think she is here. We ended up receiving the canonist with two other sisters in another meeting room with spotless reflective walls. This room was much grander than the room I had used earlier, probably in a show of respect to the Order's highest-ranking member visiting. Present with me was Alicia and Welmina. Then Verita joined in representing the Inquisition instead of Neandra due to their request to keep certain sensitive matters within the Adepta. We all stood up as the three new visitors stepped through the door with the canonist leading in the front, the floor clicking with the steps of their power armor boots. You could feel the air of piousness they carried as they entered the room. The canonist looked to be in her forties and had surprisingly delicate features considering her position. She looked impressive in her personalized ornate power armor which was half covered with an elaborately embroidered cloak featuring a hood. A huge symbol of the mini storm was shining proudly below her collar. The two sisters who arrived with her were obviously elite warriors of the order. One of them was carrying a long object covered by a silk cloth with purity seals plastered all over it. While they looked decent enough they exuded so much martial prowess in their demeanor I suspected even drunken hooligans would not dare to approach them. One of them even had a small fleur de lis tattooed under her left eye. Alicia, Welmina and Verita all bowed deeply while simultaneously performing the Aquila hand sign towards the canonists. At a loss of what to do for my proper etiquette but suspecting I should not follow the sisters, I merely performed the Aquila hand sign. The canonist pulled back her hood, returned the gesture, and stood perfectly still looking at me. After a while, just before it started giving me the creep she finally spoke. Greetings. I am Canonist Deep Dina. You must be Lady Serene. I heard you had entered the Inner Sanctum. Inner Sanctum? You meant the place where I met Sister Alicia. I inquired while glancing at the Palatine, and the latter was fast on returning an affirmative expression. Canonist Deep Dina nodded and continued, Your arrival was foretold by our founder. It was unfortunate this happened at the worst possible time and resulted in your amnesia. I apologize if my actions appeared hasty, but our situation is getting dire and time is scarce. She then gestured to the sister who was carrying a long object, and the sister stepped forward, carefully unwrapped the package to reveal a huge sheathed sword that looked too big to be wielded with one hand for an average human. The sister respectfully presented the hilt end of the sword towards Didina. The canonist muttered a quick prayer before pulling out the sword in one go with both hands. A blinding flash filled the room as the mirror-finished blade exited its sheath. Behold, the nameless sword, Didina said. I heard Alicia gulp at the sight of their order's holiest relic and all eyes in the room were looking at the shimmering blade. The canonists admired the sword reverently while explaining to me, though impressive, this relic is only a really sharp piece of almost indestructible metal forged with incredible skill. The reality was, any decent power sword will outperform it so it was rarely used on the battlefield. However, she looked at me and continued, there were records of it behaving like a power sword and more in the heat of battle during dire circumstances which should have been impossible due to the sword having no power circuit nor power source. Didina paused for a while before turning to her colleague, Sister Welmina. Have you briefed Lady Serene about our founding legends yet? Yes, my canoness. The Dialogus sister quickly replied. Good, Didina said and approached me with the huge sword. There is one more legend that was only passed down from each successive canoness, until now. She stopped in front of me and presented the hilt of the sword towards my side. It was said the true and holy daughter of the emperor will appear in our darkest hour to lead us, and the nameless sword shall be her witness. Wait, what? While I might be this prophesied figure they spoke of, I was definitely no warrior, let alone wielding a sword. What am I supposed to do? Just hold the sword, Diadina nudged. Looking at the large blade, I hesitated and wanted to decline, 
I am no warrior, canonist. Please, my lady, a final verification, if you will. This is the secret directive my order passed down since our founding. Everyone was looking at me expectantly. I gulped, touched the hilt of the sword, and picked it up. It was surprisingly lighter than it looked. I ran, Analytica, on it, and it simply read Nameless Sword. Its size was on the larger end, probably due to it being built as a single handed weapon for a Space Marine size end user in mind. In my hands, it sort of resembled the size of a slightly larger bastard sword. I raised the sword with both hands, had its blade stood upright pointing at the ceiling, and was enlightened to the fact that this was a perfectly balanced blade, a truly remarkable piece of work. Intrigued by the level of craftsmanship invested into a piece of metal that was meant for killing, I turned it slowly while watching the light reflect on its mirror finish. It was then out of the blue that a weird sensation hit me. I had a distinct feeling someone or something was reaching out to me and my thought acceleration activated in case this was an attack. Just as the world slowed down, a flat and artificial sounding message wormed itself into my consciousness. Plus plus you passed the preliminary scan. For the next level of activation, insert your blood into the sword fuller. Plus plus. Wait, who was communicating with me? I looked around and eventually my eyes settled on the sword. This sword is imbued with artificial intelligence? The need for blood or any other bodily fluid to activate a gene lock was not a new thing in this universe. I recalled a scene in the lore where an infamous Primarch licked on a data slate to bypass a high security measure. I looked at the sword again and decided to do as it advised, but I was too big a pansy to cut my finger with its edge. Sister Verita. I held out my hand to her. If you please, kindly prick my finger so I might get a few drops of blood. She was surprised but quickly went to work with haste. A few seconds later, and it was done. It was wise to leave it to the professionals. All the sisters watched with bated breath as I gingerly dropped my blood into the swords fuller. Plus plus. Plus plus. Nothing happened. Did I make a fool of myself? Then a loud chime sounded from the sword, startling everyone in the room and more messages started reaching my mind. Plus plus gene code accepted. Plus plus. Plus plus next level activation started. Plus plus. As the sword came alive, Alarmingly, I felt it started drawing heat and energy from me. Just as I was about to panic and drop it, the sword passed the energy back to me and an energy loop of sorts formed. Faster and faster the energy circulated until I felt like the weapon had become an extension of my limbs. An energy field suddenly flickered to life around the blade of the sword, showering the meeting room with pure blue light while the sisters gasped. This is... The azurous glow, Wellmana whispered with her shaking voice. Last recorded sighting was over two centuries ago. Hmm. While this looked pretty, I was unsure of its stability and decided to test it. Like a noob, I did some mock swings with the weapon and stopped when remembering I really was no warrior with zero training in swordsmanship. My sword swing probably looked so amateurish I wonder if it made the battle sisters cringe. The good news was the energy field persisted and was not going anywhere. So, it is just a fancy power sword? I queried while marveling at the glowing sword. My lady, it is running without a power source. Didina replied with unconcealed excitement. Maybe that sounded like a miracle on the surface, but I reckoned it should be just some fancy mechanic like the luxury Rolex watches running solely on kinetic energy, but scaled up with space-age technology mixed with a bit of thrown nose what sorcery. Personally, I was not that impressed due to the simple fact that using this weapon still implied one had to walk up to people and chop them up within arm's reach. I looked again at the shimmering blue light on the mirror blade and had to admit, impractical as it was going melee into a battlefield brimming with guns, the sword with its energy field activated was enchantingly beautiful. Then an idea hit me. What if I introduced my psychic energy to the circulation? Though I loathed the idea of activating Psychana Activa, as I still had so much to learn about the perils of the warp, my curiosity got the better of me. Just a little while should be fine, I thought and went psychic active. Psychana Activa, activated. The world went trippy as expected, but this time I was ready for it. Psychic energy reacted to my active state and swirled around and inside me then onto the sword, adding another layer of energy into the circulation. Then it happened, starting with a hint of fluctuation in the energy field. A second later a brilliant fire burst forth into existence and the whole blade was covered in a dazzling blue flame. Astonished by this sudden development, I almost dropped the sword again, but immediately noticed no heat coming from the conflagration. This is psychic flame? I moved my fingers near the raging spectral inferno and confirmed no rise in temperature. How peculiar. Mesmerized by the pretty light show, 
My whole attention was transfixed on it for a while until I remembered there were still other people in the room. Now that I think about it, they were awfully quiet. Flustered by my ability to get lost in my little world, which would undoubtedly look like a lack of proper manners, I turned my attention back to them and was surprised to see all the sisters, including the canoness, knelt before me. Speaking in a voice shaking with religious fervor, Diodina proclaimed with the tone of finality, revered Lady Serene, I, Diodina Grace, canoness of the Order of the Shining Beacon, hereby officially recognize you as the prophesied holy daughter of the Emperor, please take over the command of the Order and lead us as you will. Wait, wait, activating a flaming sword doesn't prove any. I wanted to say but caught a sight that made me froze, there on the many spotless mirror-like surfaces inside the meeting room were the reflections of a fair maiden standing tall. Holding a huge sword crackling with raging azurous flame, and around her head was the unmistakable holy radiance of a golden halo. Chapter 18 The Emperor's Daughter My heart's almost stopped as I got a better look at my own reflection. The familiar yet so very distant girl was staring back, eyes gleaming brightly with a golden glow coupled with an unknown source of illumination that seemed to originate from around her head, she exuded a magnificent level of saintly presence that compelled subservience. There was a sort of religious piousness resonating in the air. I could even feel the level of faith the sisters were emanating in their willingness to serve. Through the acknowledgement of the canonists and my legitimacy established by the legends from the Order's founder, in a way I have my very own army now. Without prompting my mind was already running some cold calculations. It was understood if I played the card of being the Emperor's daughter well, with but a word of command the whole order would mobilize against the rebels head-on despite the odds. The Sororita's very own zealotry and subscription to the Emperor's divinity would see them grinding forward regardless of casualties. We could probably do it too, with help from Crypterer on electronics warfare and intelligence. Together with the support of the Governor's forces we could strike into the heart of the rebels and decapitate its leadership. Ending this threat now and be prepared for the real incoming crises. The whole Sororita's order could get into position before the enemies even knew what hit them with a total shutdown of their communication network. To increase the odds of success, I would need to be leading in the front with this ridiculous flaming sword in hand and ceaselessly using my authority to turn the rebels' mightiest weapons on themselves. All the while spamming thought acceleration to always be on top of every tactical situation. If we were lucky enough, we might even be able to get close enough for me to cut down the enemy leaders with this sword. Rendered leaderless and in the chaos of the battlefield, the bulk of the rebel forces would be easily destroyed by our coordinated front. Hundreds of thousands of rebels would be grounded to dust. Valor and glory await. There will be casualties, hopefully on an acceptable level. Too bad we did not have access to Astartes' unit to lead as the spirit. Wait, what am I doing? If only I could know what would happen if that idea was put into action, then I noticed a new line appearing in my vision. Run Simulatio? Yes slash no. Simulatio? That's new, but this unknown service had yet to fail me. I chose yes without hesitation. Simulatio, activated. There was a flash. Suddenly I was suddenly transported into a battlefield where dust was omnipresent and explosions were constantly thundering in the background. Dead bodies littered everywhere and endless streams of tracers lit up the sky. My mind, my superhuman mind was registering over a hundred immediate threats and over a thousand background information were fighting for my attention. The enemy's communication network was down, but having nowhere to go most of them had resolved to fight to the death. Every street and alley was jam-packed with entrenched soldiers. Despite constant airstrikes and artillery bombardments they did not yield. Again they had nowhere to go, and this place might probably be their home. Faint cries of children could even be heard between earth-shattering explosions. Nearby the bulk of enemy elite troops had barricaded themselves, resulting in brutal close quarters fighting that could only be described as a colossal meat grinder. Squads and squads of sisters under the cover fire of constant bolter barrage got close to their quarry, their power armor deflecting hails of small arms fire raining down on them. Once they got close enough, they let loose of their flammers and meltas to burn away through, their grisly progress marked by the smell of burnt flesh filling the air under a sky darkened with misery. Under my direct command, the sisters would not falter, but the enemies would not yield. This war was started on the basis of labeling the rebels as heretics, being condemned as such they knew their only way out was to fight to their death. This was a bloody mess and a literal hell on earth. Any non-veteran of such large-scale warfare will probably not make it through. Just as that thought flashed through my mind, I caught sight of several fallen sisters in a huge crater not far from me. 
Compelled by an unspeakable ominous feeling, I approached the crater with trepidation and took a closer look. There amongst the fallen was a familiar face, the first person I met in this world. Palatine Alicia Sabbath lay dead in the crater. She was a literal bloody mess, but even under that pile of brain matter, there was still enough of her face to identify her. Being caught in between zeal and inexperience, or even just plain bad luck had probably taken her life. Looking at Alicia's corpse amidst a background of constant muffled explosions, I felt my soul leaving my body. But wait, didn't she just kneel down happily before me mere moments ago? My eyes snapped open and I was back in the meeting room. A quick check on the chronometer told me it was just a few seconds after I saw my own reflections. Gasping for air despite not feeling out of breath, I quickly turned off Psychana Activa while ignoring a few Regulus messages that had popped up in my vision. As I got back into the sweet embrace of normalcy, in the reflections my halo and the raging blue flames on my sword started slowly fading away. My mind was still racing from what I saw, but the sight of Alicia well and alive had calmed my shaken nerves. Was that a simulation mixed with a bit of prescience? I looked around, found no answer, and could no longer just keep the sisters waiting. But that brief vision of the hellish battlefield had shown me how lacking I was in real war experience and leadership capacity. If I were to leave now, it will only end up in a real disaster. I conned myself further and approached the kneeling canonists. That is something I will not do at the moment. Sisters, please rise. I decided. Yadina looked up but did not stand. Lady Serene, please accept the command of the order. She pleaded with me again. While I might be the person your prophecy spoke of, I admitted, please understand I am sorely lacking in experience and am suffering from partial memory loss. Pushing me to lead the order now is just asking for the ruination of the emperor's domain. I will definitely act with his best interest in mind. So please, stand up so we may work on how to proceed forward. As you have said, we need to make haste to save this world. Rise, sisters, we have much to discuss. With that, the canonists reluctantly stood up, followed by the rest of the sisters. I handed back the nameless sword to the canonists, symbolically passing the leadership role for the order back to her. She seemed to understand this and received the sword reverently, but could not hide her disappointment completely as she watched the blue light slowly disappearing on the blade. Now, before we speak further, there is an important thing I have to verify with you all. The accursed 13th Black Crusade is in full swing, is it not? I asked. Yadina nodded grimly at my question. What was the last major news you received before communication was cut off from the rest of the Imperium? Yadina thought for a while before replying, nothing much. Last we heard there was some really heavy engagement happening around Cadia. We were bracing for any eventual spillovers before getting caught off guard by the local uprising. That was it. I had confirmed that the news of the fortress world of Cadia falling never reached here. Naturally, I had tried looking it up on the fortress database with no results, but I had to be sure. How would they take the news? Listen well, sisters, you might wish to not believe what I am about to tell you. But let the emperor be my witness. What I am going to say is the truth. I said while I started digging into my memory of the lore on how Cadia was destroyed, I had the thick cover campaign book in my collection back in my geek life after all. Knowing the extremely heavy nature of the story, I had the sisters seated before telling them about how at the climax of the Black Crusade, a bat in the chaos war master had dragged and dropped a Blackstone fortress onto Cadia, breaking the planet apart. How Cadia was housing the mysterious Necron pylons that had been controlling the Eye of Terror. How this resulted in the great rift known as Cicatrix Male Dictum being unleashed unto the Imperium, breaking it into two, and it probably was the reason why the light of the Emperor had stopped reaching us. The sisters were still while listening, but their faces grew visibly more serious as the story progressed. For seeing all this, I had used the calmest tone possible when telling the story as I was quite sure if this information were to be told by any other person it would instantly be labeled as heresy. The only other sound other than my voice in the room was by Welmanoa's autoquill as she diligently scribbled down stuff onto her data slate in a valiant effort to record down what I had said. Not sure why she bothered unless voice recording was prohibited due to security reasons. After I finished talking, Dedina asked the obvious question. Pardon me, but I had to ask where did you get all that first-hand information? If I were to tell her the truth that I read about it from a gaming campaign book and saw the Blackstone Fortress dropped on Cadia in a cutscene of a video game, even the canonist with all her mental fortitude might have gone insane. So I conjured as much sincerity as possible and told them with a straight face, I got them from the highest source possible before arriving here. Whether it was by design or fate, 
for reasons I myself could not fathom that part of my memory is intact. Which was technically true, there were no higher sources than the publisher themselves, unless they retcon it later, but that would not be my fault. The room was dead silent after I finished briefing the sisters on the fall of Cadia. They could use some time to absorb the shock, so I waited. The sister who had a small fleur de lis tattooed under her left, I was the first to break the silence. So, how do we move forward, and what is the Emperor's plan for us? Happy that someone had asked the critical question to move forward, I turned to the sister, which prompted her to quickly bow and introduce herself. I am Celestian Superior Marquila Moret, honored to make your acquaintance, Lady Siri. Marquila was a fierce but fine-looking lady with short-length copper blonde hair just reaching the bottom of her neck. The right side of her ear was covered with a sophisticated-looking Vox device. While all the members of the Sororitas I have met so far seemed very capable, from my hunch sister Marquila tops the list of being the most dangerous of them all. She would easily be a champion of the order if such a position exists. Looking at her serious face, I felt a tad bit uncomfortable for such a lady showing me this degree of reverence. If my predictions are correct, little to no reinforcements will be coming. I had worked with the last astropath on this planet the whole of yesterday night, and we only ever managed to make contact with the Imperial worlds within the subsector. There was little response so I continued, our main goal for the moment should be ending this uprising as soon as possible with minimal casualties. As for the Emperor's will, the very mention of the Emperor had all the sisters perked up, but I had nothing to offer. My mind drew blank, but looking at the sisters I knew some directive was needed for them to chew on, no matter how vague it was. Then I recalled an opening cut scene from a certain grimdark video game. After a brief moment of thought acceleration to organize the script, I looked them in their eyes and recited the opening scene dialogue with some modifications. Sisters, the Imperium has always been besieged by aliens and monsters, attacked from within by heretics and rebels. For 10,000 years it has endured, because of the faithful like you all. By his will and with me by your side, we shall stand against the coming darkness and see to it the light of humanity is not lost in this part of the galaxy. Chapter 19 The Way Forward Unbelievable as it sounds, I had refused to immediately take over the command of a whole Sororita's army. While my old gamer self might have strangled myself on that, a simulated side of the battlefield had shown me how different things look when put into real practice. I was not worthy, nor was I ready to take the responsibility for the lives of people under my command yet. I spent the rest of the meeting briefed by the sisters on the details on the front and the upcoming decisive battle. The Sororitas had attempted a few strategic operations to eliminate the rebels' leadership, but these always ended in failure due to superior tactical maneuvers on the other side. Or they could be too blunt a force with their modus operandi for such operations since they were hardly subtle, resulting in mass casualties. Both sides had fought to an eventual stalemate and were now accumulating war assets on a front line that was the size of a country. It was now a stare-down contest with random small skirmishes happening constantly. Dedina passed me her data slate to show me a current report of the forces gathering on the front line. For a split second, I was lost looking at all the unfamiliar low Gothic characters before something kicked in, and I was able to read it as if it was my first language. I took a look at the estimated numbers of forces on both sides and felt a bit dizzy. Due to the steady escalations on the scale of engagement, the sisters were eventually regulated to spearhead roles in the Civil War, and the mother of all fights was bearing down on both sides soon. Since neither side had any major technological advantage over the other, a confrontation would just be a numbers game of attrition that would result in catastrophic loss of life and material. Then my curiosity plus old habits as a gamer kicked in, and I requested to have a look at the current total war assets available to the Order. Did Dinah obliged, taking back her data slate, and after accessing the information passed it back to me. The summary was extensive, it was like looking at the dream miniature collection list of a Sororitas player on steroids. A full militant order Minoris was here, with active battle sisters in service numbering around 3,000 and 25,000 more either in training, non-combat, or support roles. The hardware section was equally impressive. Even with the supposed heavy casualties suffered, the order still maintained a sizable number of rhinos, immolators, and exorcist tanks in active service. There were even a few rare repressor tanks in the mix. Of the sisters active in combat roles, there was a healthy mix of all the standard Adepta units except for those with repenting elements involved like repentions and penitent engines. These were relatively few and far between their ranks, probably due to their doctrine or already being wasted on the front lines. Are you aware of Arch Dominus Crypter's plan? I inquired while looking at the data. I am afraid not, she replied. 
We hardly talked in our brief meeting, but he seemed determined to end this conflict as soon as possible. Scrolling down further on the asset list, I came across some unknown listing that was interesting. What are these? I asked. Dedina took a look at the listings in question and answered. The Nunchus Hailer Flyers? These are low-orbiting aircraft with macro LOD hailers used to project bellowed hymnals into the upper atmosphere to broadcast messages for repentance echo down over unbelievers. There is the Nunchus Imagifier variant which is used to project giant holograms instead. Are they operational? I was really curious. Of course, our order took the maintenance of its war assets as a matter of priority, answered Diadina with a hint of pride. Interestingly, these are the type of units one reads in the lore but never made it to the game. I took a closer look at the flyer's operational capabilities and the power gamer inside me started turning at the possible cheesy tactics I could do with these. Dig Dina, if we show the rebels an overwhelming superiority in strength and righteousness, do you suppose we can convince the bulk of their army to surrender? The canonist pondered on my question for a while before answering, I suppose so, it is not as if they were worshippers of ruinous power. I believe the bulk of them were merely grunts pushed into the civil war without knowing better. The path forward was suddenly cleared up. I closed my eyes, took a deep breath before issuing my first ever directive to the Order. Sisters, if we are to have a better chance to stand against the oncoming darkness, the first thing we need to do will be winning the upcoming decisive battle with as minimal casualties and destruction as possible. To that end, we will need the full cooperation of the Governor's forces and the help of Adeptus Mechanicus from Arch Dominus Cryptor Cycle. I contacted Tech Priest de Taliad who was still stationed inside the fortress and an hour later a holographic conference was securely set up again. Canonist Deep Dinah, Palatine Alicia and Celestian Superior Marquila joined in this time. Cryptor's giant hologram appeared in the meeting room, eerily recreating that iconic scene from a certain classic sci-fi movie again. He noticed the extra participants, bowed and waited for me to talk first. Crypto, Canonist Diadina is here representing the whole Sororita's order. I have reviewed your plan and would like to make a few adjustments, but first please update us on the situation on the front line. Crypto bowed again and began to speak with his crispy metallic voice, as you wish, the opposition continues to accumulate war assets in the front. Our surveillance network now registered close to half a million troops and 4,000 battle tanks on their side. Three super heavy tanks are also noted within their ranks. The Arch Dominus then conjured out a three dimensional map with many, many red and green dots and continued. Governor Catalina's forces also continued to accumulate on the front line with close to 600,000 troops and 3,200 battle tanks. A statement had to be made regarding the quality of the forces, as while the governor has more listed manpower, the numerical advantage is superficial as a substantial portion of that troops are made up of substandard volunteers and reserve units, whereas the heretic side is boosted by a few elite battalions by this world standard. A direct confrontation would only yield us a 9% chance of victory with over 80% casualties, a catastrophic result which we must avoid. The preparation for the plan is going well with elements of my forces doing the final adjustments. We are constantly updating the details to suit the changing situation on the front line. Plan? What plan are we talking about? Diadina asked. It was developed less than 24 hours ago. Only Inquisitor Thorn was informed of it to prevent it from leaking. I explained. Crypto, please show us the updated plan. We could incorporate certain key areas with the full participation of the Sororita's order. Very well. Crypto ran his presentation again with updated information and noticeable improvements on his grand cheesy plan. Did Dina soon caught on to the key factor in the whole scheme, Arch Dominus Cycle? May I ask how are we supposed to collapse their communication network? Crypto returned to me silently asking if he should disclose my ability. I nodded in response. He proceeded with his explanation. Lady Serene here has the authority to overwrite most if not all primary functions of Imperial hardware with a cogitator or machine spirit. Together with my assets, we can achieve the said action for a brief period of time, enough for us to totally incapacitate the opposition leader's capacity to manage the battle. Shocked by what she heard, the canonist asked me, Revered Lady, is that true? Not gonna lie, getting called Lady twice in quick succession had dampened my mood somewhat, but I was sure Regulus will keep it out of my face. Trying to avoid further questioning, I carefully framed my answer to Dedina. Yes, it was a gift from my father. As predicted, the mere mention of Cyrene's supposed father, i.e. the emperor himself, sent the sisters into quick silent prayers, opening my chance to present my objective for this meeting. 
Crypto, what is the estimated number of troops left to defend this world after this operation is over? Around 400,000 with whatever leftover auxiliary forces not participating in the upcoming battle. He answered, Will that be enough to defend the whole planet for whatever that will come after this? I pushed. Hardly sufficient, Crypto admitted. I nodded in agreement and finally got to my point. In the light of that and for a better security of this world, I propose we give them a chance to surrender, throw them a rope to return to the Emperor's service before going down that senseless bloody path. I looked to the sisters to see if they had any objection to this. They simply bowed in agreement, so I pushed forth with my crazy plan. As of this moment, from now on please refrain from calling the opposition heretics, it is not as if they had officially renounced the emperor. To do so will leave no room for their redemption. We have the means to give them a chance to return to the righteous path and this is how it can be achieved. A few hours later, it was close to the morning when I finally got out of the meeting and headed back to my room. Most of the sisters had left hurriedly to actualize the final plan we agreed on for the upcoming decisive battle. My body still felt fresh as ever but mentally, I was utterly exhausted. Looking at the sisters grinding the details away and the planning dead into the night as unaugmented humans had my respect for them went up a few notches. Darn, these ladies are tough. Diodinia's firm grasp on the finer details of the army unit's capabilities greatly contributed to the final shape of the plan. Something I would be forever grateful for since I was basically just theory crafting from what I knew of the universe with no real hands-on experience. The whole planning part reminded me of the late-night preparation for the apocalypse scale games I had in my gamer days, except this was a thousand times bigger with real lives on the line. Any planned movement of the pieces shown on the tactical display entailed thousands of lives into the meat grinder. You could say I felt a bit numb at the end of all the talks of statistics. Suddenly, a psychic message from Aratus reached out to me. Plus Lady Serene, I beg for your forgiveness for my rude intrusion, but new developments are happening. I am at the chamber and need your guidance. Plus, mentally exhausted and saddled with countless looming problems on my mind. I almost lashed out at him before recognizing he sounded a lot like a hapless employee who was put into an impossible position. A position which I was not a total stranger with during my time working in a corporation. I took a deep breath before replying, plus very well, I am close and just got out from a meeting. We'll come to see you now. Plus, while that was not exactly true, but I needed a walk. A short while later, and I was at the makeshift telepathic a chamber Thabaris had set up for the astropath. In truth, it was little more than a controlled space with rudimentary psychic wards and security. This was not my first time here. I waved and passed the black cladding inquisitorial stormtroopers guarding the entrance to the chamber. A large display was on the wall with a radius vital sign shown in real time. Just in case the unthinkable happened, these guys were given the authorization to utilize lethal force. Aratus was coming down from the primary altar when I entered. The stormtrooper sergeant who was in charge of his safety was here too with two other troopers. I understood it to be a standard procedure at the end of a work shift to make sure the astropath was not compromised by the warp. The sergeant nodded at me and left the chamber with his subordinates. I turned to Aratus and was surprised to find him soaked with sweat as if just done with a gym session. What happened? I asked while taking a closer look at the astropath, finding him looking exhausted but still indomitable in spirit. Please excuse me for being less than presentable at the moment. There has been a sudden surge of telepathic messages reaching us, and I was slightly taxed to the limit of my capability. He pointed to the servitors dedicated to recording telepathic sessions. Some long scrolls were dragging on the floor from all the recording done. While most modern office dwellers would be puzzled at the sight of scrolls, the grim dark imperial bureaucracy loved their physical records. I moved closer to take a look and was stunned by the contents. On the scrolls were rows and rows of recorded incoming telepathic messages from all the warp traveling starships operating in the area. Some were asking for the real space location of the beacon and others broadcasting their intent to breach into real space near to us. A realization dawned on me this whole sector was being cut off from the Emperor's light. As a result, the psychic beacon lit up by Serene had become the only detectable reference point for long-distance warp navigation for thousands of light years across the entire region. So how should we reply? Asked Aratus. Well, how is this usually done? I asked back, well aware of the many lives at stake here. We never had this much traffic before. By default, this should be referred to the governor, but the usual communication between the telepathic chamber and her office were severed since the incident, and she has been busy with the war. My mind was turning at the situation. This was the best description I could give for our predicament. 
This world was like a backwater town which suddenly found itself as the focal access point for all the traffic within the province while its mayor was busy having a shootout with close to half the armed folks living here. Like it or not, a lot of things were coming to this world, and it would become the epicenter of the entire subsector. I had my work cut out for me with this mess, and my important appointment with Inquisitor Thabarus was but a few hours away. Chapter 20 Thabarus Notes A very important meeting happened just slightly after the wee hours on the day that the rebels were expected to launch their decisive major offensive. Inquisitor Thabarus Thorne had always liked to set up mind games when having to interview any interesting individual by himself. He would spend time working on a few initial scenarios and from there deployed his art of information gathering. However, the way this meeting started had defied his expectation and his carefully crafted plans crumbled in the face of that. May the Emperor preserve me, he sighed at her outstretched hands that were aiming for his hat and wrote down the date of the interview on his notes. It was 999.m41, 80 years of active service in the Holy Inquisition and Thabrus Thorn had never felt so flabbergasted. Routine surveillance and tailing of several heretical cults had ended in the most unusual of circumstances. He and his merry little inquisitorial warband were now stuck on a planet with a massive active psychic beacon. Sitting across him was Serene, the mysterious transhuman amnesiac who was partly responsible for his current predicament. After a rudimentary search about her background came back completely blank, Thabarus decided to put in more effort to dig deeper. He went as far as intercepting her luggage that was arriving from the Mechanica ship, and the information he found only further deepened his concerns. Amongst the little possessions she had, the most remarkable items were her collection of seemingly simple-looking robes, clothes, and body gloves. However, a preliminary skin revealed them to be anything but simple and his retinue had to request the use of his inquisitorial rosette to access more detailed restricted information. It turned out that the fabric used for her clothes closely resembled the same classified material used on the banners of the Emperor's personal guardians, the fabled Adeptus Custodes. The quality of the fabric was in a league of its own amongst the countless materials the Imperium has access to. Not only was it as smooth and comfortable as the highest quality silks, but it was also practically indestructible against small arms fire, to say nothing of wear and tear resistance. Thabarus knew the banners of Adeptus Astartes, the lesser cousins of the Custodes, could fly even in the face of apocalyptic firepower on the nightmarish battlefield of the 41st millennium. And with the common enough knowledge that whatever the Astartes can do, the Custodes can do better, he could assume that the banners of Adeptus Custodes would not only be made of far sterner stuff, but that acquiring said material was beyond the reach of most people even with significant wealth and power. Further adding to the mystery, most of her collection of clothes was dated to be made over a thousand years ago. The result of all that made Serene's origins highly disconcerting. When they finally had the chance to sit down and talk she had a most unusual request, asking to take a closer look at his hat. After a moment of hesitation, he handed the armored Capitaine over. Serene took the hat and marveled at the details of the stylized emblem of the Inquisition. Her expression of admiration rather than the common fear people exhibited towards the symbol of the Holy Inquisition only further exacerbated his concerns. Just as Thabarus was thinking that this could not get any more unusual, he observed the lady turn his hat until the stylized, I, was facing him. Then she put the hat on. Slowly, she struck up an akimbo pose and declared in a haughty tone, No one expects the Inquisition. There was some context missing here as Thabarus failed to understand her antics and no one else was around to possibly provide a clue. Despite protests from representatives of the Adeptus Sororitas, Adeptus Mechanicus, and even members of his retinue, he had insisted this talk session be a private one-on-one. -on -one. She smiled, beaming with an expression that was completely at odds with the situation they were currently in. Thank you. I always wanted to do that, Serene said as she returned his hat. It's heavier than I expected. Then as if donning a mask her face turned completely neutral, the previous joyous expression was completely gone. Now, let us talk. Over the decades in his line of work, Thabarus had developed what was akin to a sixth sense for discerning the truth from conversations with his subjects. He could learn a lot from what was said, and his mastery of the art of interrogation allowed him to learn a lot more from what was not spoken. Thabarus had taken great pains to study the subject of human body language. He dove deep into decoding the hidden meanings behind sitting postures, hand positions, breathing patterns, and the pattern of speech. Thousands of hours were spent watching pick feeds so he could learn to observe the twitching of facial muscles that were usually too fast for human eyes. 
More than once, Inquisitor Thabrus Thorne had dropped his verdict even before the subject of his interrogation had a chance to speak. To Thabrus' credit, his judgment had always been validated upon further detailed investigations. He was supremely confident of his skills, but that evaporated when he met Serene. She was sitting across him, her face and pose set to an almost inhuman neutral expression. Her deep silver eyes bore straight into him, and she was utterly still, the periodical blinking the only reminder that he was not looking at a lifelike sculpture of idealized perfection. Maintaining eye contact and studying her seemingly more than human features was both mesmerizing and unnerving. After a moment of silence, Thabrus decided to break the uneasy stalemate by making himself a cup of recaf from the delicate tea set that was strategically placed on the table. It was an old but proven technique, mostly used when the interviewee in question was not necessarily an enemy of the Imperium and receptive to courteous diplomacy. You want one? He offered a cup to Serene almost naturally. It was not every day one would be in a position where an Ordo Hereticus Inquisitor offered to make you a hot drink. No thank you. He had expected as much and was slightly impressed. It was not every day someone could so simply refuse an Ordo Hereticus Inquisitor without a hint of using their own authority. They sat silently for a while more, and for the moment, Thabrus was content to just sit down quietly and slowly sip his recaf. He decided to try another old technique, letting the interviewee speak first and hopefully become more willing to share. Inquisitor, she eventually said, staring blankly down at the table. Is that sorrow? A regret? Thabrus started thinking, as decades of experience started working hard to read her underlying emotions. I have dire news and would like to go straight to the point. There was a slight pause before she continued. This was told to the sisters yesterday night, and I had requested Sister Verita not to inform you of this particular issue before our meeting. Thabaris resolved to keep his composure and nodded for her to continue. I believe Cadia has been destroyed, Serene said softly. He read nothing but the truth in her words. We need to work together to dash. The sound of breaking glass interrupted her mid-sentence. Looking down, Thabaris found he had dropped his cup of hot recaf. Steaming hot liquid was soaking into his armored body glove, but all he felt was bone-chilling coldness. She looked up and continued, Inquisitor, we are just starting. Her face was still a wall of neutrality. Two hours later, Thabrus stumbled out of the meeting room. Waiting for him just around the corner were the most trusted members of his retinue. Sensing the Inquisitor was not in his usual state of mind, Neandra rushed to him, crossing the distance of several meters in the blink of an eye. Are you all right? She asked. By the throne, Thabrus muttered while shaking his head, a streak of sweat forming on his forehead. I feel like my recent rejuvenat treatment has been totally undone. Check on him. Neandra told the rest of the team, but before any of them could react, Thabrus held up a hand, standing them down. Don't bother, he said, opening a part of his greatcoat to reveal several high-grade hexagramic wards, designed to protect against psychic attacks, pinned to the inside of it. They never reacted. We just talked. It was just a talk, just a talk. A most extraordinary talk, Thabrus thought to himself. His mind was doing a quick recap of the last two hours. Of all the things Serene had revealed to him, Thabrus had counted no less than a dozen of these, if true, would warrant him to instantly silence any Imperial bystander who didn't enjoy a relatively high clearance on classified information. Most of the information sounded ridiculous the first time he heard it, but her following detailed descriptions soon changed his mind on their credibility. The most shocking of all was her prophecies. Oh, the prophecies. Robot Gilliman shall return. She had said it without any hint of doubt or deception. For the very first time in his grim career, Thabrus wanted to doubt his own readings. She was either delusional or telling the truth. Neither was a laughing matter. What had really shaken him was not just about the things she said, it was how she had said them. She was just so nonchalant about it. A brief moment back then, Thabrus had this illusion they were just old friends sitting down having recaf, and she was giving him casual updates about some mundane hobby they both shared. By then the supposed original primary objectives of the meeting, the discussion of Serene's identity and the upcoming major battle, had since fallen to the sideline as more time was ended up spent on discussing other topics. At this point with all the information available to him, Thabrus had to concede despite his reluctance of admitting it outright. She might actually be who the Sororita's legends claimed to be and her outrageous plan for the major battle might work. In conclusion, regardless of the absurdity of it all, supporting Serene's current activities here seemed to be the best way forward for the benefit of the Imperium.
It was only after the talk Thabaris noticed his notes never went beyond the date he wrote down initially, 999.m41. For a split second Neandra thought she saw Thabaris' hand tremble and before she could verify it, he moved the hand to retrieve a small flask from inside his greatcoat. He then proceeded to open the flask and gulp down its contents in one go. I thought you quit Amasek. Her eyes narrowed slightly. I did, Thabaris answered, putting his flask away. Sir, Fulton and Salih are here as requested. They just arrived. Acolyte Herlindia reported, shall I brief them on their appointment? Thabaris was about to approve that notion before an unconventional and somewhat mischievous idea came to him. Why should he be the only person to suffer the weird antics of that lady? Nah, no time. Just tell them under no circumstances can they treat her poorly. He finally said and sighed, somehow the Inquisitor knew today was going to be a long day. Chapter 21 Psychic Duo My first lesson in the basics of safely using psychic powers should be happening soon. It was kind of exciting and nerve-wracking at the same time. I was wondering if I had talked too much in my session with Inquisitor Thabaris when someone knocked on the door of the meeting room. It opened and Acolyte Herlindia entered. Lady Serene, she bowed, the psychers you have requested to have a word with have arrived. Psychers? More than one person? No matter, I might even get more advice. Thank you, Miss Herlindia. Please let them in. I replied while trying my best to be courteous and caught her subtle expression of being surprised first followed by a faint smile. Was she astounded by the fact I remembered her name? Having the photographic memory of a Primark really helps in scoring easy social points. Due to all the happenings, it felt like a lifetime ago when she introduced herself meekly back in the inner sanctum. Her Lindy about again and left after that two newcomers entered the meeting room. Without even looking at them, I knew they were psychers because even without going psychically active myself, somehow unseen energies could be felt whirling around them. Not only were they psychers, but these two were also in a different league compared to Aratus the astropath. A man and a woman stood near the entrance and were looking at me. Both of them had similar pale skin and attire, wearing the psyker robe with extra carapace chest and shoulder armor pieces. The man was carrying a thin staff whereas the woman had a small psychic hood-like structure behind her collar. Well, come in, I said while standing up and greeting them with a light bow. The man and woman nodded. Together they walked towards my table, slightly bowed and proceeded to sit on the empty chairs available. Greetings, I am Serene. Fulton Merdini, the man replied with a soft voice. This is my colleague Tzali Hennard. We are sanctioned psychers in the service of the Holy Inquisition, currently assigned to Inquisitor Thorn. A swift, Analytica, confirmed both their human and psyker status as I took a closer look at them. They both appeared to be in their late thirties. The man was slightly below average height, had short white hair and a face that could say to be uneasy. He gave off the aura of a tamed beast, controlled but dangerous. The woman was half a head taller than the man. Beneath an average-looking face was her unkempt waist-length blonde hair that hung lazily in front of her psyker rope. The one common trait of appearance they shared was their hollow-looking eyes. My best description of their overall impression would be unhinged battle psychers. While this might be just me stereotyping, these two definitely reinforce the notion of why normal people would be uneasy near psychers. Inquisitor Thorn mentioned you would like our advice. Well, we are here. Fulton said then stopped talking, looking at me with his unnerving gaze. Truth be told, I was not exactly feeling easy talking with them, but I had a much, much greater fear of being possessed by a demon or worse, being turned into a chaos spawn down the road. The very notion that such a possibility existed sent ice-cold chills down my spine. So despite my trepidation, if I ever had to rely on psychic powers, I had to consult the real professionals. Plus, well, plus suddenly a female voice was heard communicating telepathically. Plus I got nothing. Plus replied a male voice. Looking at them, I realized they were chatting through telepathy. Did Inquisitor Thorn mention anything to you about me? I asked. Fulton shrugged and Salih answered with her hoarse voice. We were bedridden for days after arriving at this accursed system and just got better recently. I see. Well, I would like you two to brief me on the perils of the warp and teach me the knowledge of self-protection when using psychic powers. Fulton's eyes narrowed upon hearing my request. Plus, what is the deal with her? Plus, Tsali asked in telepathy. Plus, no idea. I will probe and see. Plus. Plus, wait. Thorn introduced her. Is that wise? Plus. I then felt the slightest sensation of being probed, but it quickly fizzled out. Huh. Fulton seemed startled, but his timing was so good without knowing better it would be as if he was reacting to my request. Silly shot him a glance, side sent telepathically, plus Fulty, don't be rude. Plus. 
Plus she resisted my probe. Plus. Plus wait what? Are you getting rusty? Plus. Plus like hell I am. Plus. Please. Will you accept my request? Being probed without permission should have been considered egregious conduct on his part, but I decided to let his action slide for now. Salih replied this time. Who are you? And why do you need such knowledge? Well, I too am a psyker. I began explaining before being interrupted by Fulton. Haha. <laughs> you? A psyker? I am sorry, little lady. Being requested by Inquisitor Thorne to meet with you is one thing. What you asked of us is off limits. He then stood up, approached me with an imposing stance, pressing his face close to mine and spoke. I don't know who you are nor do I care, but we sanctioned psychers do not indulge with the make-believe of the privileged, especially when it concerns matters dealing with the warp. Do you think this is a gain? One wrong move here and you with your entire whatever noble family lineage on this little god-emperor forsaken rock can be wiped out without a trace. Do you hear me? Plus Salih, I will probe again. Aid me. Plus Fulton was apparently not satisfied with the previous attempt. Judging from what I just heard, she can buff him? Is this some sort of psychic choir technique? Interested in their technique, I shut up and just kept observing them. Plus she went quiet, very suspicious. Plus. Plus very well. Let's go. Plus. For a brief instant, I felt their powers connected and Fulton tried probing me again with greater intensity, but again it fizzled out. Plus I got nothing. This is not normal. Plus Fulton declared. Now that I saw their technique, I decided to show them my psychic active state to end this charade. Please, I know this is not normal, but I am a psyker. Let me show you. Psychana Activa, activated. The now familiar trippy sensation took over me again. As expected, the two of them had a much stronger psychic resonance than a radius in my active state. I could even detect a small linkage of their powers. That must have been the result of years of working together. Plus, do you get it now, Fulty? Plus, I joined the telepathic conversation. Both of them were stunned, especially Fulton who was very close to me and had this derpy look on his face. In the next second suddenly things took a dive as I sensed warp energies gathering around Fulton. Alarms in my head sounded as my thought acceleration activated automatically. Wait, is he trying to smite me? Smite was a generic psychic power in this universe in which the psyker unleashed the power of the warp in the form of otherworldly lighting energy to electrocute their enemies. I could see in slow motion the power gathering on the Psyker as he charged up for what could be a fatal attack. Fulton. Sully called out to stop her companion, but the latter seemed lost in the motion. I needed to stop this from developing into a disaster and suddenly recalled that the warp energy seemed to respond to my will when I was psychically active. Standing up, I instinctively willed myself to disperse the energy gathering around Fulton. Reacting to my directive, the gathering storm dissipated like light smoke hit by a strong wind. Surprised, like me, by my successful denial of his powers, Fulton now had an even derpier look on his face as panic started to take over him, flipping my previous impressions of the psyker being the cool kid in class sort of person. Not wanting to risk another psychic attack, I put strength into my words and felt my inner might radiate outwards as I delivered a serious warning to Fulton, Mr. Murdini, stop. Something tangible burst forth from me. It even flipped the teacup on the table as my words echoed in the room and what followed was dead silence. Fulton had fallen back and sat on the floor. Both psychers went still looking at me like deers staring into headlights. Well, that was effective, but why are they looking so afraid? Looking closer at them, my transhuman eyesight picked up my own reflection on their irises. It would seem like my halo was leaking out and it petrified them. Hold on, why is my halo active now? I quickly looked into my status and found out it was actually part of the feature in Regulus which became available when becoming psychically active. I must have missed that the first time as it was quickly dismissed after witnessing that terrible war vision. Please, my colleague was spooked. Salee found her voice and placed herself between me and Fulton. It was at this moment I caught more details from my reflection on the spilt decoff on the table. My halo looked and felt slightly different from the first time it manifested. It was more pronounced and had more weight to it. Looking closer at the reflection, I could even see the edges of it had a hint of red tint with an edgier outer glow. I guessed in my desperation to stop Fulton, my halo must have been cranked up to the maximum level. They each held up a hand as if blocking rays from the sun while holding hands with their free hand. Fulton was even hyperventilating. Am I being oppressive here in my current state? I am sorry. I apologized while deactivating my halo. Their relieved faces told me it was far from a pleasant experience. Fulton let out a breath of relief and proceeded to just lay down fully on the floor. Salih shot him a glance before commenting, 
plus told you that was a bad idea, plus. I sighed. This meeting had started on the wrong foot but was still salvageable, and going forward I will need to treat my future interactions with psychers very carefully. Plus let us start again, I recently lost most of my memory. Would either of you kindly brief me on the perils of the warp and teach me the knowledge of self-protection when using psychic powers, plus. Just then, my mind registered a flurry of encrypted Vox messages received by the fortress from the front line. Things were happening and we had little time to lose. Chapter 22 IT is starting. There was a weird tension in the air. I was not sure if that was because of my awkward initial interactions with the psychers or the looming rebel offensive that might be happening soon. Apparently, they had never met a psyker who can go on and off that will. And me going psychic active so close to Fulton with my level of power had triggered distressing memories of a past experience he had with some warp entity in a previous mission where he almost lost his life. He confessed the very similar feeling of being severely outmatched had triggered his out-of-control outburst. While that was not a valid excuse for him to lose control, I assured the psyker this matter will not be pursued further by me in the future. After receiving Fulton's profuse apologies, we went forward with the crash course. We proceeded smoothly on the lessons, silently agreeing to ignore the puddle of spilt decoff that served as a stark reminder of a disastrous close call. Just as things were going into high gear, my crash course with the duo psychers came to an abrupt end when Thabaris interrupted the session with breaking news from the front. It seemed like the rebels would be starting their full offensive soon, and I would need to prepare for departure to the front lines immediately. My presence at the front line had become necessary as Crydefer had calculated that my tweaking of the plan had made the data load required increase 20-fold. So he had rushed to build a device in close proximity to the front line that was needed to cut down the margin of errors. I already knew this was coming as a part of my consciousness was still connected to the fortress machine spirit and the spike of traffic and encrypted Vox messages did not go unnoticed. That said, I did benefit greatly from the brief interaction with the psychers. First, I had accidentally mastered the conjuration of my halo during the second activation. The halo was one way to radiate my psychic might and it had so far proved useful to strike either reverence or fear into the emperor's subjects. Second, I finally understood the basic concept of self-protection from the perils of the warp. The fundamental outline was quite simple. Think of the warp as the sea and warp users as the swimmers. A normal swim in shallow waters would normally be quite safe and the chances of being eaten by a predator almost non-existent. Except in this case, sometimes the sea could come to you, so one needed to be perceptive to the currents. Then there were the other considerations like the mental fortitude of each individual when assessing the risk of warp taint while using psychic powers, but we simply do not have the time to dwell into the details today. When I had free time, more lessons would definitely be needed on this subject matter. I was on my way to my room for another change of clothes, one aimed to impress and hopefully help in getting the full cooperation from the governor's faction to make our grand trap successful. To that end, I had enlisted the help of Sister Dialogus Welmana on that front since I had always been a fashion idiot. Welmana had stayed behind as a liaison for the Sororitas as she was not of the militant order. I had her waiting for me at my room via Vox as I sped across the fortress massive walkway. Halfway through my journey, I had a distinct feeling of being watched. Curious, I slowed down and noticed a security picked feed, a term they used for cameras here, was aimed at me. I let my mind sink deeper into the fortress network and confirmed my hunch. At the same time my consciousness had reported to me there was another picked feed looking at the control room, which controlled the picked feed looking at me. So they even had a watcher watching the watchers, that's the Imperium for you. I tagged my mind into said picked feed and a view popped into my vision showing a dimly lit room where two people were looking at a monitor. On its screen was yours truly focused close up. The audio was also connected. Is that the mystery guest? One man asked. I think so. All sorts of important people were flying in just to see her. Who do you think she is? The other man asked back. Throne knows that knowledge is beyond our clearance, shrugged the first man, but she sure looks pretty. Wait, is she looking at the picked feed? I had their attention and might as well use this convenient chance to test something. So I smiled, then instantly activated my halo and cranked it to maximum intensity. The two men in my overlapped vision panicked, moved back from the monitor, tripped over each other and fell over in comedic fashion. Hilarious as it was, the brief testing of my halo effect seemed to indicate it could somehow permeate through live picked feeds, but its effectiveness remained inconclusive. How this was achieved was totally beyond me, but... 
The grimdark universe was a place where scrap codes that transmit warp-infested computer viruses exist so the underlying principles might be the same. That my halo, like the Emperor's, which might be essentially a type of positively charged warp energy emitter that could work through live picked feeds might not be that far-fetched of a concept after all. At any rate, it felt like a bad idea to leave a record of the incident, so I had my consciousness reach into the database of the fortress and erase the records on both ends. As I did so, I wondered how all this was achieved as the computation happening in the back end must be enormous. I looked down at my hands and remembered all Primarchs were sentient weapons masquerading as semi-humans. Since that much was true, the same must be said of Serene. The fact that my consciousness now resided in such a body had implications that I had neither the time nor the will to deal with at the moment, so I shook off that uneasy feeling and hurried to my room. Sister Welmana was already waiting at the door of my room when I reached it. My senses detected her breathing quickened as I approached. Nervousness, anticipation, reverence, somehow I could read her emotions like an open book and it felt strange. Rarely if ever had I evoked such emotions amongst other people back on earth. Of course, if our position was flipped and I was back to my old self, I would probably be a sweaty mess if a literal demigoddess approached me in private. She was about to bow when, Welmana, please teach me how to perform the proper greetings for high society in this world. Slightly stunned by my request, but quickly coming to her senses, Welmana performed the gesture in front of me. As expected of a proper scholar, her greeting looked flawless. The whole greeting gesture was a mixture of an old-fashioned curtsy which then progressed to the Aquila hand sign that was only performed by female members of high society on the planet. I committed her gesture to memory and tried performing it in front of Welmana. Let me see. Lower my head slightly. Hold up the edge of the outer cape. Extend my right foot behind the left. Slightly bend the knees and then bring myself up. Proceed to do the Aquila hand sign and raise my head. Too easy, the level of precision provided by this body had made such a sequence of actions too easy. Am I doing it correctly? I asked. Perfectly done. Welmana was looking at me with sparkling eyes behind her goggles. May I ask why would you go that far to show respect? Her question prompted me to take a closer look at the scholar. Was she serious? Did she truly believe just because I had Serene's credentials that people would willingly do whatever I say? Or was this a thing in this universe? Or had I reached the age to throw out random wisdom? Being a member of the Sororitas, which was an organization of zealots, might have skewed her point of view on these matters. It is simple, I answered. Paying respect is free, and I believe it should always be paid whenever appropriate. It was not as if I was a typical eight-feet-tall Primarch with a legion of super-soldiers numbering hundreds of thousands under my command. If that was the case, etiquette would literally be optional when dealing with the normal folks. I had to play to my strength to increase my odds of long-term survival going forward. We finished up and proceeded to the landing pad where Flame Raven was waiting. Welmana will be riding with me on the gunship for this trip to the front. The external sun had just broken through the horizon and the morning wind made the scholar shiver as we approached the downed rear hatch of the flying fortress. I was curious as to why Welmana was shivering when the temperature felt just fine before a shocking realization hit me, all this while. I had been interacting with this world with the body of a super-level transhuman and had been taking a lot of things for granted. My mind was racing back to some of the minor details that happened since coming to this world. Like back in the inner sanctum when I was able to easily push Alicia off me despite her being suited up in power armor and how the nameless sword was lighter than it seemed. So all that was because of my Primark level of physiology? Am I losing my sense of humanity without even realizing it? Lady Serene? Welmanoa's concerned voice woke me up from my stupor. I had stopped walking, and she dared not walk in front of me. I looked at the scholar again and found her still shaking in the morning breeze. You are freezing. Let's get inside. I said and hastened my steps. Thabris was waiting at the rear hatch entrance. The tail ends of purity seals plastered on his shoulder pad were fluttering in the wind. Now that I think about it, that armored capitan of his must be weighing like a helmet in a normal human's hand. Beside the Inquisitor was Ranta the friendly stormtrooper, he was enjoying a low stub, its glowing ember ends shining with the same intensity as the laser range finder optic of his hotshot volley gun. Good morning, Mr. Ranter. While walking towards the gunship I greeted the big guy who I had not seen for a whole day. Morning there, little miss. You are looking mighty fine today, he said while putting out his low stub and stepping aside to let us through. Thabris shot his retinue a side glance, took out a data slate and accessed something on it. He then passed the data slate to the henchman before dropping a comment, Ranter, I hereby permit you to read this document. Go through with it and update your etiquette when dealing with Serene Effective immediately. 
Return this to me later. A puzzled Rander took the data slate and started reading while Thabris greeted us with a nod. Serene, sister, follow me. As Welmina and I followed the Inquisitor entering the gunship, behind us came the surprised gasp of Ranter. I was greeted by the distinct smell of Flameraven's interior again. It was a sort of mix between an expensive car and an airline cabin. My mind could not help but think back on all the recent happenings. Everything felt like a lifetime ago, and the hardest day was still ahead. I reached out to greet the gunship's machine spirit. Flame Raven, how are you? Plus plus fully operational and ready to serve. Authority. Plus plus. Being the authority, I might need to get used to that concept soon. Chapter 23 Final Preparation A lot of people will die because of my actions today. That mental resolve was made as I was securely fastened to the harness of a chair inside the Flame Raven again as it sped towards the front line. Anxious about the looming military operations, I was not idle and had been ceaselessly using thought acceleration to review all the details and running simulations inside my head. Time itself seemed stretched from my point of view in this weird period. A short while into the flight, for lightning air superiority fighters appeared on our flight path and settled into formation to escort the gunship. This much was known because even as I sat quietly on my chair with no outside view, encrypted communication chatter between the fighters could somehow just be heard inside my head once I consciously tuned into it. Somewhat mentally exhausted from my relentless and ceaseless review of the pending operations, I decided to take a break and eavesdrop on their conversation. Lightning One, look at the huge gunship. Who is the VIP this time, someone asked. No idea on that Lightning Three, but be on the alert. The command mentioned high possibilities of sneak attack, replied Lightning One. You serious, Lightning One? We are way back in the green zone. Say, any of you guys heard a rumor about the AA Manicors firing at an unknown target here recently? I heard it was some sort of cyber attack. Got a friend stationed near there, and he said all the rockets had been fired. Huh, ain't nothing gonna survive that kind of salvo. Someone laughed. Bah, I'd rather be in the front lines now teaching those darn rebels a lesson than escorting some unknown big shots, another replied. I heard the front is heating up, so you might just get your wish after this run, Lightning 4. Alert. Reading on Auspex, bearing 12 o'clock. That startled me and I tapped straight into Flamer Raven's Auspex readings. Sure enough, something appeared on the edge of the Auspex range. Detailed readings of the approaching aircraft from the gunship's sophisticated systems filtered into my head and one profile emerged. Archaeopter Stratoraptors. A cold and flat voice popped into the conversation, Lightning Squadron. This is Taraxii Prime Iota 47 of the Adeptus Mechanicus leading Stratoraptor Strikewing Alpha. We are here to add to the escort of Gunship Flame Raven. There was a pause. I guess the leader of Lightning Squadron was scrabbling to verify the identity of the new flyers. Roger that, Alpha. We just received updates from Strategic HQ on your arrival. Glad to have you with us. Your compliance has been noted. We will lead from the front. So the rumors are true. We have COGS joining our side. COGS was a derisive term used by some of the Imperials for members of the Mechanicus, the reason being Opus Machina. The emblem of their religious faith was a hybrid of human and cyborg skull in front of a mechanical cog. The COGS sent their flyers too? Just who is it we are escorting? Lightning One. Serene. One of the most powerful people on the planet was addressing me, interrupting my eavesdropping operation. Due to the excellent soundproofing of the gunship's interior, it was even possible to whisper while in flight. Yes, Inquisitor? You have my sincerest apology for what happened with Fulton, though I must confess my reluctance to punish him severely for his transgression due to the need for his talent for the uncertainties ahead. That, in the very unusual circumstances of your unique ability to be able to go psychic at will. Admittedly, I should have picked up on that part earlier with all your interactions with the psychers, so I must say sorry again for my shortcomings. An inquisitor was apologizing to me due to the actions of his subordinates? He must be up to something. He paused for a bit then continued, but Fulton did commit a grave mistake and nearly created a catastrophe. In the light of that, I would submit his fate to you after this war is over. His words prompted me to take a closer look at him. Is he throwing Fulton under the bus to save his own skin or bowing to Serene's background? I searched for my feelings and found myself harboring no ill will towards him nor the psyker. In fact, in light of the competency they and the sisters had shown with rapid developments, my respect for the people of this universe had been steadily growing. No harm was done, I replied. Please don't get too hard on Fulty. I was partly to blame too for what happened. I am grateful for the lesson and advice he provided and I look forward to another session with him and Celise soon. 
That should secure Fulton's well-being for now. Fulty, huh? He chuckled upon hearing my usage of the psyker's nickname. I see you generally have a benevolent approach to issues. Is that supposed to be a compliment? Anyway, if your appreciation is real, please help me at the meeting to push my plan forward. By the way, what happened to Neandra? The assassin's absence was felt, and I was sure she was present at the fort in the morning. But in truth, I had an idea of where she had gone. Earlier in the flight, there was a sudden request from Crypterer to utilize my authority for masking some of our aircraft to fly deep into the rebel-controlled territory. They must have confirmed the whereabouts of the rebel leader. Knowing this was the decapitating move we had agreed upon I obliged, followed his instructions, and with the back-end connection he had somehow established in the rebels' hardware. Took over the control of a whole Auspex network belonging to the rebels through the Flamer Raven's wireless connection. In what could be the litmus test for the whole operation, I observed through the readings as a group of aircraft from our side went further and further into rebel territory until they reached their destination without incident. One of those aircraft was a stealthy small strike craft that had the hallmarks of the Inquisition written all over it. That must have been where Neandra had gone. Let's see how Thabaris is going to answer me. From what you told me, a total decisive victory seemed like the only way for this world to survive. I will protect the Emperor's domain to the best of my capability. As for Neandra, she took an opportunity to strike on critical targets. Is she a Calidus Temple assassin? I asked out of curiosity. The Calidus Temple was one of the four major temples of the Officio Assassinorum, a highly secretive agency of the Imperium of Man's government that employs transhuman super-assassins to do its work. The temple itself mostly employs female operatives due to its unique requirements. Thabaris looked around before answering me. We were alone in a sectioned-off compartment so our conversation being leaked seemed unlikely, but the mere mention of an Officio Assassinorum temple still seemed to make him uneasy. Throne. I hope you do not make a habit of talking about highly classified information so casually. Well, I smiled and pressed, merely more for fun seeing a stern person like him getting stirred up. No, he answered reluctantly, it is a long story for another time. Suddenly, I became aware of the Flame Raven being targeted by a myriad of anti-air systems and a flurry of IFF exchanges between systems soon followed. It seemed like we were near our desk. You? Needing social assistance? He actually laughed. So mean. I cannot fathom a scenario where that would happen. At any rate, I am sure the Sororitas present would not allow their holy daughter to be swarmed by the uncultured masses. You have no idea of the language they used to protest my solo interview session as if I was in a position to bully one such as you. A while later, we landed and Thabaris led the party towards the rear hatch. It was a crowd. We were with Ranter, Herlindia, Fulton, and Salee with the additional sister Welmana and tech priest Daedalid joining in as liaison for Sororitas and Mechanicus. I noticed the subtle nodding between Thabaris and Fulton. There must have been some standard psychic security measures being carried out discreetly by them. The rear hatch of Flame Raven opened, and we were greeted by a small crowd. Standing in the front was interrogator a male, flanked by Palatine Alicia and a decorated-looking female Scatarius who I did not recognize. Behind them were three small groups of people. Inquisitorial goons-looking gunmen with extra soldiers standing at ease right behind a male, the same group of sisters I recognized from the inner sanctum was following Alicia, and a squad of Scatarii rangers standing still like statues behind the female Scatarius. It looked like a miniature Imperium here. Hey, if we have space marines here we would make a complete set. I was still entertaining such silly notions when Thabaris stepped forward, prompting me to follow him down the ramp. Alicia and the sisters saw me and their faces lightened up. I had this weird sensation as if meeting the fans of my own club, except my fangirls were all wearing power armor and armed with bolters. Sir. Serene. As a male greeted us both, I could see a subtle change in the sister's expression. Wait, are they getting slightly pissy now because the interrogator was addressing me without honorifics? These formalities concerns might become an issue in the future. Maybe I should get one of those sister famulus to sort out such matters after the war is over. Thabaris tilted his head slightly, silently inquiring about the crowd he was not expecting. They insisted on coming. A male replied to the unspoken question. I nodded at a male before greeting the others. Sisters, we meet again. Skatarii, greetings. The sisters bowed reverently while the leading Skatarius performed her sign of cog as a formal return greeting. Greetings, Lady Serene. I am Kira Heptrix, Skatarii Alpha of the Second Cohort for Dominus Cycle's Expeditionary Force. We are here to escort you to the command bunker. Stepping into the command bunker, 
I could feel the eyes on me as my first time meeting with the governor and generals will be happening soon. So many people, so many important people were looking straight at me. These folk looked like characters straight from the concept artworks of the grimdark universe. They all had an air of great importance about them that could only be cultivated with years of holding important positions. In front of me were rows of people wearing impeccable military uniforms with rows of glittering medals, and at the center of it all was a pretty blonde lady wearing a golden suit of power armor. As a mundane middle-level salary earner back on Earth, I never had the chance to meet any important individuals, let alone a group of high-level VIPs. But here I was, meeting the top-level people on the planet. Not of a country, but the entire planet. It would be straight-up lying if I were to claim I was not nervous. My stomach felt like churning, but surely it was imaginary as this body had yet to give me the slightest issue yet. Esteemed luminaries, your attention please, Wellmana spoke up, her voice amplified by the mini laud hailer built into her scholar attire. We, the Adeptus Sororitas, wish to announce and welcome the arrival of our very important guest of honor. That was my cue, and all eyes were on me. What was that old saying again? Ah. You can only make a first impression once, so better not screw this up. With this body, it should be no problem. Smiling at the crowd, my body moved naturally as it performed the Aquila curtsy. It came out smooth and easy, as the gesture was being done, and my head was rising I activated my halo on low intensity so as not to be too oppressive. A part of me knows this is somewhat cheating and underhanded. I am sorry, but too much is riding on this. I met with their gaze, seeing their pupils dilate and gradually increase my golden halo's intensity. Noticing the unusual sight before them, the bunker quieted down from its bustling noise. When the whole bunker fell completely silent, I spoke. Greetings to all. I am Serene, daughter of the Emperor and bearer of his authority, glad to be making your acquaintance. There was a slight pause before the sound of murmurs rose from the crowd. Amidst the little ruckus, the Sororita's representatives rose as one, led by the canoness herself, they walked right up to me. They stopped in front of me, performed their Aquila signs and knelt. I, Dedina Grace, canoness of Adeptus Sororitas representing the Order of the Shining Beacon, declare to all that we recognize your status as the holy daughter of the Emperor and the authority you wield in his name. Say what? Impossible. What absurdity is this? Amid escalated murmurs, a huge figure rose in the command bunker, walked towards me, and bowed deeply. I, Archdominus Cryptor Cycle, the highest representative of Adeptus Mechanicus on this planet, hail the Omnition Princess direct creation of the manifestation of the Omanissia himself and acknowledge the authority you wield in his name. Upon hearing this, the crowd erupted into an uproar and Thabrus stepped in brandishing his rosette. Order. People. Order. We have a war to attend to for the Emperor's domain. This was the crucial part. While having the support of the Inquisition, Sororitas and Mechanicus were important for legitimacy, in reality, the mundane masses still outnumbered the combined institutions more than a thousand to one. Knowing humanity, there would doubtlessly be political troubles ahead, but those can wait for after the civil war is over. I sighed internally, raised my hands and clapped once. As my hands connected, I cranked my halo to the maximum output for a split second and then turned it off, silencing everyone briefly for an opening to talk again. Thank you all for the welcome. While we have much to discuss, all will be for naught if we lose the upcoming battle, so let us win this first before anything else. I then started walking towards the planetary governor herself, as my intention became clear to the crowd, they made way and split like the Red Sea under Moses' command. Governor Catalina von Cleus, I greeted the lady in golden power armor with a slight bow. I am sorry for not announcing my arrival earlier. I will be in your care while staying on Nusquam. Arrangements were made beforehand to notify Catalina of my arrival, but she still seemed a bit caught off guard by my appearance. After looking stunned for a split second, Catalina's aristocratic instincts went back to work and she returned my greeting with an elegant Aquila curtsy of her own. It was I who must apologize. It grieves us all to show a prestigious guest such as yourself the current state of our planet. I will help where possible, I said in a less than subtle attempt to shore up her legitimacy as a ruler for the planet. Governor, time is short and the rebels will be making their move soon. Should we cut the pleasantries and start the last meeting before the decisive battle? Indeed, will you do the honors of initiating the meeting? Catalina was fast on passing the ball back. This planet seemed to be filled with quite competent people, so I nodded and turned to Cryptor. Archdominus, kindly start your presentation. Chapter 24 to War It was strange to witness people clapping at the conclusion of a war plan's presentation, 
It had an eerie resemblance to the chilling scenes about a certain Operation Darkstorm from that depressing anime from many years ago. I was just hoping the actual execution of it would not be mirroring that disastrous result, but there was a key difference here. We were aiming for mass salvation, not destruction. You could say the push for my war plan was largely successful and had gotten everyone on board. Cryptor showed proof of our capabilities by disclosing the details on the strikes we made on the outposts earlier, but kept my true ability under wraps to the Nusquamis for the moment. The Nusquamis themselves were kind of stunned by the ambitious scale of our plan, and even did a standing ovation at the end of it. Well, given their prospects just went from the low chance of getting through this unscathed to potentially being big winners it was an easy sell. Besides, it would be the Adeptus Mechanicus and Adeptus Sororitas that would be carrying out the key operations for the plan, so the Nusquamis just had to do the easier part of holding up their battle line to fully benefit. Catalina was beaming at the end of it, and I could see she was smiling from the bottom of her heart. My guess was she had been keeping up a facade of a strong leader for a while now, and things were finally looking up. Fabris also helped to push the acceptance of the plan by giving warnings on further potential threats and the prospect of little to no reinforcements on the way. Something did happen during the event as I noticed a male and ranter slipping out of the command bunker. It seemed like they were on a mission and some inquisitorial business was happening in the background. I did not have the full details but hoped Fabris underlings were as competent as they looked. Naturally, the Nusquamese tried to swarm me for more details after the presentation but the Sororita's wall proved effective. I did have a brief moment with Governor Catalina to thank her for the support of the plan and took the chance to pass her the summary for incoming starship traffic from Aratus. Catalina, I have some reports here that were meant for you. I then turned to Signal Wellmana who was a few steps behind me. The scholar hurried forward and respectfully passed a parchment scroll to the governor. The governor received the parchment, opened it up hesitantly and her eyes widened. This, what is with this amount of incoming starship traffic? The scroll was the summary list compiled from the astropathic messages Aratus had received recently. According to him, it dwarfed the combined traffic for the last combined 50 years. Seeing her flinching at the report was kind of hilarious in the desperate respite I needed. Before the Nusquamese top brass left for battle, Thabris dropped a gag order on them all, forbidding anyone to disclose my identity to people outside this meeting on pain of death and worse in our bid to exercise information control. The assembly was then dismissed as the time for the grand battle approached. I was later introduced to the other leading figures of the Sororitas. Of note were the other three Palatines, Sister Selisa Gallen, Sister Helenta Cadia, and Sister Domini Zeal. All were seniors to Alicia and looking the part of a capable field leader for the Chamber Militant Order. As the Palatines were present at the final war meeting, and thus witnessed my halo manifestation, they reverently received me. It prompted me to realize how convenient all these setups were for Syrene. Someone had been pulling the strings for at least a thousand years to make all this happen. I then followed the sisters to an assembly for the final inspection on key elements of the operation with Tech Priest Detailiad, Skatarii Alpha Kira, and a skull probe from Cryptor following silently. Canonist D. Dinah was looking particularly delighted like she could not wait to show me the result of her overnight labor. As I stepped out to another clearing, what awaited me left me speechless. On the field under a cloudy purple sky was a massed assembly of the elite units of Sororita's seraphims in their familiar power armor with angelic-style jump packs. Their dull silver power armor glittering under the rays of the late morning sun that managed to sneak through the clouds periodically. The seraphims were standing completely still, in stark contrast with the tail ends of purity seals on their armor that were waving gloriously in the wind. There was a low humming sound resonating in the air as the collective thrumming of active power armor sang in unison, anticipating the coming battle. My superhuman mind quickly counted their numbers and found there were 300 of them lining up in a military parade. The Order of the Shining Beacon had mobilized all their seraphims for this critical operation. In the cloudy sky above, unfamiliar-looking flyers were doing low passes in tight formations. I soon recognized these as the Nunchus Hailer and Imagifier Flyers, freshly awakened from storage by my request to join this fight. Giant holographic projections of the Order's symbol could be seen underneath some of them. This is gloriously magnificent. Magnificent work, sisters. I praised the canonists and palatines wholeheartedly, trying my best to play the part of being a leader who did none of the actual work but took notice of good efforts. The glorious sight of it almost brought tears to my eyes as my gamer self greedily soaked in the spectacle before me. In front of the 300 elite sisters stood a single seraphim more decorated looking than the rest. She was standing in attention with her helmet tucked underneath her right hand. 
This person's name had come up time and again during tactical planning sessions with Deep Dinah and Markila back at the fortress, so I knew who she was. Seraphim Excelsior Zarfia Abeo, the highest-ranking Seraphim superior of the whole order. I almost lost myself completely to the visual spectacle before remembering my purpose here. I quickly summoned the skull probe over and connected myself to the network while walking towards Zarfia. Zarfia was dark-skinned, short-haired, and had thick lips. Maybe a descendant of African lineage? She had the complete look of a no-nonsense, tough-as-nails lady you would expect to see as a squad sergeant in a classic sci-fi movie. Sister Zarfia, I called out to her and formed my Aquila sign. We just met but already a great burden was placed on you by me. On that note, I beg for your pardon. Zarfia will be playing a key role in leading the Seraphims for the first phase of our operation. If successful, we could potentially silence all the big guns in the Rebels' rear formation with minimum casualties, so a lot was hanging on her capabilities. Holy daughter, she maglocked her helmet, returned the Aquila sign, and replied, I was briefed on the operation and God Emperor willing, will not fail the mission. Zarfia paused for a short while before asking, May I have your permission to ask some questions regarding this operation? I nodded for her to go ahead. The issue of the air transports has yet to be resolved, and how are we supposed to penetrate the Rebels' air fighters' defense net with so few fighters on our side? As with standard practice on military matters, certain details were being withheld to prevent information leaks, and this lady was not afraid to ask key questions. I am liking her guts already. Complex imperial politics had shaped certain aspects of the civil war. A point not mentioned earlier was that since almost all imperial aircraft were under the direct jurisdiction of the Aeronautica Imperialis branch of the Imperial Navy, the Master Chief Petty Navy officer on the planet had greatly disapproved on the prospect of losing precious aircraft over this silly civil dispute. Said Navy officer had since put his feet down, forbidding both sides from utilizing any aircraft under his jurisdiction for the duration of this war. As a result, only a limited number of aircraft that was wholly owned by the Nusquamis locally had joined the fight and heavy bombers were not involved in the battle. These unique circumstances had allowed both sides to mass tank columns without getting worried about being bombarded to kingdom come from the air. Still, the rebels currently controlled more aircraft than the loyalists on paper. From Zarfia's point of view, this would be a great cause for concern for she will be leading all of her order's precious seraphims for a deep strike mission without much air cover. Your transports are here, I said just in time as a fleet of Mechanicus air transporters appeared in the sky. I had been tracking them since they entered the radar net. Crypterer had kept them hidden, deploying these from his starship to stay away from any possible prying eyes until the last possible moment, only ordering them in when it was time to move out. As for the enemy fighters, have no worries, for we have methods to deal with them. I need to beg for your pardon again as no further details will be given. All I can do is to ask you to have a little faith in our planning for that. If that is what is asked of us, very well. Zarfi about. She then asked another question, this time hesitantly, Holy daughter, we heard from the canonists that you could manifest his light. Please, can we witness it for ourselves? His light? Did she mean my halo? I had been spamming my halo recently to get over tight corners and grew a bit weary about it. Frankly, it felt manipulative to the point that I was starting to feel uncomfortable about its usage on the people around me. Hold on, she said, we. By we, do you mean everyone here? I asked. Zarfia nodded. Inwardly, I cringed hard at the request. The Adeptus Sororitas could rightly be considered as one of the biggest state-sanctioned dedicated fan clubs for the God Emperor of Mankind, where membership is for life and the membership fee is eternal service to the church. It would be natural for them to seek out any tangible proof of his divinity whenever possible. Did Dinah would not skip such a golden opportunity to boost the morale of her order as they had taken a few horrible setbacks lately. I took a closer look at Zarfia and realized she could not have been older than 30 years old, which prompted me to look at the rows and rows of seraphims behind her. Some had the visor of their helmet lifted so I could see a part of their faces, by the gods most of them looked so young. Girls about half my mental age were geared up, and prepared to go to war zones for their beliefs. Surely I could put aside my own feelings for a while and give them a light show? Feeling obligated, I nodded to Zarfia. I understand. Sister Marquila, the relic sword, please. Celestine Superior Marquila had been hanging around carrying the sheathed nameless sword beside Deed Dinah in what might be a vain attempt of enticing me to claim active leadership of the order. Sorry, but that is not going to happen anytime soon. I will consider that only after the war is over. 
For now, I just need the sword for the complete light show package and take this opportunity to live test the Nunchus Flyer systems. Marquila quickly walked over and presented me with the hilt of the nameless sword reverently, mimicking a scene I had witnessed before in that meeting room back in the fortress. Recalling how Dedina did it, I mirrored her stance, silently prayed to not screw this up and successfully pulled the sword out in one go. The nameless sword exited its sheath with a blinding light and became the focal point on the field. I ordered the skull probe over and mentally triggered the advanced selfie picked feed function while accessing the wireless network with my authority to project the image and sound feed onto all the Nunch's flyers. Immediately, all the holographic projections on the flyers switched to gigantic portraits of myself via the direct live feed from the probe. This was starting to feel like a concert now. Hello, I said to the skull probe and through its microphone my voice echoed throughout the whole field via the lod hailers on the flyers. Well, this is the next level of cringe. It was so embarrassingly awkward my skin started to crawl, but there was no going back now. It was at this time at the back of my mind, where some cold calculations were always running, I realized the air transports will land in about a minute. It was kind of a social emergency, so I activated my thought acceleration to get some breathing space. I had no time and urgently needed a short pre-battle speech that is badass enough for this universe. Quickly I scanned my mind for all lore and contents regarding this matter and only one result surfaced. Relieved, I gave a silent thank you to my old self for binging YouTube contents before changing the original text for my usage. They had all been briefed, so I will just go straight to the point. Looking at the silent crowd, I took a deep breath, raised my sword and activated my halo. The moment the assembled sisters saw it, their expressions softened and their eyes lightened up. Encouraged by their unspoken support, despite feeling ridiculous in front of so many people, I said the prepared words out loud, it was broadcasted clearly over by the Laud hailers. Seraphims. Sisters. Absolution is at hand. We are facing our sacred duty. Let justice be your song. Let righteousness guide your weapons. We are the daughters of the emperor. We are the bearers of his will and our mission shall be done. For our undying lord and savior. For the emperor. I finished the really short speech by firing up my halo up to the highest level while activating the psychic flames on the nameless sword. A huge plume, much larger and brighter than the one before burst forth from the blade and the seraphims who were previously silent broke out in thunderous applause. With my gigantic holograms in the air, a religious resonance of sorts happened and the piousness was palpable in the air. The seraphims beamed, echoes of their joyous cries hit me like solid waves as they witnessed with their own eyes the proof of their god's divinity through my actions. For the emperor. 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 The sisters' chants shook the field. Then the weirdest things happened. As if the heavens were answering, a strong ray of sun broke through the clouds to shine directly onto the field, illuminating the ecstatic sisters. He answered. Someone cried out which only pushed their heightened zeal further. One could almost taste their emotion. I was totally stunned witnessing this ridiculous scene. What are the odds of the sun ray breaking through the clouds at this exact moment? As if answering my question, another thought immediately surfaced. Who are you yourself? Look around. Aren't your very existence proof of his divinity? I looked back and found the canonists and palatines all kneeling behind me. Some of them were weeping openly. The sisters continued their chants until the Mechanicus air transports arrived shortly they landed in perfect synchronicity for the seraphims to board. Somewhat in a daze myself, I bid farewell to the sisters as they got on their way to war and took the extra care in giving directives to their canonists while returning the nameless sword to her. Dear Dinah, please take care of your sisters and yourself. I look forward to your triumphant return. I said, indirectly prohibiting the idea of them resorting to martyrdom to achieve their mission. Unlike me, she will be heading to the field while I would be doing my part in the back line. Giving her the sword to keep was also meant to encourage her to come back in one piece, lest the priceless relic is lost in the chaos of battle. I have my selfish reason for wanting to minimize the potential casualties of the sisters. If a lot of the senior members of the Sororitas got themselves killed in this battle, it might cripple the little Minori's order. Should that happen, the surviving sisters will inevitably look to me for future directions, and that would be a world of hurt which I want to avoid. Soon all the battle sisters had left for the battle leaving behind the non-militant members and the Dominus liaison. Kira approached me with a bow, my lady, Dominus Cycle is waiting. Cryptor and I met up to go through with the final details of our plan. We were walking towards a huge setup the Mechanicus had prepared for this battle. My best description of it would be a podium of wires. 
a monstrous-looking contraption that was finished for the operation and placed in a discreet location behind layers of protection that seemed to be able to withstand even the ungodly firepower from a titan. Wellmana, Verita, and Kira were behind us, silently following. As we walked towards the monstrosity, my feeling of unease grew. For a fleeting moment, I was not sure why I was there in the first place and tittered on the edge of having a panic attack. It was then the Arch Dominus spoke. I commend you, your ability to grab a crowd's attention is remarkable, canid Crypterer. Is he trying to comfort me? Looking at the towering post-human, an idea suddenly came to my mind. Want me to teach you a trick? I asked. Trick? Undefined, however. Please proceed. If you need everyone to listen to you in a hurry, do this. First, you slap your hands together loudly, then say this. Slapping my hands together producing a loud clap. I then proceeded to rub them together in a classic scheming pose mimicking a certain famous mad scientist from another far future before saying it out loud. Good news, everyone. Following my example, Crypterer slapped his primary hands together, but the sound that came out was a low metallic clink instead of a loud hand clap. He paused for a split second before concluding, phase one failure, sound vibration quality unsatisfactory. Improvised, synthesis sound vibration for phase one. I offered. Recalibrating. Crypter replied before slapping his primary hands together again. This time as his hands touched each other he played back the clapping sound I produced earlier with enhanced volume resulting in a satisfying clap. Then proceeded to rub his hands together with the same scheming pose before saying out loud, Good news, everyone. Watching the whole thing happen, I was thankful for all the regulus, action override, messages that kept popping into my view. I was beginning to really appreciate it. Well done. I gave him a thumbs up. I will field test this trick when appropriate and report back the result. Cryptora replied as we reached the gigantic podium. My little tricks are nothing compared to your real groundwork. I praised him wholeheartedly and asked, how did you manage to get the timing of their grand assault so well? That part is simple. Through the information network of this planet, I had contacted all the tech priests and engine seers who happened to be serving under the rebel's side. To each and every one of them, a coded message that only a true disciple of the Omniscia could decipher was delivered. I gave them two choices, serve the Omniscia as plan or get out of our way. Fail to comply, and I will personally see to it they will be hunted down and their data cores be melted for recycling. What are you? Some space godfather? I took another look at him, imagining the Dominus canning to himself about giving offers the followers of his cult can't refuse, like a true techno-mob boss. I am so glad we have you on our side. I remarked truthfully, having Dominus Crypterer as your enemy on the other side of the battlefield was no laughing matter. As per your previous directive, I must inform you the action you are about to partake in will result in the loss of human lives, casualty estimates unknown, highly dependent on your performance and a variety of factors too complex to calculate. Due to your request and the 20-fold increase in data load required for the operation, there is a chance that the working strain might exceed your capacity to handle and we have no previous experience for such heavy use of your ability. In the light of that, I have requested Inquisitor Thorn to provide dedicated medical personnel, just in case. Somehow he was sounding like a nagging old dad again, but I was grateful. Who knew the person who was showing me the most care after coming to this world was from the Mechanicus, even if it was for his own ulterior motives. It was then I noticed the complicated expressions on both the sisters who were following us. Crypterer only spoke vocally when it was a necessity, so from their point of view, the Arch Dominus was simply dropping incomprehensible binary the whole time while I talked. It was such a classic sci-fi trope on the protagonist talking to a beeping robot sidekick. The whole scene must have been looking very confusing for the sisters, so I smiled apologetically to them. Thank you, Crypto. Let us pray that. I looked up at the cloudy purple sky, thinking about all the people who were about to die today, and said the only thing that came to my mind. The Emperor Protects. Chapter 25 First Strike. Today was the day that would determine who became the governor of this planet. Flight Captain Galius, the commanding officer for Flight Squadron 315, was feeling good on the big day of the Grand Assault as his personalized fighter aircraft cut through the purple sky towards the front line with his trusted squad mates in tight formation. They had the governor's forces where they wanted them, and a decisive battle was commencing. Going from past experience of dozens of engagements, there was no way they were going to lose this fight. Galius was not a man who was particularly interested in the politics of it all. The governor and her half-brother had a quarrel so war broke out. As far as he was concerned, he was just glad that he was on the winning team. After this was done and settled, 
Lord Kai then would replace his half-sister as the new planetary governor. Things will carry on as normal after the mess was cleaned up. The God Emperor will remain as unmoving as the Externus Sun, and by his good grace, maybe he will earn a few medals and get a good race. Things were looking up. That said, the forward squadrons ahead of him had not sent their updates yet, and the chatter from headquarters went still some time ago. Galius was about to double-check if he had muted his Vox unit by accident when a message started playing. From it came a calm and soothing female voice that he had never heard before. Attention to forces under Kaithen von Cleus. This is a statement made on behalf of Catalina von Cleus, the rightful governor of Nusquam backed by a joint declaration from the Inquisition, Adeptus Sororitas and Adeptus Mechanicus. Your actions of taking up arms against Governor Catalina is deemed illegal and misguided. By the Emperor's grace, we will confer to you a chance to surrender. Choose wisely when the opportunity to return to the right path presents itself. The Emperor protects. Galius was livid. Just what in the throne's name is headquarters doing? Losing out on electronics warfare now of all times? Galius tried a few settings on his Vox unit, but all the frequencies were occupied with the same repeating message. Just when he was about to turn to another frequency, the message changed. Attention to Flight Squadrons 315 to 320, your chance is here. We have total control over your radar net, Vox network, and ground anti air systems. Eject from your aircraft now for salvation. Galius gulped and felt a cold premonition as the Vox singled out his flight group, making it sound less like an empty threat by the second. He quickly checked on his auspex and was stunned to find its readings had gone haywire and he could not even contact his squadmates. At the same time, his onboard warning system started to chime, signaling his craft was being targeted by anti-air systems despite the fact they were still flying in airspace under their control. This is not a drill. Please don't die from this. You have 10 seconds to comply starting now. 10, 9. Galius watched in disbelief as his day abruptly turned 180. He looked outside from his cockpit and witnessed the rest of his squadron seem to be in the same predicament. His first wingman was even frantically hand-signaling to him. Six, five, four. The gentle female voice continued her relentless countdown. The incongruity between how it sounded and its lethal implication paralyzed Galius. Then he saw it, on the edge of his vision. Far off in front were the forward squadrons and they were falling from the sky in droves. Trails of smoke signaling the deaths of aircraft and explosions filled the sky while the warning chime inside his cockpit was getting deafening. 2-1 Galeus screamed and hit the eject button. A split second later he was in the air with his seat. He looked down just in time to witness his prized personalized fighter aircraft being blown to bits by anti-air fire originating from behind the lines. Meanwhile, higher in the sky elsewhere, Zarfia Abeo was praying to the Emperor while waiting for the green light to deep strike into battle. She and her 300 Seraphim sisters had gone on a very risky mission riding on blind faith, boarding unfamiliar air transports flying over enemy airspace with no fighter escorts. As prepared as she ever would be for the impending operation, Zarfia went into a warrior's meditative trance, making peace with herself while awaiting whatever fate awaited her. Just hours earlier, Canonist D. Dinah had returned from her abrupt departure with a renewed sense of zeal none of them had ever remembered witnessing. A quick meeting involving all the highest-ranking members of the Order was then held. Zarfia and the others had come out of the meeting infected by that zeal as well, but it still sounded too good to be true. She had still harbored a sliver of lingering doubts until witnessing that light herself. Just the fact that their holy daughter was with them had burned away any question if their actions were ordained by his will. Strangely, despite currently being in the most dangerous part of the mission, Zarfia felt totally at peace. Having strong faith is one thing, witnessing the divinity of one's God manifested, bringing absolution to that faith was a totally different level of experience. His divinity is real. She could die now and be happy, knowing even if this mission failed with her death, somehow it will still be part of his divine plan. Ding. A system chime broke her reverie. She recognized the sound and put on her helmet for the tactical relay update. What she saw shocked her. A complete tactical map of their target base with astonishing detail was displayed in her helmet's data feed together with an ETA countdown of two minutes. She did. I watched as a literal god of war as the rebel flight squadrons 315 to 320 blipped out of existence, further cementing total air superiority for our side as the grand trap was about to be sprung. I was not sure if the pilots ejected from their aircraft in time, but a final warning was delivered before the anti-air weapons hit their aircraft. Everything was calculated down to the second, giving them no chance to react outside the script. 
The next targeted message was prepared as I kept up with thought acceleration to control multiple complex processes, compiled my warnings and digital sound data, and delivered it to the next batch of Rebel Strike Wings while targeting them with anti-air assets from the Rebel's own backyard. At the same time, I was fabricating false data and OSPEX readouts for their headquarters to keep their main battle force on the ground rolling deeper into our trap. There would be a lot of confused people on the Rebels' side as their anti-air placements were seemingly firing at random. But since most real long-range targeting was done by cogitators, it was a simple hijacking operation for me once a connection was established from the back end. My eyes were closed, but a virtual map of the battlefield created from live data had replaced my vision. Hundreds of thousands of unit indicators populated the map, each signaling their real on-field counterparts. Thousands upon thousands of messages of cogitators establishing connections and complying flashed by in my view, and I soon learned to tune it out. With the secret aid of Mechanicus personnel from the inside, we now had total control over the long-range Vox network of the Rebels and millions of Vox messages were intercepted. Decrypted and analyzed by Cryptifer's advanced cogitators in orbit for tactical information while I acted as a conduit between the whole process. Exabytes worth of data must have gone through me every second to direct the battlefield, and for the first time, I felt a bit strained. Everything is going as planned. Such a numerical improbability. Cryptor's comment popped into my head. He was on his own command throne close by elsewhere to oversee the deployment of Mechanicus forces. The dominus words prompted me to double-check on the status of Zarfia and her sisters. It seemed like they had successfully reached their destination and were in the process of deploying from the sky. I heaved a sigh of relief but immediately got back to my feet checking on everything since the biggest hidden threat of all, the renegade space marines had yet to show themselves. The looming threat of an ultra-elite force of unknown numbers and modus operandi was the biggest unaccounted risk factor of the whole operation. Despite all the war meetings we had been through, no ideal solution ever surfaced on how to deal with them, so we had left it at that, reserving some forces on our part and hoping for the best. So are we good in proceeding with our plan? I asked via the information link established via the podium. Yes, are you holding up fine on your end? It felt a bit strained, but it is manageable for now. Good, the back-end elements are in place. We shall proceed as planned. Omnisia be praised. Your actions of taking up arms against Governor Catalina is deemed illegal and misguided. By the Emperor's grace, we will confer to you a chance to surrender. Rearguard General Boren raised his eyebrows at the message coming from the central Vox unit of his command bunker. Charged with all the artillery battalions under Lord Kai then, Boren had multiple units of dedicated artillery groups under his direct command tucked safely behind the main offensive line guarded by layers of protection. He was ready for a day of action on delivering death to the front line via extreme range and had been waiting for targeting orders from the main battle group but it was strangely quiet from the front. Then the Vox network seemed to be hijacked by the governor's forces and had been repeating the same weird message ever since. Bah, humbug. Warren scoffed, as if talking rubbish alone will change the course of the war. We have thousands of guns here waiting to sing to your demise, soon to be ex-governor. Maybe she knew her only way to get out of this is to talk us into surrendering, one of his aides offered. Boren laughed slightly at his aide's awkward effort to shine his shoes but had to admit he was never much of a fan of Catalina due to personal taste. The general mused at his own thoughts but was soon getting back into working mode and demanded, quit idling around, who can tell me when will the Vox network be fixed? Suddenly there was a commotion and a lot of sounds were heard from the outside. Boren was alarmed as he searched his memories and it reminded him of the retro boosters of jump packs but none of the units under the banner of Kai then utilized such advanced equipment. Before he could verify what was happening, the sound of bolt weapons firing was heard all around. We are under attack. Someone in the command bunker snapped to his senses and called out. The Vox. The Vox is not working. Another shouted. Impossible. Boren thought to himself. The governor's forces had deep-struck jump pack units directly onto his position and cut off his communications. But the Auspex radar net had picked up nothing, unless... All our Auspex and Vox network had been compromised. He shouted his belated realization. Not only that, the fact that elite enemy units had directly landed on his command bunker meant a catastrophic level of classified information might have been leaked out. The short-range independent Vox units should still work, get the emergency runner truck going and warn Lord Kai then that we are compromised. Someone did that and a Torox truck parked at the edge of his base immediately sped off towards their headquarters. Boren had been a general for decades, he prepared such a contingency for any just-in-case scenarios. 
Little did he know squads of Mechanicus Sicarian infiltrators had infiltrated near their base. The truck was ambushed and never reached the headquarters, while their short-range Vox was hopelessly out of range to warn their colleagues. Back in the base, Boren watched in disbelief as the reinforced plasteel door of his command bunker began to glow red-hot and was cut down by the distinct superheated melt of beams. The administrative staff inside Boren's command bunker were still frantically voxing for help when the armored, angelic forms of multiple Sororita's seraphims stepped through the fallen plasteel door and came straight for them with bolt pistols and inferno. Pistols raised. One of Boren's bodyguards fired a few lost pistol shots at the seraphims, but the lost bolts bounced off harmlessly from their power armor and his brain was blown off for his troubles. Boren had drawn his lost pistol, but he knew it was a lost cause. Against elite sisters wearing power armor in close quarters, their odds of winning were close to zero, so he waited for death. To his surprise, the sisters pointed their weapons at him but took no further action. For a while, the only sound that could be heard inside the bunker was the Vox unit repeating the same messages. Staring down death, General Boren watched in astonishment as the seraphims in front of him parted, giving way as a seraphim superior stepped forward. Boren could easily tell she was a sister superior as the leading seraphim was brandishing a power sword and wore a more decorated helmet than the rest. The sister superior looked at him and removed her helmet, revealing a stern-looking dark-skinned woman. She eyed Boren for a while before speaking. Greetings, General. I am Zarfia Abeo, Seraphim Excelsior of the Order of the Shining Beacon. She then turned her head at the Vox unit, which was still continuing its message. Choose wisely when the opportunity to return to the right path presents itself. The Emperor protects. Zarfia seemed to smile upon hearing that, and eyed General Boren again before saying, Our holy daughter has spoken. This act of mercy will only be granted to you once. So what is your choice? Choose wisely. General. Boren gritted his teeth, made his resolution to die standing, and replied, You won this fight. Do what you want, but I will not betray my people. Again he expected death, but Zarfia simply looked at him with an expression that suggested pity, like a parent looking down at a wayward child throwing a tantrum. General, I believe you do not understand the gravity of the situation. Fortunately, there is a certain someone who could enlighten you. Sisters, secure the others in a separate room. It was at this time a skull probe with a sophisticated-looking device attached underneath it floated into the command bunker. It flew around doing some sort of scanning for a while, then it stopped flying and settled down on a desk in front of the general. As it did so, all the Vox devices inside the bunker finally stopped broadcasting. In the eerie silence, the device under the skull probe came to life and out pops a hologram featuring a young lady with an air of saintly regality. As one, all the seraphims present bowed deeply towards the figure. Excellent work, sisters, said the figure in the hologram, her voice a match with the one that was on ceaseless repetition earlier. Now, I would like to have a few words with the general. Moments later, a hapless Boren was forced into a conversation with the hologram, a diligent Zarfia looking from the side. General Boren Yalston, I am sorry we have to meet his opposition on this battlefield. My name is Serene, daughter of the emperor. I am supporting Governor Catalina von Cleus in this unfortunate conflict. Receiving no response, Serene paused for a moment before asking a shocking question. Have you forsaken the Imperium, General? Boren felt his breath was taken. Chapter 26 Assassination Target Acquired After verifying their target was indeed Kaithen von Cleus, Neandra activated the recording function on her binoculars and gave the signal to attack. A long distance away, elite kill team members of Mechanicus Skatarii Rangers fired their transuranic arquebus from concealed positions. Neandra watched as the supersonic depleted transuranium shells that could fully penetrate a battle tank went through layers of reinforced concrete and hit their mark, only to be repelled by an energy field that materialized on impact. Even through the walls, the advanced sensors in her multi-spectrum binoculars had confirmed their quarry was still alive. This rare joint operation between the Inquisition and Mechanicus had started off promising enough, but a quick and easy resolution still eluded them. If it had gone as planned, Neandra just had to be a witness to Kythan's demise, but unfortunately, the man was resourceful enough to survive their sniper volley. So it is back to the standard affair after all, the assassin thought as she sprang into action and ran forward after sending out another signal notifying the strike force to go for the assault. Way ahead of her. Squads of Mechanicus Sicarian infiltrators who had snuck forward earlier broke their concealment and started a direct attack. Artillery fire inbound onto target base, variant Manicor Storm Eagle rockets, ETA 5 minutes. 
The Skatari I Alpha Ranger who was in charge of the strike force dropped his Vox warning with a tone so flat most people would think the speaker was completely devoid of biological parts. But what Neandra took notice of was their choice of weapon deployed. Mandacor rockets again? She mused to herself, silently noting how even the cult mechanicus, an order that was supposed to champion cold logic could still be petty when a chance of payback presented itself. Inside the perimeter of the headquarters, hell broke loose as automated sentry guns came online but instead of shooting the invaders, turned their guns on the occupants of the base instead. Heavy bolter rounds started firing indiscriminately into troops and administrative staff with gruesome effects. Amid the ensuing havoc, any troops that managed to rally soon clashed with the Sicarian infiltrators and the results were spectacularly one-sided. The tall and slender forms of post-human infiltrators barely broke their stride as they cut through the human ranks with fleshette blasters spitting death, while taser goads split heads and bones in showers of blood and gore. The cybernetic killers sped relentlessly forward, all the while broadcasting mind-bending neurostatic bombardment of anguished static screams on disruptive wavelengths from their dome-shaped heads to cause further disarray as they decimated the rebel ranks. The rebels who were caught between a surprise attack and subverted security measures stood no chance. Dozens of people died in the first 20 seconds before a general alarm was even sounded. Neandra was getting close to the quarry, her ponytail and chameleoline camo cloak fluttering in the air as she dashed forward with inhuman speed and leaping over heaps of dead bodies. Right in front of her a short distance ahead, the squad of infiltrators charged with securing Kai then went inside the main building for the finishing blow. Archdominus Crypto Recycle had deemed the assassination attempt on Serene an act of high terrorism and pinning the responsibilities on Kai then. This operation served both as payback and a decapitating strike on the leadership of the rebel army. An elite strike force was assigned to the task and Neandra was attached to it as both liaison and overseer of the operation for the Inquisition, as it was an Inquisitor Thabarus' interest to confirm Kaithan's elimination. This was the first time Neandra was working with members of Skatarii, the cybernetic military forces of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Looking at the speedy progress, even as a lethal killer herself, she was impressed by their cold efficiency. Just as she was anticipating the mission coming to a closure, the sounds of close-quarter melee erupted from the target building. Kain still has forces that are able to withstand the Skatarii? The moment that idea crossed Neandra's mind, there was a sudden sense of foreboding warning her that she had turned from a hunter to the hunted. Trusting her instincts, Neandra quickly moved to one side without hesitation and barely dodged an unseen attack that seemingly materialized from the thin air, feeling the air sizzling uncomfortably close to her face. Despite the lack of a visible enemy, the assassin somehow managed to parry two more heavy blows in a heartbeat before jumping back and dispersing a cloud of powder in front of her. Being the chief distributor for Thabarus Inquisitorial Judgment for decades had taught Neandra to prepare for all eventualities so a seemingly invisible enemy hardly counted as the strangest thing she had seen in her unconventional career. When her powder made contact with the enemy, a curious reaction occurred and undid whatever was holding up the stealth, revealing her opponent to be a space marine in full warplate. Pushing down her own shock at the revelation, she had but half a second to get a proper look at the marine without any time to dwell on how a seven-feet-tall space marine could turn invisible. He appeared to be wearing a dark gray suit of power armor of mismatched components devoid of any markings, but was primarily made up from Mark VI armor. His choice of melee weapon was a single lightning claw gauntlet. The Marine's Corvus pattern helmet with cold blue lens stared like an avian beast as he pointed a bolt pistol at her, just in time for the assassin with transhuman reflexes to dodge his shot by the smallest distance. Neandra lunged forward with her power sword, forcing the Marine to take a step back. Taking her chance, the assassin quickly drew and fired her grav pistol at the marine near point-blank range with her free hand. A weapon that was really effective against large mass targets, grav weapons were rare but not out of reach from the Inquisition. Knowing the possibility of encountering renegade marines again, she had prepared the pistol just in case any of them showed up. Too close to dodge the attack, the marine instead blocked the shot with his bolt pistol, sacrificing his sidearm and retaliating with a brutal and swift upwards kick. His attack connected but to his surprise, the assassin took the blow, the close space severely limiting its force to be lethal. She caught the kick with her arms and used it to launch herself backwards to put some distance between them. The marine watched as the Neandra nimbly flew back, drawing her camo cloak in and activating it to melt her image with the surroundings an instant later. 
He was about to give chase before realizing the perimeter heavy bolter sentries had started training their guns on him, so he retreated. Moments later, Neandra was applying first aid to her bruised forearm that had absorbed the kick while watching from a safe distance as the Rebel Headquarters compound was leveled by relentless bombardment. With its void shield generator shut down, the base was helpless against conventional attacks. Earlier, she had witnessed a dark gray Astartes Thunderhawk gunship flying extremely low to the ground fleeing from the site like a wounded beast. She had little doubt Kai then had escaped on it. The Skatarii Alpha Ranger, sounding as lifeless as before, had reported back to her about the Sicarian infiltrator's squad tasked with apprehending the Rebel Lord, had clashed with an unknown Astartes unit, and was presumed lost before the bombardment hit. She raised her bandaged forearm. It stung a little even with all the pain suppressants in her system. The blunt force trauma from a space marine's kick with his power-armored boot could have caused some deep muscle and bone damage. She made a mental note to get prepared for some of Verita's good old berating while sending out a coded message to Thabaris informing him of the unfortunate mission result and her strange encounter with a space marine who can turn invisible. Mission update. Operation decapitation had concluded. Moments ago, I had flipped the identification friend or foe protocol on the sentry gun network and turned off the rebel headquarters void shield generators, it would appear the carnage was over. Fighting through my complicated feelings of getting people slaughtered, I asked the important question. Did we get Kai then? Negative, Kai then Von Cleus had escaped due to renegade Astarte's intervention. Cryptopher sent via mine link. So they finally showed up in the theater of war. How many marines? Reports suggest only a very small number of them took part in the action. A single Astartes Thunderhawk gunship left the area with Kaithan on board. There is this more concerning report about at least one of the Marines our strike force encountered seemed to possess an unconventional ability, being completely imperceivable even by a transhuman until he attacks. You mean they could be totally undetectable? Is this some sort of chaos sorcery? I was shocked. That might explain why I could not detect any of them in the war zone. How that was achieved is yet unknown but so far there has been only one reported case. Seeing they had never used it to get rid of the governor, this ability is either a very rare skill or could be constrained by severe deployment limitations. Are we at risk of such attacks? Although the odds of them infiltrating here for a surgical strike of their own is very low. Just in case, I have ordered Skatari Alpha Kira to double the guards stationed around you and me. So, after all that effort, we could have ended the war then and there. Unfortunate. But the decapitation of his military leadership capacity was successful. He has suffered a catastrophic loss of key personnel and his army headquarters was completely destroyed. I am relaying to you all the acquired data as we speak. Thank you, Crypto. I sent back while receiving the huge data cache, at the same time ignoring the waterfall-like constant messages of cogitators establishing connections and complying. I took a peek and noticed Neandra had taken part in that mission and was relieved to see no report of her injury or demise. I quickly took out the key information and compiled the data into a presentable format to be used later and sent an advance copy to the rear end of the rebel forces where the Sororita's Seraphims were holding up rearguard General Boren. A lot of effort had been put into the operation to take over the rebels' backline. I had even enticed the general to talk so a more comprehensive analysis of his speech pattern could be done. It was then demonstrated to let him know we do not exactly need his cooperation to screw up their whole army. In truth, I did prefer him to surrender to us peacefully. Warren Yalston, known as Ironback, Boren by his subordinates, has a reputation for being a straight-talking, stern but fair man with effective leadership skills. Just the type of man the planet needed for defense. Boren had since been asked about the renegade marines, but he apparently knew nothing about it. His shocked reaction upon being informed and shown evidence of the existence of space marines seemed genuine enough, so that meant only the people at the very top of the rebel faction were involved with the marines. The plot thickens. Successfully getting Boren and the forces under his command out of the fight meant we had for the moment put multiple artillery regiments out of the equation, effectively silencing thousands of big guns in the back line. Now we just need to wrap up the big fight quickly to prevent further complications. We had since rerouted the whole tactical data streaming from the Rebel headquarters and sent a constant stream of fake information to the Rebels' on-field army, masking loyalist movements to insert our entire army into strategic positions right under their noses. From the Rebel army's point of view, their Auspex readout told them they were routing us and sending the governor's forces on a disarrayed retreat. We had deployed a complex mix of false readings and sacrificial dummy units to make the ploy look as convincing as possible. 
Hopefully the fog of war, combined with the endless supply of smoke in the actual battlefield, could last long enough for the deception to work. I watched in my vision as the thousands of pieces moved slowly into position, pushing the Grand Rebel Army further and further into a tactically unsalvageable position. Suddenly there was a rapid stream of notifications indicating a surge of intercepted Vox messages coming from the Rebel Army. Mixed within reports of coordination and engagements were the personal messages from the Rebel Army. Not sure why, but a flurry of personalized Vox messages started appearing on the field. What is this? They had broken their Vox discipline? Apparently, it is a peculiar local custom known as Last Vox Right with some historical background. I had advised Governor Catalina against granting the privilege to her troops since it will give away our position. Cryptifer replied with a hint of disapproval. Curious. I dipped my consciousness into the stream to sample the contents and a massive amount of information came passing through me. Here was a father telling his children to behave if he did not return. There a son was calling his parents not to worry about him because they were winning. Another confessed her love to a colleague and asked for a chance for dinner should he return. Like a slow summer phantom rain, the trickle of private Vox messages went through me. It drizzled slowly at first, then steadily it gained momentum. More and more messages came forth until it poured like a tropical storm. Again and again, similar messages and patterns kept repeating themselves. Parents and children worried about one another, friends wishing luck amongst peers, lovers calling out to each other. Hundreds of thousands of people were voxing out what could have been their messages if they never met one another again. The aftertaste of the data stream started flooding and formed an image of the combined soul of the army staring back at me. Their messages were so mundane, so ordinary. They are just ordinary people. I watched as a silent observer in a sea of well wishes and farewells. After a while it was getting hard to observe, so my consciousness was retracted from that data stream. When my vision returned to the godlike view of the battlefield, a few good old, regulus, notices had popped up on the edge of it. Breathing in deeply, my mind struggled to focus. Throne damn it, I can do this. Then suddenly, an odd but familiar sensation hit me, one that should not have happened. Doubting myself. I swatted my forehead with the back of my palm to make sure, but there it was, on the back of my palm was a patch of moisture. It was sweat. I was sweating for the first time since coming to this world. Just as its implication was being pondered a wave of dizziness and headaches hit me. I reflexively held onto the side of the podium but then my body started to shake slightly before stabilizing back. Oh hi. Mortality my old friend. Long time no see. Lady Serene? Behind me came the concerned voice of my assigned caretakers, Verita and Wellmina. I am alright, just feeling a bit tired. I assured them, but inwardly a sense of panic was setting in. So this hyper-advanced transhuman body has its limits after all. Chapter 27 Grand Army There was an unsettling atmosphere in the air as the battle to decide the fate of the planet progressed into unknown territory. On a front line stretching 300 kilometers long, the Grand Army under the banner of Kai then von Cleus the half-brother of the current planetary governor, was rolling down from the north after weeks of preparation, hoping for a decisive engagement. With Kaithan's forces moving towards the capital city of Nusquam, to retreat would mean ceding several key planetary infrastructures to the rebel forces, losing both prestige and any advantage held. Strategically, Catalina could not avoid this battle. Kaithan's mother was from the northern part of the planet, belonging to the more hardy bunch of the populace whose military tradition went further back than their southern counterparts. This was reflected in the military divisions on the planet itself. The North had long since prided itself on the fact that most elite and celebrated battalions were from their side. Due to that, while the armies facing off against each other was comparable in strength on paper, Kaithan's faction was confident in the final outcome of this matchup. The Grand Northern Army was made up of roughly 4,000 battle tanks and 10,000 combat vehicles separated into three battle groups. The bulk of the army was in the center group with two other smaller groups on each side to prevent flanking maneuvers. Choose wisely when the opportunity to return to the right path presents itself. The Emperor protects. The speaker blared with a gentle female voice repeating the same message again and again inside the confined compartment of a Torox armored transport. What the frack is that? Trooper Mattias asked. Like hell I know. Maybe it is your mother talking on the speaker? Com Specialist Lantis replied. I will be damned. You can actually compliment. If his mother sounded that beautiful, I would not mind meeting her one bit. Teased Trooper Silas. Shut the hell up, all of you. Sounds like all the long-range Vox channels have been taken over. Anybody still wants to do your last Vox right, do it now. I am cutting off that privilege after one minute. 
barked Sergeant Gerhardt as he supervised Lantis working on the communicator, but regardless of his efforts the same message was repeating on the Vox speaker and it was beginning to unnerve them. Losing out on Vox war on our big day? A bad omen if you asked me, but at least they had the decency to pick a speaker with a beautiful voice. Another trooper added his voice. I don't know about you guys, but this war ain't feeling right for me from the get-go, chipped in a low voice. It was from Ignatham, the quiet but capable person in the squad who seldom spoke, but when he did, people listened. What do you mean, Ignatham? Silas asked. That got everyone's attention. Ignathas eyed his squadmates for a while before talking, that day, I saw it, on one of the fights when they attacked, they had Sororitas with them. Trooper Ignatham. Sergeant Gerhart gave his warning, but it was too late. Is that true, Sarge? The Sororitas are with the governor. So that is not a rumor? That message even got the Inquisition involved now. No one in their right mind would mention the Inquisition if it ain't real. Lately, there was a rumor going around that the initially neutral Sororitas had shown up alongside the forces of the incumbent governor in the civil conflict. Nusquam was a civilized imperial world that held the seat of the planetary governor as the highest office and other branches of the imperium as ruling subsidiaries. As such, the fact that a whole order Minoris was here despite the world not being under the direct control of the ecclesiarchy was a rarity indeed. Even so, like the rest of the Imperium, members of Adeptus Sororitas were widely viewed as symbols of piousness on Nusquam. The Order held enough sway on the public's opinion, and their recent support towards Catalina had been largely downplayed by Kythan's faction. But this suppression could not keep going on for long, which was part of the reasons they had pushed for a swift conclusion. Once Kythan held the office there was little the Sororitas could do as against the host of the planet but to file protests, but such actions might as well be spitting at the sea. For the common soldiers on the planet though, the Sororitas enjoyed an idol-like status with their reputation of being well-trained for combat, zealous ferocity in battle and access to usage of iconic war gear like power armor and bolters. That was why a blanket gag order was in place forbidding the common troopers from discussing the matter in an attempt to prevent it from eroding the troops' morale. Specialist Lantis, turn the communicator off if you can't switch around that message. The rest of you shut it. Or I will be forced to dash, Sergeant Gerhart was dropping another warning when the Torox transport suddenly came to a halt. Losing his balance, Gerhart toppled to the side, a loud thud was heard as he banged his head on the inside of the truck with his prized caddy and pattern helmet. Thrown damn it. Driver, what the hell are you doing? The sudden stop had made the big man divert his wrath while the rest of the squad kept their silence as they knew better than to be on the bad side of the sergeant when he got really pissed. Sorry, sir but the indomitable fury has suddenly stopped moving. The driver replied. That got the rest of the squad to check on the leading Bane Blade's super heavy tank from their visual slit. Yeah, she has stopped moving, Sarge. What the? Suddenly there was a loud thud on the roof of the Torox and an explosion of sorts happened. Everyone flinched at the sound and someone cried out, We are being shelled. The whole squad panicked and expected massive explosions to follow, but none came. In the eerie silence inside the compartment, a constant popping sound could be heard outside of their transport while the same message asking them to choose wisely was repeating itself. The Emperor protects. The Emperor protects. Gerhardt muttered to himself with a shaken voice for a while before finally turning to his subordinate to vent his frustration. Specialist Lantis. Didn't I order you to turn that thing off? I did turn it off, Sarge. Lantis replied meekly while adjusting his spectacles with a trembling hand. Sarge, you need to take a look at this. Ignatham's calm voice had everyone's attention. Her heart took a look at what the trooper was indicating, and he gasped. What in the name of, the sergeant said while opening the rear hatch of the vehicle. Outside the vehicle, everything on the ground level was covered with a layer of white smoke. Above them, some unknown flyers flying in formations could be seen. Sarge, I am afraid to ask, but have we been bamboozled? This does not look like an easy victory for me. Sela asked, where are our flyers? Why does it look like they have total air superiority over us? Over their head up in the sky, a few flyers could be spotted flying, and the same message they had heard repeatedly inside their vehicle could be heard reverberating across the field. Are those, the Nunchus Hailers? Those things only ever came out during special big church events. So we are really going up against the sisters and the Inquisition? This is madness. Meanwhile, inside the leading Bane Blade Indomitable Fury, Lord General Luther von Norden, Supreme Field Commander of the Northern Grand Army, was hit by a grim realization something was really amiss with the development of this battle. First off, communications between his army with the rear elements was suddenly lost, 
no one from his battle group could make contact with the headquarters nor rearguard General Boren. Then their long-range Vox network seemed to be hijacked, broadcasting the same repeating message asking them to surrender. Their enemy had even bothered to send Lod Hailer flyers to bombard them with the same message, signaling their loss of air superiority. Just moments ago they were shelled by artillery rounds. Thankfully those were just smokescreen shells, but the shelling was so accurate he had a distinct feeling they were being taunted. With the realization that the whole army could be moving into a trap, he ordered the battle group to a grinding halt. Sure enough, after his battle formation halted their movement, forward observers reported the path in front was hit by the next wave of smoke bombardment, rendering everything in a blanket of white smoke and confirming his hunch that their default route had been anticipated. Have we been totally outmaneuvered? Luther could not fathom such a thing happening at this very moment. Catalina's side had never displayed such expertise and Kythan's camp had had the upper hand on almost every engagement until now. Lord General, his right-hand man, a junior officer, approached him gingerly, breaking his thought process. Someone is on the line and wishes to talk to you. Who? She claims to be a daughter of the Emperor, currently representing the combined will of Adeptus Sororitas, Adeptus Mechanicus, and the Holy Inquisition in supporting Lady Catalina. Talk, huh? The Lord General's eyes narrowed, that means they do not possess enough leverage to deal with all of us yet and wish to buy time. Have you all worked out where the smoke shells originated from yet? My Lord, from the evidence so far, we believe the shells originated from our back line. So, General Boren has betrayed us or somehow Catalina's forces actually took over his command. At any rate, they could not have sent more than an elite strike force to do the job. I agreed on that assessment, Lord. Your orders. Send Colonel Arnold's 144th Mobile Infantry Division to find out what is happening back there. Make sure we take back control of our artillery battalions. If found to be at fault, General Boren does not have to survive. Affirmative. Something fishy is happening. Without stable back-end support dragging this engagement will be a great disadvantage to us. Prepare to move the whole battle group forward. We are diverting from the original plan and going straight in. In the meantime, let me talk to whoever this person is. I turned off the communication line and let out an inward sigh. It was too optimistic to think we could have resolved all this without further bloodshed. So the talks broke down and it seemed like we would be doing this the hard way. Lord General Luther von Norden was not intimidated by us dropping smoke screens on his forces one bit. The general had also refused my request for holographic communication thus my halo trick was denied and we negotiated via voice only. As a result, I did not have much to work with on him. From his profile, I could see the man was a fierce-looking, hawkish individual who had spent his entire adult life in the military, climbing his way through the ranks with a combination of competency and a tireless work ethic. Background-wise, he came from a family with deep ties to the established noble houses of the planet and was a distant uncle to Kai then, Catalina's half-brother. Luther was proving harder to deal with than I expected. But then again, I knew for the Lord General, this war was more than a civil dispute, it was personal. From the information we dug out on him, it was widely known decades earlier Luther had lost his beloved and only son in what was a messy love affair that had involved Catalina. The general had hidden that grudge well, but apparently it had secretly manifested into his life's mission to bring the governor down. Now that he had the one and only chance to see it into fruition, no amount of reasoning could sway his resolve. Even the fact that Kaithen von Cleus had retreated from the theater of war did not seem to bother him much. It might even have the opposite effect since that meant Luther literally answered to no one but himself on this battlefield, with close to half a million troops and a lot of battle tanks under his command. From the brief talk, I had the impression he was convinced either our actions were some form of trickery or we did not really have the means to stop his forces. At this point, nothing short of the emperor himself in his full glory with a whole great crusade fleet appearing in the sky will change his current course of action. This stubborn old geezer is going to get a lot of people killed. The same rigid military structure that had enabled us to take over the rear line of the rebel forces now prevented us from convincing the bulk of the main force to surrender. Shivering slightly from the accumulated strain of ceaselessly using my ability to manage the operation, I gathered my strength before resolving myself for the inevitable big battle that would result in mass casualties for the rebels. But better the rebels die than dragging the safety of me and my associates together with the future of this planet down the drain. I am sorry a lot of you guys will have to die a wasteful death. Crypto, you heard what he said. I sent. Affirmative. The calculus did put the odds of convincing him to surrender at less than 
The general's response is within the predicted perimeters as logic and loyalty are no longer his primary operational motive. Are you happy you can test your toys now? Emotional gratification unnecessary, data collection and live test of the experimental approach to warfare is the priority. Usage of the term toys is incorrect for the hardware involved. The Dominus answered without skipping a beat. So is everything ready for the battle? Affirmative. Hold on. I am receiving a vox from Inquisitor Thorn. It appears to be urgent. Patching him in. A system chime sounded, signaling Thabra's participation. Dominus. Has the engagement with the rebel main army started yet? Can you get Syrian in here too? The Inquisitor's voice barged into our virtual communication. Something about the way he sounded made me realize this could be serious. I am here, Inquisitor. We are just about to make contact with the rebel main force. What is the urgent news? Serene? Good. You must listen to what I am about to say carefully. We have just uncovered important leads to the Chaos Cult working behind the scene. I believe they are planning to use a blasphemous ritual together with an ancient artifact to summon powerful warp entities over. Oh, this is serious, seriously bad. Chaos cultists cooking up long-term schemes to bring down worlds is totally a thing in this universe. I was so busy preparing for the war I had totally overlooked the very reason Thabris was on this planet, chasing insidious chaos cults. To my understanding, this particular ritual utilizes the recently departing souls who had died of violent deaths to fuel its potency. In short, everyone on the planet involved in this civil war is but a sacrificial pawn in their scheme. If possible, do not engage the rebel army until this is resolved. Stunned by the news, I took another look at the tactical overview and watched in horror as the Grand Rebel Army started moving again. This time, they were going straight to our defensive line. Chapter 28 Grand Trap An emergency virtual meeting was held just before the biggest engagement with the Rebel Army happened. Holographic busts of all the important people were arranged in a circle as the urgent discussion went down on virtual space. Chaos cultists? and a blasphemous ritual utilizing departing souls as fuel to open up a warp portal and summon demons on my planet. Catalina voiced her disbelief. The level of shock she experienced shattered the joy she had experienced earlier today. The ritual site appears to have quite a formidable defense with void shield generators. Orbital bombardment won't work. Inquisitor Thorn had tapped into the rapid response force we had reserved for the renegade Astartes to deal with the cultists. He and his team are heading towards the site as we speak. But the target destination is quite a distance away. It will take one and a half standard Terran hours just for the strike force to reach there. Cryptor notified. So, this was why my lady was pushing for a peaceful resolution. Your boundless foresight and wisdom astounds us. Praised Canonist D. Dinah with a bow, and the rest of the Palatines followed suit. But I was feeling unwell, and we had no time for these Sasuga. Shenanigans. So I quickly and lightly brushed off the compliments and brought the topic back to its course. We are but moments away from engaging the main rebel army, and as outrageous as it sounds, our main priority now is to scale down the potential casualties for both sides before the ritual is dealt with. Fortunately, I had brainstormed with Dominus Cycle before on such matters, and we had come up with some solutions to minimize casualties on both sides. I summarized. I will have to respectfully disagree on that statement. Surprisingly, Cryptora refuted me and he continued, Almost all of these solutions were solely pushed by you in one of our much earlier discussions. I take no credit for such extreme approaches to non-lethal resolutions. Bless the omniscia, these could now be applied to our current situation, largely thanks to your foresight. His words brought me another round of applause from the sisters. Even some of the Nusquamese were joining in, making the meeting even more awkward for me. I did come up with some outrageous ideas in my naive attempt to save lives in our previous discussions never expecting them to be implemented for real. Cryptor continued, At any rate, I had taken the liberty of putting down some of those ideas into executable formations and engagement protocols just in case we have use of it, like now. Fortunately, our forces are already in place and ready. We just have to change the method of engagement. With cooperation from you all, we could in theory massively cut down casualties until the heretical ritual is dealt with. The Dominus then started distributing the detailed information of his plan, again doing the real work here. Very well, let's do this. I declared, and the emergency virtual meeting concluded in high spirits. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Soon after the meeting right in the afternoon, the Grand Northern Army finally made contact with our forces. Banking on their advantage of dictating the engagement and having better trained battle tank companies, the rebels tried to push through the defensive line by concentrating their forces in one spot. Responding to this, 
we sprang our trap. First, we bombarded the whole area with smokescreen shells from our artillery units, rendering visibility on the field close to nothing for a while, slowing their progress to a crawl. Kryptorer then started to conduct his massive experimental warfare on the rebels. Taking full advantage of our total air superiority, he deployed thousands of experimental probes from the air and had them swarmed over the rebels' tank formation. Utilizing sophisticated Auspex readings, he was able to pinpoint the position of each and every tank in the rebels' formation and started detonating probes on their tracks. Immobilizing half of the spearhead tanks and leaving the rest in an awkward position on whether to press forward or leave their compatriots behind. Next, he proceeded on doing the same with all the outlying vehicles of the battle formation, effectively attempting to trap the whole army with their own immobilized vehicles. Finally, a portion of his probe swarm was dedicated to taking out the mobile artillery in the rebel army to deny them their indirect fire capabilities. The small number of mobile artillery tanks in the rebel army group, be it Basilisk, Colossus, Griffin, Manticore, Medusa, or Wyvern tanks, were all hunted down and had their primary weapon disabled by a suicidal probe detonating at a critical point. A few unfortunate incidents did occur as some of the artillery tanks were obliterated outright when a probe was detonated too close to their ammunition. I winced internally every time one of these rare cases occurred. Alarmed by this unforeseen development, the rebels tried their best to shoot down the probes. Soon tracers of small arms fire were observed from their formation as they tried their best to bring the probes down. Good luck with that with all the smoke and the chaotic situation, and that was before taking the agility of the probes into account. Kryptor then took advantage of the chaos to sneak in his sophisticated spy probes and attach them to the turrets of the leading Baneblade super heavy tanks. With my authority ability, we easily bypassed their security protocols and managed to covertly tap into all their communications. When the frontmost elements of the rebel tank formations finally met with the defenders, more troubles awaited them. Knowing exactly where they would strike, we had placed Catalina's most capable tank hunter units in entrenched positions to meet their assault head on. Units of Mechanicus Onager Dune crawlers armed with neutron lasers were present at key areas to provide accurate fire support, immobilizing tank after tank with their pinpoint accuracy. In this clash, we would make a point of immobilizing and destroying the primary weapons of the first few rows of enemy tanks with precision fire from our units and suicide probes, creating a barrier of lame duck units at the forefront of the rebel armor spearhead to further by time. A makeshift system had been set up, enabling Cryptorer to share targeting data acquired from the Mechanicus' sophisticated sensors with all friendly units. Such features enabled the governor's forces to operate optimally even under the heavy cover of smoke screens, firing anti-tank rounds at the maximum distance to disable more rebel tanks. With me keeping tabs of their command chatter and providing a god's point of view over the entire battlefield to direct resources, we were able to outgun the rebels despite the majority of our forces being less capable in actual combat performance. Putting up a fierce fight against the rebels' armor advances with all our stacked up advantages. Meanwhile, the rebels struggled to bring their superior tank numbers and gunnery to bear. Working in very difficult conditions of low visibility due to smoke screens and suffering from constant communication errors thanks to me messing with their short-range Vox via spy probes scattered in the field. Soon the rebels' armor assaults were hindered by an ever-increasing number of immobilized and disabled vehicles. Any hostile vehicle that could break through our lines of fire would be visited by one of Crypterer's suicide probes and had its track blown off, halting any tangible progress. Then to top it all off, in the chaotic mess, Cryptor exploited our total air superiority again to drop a massive EMP bomb on the Rebels' battle formation, carefully calculating the area of effect so the electromagnetic pulse would mostly hit hostile units. Contrary to what a typical sci-fi movie would have you believe, most military hardware was shielded against such an attack, but the Dominus was aiming to cripple their targeting systems and add further woes to their already dire situation. According to the very first plan Cryptor had suggested, this would be the point where we dropped all the artillery rounds to finish the stranded rebels off, but we were not helping that dark ritual today. The glorious combat Lord General Luther was hoping for had become a quagmire of impossible scenarios. All these actions so far provided the perfect cover for the bulk of Catalina's reserve forces to quietly deploy further outside of the combat area. Exploiting our total control over the information the rebels were receiving on the battlefield, we were able to slowly encircle Luther's army without him noticing. After about an hour or so of nonstop grueling tank battle where we were busy disabling hostile tanks while the other side was basically shooting blind, 
the rebels finally caught on that they were in a hopeless tarpit situation. Anticipating they would be making their next move soon, I had my attention focused on the inside of the leading Bane Blade Indomitable Fury. Despite the overall environment being noisy as heck as the inside of a tank operating on a battlefield should be, with all the sensors available and my superhuman hearing, I still managed to make out what was being said. My lord, the latest reports are in. Someone said inside the tank. Let me see. A voice I recognized to be Luther replied. There were hints of frustration in his tone. A while later, the Lord General spoke again. What in the Emperor's name? This casualty number is no mistake. Yes, my lord. I double-checked it myself. We have fully engaged the enemy on the front. And you meant to tell me until now we have a lot more immobilized vehicles than casualties. Confirmed, it seemed to be a deliberate act of the enemy. So, what are they playing at? Are we being toyed with? There was a brief moment of uncomfortable silence before he continued with a snarl. Unacceptable. Relay my new order. Send in the forward infantry divisions for a frontal assault. The enemy should be overcompensating for anti-armor warfare. We will see if they can continue to toy with us. Yes, Lord. It was then I backed off from eavesdropping and warned the commanders of our side on the impending infantry waves. Thus the rebels switched from armored to massed infantry assault, sending waves of infantry battle formations through their immobilized vehicles to charge our defensive lines. Anticipating that, what awaited their infantry charge was an unconventional formation of Sororitas in the front with mass Skatarii rangers behind. Under the supervision of their canonists and palatines, the battle sisters were ordered not to return fire unless they were absolutely sure their shots would not kill the rebels. Before long, the rebel infantry formation reached our line like the waves of a human tsunami. It was then Crypterer invoked the Mechanicus Protector Doctrina Imperative Protocol for his entire army affecting all the Skatarii troops on the field via enhanced data tethers that were scattered across his units. The protocol temporarily buffed all the Skatarii units to enhance their already deadly marksmanship. The rangers were soon putting their extreme gunnery skills to use, but were ordered to take only non-lethal shots. Thus another really weird battle went underway. Already outranging the standard lost guns by a huge margin and equipped with advanced optics, the rangers went to work, subjecting the rebel troops with pinpoint accurate small arms fire before they even had the chance to shoot back. Each time a ranger would fire his or her galvanic rifle, a rebel trooper would either lose a weapon or suffer a non-lethal wound to the leg or arm. The downed troopers would then be ignored and soon a huge number of wounded or unarmed troops were reported on the front, straining resources and morale for the rebels. Those making further progress charging into the defensive lines would be met by a line of battle sisters who would not shoot back. Fighting the Sororitas alone was already quite a hard sell for most of the rebel troopers, adding to the fact that the sisters were not shooting back brought a whole new level of eeriness. Most were unnerved and refused to engage the Sororitas. For those who pushed on to engage, the battle sisters' power armor and entrenched position made a mockery of their desperate efforts. Some had reported having been shot at by the sisters. However, the bolter rounds always just exploded inches from their feet, cementing the notion they were only firing warning shots, but could kill them any time if the sisters wished. While these odd standoffs were happening, the Skatarii rangers at the back line never stopped on their assigned task, picking off weapons and delivering non-lethal blows with typical Mechanicus cold machine-like efficiency. Overhead, the Nuncious hailers continued their flyovers broadcasting messages asking the rebels to surrender. Such displays of dominance were soon having a catastrophic effect on the morale of the rebels who were saddled with an increasing number of weaponless and wounded soldiers, resulting in mass surrenders in certain areas. These surrendering troops would be handled by the governor's regular units who were stationed behind the Skatarii, freeing the more elite sisters and rangers from the burden of such operations while the process was being repeated and recorded. The recorded picked feed were then displayed on the Nuncious Imagifier flyers for their flyovers resulting in another chain reaction of surrendering across the front line. In the midst of the oddly one-sided firefight, a squad of really dedicated rebels successfully forced their way into a line of battle sisters, only to be bested by the sisters in the ensuing hand-to-hand -hand combat. Swiftly being pummeled by power armor fists and awarded with black eyes and broken noses. After that, they were then unceremoniously dragged out of the combat zone to become prisoners of war. Soon the battlefield became flooded with Vox from the rebel side calling for medical aid and support. I was closely monitoring everything through all the data feeds, reacting to the action of the rebels and swiftly issuing general orders to the relevant on-field commanders while keeping tabs on the information coming out from the indomitable fury. 
This continued for a while until Lord General Luther von Norden's frustration reached a feverish point. Soon he had called for a Vox meeting with all his generals to decide on the next course of action. Wham! The sound of a bare fist hitting a flat surface came inside the Bane blade after an overview report was delivered. It was followed by Luther cursing out loud by the emperor's teeth. My lord, the rate of our men being either wounded or disarmed is worrying. This is unsustainable. The fact that most of our troops who had made contact with the enemy were left alive has severely strained our resources and morale. We are getting requests on orders with what to do with whole battalions of wounded men. Luther breathed heavily for a while before finally answering, It is fine. We have reserves. What about the key objectives? Any progress? The weakest points of the enemy defenses had been identified. Finally, some good news. How is the reorganization of our operational vehicles coming along? On that front, we will be ready soon. Of all the immobilized units, a small portion were managed to be repaired on the field. Good. Give the orders. We will be moving out soon. My lord, what about the wounded? Leave the wounded behind to continue the standoff on the stranded sectors. We are making an all-out attack with everything. That includes the left and right flank groups. We will all be pushing at the least guarded part of the enemy line. This ends now. One of the generals communicating on their Vox network wanted to voice his opinion. My lord, should. Say no more. The lord general sharply rebuked before his subordinate could finish a statement. It is decided. This time I will lead with the indomitable fury at the front. The left and right flank groups will join with the same example. The intensity of his voice made me wince and suddenly I found myself grabbing the podium to stabilize myself as another wave of dizziness hit me again. Behind me came the surprised gasps of Welmana and Verita. My condition had deteriorated until the point I could no longer hide my weakened state from them. My strength and focus were rapidly slipping away. Meanwhile, the mad general was hellbent on sending his entire army on a desperate mission for personal vendetta and would be starting his suicide run soon. Chapter 29, Beautiful World The long hours of constant strain had finally taken their toll. My body was starting to fail at the worst possible time. The world felt like spinning just when the rebel army was about to launch their most critical all-out assault. I gritted my teeth as new waves of dizziness assaulted my senses. Overwhelmed, I almost collapsed to the ground but found myself being held up by Verita. It was great to have a medical professional nearby. Serene, the fluctuation of your health vitals are reaching unacceptable levels. I have taken the liberty of directing the encirclement operation. Please stand down. Kryptor advised, finally breaking his silence on my condition which I was sure he was aware of. Yes, please take over on that but I am not standing down. The most crucial part has just begun. The Bane Blades are coming out. Is Operation Kidnapping viable with the on-field situation? Yes, the conditions are viable. Then we will push on with it. Get the elements ready. Understood. Lady Serene, you seem unwell. Please take a rest. Verita advised while helping me to stand. No, Verita. Not now. Not when so many lives are on the line and the chance to end this is finally here. I replied with some difficulty. I need to see this part through. They are starting to move. All three Bane Blades appear to be moving into frontal positions. Are you sure you can continue? Kryptor asked with a hint of concern. Truth be told, I'm not sure but this needs to be done. Verita, release me. After this, I will take a rest. I ordered and the sister reluctantly complied. After steadying myself, I dove back into the god's point of view again and saw the full offensive coming. An impressive amount of vehicles and troops were moving towards our line. Further out, a huge bulk of our forces that were deployed further away earlier were now following Kryptor's directive and started coming around to encircle the whole rebel army. This was the final phase of our grand trap. Now we just needed to kidnap their leaders and box them in. I watched intently as all three battle groups of the rebel army started moving forward, each battle group led by a Bane blade flanked by many battle tanks. They had learned their lesson. This time their formation had teams of mixed infantry squads and fighting vehicles acting as forward elements while the tank cruised at combat speed right behind them. I even saw an ogren leading one of the infantry formations. There was no avoiding mass casualties if we directly clashed with such solid formations. Meanwhile, smokescreen shells and tricks were running low on our side, so it was time for my final light show and operation kidnapping. The basic idea was simple enough. I would try to use my abilities to stun the whole rebel army by totally overwhelming their communication network plus distracting them with my halo light show. While that was being done, we would try to kidnap the Bane Blades and cover our act with the last supplies of our smoke screens. 
I had always got a soft spot for giant tanks and Crypterer had a deep respect for venerable war machines. So it was a no-brainer for us to cook up an elaborate plot during last night's lengthy discussions to try getting the Bane Blades over intact. As a bonus, it also had the potential to sever the Rebels' leadership since all their battle group leaders were using Bane Blades as mobile command centers. Due to the ritual, this part had instead become the do-or-die crucial point of the entire battle. We had the planning done in detail, however what we did not anticipate was the condition I was in when the crucial moment approached. My body was still shivering when Crypterer dropped his update again. They are coming now. Back-end connections with all three Bane Blades confirmed. All elements for the final light show and kidnapping stand ready. If this fails, we will have no choice but to incur massive casualties. How long do I need to keep it up once this started? About five minutes. Tell me when it is time. Understood. Tottering between staying awake and fainting, I was conserving my strength while waiting. After an indeterminable amount of time had passed, Crypterer finally dropped the green light. Serene, it is time. Time to go. I solidified my focus and activated thought acceleration as a massive amount of command pulse burst off from me into the battlefield. I took over all the Vox networks. Next, I got ready for the final light show. Turning selfie mode on the skull probe, I relayed my visual and audio to all Nunch's hailer and Imagifier flyers. You, this never failed to cringe me up, but it was necessary. Finally, I sent directives to the machine spirits of all three Bane Blades, overriding their operators and order the super-heavy tanks to immediately go to their designated spots on the battlefield at maximum speed while shutting down their targeting support systems. By then, I felt so weak and had nothing prepared to say for this final act. In the back of my mind, I was thinking maybe just go in, spam my halo while scolding the rebels a bit. As I was lost in thoughts the data load reached me and it was so straining my vision became blurred, I realized this might actually be too much for me and panicked. Oh, this is bad. I felt like slowly being crushed by the very air around me as the data streams started to look so distant away, nothing but thunderous thuds of heartbeats in my ears. Thump, 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 thump. Too fast. How is it that my heartbeat sounded so incredibly fast? Oh right. I have two hearts. Throne. I need five more minutes. My mind was collapsing. I felt myself clutching at straws to maintain my synapses but we are so close. Another wave of nausea hit me like a truck, sending me dangerously close to fainting. In desperation, I bit down on my lower lip, using the sensation to fortify what was left of my concentration. Verita was shouting something nearby, but no meaning came through. My perception of time had become haywire as thought acceleration became unstable and reality started slipping away from me. Five minutes. I need to just stay awake for five more minutes. What else is five minutes long? A walk? Wait. I can't leave the podium. A song? Where can I? Hold on. There is one here in my pendant, and its playtime is exactly five minutes. Working with the last ounce of strength in my coherent mind, I managed to squeeze out a command pulse. Play Beautiful World. MP3. A familiar melody started playing in my head, slowly and softly at first, but before I knew it, the song got louder and louder until it resonated throughout my warped sensory perception. It's only love. It's only love. My last bit of consciousness was clinging to the rhythm of the song like a desperate drowning sailor holding onto a piece of floating wood in a raging ocean. Lend me your strength, Sensei Yatada. That was my last thought before my consciousness finally shattered and my very existence became the song itself. Lady Serene. Lady Serene. Verita and Welmano were trying their best but received no response. Serene's eyes remained shut and she stood as still as a statue on the gigantic podium. This. This is not good. Is it even medically possible for her to remain standing while fainted? Wellmana asked her companion frantically, but Verita was way ahead, voxing to the support team nearby to prepare for a medical emergency and Kira had headed out to guide the support team over. Verita had just requested further assistance on asking for a levitating stretcher when suddenly a golden halo much larger and brighter than the one they had witnessed manifested on Serene. As the podium became covered in holy radiance, both sisters found themselves kneeling down reflexively and they watched in awe as the feeling of power emanating from their holy daughter continued to climb. While Serene had remained motionless, her halo steadily became brighter and brighter until it felt like a miniature sun. My lady. Wellmana asked but still received no response. Just as the sisters thought the events unfolding before them were unusual enough, 
To their utter bewilderment, every device with a speaker within their vicinity suddenly came alive playing a strange instrumental music and Serene started singing in her trance-like state. On the battlefield just moments earlier, the final assault of the rebels' forces came face to face with an eerie sight. Their enemies were where they should be in the distance, but on top of the defensive line were squadrons of hovering nunches Imagifier flyers with huge holograms underneath them displaying the portrait of a regal lady with her eyes closed. Undeterred by the odd formation awaiting them, the rebel army pressed forward, determined to finally have an honest fight with their enemy and were eager to redeem themselves for all their failings today. Then the strange sight got stranger still as a blinding halo with a peculiar quality manifested on the huge holograms of the lady. With that an overwhelming presence was felt across the battlefield and an unspoken message delivered, stand down. Your sovereign is here. The strange sight was extremely intimidating to the lesser-willed individuals while compelling subservience to those people with a stronger sense of faith. While their mileage may vary, the result was ultimately the same. Most rebel troopers stopped marching forwards and many even knelt down. Even seasoned tank commanders were unconsciously putting their war machines to a halt at the sight of it. Then the armies watched in disbelief as the lady in the giant hologram started to sing. A strange but pleasant melody started to play across the battlefield. It dominated all the channels on the long-range Vox, it took over the short-range Vox, it blared in the confines of combat vehicles, and it resonated in the sky with all the nunchus hailers broadcasting the song from high up. It's only love. It's only love. Mashamonigai Hatatsadek, Kanao Nara the song went on and on, singing in a language no one understood but sounded strangely nostalgic. Close to a million souls watched and listened in stunned silence as what could only be described as the largest open-air solo performance ever happened right before them during a war. Beautiful world, beautiful boy. Meanwhile, back at the podium of wires, Verita and Welmano were freaking out as Serene continued to sing her otherworldly song. What is going on? Why is she singing and what language is that? It was Verita's turn to ask questions as she pestered the scholar about the unfathomable sight before them. This sounds like ancient Terran? But it seemed mixed. I... I don't really know. Welmana was totally flustered and could not make any sense of what was going on. Little did she know at that exact moment the same song was permeating on the whole battlefield. Back on the battlefield, the lady in the holograms continued to sing with her eyes closed. She was gently swaying to the rhythm of her song, her voice soothing, and the sight of her radiant halo had a pacifying effect, making people instinctively lower their weapons. People on both sides of the battlefield had their eyes glued to the unusual event while those further away from the spectacular sight were mesmerized by the unusual song echoing everywhere. Soon, no one was fighting but the battle formations had already been locked in motion so the encirclement of the rebel army continued. During the brief surreal period when the song lasted, only a small portion of the rebel forces were aware that their bane blades had suddenly broken ranks from their respective battle groups. They watched in awe as the super-heavy tanks charged at full cruising speed straight into the enemy lines under the cover of suspiciously well-timed smoke screens, leaving their confused comrades behind with little way to notify the rest of the army on what was going on. Meanwhile, inside the indomitable fury, Lord General Luther was experiencing a world of trouble. Moments ago, his bane blade was suddenly moving on its own accord and had been pushing forward with maximum speed towards the enemy while his contact with the outside world was totally cut off as the strange song had taken over all the Vox network. Unable to contact anyone. It is all the same song on all the channels. The communication officer lamented. I have no control. The driver could be heard yelling as the indomitable fury continued moving forward. My lord, the main turret is turning 180 by itself. At this rate, we won't even have the main gun to protect ourselves. Another crew member yelled. After watching the ridiculous events unfolding for a while, Luther snapped back to his senses and quickly went to the engine room himself. The Lord General was looking for the Mechanicus engine seer who was dedicated to the service of indomitable fury. If there was anyone who could bring back the control of his tank, it would be one of the cocks. Zelton. Luther bellowed. Receiving no response, he went into the depths of the engine room. Engine seer Zelton. Where are you? Down in the engine room, it was cramped, dark and noisy as hell. The Lord General himself seldom ventured down here and most crew members were only too happy to leave it as the engine seer's sole domain. It took a while for Luther's eyes to adjust for the dimly lit space. For a moment the Lord General was convinced his engine seer had somehow disappeared until he saw a robbed figure hunched at the very corner of the engine room. The tech adept seemed transfixed on something in front of him. Zelton. Throne damn it. Why won't you respond? 
Luther crouched over and grabbed the engine seer by his shoulder. It was only then the engine seer seemed to realize he was not alone. My, my lord, Zelton stammered. My crew has lost control of the indomitable fury. What is going on with my tank? Are we being hijacked? Luther demanded. Hijack. The engine seer answered dreamily until a hint of realization appeared on the still human-looking part of his face, and he quickly refuted the Lord General. No, my lord, nothing like that. Zelton replied confidently. His voice was so calm in this apparent crisis it was surprising even to the Lord General and he demanded, What do you mean? The tank is heading towards the enemy line without control even as we speak. Get it back to our control now. I can't. Do you see this, my lord? Zelton pointed to a small glowing screen in front of them. Luther took a peek and saw nothing comprehensible to him. I see it, but nothing makes sense to me. Explain plainly and quickly. Zelton nodded and continued. I have never seen anything like it myself before. But this, this appears to be a genuine administrative level command coming from the outside. Meaning, meaning a higher authority is here, my lord. Someone very close to the source of Omnisia is on this planet, and that person is currently giving commands to the indomitable fury. As children and disciples of the machine god, we must obey. Luther froze. So you see, the indomitable fury is not being hijacked. It is merely obeying orders from a higher authority, like children obeying their parents, soldiers obeying their general or space marines obeying the emperor. The Lord General opened his mouth, but no words came out. Now if you will excuse me, I need to attend to my duties. Zelton finished his explanation. He then turned towards the engine, knelt down and started kowtowing to it while chanting, O oh great Omnisia, I hear and obey thy command. For a moment, Luther considered shooting the engine seer, but in the end decided against it. The Lord General reasoned Zelton's service will still be needed in the future after he wins the war. For now, he just needed to salvage the situation. Back at the podium of wires, the song was finally over. Serena immediately shut down and collapsed to the ground, sending both Verita and Welmina into utter panic. Chapter 30-something came forth. Destinies collided. Fates changed. Much earlier, when the rebels were about to make their first major push just after Inquisitor Thabaris dropped his urgent warning, Something unusual happened at the ritual site. Fate has it that somewhere in the Immaterium, swimming in the eternal and infinite Empyrean Sea, an ageless consciousness took notice of a faint calling originating from beyond space and time. Made by an intelligence with an understanding of the ether, there was a right type of ring to this calling. Several lesser Neverborn were already flocking to it. Like carrion flies, they loitered around the source of summoning and were licking at offerings pouring through the veil gathering strength to pass through space-time to directly feast in that world. The arrival of the ageless consciousness startled the lesser Neverborn. Like an apex predator entering into a scene of primal feasting, its lesser kin scattered hurriedly to avoid its wrath, leaving the opening solely to it. The unknowable thing investigated the source and let a part of its impossible self sample the other side for the briefest of period and found it lacking. The calling offered the essence of blood and souls of sentient beings but the quantity was petty and its initial offering paltry for its appetite. There were many other similar happenings which offered much more substantial rewards. Unimpressed, the consciousness decided to ignore this calling when a certain aspect of what it sampled caught its attention. There, within the myriad of information it tasted was a faint residue of a very rare type of existence, an existence which would be an anathema to its kind, one that a never-born would consider being its bane. Intrigued, for a moment it thought of further investigating before deciding whatever it had sensed was too weak and not worth the attention. It would hardly recoup its energy and resources. Still, it had really disliked the hint of that existence, so much so the idea of leaving it alone greatly displeased it. Kill it. Such anathema called upon itself to be erased, but the tediousness of doing it, the energy involved and the insignificance of that existence's level of strength made it teetered on the very edge of indecisiveness. Do something about it? Leave it alone? Leave it be. No, kill it. Leave it be. Kill it. Why not both? Finally decided on its course of action, the impossible thing pushed a tiny piece of itself over the edge of space and time. It then poured its rage and displeasure into that portion of itself, and then severed it. Go forth. With wordless directive it commanded its splintered self and imbued it with just enough power to cross the veil. Seek that which displeases us and erase it from existence. Sustain thyself with sentient essence on the other side. Do not return until no sentient being can be found in that world. Its splintered self groaned in agonizing acknowledgement, and with the granted energy it crossed the threshold of eternal horizons. 
Homing to the source of calling, it pushed itself through the veil between dimensions, and there it would take the form of screaming tormented rage made flesh. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Throne on Terra saves us all. Inquisitor Thabarus watched with unconcealed horror at the trail of carnage left by something truly massive. Along the path of wanton destruction it had left behind were the entrails of its many victims and vague chunks of human remains. Whatever it was, it had clawed its way out of an underground facility and left a hole on the side of a reinforced building the size of an Imperial Knight Super Heavy Walker. All the heavy weapons that guarded the facility were useless against it. The gory remains of their users and the weapons trashed stayed a silent testament to that. There was even an upside-down tank on the roof that was still burning with a raging fire. Well, this is something we don't see often enough, for once the heretics purged themselves and it looks like whatever they summoned was not under their control nor was it on their side. Interrogator Amale's unsolicited attempt at dry humor received no response. Track that thing. Have the task force secure the perimeter. Nobody gets in or out before this is over. Thabris ordered. Not waiting for a response, he opened a Vox call to his gunship. Tasia. Sir. Have the Flame Raven switch its heavy bolter ammunition to Psycannon bolts. Relay to the unrelenting vigilance to ready the exterminatus solution for immediate deployment. Sir. You heard me right. We have a breach, threat level maxima. Pray we do not have to deploy it. Sir. Thabarus closed the vox and could not help himself, but muttered a silent prayer for the order he just relayed. The emperor grants us strength. Please don't let it come to this. Then the notion that Cyrene was on the planet derailed his thought for a moment, but tried as he might, the image of her petite frame just could not size up with the level of threat they were facing. He sighed, shook his head to refocus, and turned to his retinue. Now. Do any of you have any idea of where it went? That way, sanctioned Psyker Fulton said as he pointed his staff in a direction, his eyes glowing with psychic power. It is moving fast. I can feel. It's red-hot anger. Added his partner, Salee. She was shivering from what she had sensed. Why going that way? What is in that direction? Ranter asked as he tried but failed to relax his grip on the hotshot volley gun, which would not be seeing any action in this raid operation. That direction gassed Acolyte Herlindia, but it was Thabaris who finished her sentence, the way to the battlefield. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Back on the battlefield, Lord General Luther von Norden was furious beyond words. From his point of view, his big day of triumph had been totally ruined by a never-ending amount of underhanded tricks and honorless subterfuge. As the ridiculous events unfolded one after another, accumulating to the present where the symbol of might of the Northern Grand Army was being driven away like a victim of Grand Theft Auto while his entire army was being distracted by a song. This was totally not how the Lord General had envisioned his day would turn out to be. When it became clear if Luther had stayed on the Bane Blade he would end up being kidnapped himself, the Lord General opted to climb out of the super-heavy tank and jumped off instead. The landing was harsh. Luther survived, but sprained his leg. His command squad who had followed him on the jump picked him up and luckily they were soon being picked up by a Torox transport that was following the Bane Blade not so far behind. Suffice to say, finding their supreme commander limping in the middle of a chaotic battlefield with a singing lady as the backdrop was not how Squad Gerhard had envisioned their day would turn out to be. After getting the Luther and his command squad inside, Squad Gerhard's Torox turned back towards their combat line. Passing through formations of tanks and troops who had stopped moving forward with its inside cramped up with the extra personnel and a gray-faced Lord General. Soon after that the song ended the Vox network, suddenly went back to normal again, and another chaotic hell broke loose as the absurdity of the battle situation became apparent to all. First, all three bay blades of the rebel army had been hijacked. Obeying an unknown directive the super-heavy tanks went to their designated spot and proceeded to shut down after arriving. Two out of three battle group commanders were still inside their tank when the battle sisters came knocking with melted guns. Both the kidnapped commanders surrendered in the following standoff. Meanwhile, the news of Syrian fainting sent a shockwave in Catalina's camp. Cryptorer took over as the overall commanding figure, but without Syrian's authority ability, they no longer held total dominance over the Vox network, allowing the rebels to finally utilize their Vox communication to some degree again. But what awaited them was a tsunami of bad news, the endless calls for medical aid, weapons and supplies, coupled with urgent reports of being surrounded by all sides flooded their vox as the encircling forces were finally being spotted. Evidently most troopers in the rebel camp had seen enough. Even the most tactically challenged soldier had realized their opposition was showing them a tremendous amount of mercy and restraint. When the holographic image and recordings of their battle group commanders surrendering to the Sororitas appeared in the air, 
the fighting will of the smaller battle groups fell apart and their next highest ranking officers soon declared their surrender. In the biggest battle group at the center, cracks were appearing, with troops stationed at the outermost layers silently slipping away to escape or surrender. As this battle was considered to be a civil dispute involving no Astra Militarum regiments, no commissars were present to go around shooting fleeing soldiers and soon there was an exodus of surrendering or fleeing troops. Some of the fleeing troops escaped to the path they came from, squeezing through the tiny gaps between Catalina's forces before they could complete their encirclement, since not incurring casualties was their primary objective at that moment. The governor's troops let the disorganized fleeing rebels pass through the gaps uncontested. To Luther's credit, a sizable portion of the most elite and diehard bunch of the rebel army had stayed with him as the encirclement was being completed. Surrounded on all sides with no way of escaping, it was a last stand, and soon a talk between the two sides was being held to discuss terms. Premonition. Something had arrived. Something huge. An angry twisted thing. A thing that should not have existed in this world. Its existence should not have been possible, but a price was paid. Be warned, it is here to seek you out. You, yes, you with their anathema's bloodline. Now an equal or greater price must be paid to see it gone or this world of man will die. Again, you are its target and the key to its banishment. I regained consciousness. The first thing I heard was Verita berating someone. She was sounding like a pissed-off girlfriend on a messy breakout, but that was so contradictory to my mental image of her. Verita. I called out. My voice sounded weak, surprising even myself. I opened my eyes and was immediately blinded by the bright medical light shining down at me. It made me reflexively raise my hand to block the illuminations. Someone gasped and grabbed my hand. It was Wellmana. Verita, Lady Syrian has woken up. Wellmana, where am I? Help me up. No, you need to stay down. She popped into my view, her face full of concerns. No, get me up. The war, what happened to the war? And. The thing. A cold chill went down my spine as the premonition I felt during my delirium state surfaced. Thanks to your song, the last I heard from the front line was that the war is being wrapped up. Wellmana answered reverently. Song. I was confused. Oddly enough, the level of respect coming from her to me seemed to have gone up a notch. Why is this happening after my shameful performance of fainting on the most critical battle? Lady Serene. Verita came running to me as Wellmana was helping me to sit up. My lady, is it true? I have tried to verify with the quartermaster of the fortress, but is it true you have not eaten a single meal since you're staying at the fortress? Meal. I was stumped for a moment before remembering I never once felt hungry and was being swamped by the never-ending amount of meetings ever since the start of my lodging at the fortress. Now that I think about it, I hardly even drank a sip of water. No, I have not eaten anything at the fortress. Verita choked on her breath upon hearing my answer, but before she could say anything more, a skull probe that had been silently hovering nearby became active and floated in front of me. Serene? My princess. Are you operational? It was Crypterer. I held my hand up at Verita and then pointed at the probe that shut down her impending berating. Crypto. Sorry I fainted. What happened while I was out? I have good news and bad news. Good news first. Your plan worked. We got all three Bane Blades and there were little casualties. The majority of the fighting had stopped and still no signs of the renegade Astartes. That concludes the good news. I gulped. Please continue. Now the bad news. Inquisitor Thorn arrived at the ritual site finding only it in ruins with dead cultists. A high threat level warp entity had come through and it had already left the site. While the Inquisitor did not inform me of this, but I know he had deemed its threat level to be serious enough to order his ship to prepare for exterminatus. Wait, what? What came through? By the Inquisitor's request, I had some of my reconnaissance assets tailing it now. Sending to you field imaging now, it is heading towards the center of the battlefield as we speak. An image popped up in my vision, confirming my dread. There amongst the landscape, flying at incredible speed was a gigantic horned humanoid entity with leathery wings, a bloodthirster, probably the angrier type. But why? Didn't we cut down the bloodshed to a very low level with the actions we had taken? And why was it in black color? A greater demon in the physical realm. Whatever it entails, I was guessing it was not as simple as shooting it down like in the video game. The very existence of this being was already defying the natural law of the universe. Crypto, how powerful is this thing? Can we send in mass soldiers and tanks to grind it down? Regarding that question, I had tried backtracking its path from the ritual site and found this. Relaying recorded picked feed to you now. Another vision popped up in my view. It seemed to be from the point of view of a skull probe. 
At first, I could not tell what I was seeing. It was as if my brain was refusing to acknowledge the ridiculous sight. After a short while like a switch being turned on, I saw the vision as what it was, a scene of pure carnage, the aftermath of some uber butchery. It was a field completely stained red and black with blood. Chunks of what appeared to be human parts, broken bones and random innards could be seen littering everywhere accompanied by a sea of burning wrecks. The level of violence needed to create this scenery was borderline satirical. Something was making a statement. From the clues gathered on site, this would be the 144th Mobile Infantry Division of the Rebel Army led by a Colonel Arnold. Kripterer continued to explain as the view on the field of carnage moved to a particular spot, focusing on a pile of splattered flesh. This appears to be the deceased colonel. The identification tag and what was left of the lower jaw is a match with the dental records. With this we can deduce conventional troops and tactics might be totally ineffective against this warp spawn. I was speechless. My survey of the site had also uncovered another interesting fact. The warp spawn appeared to be gaining strength, as evidence suggests the level of blunt trauma force applied to the troops was steadily increasing after the initial contact from this area. Kryptor continued to explain away, but my mind was already tuning out, looking at the larger picture and its implications. This thing was gaining strength by slaughtering people. If left alone it will just continue gathering power from all the killings, as it does so it might even summon more of its kin to escalate the slaughtering. My mind went to the billions of people here, the psychic beacon, and the incoming ships. Suddenly I saw nothing but a literal sea of blood. My blood ran cold. I shivered. This thing might be the end of us all. What am I supposed to do? Run away? We can still run, right? Leave this planet. Leave the beacon. Leave the people. Then I remembered the combined souls of all the people I saw in that sea of wishes and my pledge to the sisters. The premonition I experienced earlier came back to me like lightning. You are its target and the key to its banishment. Damn it. Throne damned it. I. I had made up my mind. Crypto. Yes, omniscient princess. I await your directive. Please send me the list of deployable secret weapons you are willing to depart for the final gambit of this venture. We will see if the situation is salvageable from there. It could be a hard sell, but using older toys to trade for shiny new ones should be a tempting prospect even for famous hoarders like them, and I was sure the Arch Dominus was keeping a few cards hidden. So I waited for the reply. Very well. And please get me a fast ride to the front line. I need to pick up my sword from Canonus D. Dina. Understood. Finally, have as many forces as possible under your command heading to it right now. We will need all the firepower we can get to light that thing up like the Emperor's Day Parade. Chapter 31 Destiny Calls My mind was made up. I would go and face the unusual greater demon in the field. I was afraid, terrified in fact, but running away now would mean throwing away the lives of billions of people without trying something first. I could never live with myself with that, especially since Syrian might be the only one who could do something about it. Earlier when it was but a million lives at stake, that pressure had already caused me a great deal of distress. I was sure my fragile psyche had no way of surviving a thousand more times worth of guilt. Before I even started walking, my heroic venture was already hitting obstacles as Sister Verita and Sister Welmina had ganged up to block my path while Kira looked on from the side. Lady Serene, where are you going? To the front line. Why? It is not safe out there. Nowhere is safe now. There has been an unusual warp breach. A greater demon of unknown nature now walks on this world. Inquisitor Thorn has already ordered the preparation for an exterminatus if we cannot stop it soon. Exterminatus, the subject of many memes, was the ultimate flexing action ordered by the highest authorities of the Imperium of Man to destroy a planet's biosphere and all life upon it. It was scorched earth tactics scaled up to a planetary level. Both sisters turned deathly pale at my statement. I pushed past them, walking towards an open field while using my authority to establish a priority vox call to the Inquisitor himself via Crypterer's skull probe. After some tries, it connected and I put it in speaker format so both sisters could hear the important conversation. Inquisitor. Serene? Thank the throne you are up. There has been an unfortunate development. I know about the warp breach and your preparation for the exterminatus. There is no hiding anything from you, is it? He sighed. Keep that as a last resort. I will be heading to the field and see what I can do about it. Very well. Do you have a way to stop it? For some reason, he sounded very calm and cold. It was then I remembered who I was speaking to. Is he already thinking of how to silence the masses if I am able to clean up this mess? Realizing what might be coming even after so much effort was put into saving lives made me furious inside. We had not come this far just to put up with this bullshit doctrine of treating the population like cheap dirt. After taking a deep breath, I answered the question in my calmest voice. Nothing concrete yet, but promise me you won't do anything rash like silencing all the witnesses to this occurrence like the aftermath of the First Armageddon War. 
To my knowledge, the first war for Armageddon was a truly titanic clash between the forces of chaos and the defenders of the Imperium of Man where a demon Primarch led a demonic assault on the hive world of Armageddon. The war itself was horrible enough, but its aftermath was arguably far worse. There was an ugly internal conflict when the Inquisition's decision to sterilize the entire surviving population of Armageddon and the Imperial troops that took part in the war, to maintain their policy of secrecy concerning the existence of demonic entities. According to the lore, untold millions died for being bystanders and billions more ended up in the direct crosshairs of fellow Imperials in said conflict. It had stood up as one of the darkest episodes of Imperial cover-ups gone wrong. I did not know if that sort of merciless standard operating procedure was something Fabris would subscribe to but it might not be far off. There has to be another solution to this than the usual methods the Inquisition employs. Going forward this might become more and more common, and we can't just start killing everyone every time one of these things comes through. I pushed with my valid reasons. I agree with you on that statement. He relented. While I understand we do not have the resources to screen thousands of troops for warp taint, I will look for a solution if we get through this. So promise me you will not enact mass killings to silence witnesses of this incident while I am alive. Fair enough, I promise. Will you swear to that in the name of my father? Very well. I swear to the God Emperor that I will not silence the witnesses to this conflict while you live. Thank you. I will be going now. Just as I cut the Vox call my mind registered three Mechanicus flyers approaching fast. My ride's here. I turned to the sisters, they both looked as pale as ghosts after hearing the grim developments. I. I'm coming with you. Wellmana blurted out. Me too. Verita followed. Are both of you serious? I am heading to where a greater demon is rampaging. Lady Serene. Wellmana protested with teary eyes. Please think about the tirade of condemnations canonist Eek Dino will be leveling at me should I leave you alone in this junction. Likewise, I will be accompanying you to the front line as my meager skill set might be called upon to serve. Verita insisted. Your security is my primary objective. I will follow you regardless of your destination. Kira added. It looked like there was no way I could shake them all here, so I laid down my condition. Very well, you may follow, but once we reach the front line, you two need to stay away from direct action. A wing of Mechanicus flyers appeared and approached us, an Archaeopter Transector fast transport escorted by two Stratoraptors, its gunship variant. With their unique shape, it looked as if we were being approached by three colossal dragonflies with wings resembling that of a bat. Once the flyers got close enough they engaged hover mode, causing a huge downward draft that made our clothes flutter furiously as the transport landed in front of us. I stepped forward but Kira was way ahead of me, she opened the side door and ushered us inside. Once we got into the transvector, I noted its interior was a far cry from that of the Flame Raven smelling like a car workshop with cold, austere-looking seats aimed for maximum efficiency. This aircraft was a workhorse model for the Mechanicus after all, the concept of travel comforts might not even exist in its design. At the front of the flyer was the pilot who looked to be a heavily augmented human. As I moved closer to relay my instructions, to my shock I realized his lower body and mechanical legs seemed to be fused with the aircraft itself. Oh yeah, this was mentioned in the lore, but to see it in real life was unnerving. The pilot must be a Taraxii. The Taraxii looked at me with his cold goggle eyes, he seemed to be confused and said in a flat voice, Mechanicus personnel only. Kira appeared beside me, brandishing a shiny Opus Machina like a sheriff showing off a badge, overruled, I am Skatarii Alpha Kira Haptrix. This operation falls under Dominus Cycle's directive, you will comply. Crypterer's skull probe flew over and canned some binary verification code. Complying. The Taraxii nodded and off we went. We settled down inside on the cold, metallic seats as the transvector steadily gained speed. I then made a priority vox call to the canonist through the skull probe that connected quickly. Diadina. Lady Serene. I am so glad to hear you are fine, receiving loud and clear. Please listen carefully. Despite the measures we had taken, a true enemy has appeared. Inquisitor Thorn had warned us of a serious warp incursion, and he is currently chasing it down. It has taken the form of a huge winged humanoid, carrying a gigantic axe, and is currently heading towards your direction as we speak. I am coming over to fetch the Nameless Sword, and I need you to prepare a few things for me. A fast rhino. A capable driver. After dropping my instructions, I ended the Vox call and switched on the composite picked feed from various sources chasing the demon. I saw it rampaging towards the heart of the battle, sometimes stopping to unleash its terrifying rage at the unfortunate retreating rebels that got in its way, flipping tanks and cutting people down as it saw fit. I watched the live stream intently, wanting to learn its pattern of attack and weakness. So far, one glaring weakness seemed to be that this thing was limited to only melee attacks. Granted, almost everything it touched instantly got destroyed, even Lehman Rust battle tanks were little more than speed bumps as it rampaged forward. The greater demon seemed so awkwardly out of place in a battlefield brimming with guns and cannons it was almost laughable, but so far it did not even look bothered by the returning fire. It seemed to be enjoying the atmosphere of the war, striding purposely forward into a whole armored formation, completely impervious to small arms fire and large caliber guns. Wellmana approached me timidly and asked, My lady, pardon me but you mentioned a greater demon is on the loose? Surely an issue like that is better left to the army to deal with. Her question almost made me want to hug her and cry out loud, how I wish it to be the case. Instead I suppressed my emotion and turned to Verita. 
Let me show you. Verita, please lend me your data slate. The hospitaler obediently passed her inquisitorial data slate over. After some tweaking with my ability, I successfully streamed the picked feed of the demon as it was doing another round of frenzy butchering on the rebel troops. This is happening now, I said and passed the data slate to them. Both sisters watched what was happening on screen with horror as the relentless one-sided slaughter continued. Muffled death screams filled the cabin of the transector. Both Welmina and Verita looked shaken after witnessing what a greater demon could do in this world. Even the stoic Kira looked like she was uncomfortable after sneaking a few peeks at the data slate. After a while, I concluded nothing more could be learned and turned off the feed. Best not look at it too much, I said. Might taint your soul. Corruption of one's soul and body by exposure to anything related to demons or the immaterium is a thing in this universe. While the Sororitas are famed for their resistance to such influence, the risk was still best kept at a minimum. Are you going to fight that thing? You just recovered from a fainting spell. Asked Wellman worriedly. They both looked terrified. So am I inside. But letting pretty ladies down was still something I instinctively wanted to avoid, so some bravado was needed again. I put up a brave face again and smiled to reassure them. Don't mind me. I might not look like one, but I am still a Primarch. Their faces lightened up with my bold statement just as I lamented Serene had no legion of super soldiers under her command and finished my statement weekly. Minoris. A Primarch? Minoris? Wellmana quickly made a note of it. Now that she mentioned it, it made me realize I had never mentioned that term to anyone after seeing that vision. Yes, I answered while holding up my right hand then connecting my index finger and thumb together. A tiny Primarch, but Primarch nonetheless. The blood of the Emperor flows in me. By his will, I will find a way, or this world will end. At the back of my mind, a sinister plan had been brewing for a while to exploit the demon's weakness. If that premonition of mine was correct, Syrene's existence was the main reason why this greater demon came to this world in the first place. Since I am its primary target, a scheme could be set up to bring it down. After all, it is only a melee monster. Let's cheese it to death. Syrene, here is the compiled requested list. Crypterer's voice sounded in my head as a listing of highly classified weaponry popped into my vision, and I quickly went through it. No, no, no idea what is this. Not this. Definitely not that. Why is this even here we are trying to kill a demon, not the world itself? Wait, he has this? Crypto, is this? I was still refining my schemes with the Dominus when we arrived at our destination. The Transvector soon touched down on a field near to a large concentration of friendly forces. Thank you. I sent my gratitude to the Taraxii pilot via Crypterer's skull probe, and he seemed surprised, turning his head swiftly towards me as if to verify it was no fluke. It might be the first time he received binary communication from what appeared to be an unaugmented human. As I stepped out of my ride, I could not help but notice there were a lot of people waiting for me. Leading the welcoming party was Canonist Diodina herself. Weirdly, Alicia was by her side, but I distinctly recalled she was stationed elsewhere commanding another contingent of sisters. Even Governor Cothalina was here with some of her top generals together with the Skatarii Marshal. It's mission done. The transvector took off with another wash of powerful downwards draft. After it left, the sound levels in the area finally returned to a level where people could converse, but it was still noisy as hell. I observed my surroundings and came to the shocking realization that, for the first time in this life, or the last, I was in a real war zone. Under the late afternoon sun, lines upon lines of war machines were everywhere. A bay blade which I recognized to be Kothalina's command ride was here too. There was this perpetual smell of smoke with a hint of burned gunpowder that filled the air, the constant thrumming of war equipment, be it the tank engines in the distance or the power armor backpacks nearby was inescapable. It sure felt different here compared to my perspective back on the podium. I was still in awe of the intensity of my surroundings when Deep Dina and the others approached. She knelt down while greeting me, holy daughter. Following her example, the rest did the same while we were being observed by a whole field of army personnel. Personally, I just felt like digging up a hole and hiding inside it because of the sheer level of tension I was experiencing from the level of reverence on open display. Please rise, we have urgent matters to discuss and time is short. I said while doing my best to suppress the unbearable level of social anxiety bubbling inside me. With that done, we were soon moving towards a makeshift command tent with tables set up not too far from the landing site. While walking towards the tent, my superhuman level of hearing was soon picking up a lot of hushed but excited chatter, and through my connection to the network, I noticed some random bursts of Vox messages were going around in the area. She's here in the flesh. Is that the singing saint from just now? Wait, what? That hologram was a real person. Come and see. She is here. I still can't get that song out of my head. Singing saint? A song? Wellmana did mention something about a song. Back then I was so fixated on the demon crisis the matter was brushed aside but now it piqued my interest. Intrigued by the chatters, I continued walking while my mind dove into a few cogitators in the area with records of recent events to see what had really happened. I managed to get hold of some footage of that time and began going through the recordings and... What in the freaking name of throne? I watched in disbelief as a recording of myself doing a live solo of Beautiful World in the middle of the battlefield streamed in my vision. The level of shocking cringe was too much. I shuddered so hard that it broke my stride. Losing my balance, I almost fell to the ground, but a vigilant Verita who was always one step behind me saved the day by grabbing me. Naturally, this caused another commotion and put the issue of my health into focus again. No, no, 
I am fine, really. We need to do this. This world and its people need this. Trying to hide my embarrassment, I was adamant on not delaying the meeting and pushed on, then I noticed their subtle expressions of concern turned to admiration. By then the misunderstandings had gone down so many layers I gave up on explaining. Let's just get to the matters at hand. Soon another emergency meeting was underway in the makeshift command tent with holographic bust of Krypterer and Thabrish joining remotely. The situation was becoming really urgent so I went straight to the point. Everyone, despite your valiant efforts, our true enemy was more sinister than we anticipated. Inquisitor, could you please brief everyone here on the situation? Thabra's hologram nodded grimly and started speaking. Yes, as mentioned we arrived only to a ruined stronghold with all the cultists dead on sight. The heretics had been toying with power beyond their control and paid the price for their folly. Unfortunately, there is now a greater demon on the loose and currently heading your way. Pardon me, but are we talking about a single enemy? One of the generals asked. Surely with the amount of troops we have here we can simply overcome it with sheer firepower? Thabrish shook his head. This is an enemy we cannot defeat by simply continuously throwing troops and material at it. My psychers had been monitoring it and found the warp spawn seemed to be gaining strength with each victim killed. Our only hope is to subject it with an overwhelming amount of firepower in a very short span of time to banish it back to the warp, but we must do it quickly before it becomes too powerful. I nodded in agreement and continued, exactly, earlier during the brief period when I fainted, a revelation came to me about the nature of this greater demon. The mention of a revelation had them all perked up. I then continued to speak and dropped my plan. For reasons unknown, its arrival appears to have something to do with me being its primary target. I will act as the bait. If the revelation turns out to be true, we can probably bring it down before it becomes unstoppable. The statement brought out a round of murmurs and the sisters objected to the plan out of concern for my safety, but I vetoed them since no better option was on the table and everything was on the line. What if it does not take the bait? Kofalina asked. Then we will throw everything we have at it but with a much lower chance of success. If that fails I will have no choice but to enact exterminatus on Nusquam as the planet and its assets cannot be allowed to fall into the possession of the great enemy. Thabarus replied to the petrified Nusquamis present. That settled, I turned to Krypto's hologram, Crypto, can the special weapon be ready in time? The Dominus bowed and replied, it is in the process of being prepared and will be ready for deployment soon. Good, please make haste. I then turned to the Canonus, Diadina, how are my requests coming along on your end? Diadina bowed, put her hand on Alicia's shoulder and replied, they are all ready, your driver is here. I summoned her after receiving your directive and she drove over quickly. Alicia, I was surprised. Yes, she is one of the highest record holders for tactical driving in our order after all. Diadiana said and Alicia nodded to me with confidence. The mental image of a delinquent-looking Alicia drifting with a rhino tank appeared in my mind, almost making me laugh out loud as it seemed so far off from the palatine I knew. Suddenly a light rain started to drizzle and everyone present looked up with a frown, but I felt my skin start to crawl with goosebumps. This is no natural rain. I looked to the sky and felt a suffocating presence in the air. It was as if the world itself was weeping and crying out for help. Ready or not, we need to engage the greater demon before it is too late. Chapter 32 The Duel If this was a game, it felt like the final boss fight of this war was looming. A light rain with the taste of doomsday heralded the duel. I turned to the canonist, Diadina, the relic sword, please. She nodded and gestured towards a battle sister nearby who was holding the large blade. The sister approached, knelt down, and handed the nameless sword to me. I received the sword and thanked the sister before realizing she was not Celestian Superior Marquila who was by the canonist's side. Had Marquila fallen in battle? It was hard to imagine such a fate had befallen to her. Curious, I asked around, where is Sister Marquila? It was then I heard from Diodina the most ridiculous story ever since coming to this universe. While I was out cold there was a standoff between our forces and the last group of rebels who had not yet surrendered, it was none other than Luther who was the leader of that die-hard group. Diodina had a talk with Luther via Vox communication. During the talk the Lord General had demanded us to redeem our honor for using underhanded tactics and subterfuge to undermine his honest approach to war. In short, he was throwing temper tantrums and demanded a trial by combat as some sort of last resort to salvage his honor, the condition being we would send our best fighter to face his best in a one-on-one -on -one combat. If his side won, he would quietly surrender with the rest of his troops. If our side won, he would apologize to us first and then surrender with the rest of his troops. Should we refuse, he threatened to gather anyone who would follow him for a glorious final charge to redeem his honor as a soldier of the Imperium. Luther had figured out we wanted to keep as many people alive as possible so he was pushing it. To top it off he had touched everyone's nerves by calling me names like that singing whore during their conversation. It was clearly a taunt, but it worked. That insult did not go unanswered and soon Marquila requested to be the one to represent us. Krypterer had complained about the whole demand being totally illogical but saw its merits of avoiding complications. To his logic, if Luther had kept to his word he would be surrendering either way, risking the life of a sister seemed totally worth it. Since Marquila was expressing her eagerness for the duel anyway, he approved it. That was half an hour ago. So in the middle of the battlefield now was a big bunch of people gathering around to watch a one-on-one -on -one duel. 
Meanwhile, moments earlier at the duel site, after the rules for the fight had been agreed by both sides, Celestian Superior Marquila watched with her arms crossed as a Chimera armored transport came forth. It took a sharp turn, had its rear end facing towards her, and stopped. The Chimera's rear hatch then opened and a figure too big even for an Astartes slowly stepped out. The rebel troops cheered as the figure's immense muscles flexed after escaping the confines of his ride. Under the late afternoon sun the best fighter for the rebels, an abhuman ogren standing close to three meters tall yawned as he scratched his belly lazily while holding a club the size of a man. Custom armor covered the ogren's body and a fierce-looking half-mask covered his face. Markeela raised an eyebrow. This would certainly make the duel interesting. The sister had heard about a misplaced ogren who got adopted by a general some time ago but this was the place she had least expected to encounter the abhuman. If she recalled correctly the said ogren also had a very simple name, and in the very next moment Luther confirmed her memory. Boy. Papa. How many things do I have to tell you? Call me father, boy. Yes, papa. Never mind. See that lady over there? Yes. Smash her, and you will get extra portions of food tonight. Okay. The ogren stepped forward, readied his club, and declared, Boy no like fight lady, but boy like food. Marquila readied herself, and the duel began. Boy stepped forward swinging his club. Any connection with that weapon would have immediately ended the fight, but his actions were too obvious, and the sister dodged them all. Marquila tried to take advantage of Boy's openings between each swing by sneaking in some swift attacks with her power sword. To her surprise, while the Ogren looked clumsy, he was a natural fighter. All her attacks were either blocked, parried, or deflected in unconventional ways more suited to a bar brawler than a duelist. The Ogren's raw power was immense while Marquila was a lot more skilled and aided by her power armor. As the duel continued, it looked like a stalemate would be inevitable. While the two exchanged more blows, the spectating rebel troops cheered thunderously while the other Celestians accompanying Marquila remained silent. The fight dragged on until a light drizzle began. By then Marquila was close to exhaustion and Boy had accumulated a number of wounds around his body. Both fighters knew the fight was drawing to a close, and then the Ogren spoke. Lady hard, Boy still get food. Marquila wanted to laugh. The Ogren's simple approach to life was refreshing. She replied, you will have to defeat me first, Boy. Boy beat hard lady. Come and try it. Just as the duel was about to enter its final phase, a pair of flyers flew side by side over in high speed. A nunchus hailer together with an imagifier. The fight halted, Marquila watched in surprise as a huge hologram of Syrian was seen underneath one of the flyers while a deafening announcement came from the other. People, you need to evacuate this site immediately. This is not a drill, I repeat, evacuate immediately. Go towards the governor's forces now for your own safety. The huge crowd seemed stunned by the sudden development and watched on as the flyers went around the field repeating the message. A skull probe that was sent by Crypterer to accompany the sisters suddenly became active. It flew over, stopped in front of Luther, and started communicating. Lord General, the true enemy has appeared and is coming your way. I am calling off the duel. Get your people evacuated immediately. What are you even talking about? Can't a dead man claim his honor and peace? Meanwhile, back in the duel ring, the Ogren had stopped moving. Sky Lady. Moy murmured while looking at Sirene's hologram with a stupefied expression on his exposed face. Sky Lady? Marquila was confused until she realized the Ogren had associated Sirene to the big holograms in the sky. Ogren, she asked. You heard the Sky Lady singing? Yes. World, beautiful. Moy, beautiful. The Ogren replied, and to the sister's astonishment, he actually started weeping a little. Boy, do you like Sky Lady? Marquila asked tentatively. Like? Boy thought for a while before deciding his answer. No, no like. Marquila's expression darkened upon hearing that and prepared to continue the fight. Like, no enough. Huh, boy. Love, Sky Lady. The origin struggled with his vocabulary. The absurdity of it all was heard by some troopers present, and a few chuckles broke out despite the tense situation. Marquila could not help but smile at Boy's statement and involuntarily relax her stance. Boy, I have met the Sky Lady. She is our holy daughter. Her name is Sirene. Sky Lady sighed, right? Hard Lady. No Sky Lady. Boy contemplated for a while before declaring, we know fight. Their inaction finally caught Luther's attention and he was not pleased. What are you doing, Boy? Finish the fight. Boy, no fight, Sky Lady. Want no fight. Why you little how dare you disobey my order? I am your father. Finish the fight. Enraged, the general stepped forward and pulled out his lost pistol. No, that's an order. Luther pointed his weapon at the origin. Livid at a blatant disobedience of his authority on possibly the worst day of his life, Luther finally lost it. The sounds of lost pistol being fired rang out as the Lord General shot boy a few times. The crowd gasped. Marquila furrowed her brow while the origin flinched but stood still. I said fight. No. Fine. I will do it myself. Declared General Luther as he pointed his lost pistol at Marquila and fired. A veteran of many battles, Marquila was already bracing for the familiar impacts of Lost Bolt, but it never came. A huge mass had intercepted that bolt. Boy had stepped in to shield her and added another wound to his tattered body. Get out of the way, boy. His anger completely boiling over, Luther pointed his Lost Pistol at Boy, and this time the people around them started screaming and running away. 
Luther watched in surprise as all the hardened soldiers he had known for years were all suddenly acting like frightened children. He looked back at Boy and the sister again, suddenly realizing they were no longer even looking at him. Their sights focused upwards and both had horrified expressions. It was then Luther realized a huge shadow was cast over him and the raindrops had stopped falling on him. All the hair on his arms were raised on their end. Fear, crippling mortal fear had suddenly enveloped the Lord General but he forced himself to turn around and came face to face with the very definition of a nightmare. Standing right behind Luther was a black-skinned humanoid towering more than three stories in height. It had powerful but twisted-looking muscles covering every inch of its body. Long curved horns rose proudly from its inhuman head that held an expression of perpetual agony and anger. A pair of colossal bat-like wings extended from its back, so vast that the wings had completely blocked out the rain for the Lord General. A pair of huge, ember orbs shone from where the creature's eyes would be, staring straight down at Luther, piercing his soul. Weird as it sounded but in his last moments Luther found his mind flooded with seemingly stupid questions. What is this thing? Why is it so big but so quiet? And why is my life flashing before me? But Luther knew. He knew what stood before him was a demon. He knew no mercy would be coming, and he knew his place as a soldier of the Imperium, so he pointed his lost pistol at the thing shouting. For the EMP. Lord General Luther von Norden was no more. Even standing so close Marquila could not see how it happened. There was simply a blur of motion followed by a harsh splattering sound and where the Lord General once stood was but a puddle of blood and gore. Even in her shock, years of harsh battle discipline had Marquila automatically revert back to her fighting stance again. It was only then she noticed the demon was carrying a double-bladed axe of enormous proportions and boy was already charging towards the warp spawn. Ffffaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
It was more than a huge winged humanoid with a colossal axe. Its very existence had warped the nature of reality around it. This thing does not belong here. Alyssia was doing a great job of pushing the rhino to its limits in the rain, and we went on a pre-planned route that would go around the battlefield in an endless loop while the army could freely shoot at the kite demon. The true enemy is here. Show it no mercy. I sent my desperate order through all the general communication networks, and the army responded. The Imperials were soon unleashing a hailstorm of fire at the unholy thing, lighting it up in a glorious display of firepower with flashing tracers and lost beams appearing all over the field, all drawing a line to the massive wing demon. But that seemed to only make it angrier as it roared in protest and persisted in chasing me down, determined to end me above all else. Shoot that thing. Don't hit the rhino. Avoid hitting the leading rhino at all cost, I repeat. Connected to the communication network, I was informed of the commander's frantic orders in the air. Blam. Blam. Kira was discharging her galvanic rifle beside me and both her shots landed squarely in the demon's eye, a testament to her great marksmanship, but the impacts didn't even make it flinch. I watched with great distress as the distance between me and the thing steadily got shorter and shorter. The rain, the smoke, and the horrendous sound of a huge amount of weapons being fired made for a hellish scene. In the chaos of it all, an unfortunate Chimera armored transport ventured too close to the demon, and it swatted the light tank off with a swing of its colossal axe, sending it flying and landed on its top in the distance. Buying me a grand total of two more seconds of distance. R.I.P. Unknown Chimera Driver and Crew. We need better and more accurate firepower. Just as that thought entered my mind, I was suddenly aware of a familiar machine spirit entering my sphere of influence. Gunship Flame Raven had arrived. The massive inquisitorial gunship appeared on a low pass from nowhere, flying straight at us before unleashing all its payload at the massive demon chasing right behind my ride. The thunderous discharging of its many heavy weapons made me wince. Beams of concentrated loss cannons, superheated multi melters and streams of bolt rounds laced with a tint of silverish blue light burst off from my flying savior, accurately hitting the massive winged demon. The sheer impact of it made the monstrous creature stumble. Even in my odd state, I noticed the bolt rounds seemed to be laced with latent psychic energy. Are those, the psychanon bolts used by the secretive super elite Grey Knight Demon Hunters? So Thabaris had a stash of this precious ammunition in case of such emergency. It howled, the otherworldly cry shaking the air. For the first time, I believed it finally grasped the concept of being hurt. In the blink of an eye, Flame Raven flew past us, its huge backdraft messing up the rhythm of the rain falling over us as it passed. The gunship then went into a steep turn, its two twin heavy bolt responses never stopping to fire at the demon locked in its crosshairs. With my psychic senses, I could see the psychanon bolts were hurting it in this world and the next, doing the real work. Enraged, it finally took its attention off me to grab a massive rock from the ground and prepared to hurl it at Flame Raven. From my viewpoint, a transcendent level of calculations told me if the rock stayed on course it would hit the gunship's cockpit. This was not some mindless brute throwing object as feeble protest, malevolent intelligence was guiding its every action. Not about to let that happen, I activated thought acceleration and tapped into Flame Raven's flight control to dip its flight path ever so slightly while dropping a warning in its internal speaker, careful, rock. The rock flew in slow motion, I watched with bated breath as it passed within centimeters of its intended target, missing the gunship by a hair's breadth and landed with a massive splatter of dirt in the distance. Flame Raven continued flying unsteadily for a while before picking up speed and hurriedly making its escape probably with Tashia screaming inside the cockpit. The greater demon seemed to know I had spoiled its plan and turned towards me again, eyes glowing with distilled hatred. Ignoring the endless hail of projectiles hitting it from all sides it grabbed another massive rock, and this time hurled it straight at me. Luckily, we had already put more distance between us, and my ride was not a flying gunship with a restricted movement path. Alicia, sharp turn left. The sister complied and mere seconds later the massive rock landed on our right, creating another massive shower of dirt that was too close for comfort. Can nothing kill this thing? By this time the greater demon had taken so many shooting attacks, this was beginning to look like a bad trope of a standard monster movie where the kaiju was being impervious to all but some secret weapons. Talking about secret weapons, I was wondering what was holding up Cryptor on my special weapon request. Tapping into the communication network, I sent a direct priority message to him. Crypto, conventional ballistic weapons are not effective against it at all. We need the Caliban special now to pin it down. The requested weapon is en route for deployment. ETA 5 minutes. I will patch you directly to the weapons control. Please do the work of the Omnisia. Thank the throne. So you got the weapon ready? Affirmative. All rites of activation had been rightly performed. Be advised a Mechanicus strike wing is nearby and should be arriving to aid shortly before the weapon reaches you. I will my authority to cut through all the technical clutter to get hold of the exact location of the special package and a highlighted ping appeared in my vision. It was coming fast, but five minutes might as well be an eternity when facing this monstrosity. My ride took a steep turn to the left just as another huge object landed where we were moments ago. This time it was the turret of a Lehman Russ battle tank. Luckily Kira was giving evasive instructions to Alicia while I was busy communicating with the Dominus. It was then the Stratoraptor's strike wing Cryptor mentioned arrived in tight formation and performed a classic low passing strafing run on the demon, peppering it with an impressive amount of accurate firepower. The monstrous thing roared in protest, 
threw another piece of wreckage at the three aircraft formation, then it spread its wings and took off after them at an impressive speed. Too far to exert my influence on the strike wing, I watched in horror as the wreckage hit one aircraft, followed by the demon headbutting into another, obliterating two out of three Stratoraptors outright. Not done with the carnage, it then flew after the final aircraft, finishing the job with its axe. Why does this thing seem to be getting stronger? Digging through my memory, I recalled some lore that mentioned certain types of demon or demon engines that enjoyed an increase in prowess as their connection with the physical world got weakened. So this thing gained strength both by its act of killing and getting wounded? What kind of imbalance is this? The demon then turned in midair, making a beeline towards me. The sheer pressure it emitted made me shiver. It was done with the playing and wanted to end this fast. Just then, Crypterer's urgent new warning reached me. Priority alert. A renegade Astartes Thunderhawk gunship armed with a turbo laser destructor has just slipped through our air defense net and is currently heading your way. Turbo laser destructor. Those titan killers. Just my luck. The Thunderhawk was mounted with one of the most lethal weapons in the Imperial arsenal. My rhino might as well be made of paper in front of that thing. How did it get through? And what is it doing here? My apologies, these renegade marines had employed some of the more advanced stealth features in their gunship setup. Their current objective is still unknown. I am scrambling all available assets, but nothing is close enough to intercept the gunship. Where is it heading? Analyzing. It appears to be coming straight at you by tracing back the priority targeting information you are broadcasting on the demon. Recommend immediate evasive action. I gasped. When it rained, it poured. My calling out to all Imperials to shoot the demon had led to an expected opening. Staying on my ride would render me a sitting duck to the gunship. On the other hand, getting off would mean getting into hand-to-hand -hand combat with a towering greater demon which I was sure I would not last more than three seconds against. Another ping appeared in my vision, highlighting the position of the rapidly approaching Super Heavy Space Marine gunship with a big red dot. Its turbo laser's effective range indicator closing in like a death specter while the greater demon closed in from the other side. I fucked up. Talk about being between a rock and a hard place. Am I at the end of the road? From the front, an approaching Thunderhawk gunship armed with a turbo laser, on our back an enraged greater demon flying over. Caught between life and death, time slowed as my thought acceleration activated again without prompt. In my heightened state of awareness, I checked all the data readouts and saw something peculiar. Doubting myself, I double-checked again to confirm the readings. Could this be true? I was trembling with fear inside and forced my logical side to do the cold calculation. If my hunch was proven false we would be dead anyway, there was no way a space marine gunner would miss its target in the open field with a primary weapon of that caliber. Alicia, do a big 180 turn to the right. I ordered. Lady Serene? Kira asked out loud as that would turn us towards the demon, but Alicia had full faith in my order and was already doing the big turning. Stay in the rhino. Crypto with me. I ordered before climbing the side of the hatch and jumped off the rhino while it was mid-turning. Somehow instinctively I knew surviving this jump was a walk in the park, so I took the lead. While mid-air, rapid thoughts went through my mind. What the fuck am I doing? Looking at the rhino speeding away from me, an inner understanding surfaced. I have made my choice. If a fatal miscalculation was made here, I just wish no harm would come to my companions. After so many years of living on Earth and even after becoming a jaded dude, deep inside I was still but a naive person wanting a happy ending for all. Note to self, you are still such a damn noob. I landed forward, sword in hand, did a small somersault roll and just ended up continuing walking as if it was the most natural thing to do after jumping off from a speeding vehicle, but I got mud and water all over my clothes and hair now. The rain seemed to get heavier, I raised my halo and pointed the nameless sword at the approaching demon and waited. Come at me. The sword seemed to agree, and its plume of blue flame got brighter in response. It was then Crypterer's skull probe joined me in the rain. My princess, what are you doing? He sounded frantic enough it almost gave his flat tone a hint of emotion. Betting on a hunch from the readings. I answered while resending the target priority call on all open channels again through the skull probe. This is no time for heroic nonsense. I beg of you, please evacuate from the field immediately. You know as well as I do if that Thunderhawk menace to harm, there is no way to evade it. So I am leaving Kira and Alicia out of this gambit. I see what you mean but this is still too reckless. Seeing me on the ground, the demon in the air let out what sounded like a joyous roar. It then held its axe high with both hands and started dropping straight at me. Even with thought acceleration, it was becoming hard to track its motion as it dove at me with what would be an unstoppable attack. I winced and started really praying to the emperor for the first time. Please, Big E, I am begging you, let my hunch be correct. Then to my surprise, the nameless sword suddenly glowed brighter than ever before and I felt immense power surging through my body. This is do or die. Every fiber of my being told me I was in mortal danger and something was charging up in me. This felt familiar. I had experienced this before when Fulton was about to smite me, but this time it was I who was gathering all my powers. Time slowed. My thought acceleration seemed to benefit from my charged up state, but all I can see was the massive warp spawn with its reality distortion field bearing down on me in the rain with absolute detail. My body became hot, then cold as all the energy gathered on my left hand. Time slowed further as instinct compelled me to raise my left palm towards the approaching demon. Be gone. A blinding golden lighting burst off my palm, the intensity of unleashing the power numbing my entire arm. 
I watched dumbfounded as the lighting struck the demon squarely on its chest, and a satisfying psychic feedback told me something cracked. This is working. My joy lasted for a split second. The massive warp spawn continued unimpeded. I watched in despair as the demon became a blur of motion, bringing its axe down. At the same time, a mental warning notified the Thunderhawk's turbo laser range had reached me. I let out a soundless scream and closed my eyes. My world became silent and pure white. Chapter 34 Final Be Down Am I dead? In a soundless world, my vision slowly returned and I felt the rain hitting me again. There was something in front of me, something huge. Squinting, the object came into focus. It was an axe, the colossal axe of the demon, and it was sticking up from the ground just a few feet away from me. Being this close, I could tell the weapon was easily more than twice my height. The demon was a much further distance away in a freshly made crater, looking worse for wear and struggling to stand up with movements suggesting confusion. That impact from the turbo laser, at this range, felt like having a sun thrown to my face. Unfortunately, not even that level of firepower with whatever I had done could kill it. Just as the demon was about to get its bearings again, it was hit by an ungodly amount of very accurate heavy bolter fire and a myriad of other weapons. I turned around just to witness the massive gunship swooping in as it continued to hammer on the fallen demon. My hearing still had yet to return, but I could feel the vibrations the gunship created in the air with its firepower. The iconic space marine gunship was so close to me. In a daze, I reached out, accessing. 1. 1. Responding machine spirit within the vicinity. Connect? Yes slash no. Yes. Connection established. Plus plus. Accessing machine spirit via ethernet link plus plus. Authority confirmed and accepted. We are ready to serve. Plus plus C. Identify yourself. This is Adeptus Astartes Thunderhawk Gunship Shadow Talon Hashtag Machine ID. Ave Imperator. We await your. Connection timeout. Plus plus it. Connection timeout. Plus plus it. Did someone sever the link? The Thunderhawk flew over me, its titanic hull shielded me from the rain for a second, and I sensed some peculiar presence inside it. It then proceeded to fly over the demon, and then a huge amount of explosions detonated in the crater. Cluster bombing run. Theory confirmed. Twice it had the chance to attack me, but it did not. I was not their target. But the Thunderhawk was now definitely the target of all the aircraft and anti-air assets on this battlefield. I watched in amazement as a swarm of aircraft including Flame Raven appeared from all over the battlefield chasing after the Thunderhawk as it hightailed it out of the fight after delivering its unsolicited attack run on the demon. Just then another ping got my attention. The special weapon delivery was finally here, carried over by a Stratoraptor with perfect timing. I dove into the network, took over the trigger control of the weapon, and fired it at the day's demon. It was like shooting a fish in a barrel as the special missile made a direct hit, creating a bubble of space-time anomaly around the demon. The Caliban Special was a stasis bomb, one of the more exotic weapons available in the Grimdark universe, effectively trapping its target in a bubble of perpetuity for a short amount of time. It was one of the very rare weapons Cryptor had in his stash of secrets. The demon was now stuck in a stasis bubble. Inside the affected area time basically just froze. Due to the arcane nature of the weapon, no one could tell how long the effect will last, but I fully intend to exploit this period. Crypto, we have it pinned. Understood. I will be directing all available firepower to bear while broadcasting its location to all the channels. We had but a few minutes at most. Please create more distance between yourself and the impact site, and kindly refrain from any further reckless actions in the future. It was then my hearing finally returned, and I was aware of a rhino tank pulled over beside me. Alyssa climbed out from the cupola, jumped down from the tank, and started walking over with Kira. The sister appeared none too pleased with my plot of ditching them. I took a closer look at Alicia. The probationary palatine had a sour expression between pouting and crying. It felt like she really wanted to scold me, but held me in too high regard to do so. There was one way to defuse this weird tension. I stabbed the nameless sword to the ground, walked over and hugged her while apologizing. I am sorry. She was surprised by my embrace and apology. Her power armor was cold to the touch, but it still felt good after all those close calls. The reality of death just passed over by a hair's breadth hit me like a truck as I buried my head into her chest. This feeling of relief was overwhelming. Then an awkward realization hit me. What I was doing now might have been the dream of many hobbyists in my past life. Why did you do that and how did you know? Alicia finally asked while starting to brush off the mud from my hair. The Thunderhawk's angle of attack was constantly shifting towards the demon, but I was not certain it would work out. The probability checks out, Lady Syrene had a better chance of surviving a turbo laser impact with her reinforced energy protection field in the open. Being inside an armored transport would bring complications into the equation if that weapon was indeed directed at her. Quoted Kira without missing a beat, however, that will make little difference as you will still be unlikely to survive hand-to-hand -hand combat with that warp spawn. There is one key difference, I answered, you two will still be alive. Both Alicia and Kira looked stunned by my response. Just then the army started firing into the stasis bubble, signaling time to create some real distance between us and the incoming hell. Let's get out of here. After collecting my sword, we boarded the rhino again and drove away from the demon. We watched the hectic firepower intensify from a safe distance, soon an endless amount of projectiles were flying into that mess. Eventually even Kathleen's Baneblade, Terminus Pride, had joined the fray, firing all its guns one after another into the bubble. 
some long-range artillery rounds had even made it, landing round after round into the bubble. In the finale, a formation of Sororita's exorcist tanks arrived and added a barrage of missiles into the mix. I also noticed a decorated Sororita's rhino peeling off from the main battle group and heading right toward us. I recognized it to be Diodina's command rhino. The precious few minutes stretched on and the frenzy firing of the Imperials piled on. Finally, we received a warning from Cryptor to all open channels. Stasis bubble collapse imminent. Stand by for impact. Just as he finished speaking, there was a bright flash and a cataclysmic level explosion as time resumed within that bubble of space with all the projectiles inside. We watched in awe as a mushroom cloud rose from the impact site and the shockwave hit our rhino, its hull creaking in protest. The sound was deafening even after we put our hands up to cover our ears. Nothing in this universe should be able to survive that. I was confident of that notion and raised my head above the open hatch to inspect the impact site. Visually nothing could be seen as it was a world of dust so I sent out Ausbex to check. I froze. It was still there. It felt severely weakened than before but was definitely still there. Plus Lady Serene. Plus. I almost screamed out loud with a sudden noise in my head before recognizing it was a psychic message from Fulton, one of Thaber's psycho retinue. Plus Fulty? Be warned the demon is still here. Plus. Plus we know. The Inquisitor had ordered the troops to stay away until this was resolved. We are approaching your position. Please stand by. Plus. From the darkening sky, a new flyer appeared and swiftly approached. It looked like a modified Corvus Blackstar strike craft, sleek and modern looking unlike most of its boxy Imperial counterparts. Psychic resonance confirmed Fulton and Salee were on board. By then Diadinu's rhino finally reached us just as the Black Star strike craft had gotten close enough. I linked up with its machine spirit and the rest of its passengers became known to me. Neandra and Thabaris were on the strike craft too. As befitting of an Inquisitor knowing the risks involved, Thabaris was wise not to be on board the Flame Raven when it did the attack run. The Black Star landed with a huge downdraft, blowing rain and muddy water everywhere. Shortly after, for people exited it with the Inquisitor leading from the front, striding purposefully. Matching his timing, Dedina exited from her rhino together with Markila, Verita, and Welmina. Closer to us, the sisters reached first with the canonist leading in the front. Diadina's expression softened as she saw me. She bowed deeply together with the other sisters before saying, Holy daughter, everything went better than expected with just some minor deviations from your plan. I was overjoyed but was in no way about to hog all that glory. Diadina, you and the others had done really great work out there in the field. Now we just have to tie up this last loose end. Thabris and his group stopped in front of the gathering. The Inquisitor's expression was as indecipherable as ever, but I did detect his awe when he saw the flaming nameless sword for the first time in my hand, followed by a hint of amusement. Probably due to my current messy state. Well, you are in a surprisingly excellent state considering you just took down a greater demon. He commented. I scoffed jokingly before replying, first, the combined effort of the army took it down, not me. Second, the damn thing is still there. Any idea how to finish it off for good? Can we ask the army to continue blasting it from a distance? Considering all that firepower just now, I doubt that will work. My investigations on the chaos cult responsible for this treacherous act revealed they had used an ancient artifact in this scheme. This warp spawn appeared to have tethered itself to the physical world through its connection with said artifact. We might need a direct psychic attack with a force weapon to sever its final attachment to this universe. Force weapon? Where can? I instinctively looked down at the flaming sword in my hand. This counts as one, right? Just when I was wondering if I actually needed to go into that mess and stab the demon myself, Thabaris spoke again, you have done more than enough, let us handle the final. But before he could finish his statement, a blood-curdling roar came from behind us. We all turned to witness an unbelievable scene. About a hundred yards away something huge and grotesque appeared from the wall of smoke and dust. A towering, bloody mess of skinless flesh and muscle stumbled with great difficulty towards us. Where its head was supposed to be was mangled protrusions of organs, and something that looked like a deformed eyeball was hanging out from that mess. For a very brief moment, our eyes met, and it recognized me. Kill you. It said to me without words, taking a few steps forward and then collapsed to the ground in a cloud of dust. The whole Imperial gang went silent upon seeing what just happened, then it felt as though the very air itself suddenly changed. This dreaded feeling, the immaterium is coming over? Goosebumps were appearing all over my body and my instinct was screaming imminent danger. The demon is thinning the barrier of reality. Salih was the first to realize what was happening. How? Why? Thabris demanded, apparently he was also caught by surprise by this sudden development. I don't get it, but the demon seems to be burning itself up to use the artifact's power. Fulton answered as the situation suddenly became very desperate. Get behind us. Fulton shouted as he started working with Salih. Holding hands, their power fused and a protective psychic field was deployed. Everyone got into it as things literally went to hell around us. Outside the psychic field, impossible colors and weird sceneries appeared as reality started to slip away. Plus this is bad. Plus Salih cried out through psychic communication. Plus damnation. The barrier won't hold for long. Plus Fulton agreed. Plus what is the name of this psychic power? Plus I asked in amazement. Plus sanctuary. Plus. Our little sanctuary barrier was not looking well though. It seemed to be cracking from immense pressure. 
I had seen the psychic duo working together multiple times now and had a rough idea of how to contribute. Plus, let me join your psychic choir. Plus, plus, but, plus, Tilly hesitated. Plus, do it. We will be dead at this rate anyway. Plus, Fulton communicated through gritted teeth. Marquila, I passed my sword to the sister. Even while in a daze, the Celestian Superior accepted the weapon naturally. I then put one hand on the shoulders of each psyker from behind, sensing the rapid circulation of power between them. This is just like the circulation I had with the sword. Plus, here it goes. Plus, I started pumping my psychic energy into the circulation with the duo, slowly at first then increasing in intensity as our powers started to blend together. Faster and faster our circulation went as the two psychers continued to channel powers into the field with my backing. Plus, so much power. Plus, Tali gasped. Plus, concentrate and stabilize the field. Plus, Fulton commanded. So, we pushed further until the sanctuary field stabilized. It, it is working. We are keeping the immaterium at bay for now, Fulton announced, puffing. Can we move away from here? Thabaris asked the obvious question. Negative, we can't move while channeling this protective field. Are we totally cut off from the outside? I asked while trying to communicate with Cryptor via his skull probe, but received no reply. There might be literally a universe between us and our old reality. Thabaris answered grimly. So what do we do now? Diadina asked. As the others started a discussion, I found myself spacing out and my attention shifted to where the demon was outside the field. I had another hunch, a really bad one. Recalling the brief moment when I looked into the broken eyes of the greater demon, it must have assessed me with its twisted intelligence and took into account what it had witnessed. This is a trap made for me, isn't it? In a trance-like state, I slowly walked to the edge of the field. Compelled by a knowing feeling, I held my hand out and pushed my finger towards the outside. Just as my finger crossed over the field slightly, a communication came through. Fight me. An inhuman voice sounded in my head, sending frightening chills down my spine as it continued to speak. Fight me, daughter of anathema, in a daze. I found myself being pulled back from behind with a hand choking on my neck and cold steel pressed against the side of my head. It was Neandra. What are you doing? Neandra, Alicia, and D. Dinah all asked at the same time, and I heard the sound of weapons being raised further behind. Release Lady Serene, or I will shoot, added Kira with the sound of her galvanic rifle being loaded up. It seemed like my action just now was about to start an internal dispute. Stop it. All of you. I said calmly and felt the grip on my neck loosen slightly, so I continued. This is a trap for me. The demon wants to fight me. I heard it's calling. What in the? Why? Thabris asked. I don't understand either. With the low level of casualties we achieved, nothing of this level of threat should have come through via that ritual. It almost felt like it had a personal grudge with me. I replied. No one had anything further to add to that statement. So it was time to defuse the situation. Mustering as much authority as possible, I demanded, unhand me, Neandra. Neandra hesitated until Thabris weighed in. Do as she says. If she was possessed, we would all be dead by now. The assassin complied. I turned around to have a look at the gathering. It had been a long day, and everybody was looking under the weather, Verita and Wellmana were looking especially pale. Seems like I will need to fight and banish the demon myself. Destroying the artifact or hitting the demon with a force weapon will cut off his attachment to our world and in this phenomenon, correct? That should be the case. Thabaris nodded. I pointed at the nameless sword. Is that a force weapon? Salih winced at my question. Like just now with its blue psychic flame? Definitely. Good. I had to be sure. We will accompany you, Diadina said. No, it is almost pure immaterium outside this field, and probably only I have the Emperor's true blessings to stave off its corruptive effect. I replied. In truth, that statement was a mix of half-truths and guesses, but I doubt the rest could help much in the upcoming duel, without even taking into account the risks of being possessed or being mutated to death. My companion sprouting tentacles and attacking from behind was the last thing I want to see while in a boss fight, in a sight like that would probably break me. But this is so dangerous, Marquila wanted to argue. The demon is severely weakened, it can be done. I declared while stretching out my hand to the Celestian Superior. She hesitated for a second, saw Diadina nodding before handing the nameless sword back to me reverently and delivering her blessings. May the Emperor grant you strength. I nodded, taking back my sword and triggering its flames. I then walked to the edge of the field. Outside this barrier was chaos itself. This is it. The last deciding fight for this war. I took a deep breath and turned my head around, like a gathering of really expensive-looking cosplayers. The whole group was looking at me silently. See you all later. The Emperor protects. I forced a smile, tuned my halo to the maximum level, and then stepped forward into the unreality. Outside, the first thing I did was to nervously observe myself, looking for any signs of troubles and actively checking my own status. So far everything seemed fine. Looking closer, I found my halo seemed to be creating its own sanctuary field effect around me, constantly repelling the immaterium. The outside was an eerie world. The aftermath of close to a whole army's worth of weapons discharge mixed with the immaterium had made a real mess of the field. Dust, hot steam and smoke were everywhere. Visibility was practically zero with only the light provided by my halo illuminating the path forward. I approached the position of the downed greater demon cautiously, spamming Auspex, to constantly confirm its exact location. The readings were weird, it felt like the demon's very existence was hanging by a thread, a burning will that stubbornly refused to leave. 
Thinking about the current situation, some facts were dawning on me. A powerful demonic entity thinning down the barrier of reality to bring a world into the Immaterium was the standard endgame for a demonic invasion. But that was usually done after the Chaos forces had gathered enough power and souls to pull a whole world through. This demon doing this now, while it was severely wounded, served no other purpose than to force my hand. So this is definitely a trap for me. I shook my head to regain focus, nothing matters now, but to banish the demon and call it a day. I continued to spam Auspex forward. It was still not moving, but the ominous feeling was intensifying. Finally, I reached a clearing and saw my target. There in the distance was the injured demon. It was still a bloodied mess and appeared to be motionless. I continued to approach until instincts told me to stop. Looking closer, and with my Auspex readings, I saw a disc-like object inside the body of the demon. My psychic sense indicated weird energies were emanating from said object with the demon's essence intertwined with it. This must be the artifact Thabris had mentioned. Now I just need to hit it with my sword. The demon remained curiously motionless. No taunting nor further communication was coming forth. This last boss fight was looking more like a puzzle than an actual fight. So, how? Fatigue was setting in. This need to end fast. I then remembered my pillow throwing way back in the bedroom. Despite being not aerodynamic at all, I still managed to fling the sleeping aid with a respectable speed. That meant, the nameless sword could probably be launched like a spear. That way there was no need to get any closer to the demon. Only one shot at this. Too bad I could not practice. Wait. I can do simulations. Simulation activated. In my mind's eye, I threw the sword again and again at the artifact inside the demon. After a few tries, the process was refined to a certainty, hitting my target again and again without fail. Finally, I was ready. The blue psychic flame on my sword was raging now as if begging to be unleashed. Let's do this. I pulled back my body, poured my remaining powers into the nameless sword and threw it like a javelin. Go back to hell. Just like the simulations, the sword left my hand and flew straight at my target like a bolt of vengeful lightning. Then I felt it. Somehow, my senses detected the demon smirking, its smug emotion apparent, and its malice laid bare. Screaming alarms went off in my mind. Something appeared in my senses and came at me with supernatural speed, but my body was still stuck in the after pose of throwing out my sword. Time slowed further, and I finally saw what was coming at me. It was a whip, a barbed whip thicker than my arms. Even in my thought-accelerated state, I could not dodge but watched in horror and slow motion as the thing approached. My senses registered the nameless sword hitting its mark just as the whip reached me. Now I really fucked up. Z-H-H-O-M-M. There was a thunderous sound and a brilliant flash. The next thing I knew my body was flying backwards in midair, rain hitting my face. Rain. Reality had returned and a cold realization surfaced. I got hit and the reinforced energy field of my rosette must have activated. A lot of thoughts quickly went through my head. First off, I was angry at myself for being careless. A whip was part of the default war gear for a typical bloodthirster. And while this opponent was anything but typical, I should have anticipated that. Then my attention went at calculating my odds of survival. This energy field of mine should be similar if not superior to the protection granted by the Iron Halo equipped by Space Marine Commanders. So a minimum of 4++ plus plus if not 3++ plus plus and vulnerable saves? I should be able to survive this. Wait, this is not a game. My thought acceleration ended and in a flash as I came crashing back to Earth, the great momentum had me skipping across the muddy ground for a great distance before finally stopping. In a state of shock, I tried to get up but only managed to raise myself slightly while getting relentlessly pummeled by the rain. I am in such a mess now. What about the demon? I shivered pushed myself and managed to send out another wave of Auspex to its last known location. Nothing, it was finally banished for real. Looking down at myself to assess my situation, I found all my limbs were intact but there was this curious feeling of numbness on my chest. Panicking, I tried to sit up again but choked on my throat and proceeded to vomit out blood. Streams of hot blood were dripping down freely from my mouth and nose. Oh, this does not look good. I couldn't even get myself to sit upright. This transhuman body, a supposed peak-level creation of a galactic empire, could not even perform such a basic action now. I need help. In a blind panic, I reached out psychically and to my great relief, managed to grab hold of a pair of familiar consciousness nearby. Plus help. Plus. Plus Lady Serene. Plus they both replied. Plus Fulti, Sully. The demon is done for but I am hurt. Need assistance. Plus. Plus acknowledged. We are coming over. Plus. Suddenly new sensations started creeping onto my body. Ouch. Pain. Wait. And I supposed to have a grace period for the adrenaline to suppress such sensations before the pain kicks in? Plus, please hurry, I am, in a pretty bad state. Plus, without warning the pains intensified by folds, I wanted to scream but messages of Regulus were popping up again and my throat felt like it was filled with blood. Laying flat on my back on top of the cold, wet muddy ground, I saw nothing but a raining dark and dirty purple sky. The psychic duo was still responding but I could no longer hear what they were saying. I drowned in a sea of pain, everything faded to darkness. Chapter 35 Aftermath the light rain was still drizzling during the night when an Aquila lander touched down at the primary landing pad of the monastery fortress, where Crypto Recycle was already waiting with a squad of Skatarii rangers. The lone passenger stepped out of the vehicle and proceeded to greet the unmoving Dominus. The newcomer looked to be a heavily augmented tech priest, 
However, he was dwarfed both in stature and status by the inviting host. Greetings, Archdominus Cycle. I, Mugosbel Praetis Akyank, arrived as summoned. Glory to the Omniscia, your swift campaign of subjugating the rebels was glorious and indeed blessed by the machine god. If this will be done, let it be done quickly. The short campaign was indeed blessed. Unfortunately, there was a complication. Magos Balpratis, your talent is needed, follow me. They started walking, leaving the escorting rangers as they went through multiple security checkpoints together. Balpratis observed the curious mix of Mechanicus and Sororita's personnel around. As they got into a lift and started descending, his curiosity finally got the better of him. Dominus, may I inquire what are we doing in the Sororita's monastery and which exact field of expertise do you require from me? Specifically, we need advice from an expert on transhumanism and you are the best Magos biologist on the planet. We are here because of a very important patient. Patient? Yes, patient. Ask no more. All will be revealed. The lift reached its designated floor and the door opened. They were greeted by more security elements but with Crypto leading, none dared to bar the duo. Eventually, they reached a huge blast door manned by more guards. To Balpratis surprise, an inquisitor was also waiting with his retinue. One of the retinue, a psyker by his appearance, stepped forward and lightly probed the Muggos. Satisfied with the result, the psyker nodded to the inquisitor and stepped back. It was after that the trench coat wearing Inquisitor acknowledged Balpratis. Well met, Muggos. Stringent security is required with what is at stake. I am Inquisitor Thabrus Thorn of the Ordo Hereticus. You will be given access to information classified under Vermilion level Imperial clearance. Leaking any information on what we are about to show you will render yourself an immediate enemy of the Imperium. This warning will not be repeated. Before Balpratis could even organize his thoughts, they went through the blast door. Inside was a medical operation theater of sorts, with an assortment of advanced equipment. At the center of it all was a bed sworn by a myriad of personnel tending to an unconscious form of a female human with an oxygen mask on her face. That is the patient. Yes, transferring her medical records to you now. Balpratis checked the data sheet he received and started analyzing it while they walked. When the augmentation column was read, the shock he experienced almost tripped him over. Written in bold letters on the said column was but two words, pre March minoris. Dominus. This. Specification is no mistake. Confirmed. The patient herself disclosed that detail to an aide and that record was triple-checked. You can double-check her physiology on that point yourself. With a quivering mind, Balpratis quickly went through the rest of the data sheet and realized the reason he was summoned. It appeared the patient had received critical injuries, multiple internal hemorrhaging and organ inflammations were detected. But no one knew how to proceed with the treatment process since the patient's transhumanism was so advanced she was practically another species. Do you understand now? I understand. Please allow me to access all detailed medical readings and records. Sometime later, Balpratis had gone through all the data and had a hunch on what was going on. Dominus, I have reached an unlikely hypothesis on how to improve the patient's condition. Cryptorer seemed pleased. Speak plainly, Muggos. We are out of tangible options. None here knew how to deal with an injured Primarch, full scale or otherwise. Balpratis nodded and continued. Assuming the patient is truly in existence close to a Primarch, she should have an innate regenerative capability far superior to any standard Astartes. While the internal injuries she suffered were significant, they should not have been able to overwhelm her regenerative tendency. Then why is her condition not improving? From the records, or the lack thereof, I believe the patient was going without nutrient intake for an extended period of time. As unbelievable as it seems, my hypothesis is she might just be deprived of essential nutrients for the massive amount of energy needed to fuel proper regeneration. Cryptorer went silent upon hearing the ridiculous yet plausible notion. It was around this time a small commotion happened at the center of the medical bay. Without even looking, the Dominus knew Serene's condition had worsened yet again. The patient's vital signs had further degraded. Time is not with us. Muggos, how confident are you with your hypothesis? I would argue there are little better alternatives, even if bypassing all the improbabilities and you could get hold of an Astartes apothecary specializing in transhuman care right now. Ancient Imperial records have shown they were also at a loss of how to treat a seriously injured Primarch. You have a point. With me. The tech priest proceeded to the center of the medical bay where a team of elite medical personnel were helplessly monitoring the situation. No one paid any heed to the approaching duo. Cryptorer stopped walking, looked around, and proceeded to clap his hands. Miraculous as it seemed, a satisfying fleshly clap resounded as his primary metallic hands hit each other as he announced loudly, Good news, everyone. The frenzy inside the medical bay stopped abruptly, everyone froze and looked bewilderingly at the towering Dominus. Satisfied that he now commanded everyone's attention, Cryptorer spoke. I have consulted with an expert. The princess might just be too malnourished to heal herself. Please try direct nutrient injections to see if that improves her condition. Upon receiving the revelation, the medical staff hurriedly went to work. Crypto returned to Balpratis, if this works, you will have my eternal gratitude and a fair share of the ventures forward. Otherwise, consider yourself downgraded to a servitor once we are done here. That is unacceptable, Dominus. That terms and conditions never were stated beforehand. Balpratis protested. My needle cannot penetrate the patient's epidermis. Someone cried out. Same here. Another echoed and the atmosphere of further desperation was setting in. Let me do it. 
A sister hospitaler with an Inquisition badge stepped forward and after a while, successfully performed the procedure, commencing intravenous therapy now. Like a miracle and to everyone's relief, the patient's vital readings almost immediately seemed to stabilize. How did you manage that, sister? You will need a medical syringe with an adamantium needle and a monomolecular tip. Standard medical equipment won't work, the sister explained to a room of astonished medical staff. How did you know? Another senior staff member asked. Experience. Here, please keep a few of these with you. The sister replied while distributing some of her precious medical wares. I currently only have a limited supply of these on hand. Please do not waste them. Look, vital signs are improving. A round of small cheers broke out, the first good news since receiving the patient. Excellent, Crypto joined in. What is your name, sister? Verita Kern, currently attached to the Inquisition. I will commit your name to my memory, Sister Verita. You have the gratitude of cult mechanicus for your contribution today. The Dominus then turned to his fellow tech priest. Magos Valpratus, your place within my holy expedition will be cemented once the omniscient princess regains her consciousness. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I was in a void. No time, no space, no body. Just pure consciousness. Am I dead for real this time? No. Wait, who is that? It is me. Who is me? That line gets blurry, doesn't it? Serene, is that you? Yes, it is me, or you. It is complicated. You were inside all along? Come out and settle this mess. I can't, otherwise, I won't call for you. Huh, you saw everything? Yes. So how did I do? Impressive, much better than I ever hoped for. I have to ask, why do you need my help in the first place? That, I cannot share with you now. Why? It might break you. Say, well, what would happen if I had refused to help back then? I am curious too. Want to see? A vision appeared. We went back in time to the psychic beacon's activation. Deep in the inner sanctum back to where it all began. Unable to secure a soul link, Serene would fall into a deep coma when the rebels attacked. Without my intervention, Amel and Canner were doused by the flamer and proceeded to be gunned down while covered in flames. In the preceding gunfight, things got a lot more dangerous for my other associates and Alicia Lost and I during the battle. Fabris and Crypter would still arrive in time and clean up the fight, but they never reconciled due to the heavy losses incurred. Herlindia would take over as Fabris' interrogator, but her demeanor changed completely after witnessing the charred remains of a male. She went semi-berserk and executed some of the rebels herself. Apparently, she and the interrogator were more than just colleagues. After that mess was sorted, Syrian would be sent to the Sororita's monastery for medical care. There they would find out about her primarch physiology. Stricken with the grief of letting their holy daughter down, Alicia forfeited her position of probationary palatine and volunteered to become a repentia to repent her sins of failing. Meanwhile, Fabris would continue his investigations without Crypter's aid. Running low on time and letting a vengeful Herlindia take charge of some of the investigations, he ended up ruffling some feathers amongst the loyalist forces. The massive battle broke out as before. Even without having access to Syrene's authority, Catalina's forces aided by the Adeptus Mechanicus still managed to wrestle the advantage from the rebels by adapting a no-mercy approach. Alicia would lead one of the most crucial charges into rebels, never to be seen again. The bloodshed was horrendous. Hundreds of thousands died on both sides as a far more crude and brutal version of the trap was sprung. Fueled by the massive surge of souls of the deceased, the Chaos Cult's secret ritual successfully opened a huge portal and a massive wave of demons soon swarmed the planet. Realizing the heretic scheme too late, the surviving Imperials fought a losing war while more and more warp spawns were summoned through the portal. When the calculus concluded there was no way to hold the Grim Tide anymore, Cryptorer launched a desperate mission deep into the Inner Sanctum to retrieve the technological treasures sealed deep underneath the beacon. Even with the support of all his advanced cogitators, Cryptorer could not bypass the extreme security put in place by the Emperor and his attempt triggered multiple cataclysmic explosions on sight, obliterating half of the planet outright, and destroying the psychic beacon along with the unknown treasures stored within. In the frenzy of the world's final moments, amongst the billions of people on the planet, only a few thousand managed to escape the dying world. Thabaris would return on board his Inquisitorial Strike Cruiser, the Unrelenting Vigilance. There he would officially sign the death warrant for Nusquam and declare the Imperial world damned and lost. The final nail to the coffin was hammered in by executing Exterminatus on the broken planet. On the surface of the dying planet, a newly ascended demon prince credited with the deaths of billions rose from the hellish inferno, only to watch his new kingdom burn to cinders around him. With everything dead and gone, the surviving Imperial ships escaped into the surrounding darkness. Meanwhile, the void ships that were halfway traveling to Nusquam would arrive only to be greeted by a planetary graveyard. This region of space will probably never see the light of the Emperor ever again. I watched as everything faded to the void again, shaken and half expected the Regulus messages to appear, but everything went quiet. That did not happen. Throne damned it. You scared the hell out of me. That was extremely unpleasant to watch. You seem to be fading. You are waking up. I can only reach you in this state. Wait, don't go. I have so many questions. There is a lot I cannot share with you. At least tell me where were you during the last 10,000 years? And whatever happened between you and the Big E? I was being sealed away most of that time. Big E? Is that a nickname of my father? I can try to show you, but it will be unpleasant. Show me. Show me. Very well. 
Chapter 36 New Dawn Is this Serene's memory? I regained vision and my sense of having a body returned, but it was moving on its own. It was near pitch black, but my transhuman eyesight picked up the infrared light, and I moved like a ghost in a very dark and ominous tunnel leading into an eternal-looking void. While running, I managed to catch glimpses of my hands. They were delicate-looking appendages. This was definitely her memory. Suddenly she leapt over an unseen edge in total darkness. It was so abrupt I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. Cold air rushed by, and she did what seemed to be an impossible landing on another ledge with me watching it from a first-person view. This was like parkour but on steroids, added insane difficulty, and triple the speed. I had a glance below, and all that my vision registered was a bottomless void. Before I could even finish my soundless scream, she did another few more inhuman leaps and landings as she kept going at it in near-total darkness. This. This level of body control. I was stumped on what a Primark-level body could achieve with its full potential unleashed. Serene continued to move forward in the darkness and gradually, I was able to sense her thoughts. Today was the important day when she could finally talk with her creator again, she had made that resolve. Only one thing was in her mind, its intensity was seared into me even in this memory of a vision. Father. The little Primark Minoris was holding that thought while she marched ever forward into the darkness. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Wellmana bolted up from her bed with a muffled scream. The immediate sensation she felt was the unbearable chill biting into her skin. In the delirium of her half-awakened state, she struggled to recall if the temperature control of her room had been tampered with. The scholar took in a few quick breaths before realizing the reason for the plummeting warmth. Her room had stayed the same but she was drenched in sweat and her nightgown was soaked through. She uttered some silent prayers, took in a few more deep breaths to control her ragged breathing before dragging herself to the water closet. Feeling better after dousing her face with cold water, Wellmana slowly raised her head and had a proper look at the mirror. A horrible visage of her own reflection stared back, and the first thing she noticed was that her eyes were all red. The last time Wellmana remembered seeing her eyes in the shade of red was after she bawled her eyes out as a result of receiving harsh disciplinary action from a sister superior. She was still a novitiate then, and had did something stupid, that was more than a decade ago. For a few days now whenever Wellmana closed her eyes a series of tormenting images kept appearing before her. That day, in the aftermath of a duel not meant for mortal eyes, their once vibrant holy daughter was found in a nightmarish landscape covered in mud, looking lifeless with dried blood all over her face. Verita and the others had sprung into action. After determining Serene was just barely alive, there was this mad scramble of all available resources to send her to the closest complete medical bay located at the Sororita's Fortress Monastery. Wellmana, being neither a hospitaler nor having any useful skill to contribute at that time, could only watch helplessly from the sideline. She had felt nothing but numbness at those crucial moments. Now, the scholar felt as if that indescribable feeling of helplessness together with the unforgettable scenes had been seared into her soul, slowly eating her from the inside out. As a dialogous scholar attached to the Order of the Shining Beacon, Wellmana had dreamed of meeting the Holy Daughter ever since she was introduced to the prophecy. A thousand years had passed since the prophecy was first mentioned, countless dialogous sisters had gone before her waiting for such a privilege, and the truth was Wellmana had never expected it was during her time that it became true. For a brief moment in time, Wellmana had the mental image of a future where she would quietly grow old, raising the next generation of adeptus scholars and passing the prophecy down to them. Admittedly, that mirage of a quiet life was shattered as one dramatic event unfolded one after another, and things went downhill pretty fast from there. First, her mentor had suddenly passed away in her prime, leaving Wellmana as the de facto scholar in charge of handling their order's records regarding the prophecy despite her junior position. Then the civil war broke out, throwing her relatively stable universe into a world of disarray, as the junior scholar was learning to navigate this new world of uncertainties. Out of the blue the canonists had ordered her to accompany the newly promoted probationary palatine Alicia to verify her claim of a newly surfaced candidate for the prophesied holy daughter. Wellmana was skeptical at first since the Alicia she personally knew could be such a hothead at times, and it was not the first time the Order had dealt with such possibilities only to be proven false later. While on their way to the fortress, Alicia shared her story and it intrigued Wellmana. The candidate's tragic loss of memory during the dramatic gunfight at the inner sanctum was something Wellmana could not wrap her mind around. It felt like there was more to the story, so she waited with bated breath to meet with this mysterious figure. When Wellmana finally met Serene, she still could not wrap her mind around what she saw. The candidate exuded a level of presence that could only be described as saintly, but her ultra-casual demeanor towards the sisters carried none of the gravitas one would be expecting from a fabled true daughter of the emperor. As a scholar, Wellmana had counted no less than five violations of basic etiquette broken by the candidate on the first time they had met. Serene had openly greeted Alicia cheerfully back then. It was a very basic knowledge in high society proper greetings should be initiated by the lower-ranking individual even in a private setting. Surely the emperor's daughter should know better? Then the bombshell of her medical examination result hit, confirming Sirian was no mere human but a transhuman so advanced one could not even tell by her appearance. The sister hospitaler who had accompanied them on that mission had even secretly confided with Wellmana later that she saw no signs of any post-operative marks on Sirian, a fact which should have been impossible. Most imperial transhumans usually underwent so many surgeries their body was usually littered with such marks. 
Just as they were already having a hard time keeping their jaws closed, it was further revealed Sirene had an unknown organ inside her brain that was certified by the Inquisition record to be found only in Primarchs. Wilmanoa's mind had gone blank as she processed all the information that was laid before her. The fact that Sirene had still maintained her casual stance made the scholar's reality even more jarring on that day. A sister of the mythical Primarchs, a true daughter of the Emperor of Mankind. The scholar had read all that she could about the Primarchs, barring those who were labeled heretical anyway. To Elmina they were such aloof figures, they might as well be just pure legends than historical facts if not for the plentiful of statues around that constantly reminded them such beings once walked amongst mortals. All the Primarchs she knew were larger than life figures, sons of their god-emperor and super-superhuman in more ways than one. They led legions of space marines on a galaxy-spanning crusade and brought countless worlds into the embrace of Imperium. And here was a person who could be a younger sister of the mythical Primarchs, and she was interacting with them like peers bantering in a postgraduate ceremony. Feeling totally out of her depth, the scholar reported back to canonist Deve Dinah what she saw, praying to the emperor himself she was not making a colossal mistake. Finally the meeting between Serene and the holiest relic of their order, the Nameless Sword happened. Any lingering doubts were burned away by the pure blue flame manifesting on the sword illuminated by the golden halo of their holy daughter. Wellmana finally understood what some of the ancient legions of Astartes who had amicable relation with their Primarch must have felt when they were finally united with their gene father. Their order was finally whole again, and now the true work can begin. There were still many lingering important questions, however due to the issue of memory loss and the urgent matter of rebellion, all these were put on the back burner. It was then that Wellmana saw for the first time the true brilliance of Sirene. Despite clearly not operating at her full capacity, the Holy Daughter quickly orchestrated cooperation between the Sororitas, the Mechanicus, and the Inquisition with an ingenious plan to deal with the uprising rebels. The sight of various imperial establishments famous for their internal squabbles coming together and working seamlessly under Sirene's leadership for a common goal was breathtaking. The scholar was watching from the side, dazzled. Thinking back, that first direct Vox call Wellmana received from Sirene had to be the most nerve-wracking Vox conversation she had in her life. Before Wellmana could organize her thoughts she was back in Sirene's room, the short time they had spent together rummaging through the collection of clothes was the most surreal event the scholar had experienced in her life. There she was, picking up an outfit for the holy daughter from her otherworldly collection of apparel. Sirene was again talking to her in a way, as if the lowly scholar was her peers when it was just the two of them around. Wellmana was even offered to keep an outfit as a gift, it had petrified her back then. As a scholar, the true cost of such apparel was beyond her but she had guessed one might not even be able to acquire these with any amount of currency. Surprising Wellmana further, Sirene had even bothered to learn the high society greetings from their world to show proper respect for the governor and her generals. The scholar found herself totally blown away by the holy daughter's modesty and kindness. In the dark days that followed when it was unclear if Sirene could recover, Wellmana found herself in a working frenzy. With a blessing from her canoness, the scholar was going around collecting every bit of information she could about Sirene's actions during that fateful day. From the information she gathered, it was understood the combined might that had gathered under Sirene could easily annihilate the rebels from the beginning. However, instead of taking that easy route, Sirene had gone the extra mile providing many chances of salvation for the misguided fools. The subsequent chaos ritual incident had only further proven Sirene's seemingly boundless wisdom and foresight. The scholar was sure of it. In a way, Wilmana was stumped. She never would have guessed the Holy Daughter to be so humane. Being humane, it was a description so rarely used these days even as a scholar she had to triple verify the proper meaning of the word. Wilmana vividly remembered what might be the last time she saw Sirene alive and well, stepping out from a safe zone to face a greater demon alone. Watching the petite silhouette walking fearlessly into the distance, the scholar believed she caught a glimpse of what could have been a new beginning for their stagnant Imperium. With such a person gluing the different power factions of the Imperium together, maybe, just maybe things could start to change for the better. A new dawn for their galaxy mired by the never-ending wars, new hope in a sea of endless darkness. But that glimmer of hope was fading now, it had been days now, but no information was coming forth after they had secured the heavily wounded Holy Daughter in their monastery. What if the Syrene could not recover from her injuries? That very thought made Wellmana feel difficult to breathe. For the past few days and nights, she prayed like the fate of the world had depended on it. Oh please, our eternal undying Lord and Savior, I pray to thy grace, glorious Emperor of mankind. Please grant us strength, point us to the path, show us the light preserve us. No, I only pray for one miracle now. Dear Lord, please save your own daughter. Suddenly a familiar buzz broke her stupor, it was her personal communication device and Alicia was shown as the caller. At this hour? Surely it could not be. Yes, she answered with a shaking voice. Wellmana, are you alone? Alicia's anxious voice came through. The tone of her voice bodes ill news. Yes, I'm alone. What happened? Sister, Alicia said, stay calm now but I just received special permission to inform you of this. Lady Serene is. Wellmana felt like a lightning had struck her. For a split second it felt like an eternity before Alicia's next word came through. Missing. Wellmana? Are you there? Eh? Say again? Missing. Yes, she went missing. I was just notified that her bed was found empty. Kira is freaking out. 
Both the canonists and Dominus are furious. The monastery is about to go into full alert and lock down if we do not find her soon. I am heading there now. Just in case, do you happen to know anything about it? Don't be absurd. How can so many guards with around-the-clock security not know anything when Lady Serene had finally awakened and just walked away? I will take that as a negative. Alicia out. It was only after a while Wellmana realized she was hyperventilating and staring blankly at her personal device. So many questions were going through her mind, but no answer would ever come if she just stood around. Impossible as it was, a highly secured patient had gone missing under the nose of numerous guards posted by both Adeptus Sororitas and Adeptus Mechanicus after staying in a medical coma for days. Missing, that would mean Sirene was probably up, alive, and walking about. The scholar then recalled the brief glimpse of a new world she had seen and found herself wishing fervently to never lose the chance to witness such a sight again. I will go find her myself. Her resolve made, Wellmana quickly cleaned herself up, donned her scholar uniform, and headed out just as the barest hint of sunlight broke the darkness on the horizon. It was still very dark outside, but she was determined to look for the daughter of her god-emperor. Hurrying her footsteps, the scholar set off, chasing for a new dawn for the Imperium of Man. Serene, into the grim darkness of the far future. Finn, why wasn't I notified of this? Palatine Alicia Sabbath stiffened upon receiving a direct question from the Holy Daughter. The Palatine had personally known Serene for quite some time now and had never heard her sounding like this, but Alicia persisted and stood her ground. I, eh, I know it is not my place to make such a request, but please, let me handle this. In the middle of the business district, a full contingent of Sororita's strike force was moving forward, but their commander was standing still, talking frantically in a Vox conversation. Alicia, I am coming to you. Serene still sounded courteous as ever, but it was clear no argument was to be made of this decision. Please wait. I can explain, the Palatine desperately tried to push her point across, but it was no use, Serene had already cut the line. A short while after that, Alicia watched in trepidation as the sky above was split open with a bright flash. A sonic boom later, a single petite figure wrapped in a fabulous white hooded cloak materialized in the midair and started dropping leg first straight from the heavens. Even at this distance, there was no mistake about it. Alicia recognized the spiritual leader of her order had arrived via teleportation. People around gasped, not knowing what to expect from this sudden development. The hooded figure continued her free fall, moments before she hit the ground, a pair of glorious huge angelic wings suddenly appeared on her back. The wings broke her descent, and she landed gracefully. As soon as Serene's feet touched the ground a pulse of energy burst forth from her, touching everyone in the vicinity. Those familiar with the saint's embrace would know for certain the undisputed authority figure of the realm had arrived. The surroundings went quiet, a few nearby sisters were already down kneeling. Serene nodded in acknowledgement and started walking as her wings melted into the air, the sight of it made Alicia forget to breathe. The Holy Daughter retracted her hood, revealing a face of engineered perfection with soft golden light bursting forth from her eyes, she settled her sight on the newly promoted Palatine. Alicia, Serene called out. There was a paradoxical quality about her voice. It sounded soft and barely a whisper but was heard clearly by everyone around them. The young Palatine lost herself momentarily in the presence of a legitimate child of her god-emperor. Alicia vividly recalled the first time she had met Serene. Back then the prophesied Holy Daughter was brilliant enough but more mundane and approachable. That had changed, Serene had since risen to a new level of presence both in person and the weight she carried. It was not as if she had purposely put distance between herself and the people she knew, but none had dared to position themselves as peers with the emperor's daughter. The palatine found herself kneeling in the next instance without remembering doing it. She looked up and saw Serene looking down at her with a slightly troubled expression as she said her next words. Rise and explain. It was only a short sentence, but the richness of her tone conveyed many emotions, the happiness of seeing a friend, a bit of worry a tiny bit of confusion and thrown forbid, hints of slight disappointment. The very notion that she had somehow disappointed their holy daughter sent Alicia into a mental panic. Prelude. Probationary palatine Alicia Sabbath found herself preparing to do what was previously unthinkable, guiding yet another psyker into the heart of her monastery. Desperate times had called for desperate measures. It had been a few days after the conclusion of the battle for Nusquam, and Alicia watched impassively beside Inquisitor Thabris as the gunship flame Raven banked and turned expertly before slowly landing on the fortress monastery's primary landing pad. The powerful downward draft of the gunship caused the ropes, coats, and purity seal parchments of the people waiting nearby to flutter furiously. Upon landing, a side door of the flame Raven opened and two figures appeared. An elderly lady gingerly stepped forth, accompanied by a young boy. The pair fumbled slightly down the extended stairs to stand before their hosts. Alicia took extra note of the slightly hunched old lady who seemed way past her prime, but conceded to the fact that a psyker's capacity is not dependent on their physical ability. Appearance-wise, the lady was quite short and not much taller than the accompanying boy. She wore a standard imperial storm coat embellished with an inquisitorial emblem. Her eyes were covered behind a pair of round shades while a tall psychic could rose to loom over her frail features. Master Thabaris, the elderly lady began to perform a deep bow towards the trench coat wearing inquisitor who waited at the forefront of the group, but her action was cut short by the man himself. The usually stern inquisitor walked over, gently helped up the bowing lady and asked softly, 
Mage, yeah, it has been a while. How are you feeling? Surprising Alicia, Inquisitor Thabris had spoken with a tone more akin to someone meeting a senior member of the family than a master greeting his servant. Thanks to Zaki, the worst is past. It seems like I will be sticking around to continue my service. The old lady replied with a smile while reaching towards the young boy who came with her. But as her hand touched the boy she recoiled suddenly, as if she had just grazed hot metal. Ah, oh, sorry, Zaki, she quickly apologized. The little boy, who was wearing a simple gray tunic, merely looked at the old lady with a blank expression and shook his head. A pariah, Alicia noted. I see his null powers are growing. We might need to get an inhibitor for him soon, Thabris remarked. Come, I will get you acquainted. The Inquisitor then turned to Alicia and formally introduced the old lady, Palatine Alicia. This is Throne Agent Yahai May as mentioned in our previous discussions. With her help, we will have a better chance on the second attempt. Alicia nodded slightly before ignoring the newcomers. Due to indoctrination, professional indifference was the greatest courtesy she could conjure for them at the moment. The Palatine then remarked to Thabris, I pray for it to work this time too. It has been such a monumental task to have all the parties agree on the procedure in the first place. Agreed, Palatine. We need her back as soon as possible. Thabris nodded and continued. Agent Yahai was in a medically induced coma until recently due to all the happenings. Please see to her well-being while she is here in your care. That done, Thabris left with his party on board the Flame Raven. Sometime later, in the most secured chamber within the monastery, Alicia observed the gathering of three psychers and noted that while they did not speak much with one another, the relaxed body language of the old lady suggested she was glad to be reunited with Fulton and Salih. They must be communicating telepathically, Alicia realized. In the aftermath of the Greater Demon's incursion, there had been a flurry of purity tests done on all the important people involved for possible warp taint. The young palatine witnessed how the two psychers were worked to the bone, and even with her predisposition against witches, she felt a hint of sympathy for them. Before Alicia realized it, she and most of Inquisitor Thabra's party had become fairly acquainted during the grueling period. Turning to the heavily augmented figure standing in the middle of the chamber, Alicia asked in a vain hope for new developments. Magos, any changes? Magos Valpratis, who presided over the procedure, replied flatly, None. Despite her being in supposed perfect physical health for more than enough time, she still shows no signs of waking up. He then turned to Sister Hospitaler Verita, who was standing nearby. All key personnel are present. We are ready to begin the second attempt. Throne willing, we will have better luck this time, and wake her up from the inside, Verita Kern who was overseeing the event for the Inquisition remarked solemnly. Moments later, Alicia observed the ongoing procedure with her arms crossed. From her point of view, all she could see was the three psychers gathered behind the holy daughter on her bed. Both Fulton and Salih had one hand each holding onto the shoulder of Yahai. The old lady was the only one who had both her hands lightly touching Syrian's temples, and they had been at it for quite some time now. While Alicia could not see what was really going on, Judging by the strained expressions of all the psychers and the perspiration gathering on their foreheads, she suspected it was not going smoothly at all. The Palatine also noted with mild discomfort as the air inside the chamber seemed to grow thicker with each passing moment. Then the uneasy silence was broken by Balpratus' unexpected announcement. The patient is exhibiting unusual brainwave patterns. Before Alicia could decide whether that was good news or bad, she noticed the psychers starting to shiver with even heavier perspiration. Is that normal? Alicia wanted to ask, but the temperature inside the chamber abruptly plummeted. Alarmed by the unexpected event, the Palatine looked to the sister hospitaler who was supposedly more experienced in such procedures and saw Verita's unconcealed surprised face, and then, B.A.M. There was a bright flash accompanied by a shockwave, sending the psychers and medical tools flying. Verita screamed as a thin layer of frost formed instantly inside the medical bay, rapidly covering the floor and most surfaces except for Serene and her bed. Alicia had raised her gloved hand just in time to shield her face from the blast. With clenched teeth she peeked into the direction of Serene and to her horror witnessed a misty figure forming above the unmoving holy daughter. Alicia silently cursed all the people who had assured the safety of the procedure and reached for her bolt pistol, but froze as she started to recognize the solidifying figure. Wait, this, this couldn't be. Alicia's eyes widened and her jaw dropped. Trembling, she took a quick glance and confirmed that the pentagramic wards that were installed inside the chamber by the Inquisition were still intact. This was no warp breach. The frozen marble rang crisply as Alicia dropped to her armored knees, and hers were not the only one as the sound of robed and armored knees falling to the floor echoed in the whole chamber. Alerted by the loud commotion, the Celestian squad guarding just outside the door stormed in with weapons raised, but upon witnessing the scene inside, the elite sisters too lowered their weapons and fell to their knees. There, above the unmoving holy daughter, was the translucent but unmistakably regal visage of the emperor. The astral form of the master of mankind seemed to be made up of holy lights, shining with countless colors and flickering unstably before speaking in a voice that was heavy with displeasure. It was but a whisper, yet the weight behind the words boomed like thunder. Plus your presence here is not authorized. Plus. Everyone flinched at the accusatory tone from the sovereign of their species, and in response some bowed their heads so hard they were slamming their foreheads onto the ground. Most if not all were trembling uncontrollably, Alicia included. 
Just as they were expecting divine retribution, the manifestation together with the sudden frost quickly dissolved into the air, leaving a chamber of bewildered Imperials. Alicia blinked, and then blinked again to confirm the phenomenon had ended. Breathing heavily, she slowly picked herself up from the floor, her sight refusing to leave the spot where he had once been. The Palatine remained stunned for a few more seconds before snapping back to her senses, and together with Verita she hurried to Serene, finding the Holy Daughter still unresponsive but otherwise unharmed. The Hospitaller quickly went through a series of checks on Serene before giving Alicia a quick nod, signaling everything was fine. Sighing with relief, Alicia asked, Magos, status of the Holy Daughter? The Tech Priest, who was standing utterly still during the whole event, uttered some binary before looking at his instruments, and after a while he gave a metallic reply. Her status has reverted back to pre-procedure. Are you sure? Confirmed, Palatine. Alicia took another deep breath before walking towards the psychers who were still sprawled on the floor. She reached for the man by his collar, pulling him up and finding herself practically shouting with a hoarse voice. What in the name of throne was that? Explain it to me now. The dazed psyker, blood flowing down from his nose and ears, simply held up his hands but did not reply. It was Yahai who coughed an answer on his behalf. A moment please, sister. I can explain. After being helped up by Tsali, the aged psyker took a moment to tidy up herself and went before Serene. She bowed deeply and whispered for forgiveness before talking in a shaky voice. We weren't strong enough. Even with the three of us, our combined effort was like a breeze blowing at a fortress gate. We could not get in. So, we changed our approach. We pushed and pushed on her mental wall until a ripple was created. Then we peeled at the highest point of that ripple with all our strength to look inside, but everything bounced back. And that created what we saw just now? Alicia pressed. Yahai nodded shakily. While Sirian's legitimacy seemed to be proven yet again, her condition had remained the same. The bittersweet result had Alicia wanting to pull her hair off in frustration, but instead she held her hands together and whispered a prayer. By the Emperor's grace, please come back to us, holy daughter. Premonition. Something had arrived. Something huge. An angry twisted thing. A thing that should not have existed in this world. Its existence should not have been possible but a price was paid. Be warned, it is here to seek you out. You? Yes. You with their anathema's bloodline. Now an equal or greater price must be paid to see it gone or this world of man will die. Again, you are its target and the key to its banishment. I regained consciousness. The first thing I heard was Verita berating someone. She was sounding like a pissed-off girlfriend on a messy breakout, but that was so contradictory to my mental image of her. Verita. I called out. My voice sounded weak, surprising even myself. I opened my eyes and was immediately blinded by the bright medical light shining down at me. It made me reflexively raise my hand to block the illuminations. Someone gasped and grabbed my hand. It was Wellmana. Verita. Lady Syrian has woken up. Wellmana, where am I? Help me up. No, you need to stay down. She popped into my view, her face full of concerns. No, get me up. The war, what happened to the war? And the thing. A cold chill went down my spine as the premonition I felt during my delirium state surfaced. Thanks to your song the last I heard from the front line was that the war is being wrapped up. Wellmana answered reverently. Song. I was confused. Oddly enough the level of respect coming from her to me seemed to have gone up a notch. Why is this happening after my shameful performance of fainting on the most critical battle? Lady Serene. Verita came running to me as Wellmana was helping me to sit up. My lady, is it true? I have tried to verify with the quartermaster of the fortress, but is it true you have not eaten a single meal since you're staying at the fortress? Meal. I was stumped for a moment before remembering I never once felt hungry and was being swamped by the never-ending amount of meetings ever since the start of my lodging at the fortress. Now that I think about it, I hardly even drank a sip of water. No, I have not eaten anything at the fortress. Verita choked on her breath upon hearing my answer, but before she could say anything more a skull probe that had been silently hovering nearby became active and floated in front of me. Serene? My princess. Are you operational? It was Cryptorer. I held my hand up at Verita and then pointed at the probe that shut down her impending berating. Crypto. Sorry I fainted. What happened while I was out? I have good news and bad news. Good news first. Your plan worked. We got all three Bane Blades and there were little casualties. The majority of the fighting had stopped and still no signs of the renegade Astartes. That concludes the good news. I gulped. Please continue. Now the bad news. Inquisitor Thorn arrived at the ritual site finding only it in ruins with dead cultists. A high-threat level warp entity had come through, and it had already left the site. While the Inquisitor did not inform me of this, but I know he had deemed its threat level to be serious enough to order his ship to prepare for exterminatus. Wait, what? What came through? By the Inquisitor's request, I had some of my reconnaissance assets tailing it now. Sending to you field imaging now, it is heading towards the center of the battlefield as we speak. An image popped up in my vision, confirming my dread. There amongst the landscape, flying at incredible speed was a gigantic horned humanoid entity with leathery wings, a bloodthirster, probably the angrier type. But why? Didn't we cut down the bloodshed to a very low level with the actions we had taken? And why was it in black color? A greater demon in the physical realm. Whatever it entails, I was guessing it was not as simple as shooting it down like in the video game. The very existence of this being was already defying the natural law of the universe. Crypto, 
How powerful is this thing? Can we send in mass soldiers and tanks to grind it down? Regarding that question, I had tried backtracking its path from the ritual site and found this. Relaying recorded pick feed to you now. Another vision popped up in my view. It seemed to be from the point of view of a skull probe. At first, I could not tell what I was seeing. It was as if my brain was refusing to acknowledge the ridiculous sight. After a short while like a switch being turned on, I saw the vision as what it was, a scene of pure carnage, the aftermath of some uber butchery. It was a field completely stained red and black with blood. Chunks of what appeared to be human parts, broken bones and random innards could be seen littering everywhere accompanied by a sea of burning wrecks. The level of violence needed to create this scenery was borderline satirical. Something was making a statement. From the clues gathered on site, this would be the 144th Mobile Infantry Division of the Rebel Army led by a Colonel Arnold. Crypterer continued to explain as the view on the field of carnage moved to a particular spot, focusing on a pile of splattered flesh. This appears to be the deceased colonel. The identification tag and what was left of the lower jaw is a match with the dental records. With this we can deduce conventional troops and tactics might be totally ineffective against this warp spawn. I was speechless. My survey of the site had also uncovered another interesting fact. The warp spawn appeared to be gaining strength, as evidence suggests the level of blunt trauma force applied to the troops was steadily increasing after the initial contact from this area. Crypterer continued to explain away, but my mind was already tuning out, looking at the larger picture and its implications. This thing was gaining strength by slaughtering people. If left alone it will just continue gathering power from all the killings, as it does so it might even summon more of its kin to escalate the slaughtering. My mind went to the billions of people here, the psychic beacon, and the incoming ships. Suddenly I saw nothing but a literal sea of blood. My blood ran cold. I shivered. This thing might be the end of us all. What am I supposed to do? Run away? We can still run, right? Leave this planet. Leave the beacon. Leave the people. Then I remembered the combined souls of all the people I saw in that sea of wishes and my pledge to the sisters. The premonition I experienced earlier came back to me like lightning. You are its target and the key to its banishment. Damn it. Throne damned it. I. I had made up my mind. Crypto. Yes, omniscient princess. I await your directive. Please send me the list of deployable secret weapons you are willing to depart for the final gambit of this venture. We will see if the situation is salvageable from there. It could be a hard sell, but using older toys to trade for shiny new ones should be a tempting prospect even for famous hoarders like them, and I was sure the Arch Dominus was keeping a few cards hidden. So I waited for the reply. Very well. And please get me a fast ride to the front line. I need to pick up my sword from Canonist D. Dina. Understood. Finally, have as many forces as possible under your command heading to it right now. We will need all the firepower we can get to light that thing up like the Emperor's Day Parade. B2CH.1 Memory In a world where the Dark Gods literally exist, are atheists the flat earthers of the grim dark universe? Alone in the darkness, she continued to run, experiencing Serene's memory from a first-person view. My vision was illuminated by the barest of lights as she continued her lonesome journey through a long and dark passage. All around I saw sophisticated piping, wires and panels crawling on every wall surface available. Everything looked high-tech yet the extreme dilapidated state of the whole place reminded me of the inside of an ancient tomb. Looking at the incongruous scene of what could only be described as a fantastic ruin, I was struck by the possibility that this place might carry more historical weight than the old wonders of the world from my time. As I pondered on these unsettling notions, Serene's soft footsteps continued to echo in the endless darkness, her anticipation increasing with every step. The journey through the passages eventually ended as she reached her destination, a dimly lit clearing in the middle of nowhere. Whatever they were using as illuminators had survived the ages, a testament to the level of technological sophistication achieved by the people who built this place. As Serene stepped into the dim light I glimpsed down and was shocked to see a dirty rag covering her frame. Even with the limitations of a first-person view, I could tell she was clearly a child at this point in time. She looked surprisingly frail and even borderline malnourished, not in the slightest state to hint at her status of being a transhuman heiress of a galactic empire. Oblivious to my observations from the future, she continued walking, looking for a perfect spot. While the place did not look out of the ordinary, an impression from her memory informed me it was a carefully calculated location after many trials and tribulations. Eventually, she selected a spot to sit down on the cold stone floor, brushing random rocks away as she did so. Her mind was still hot with anticipation as a vivid thought imprint seeped into me. Finally, after all this time, I can talk to my father again. She soon settled down into a controlled breathing rhythm. There was a brief moment of disorientation, and I suddenly found myself looking down at a girl from a slight elevation and almost freaked out. That was until I recognized the platinum hair. Serene? But how? It took a moment before I realized what happened. This must be a form of astral projection. As far as I knew, a certain famous inquisitor who was bound in a life-sustaining armored chair used this technique a lot. I could not help but feel flustered again as I realized just how little I knew of her capabilities. I need to ask her for a comprehensive list when the next chance comes around. While I was making a mental note on this issue a floating feeling took over and my view started levitating up, she was moving. As her consciousness drifted upwards, she looked up and an incredible sight came into view. For a moment, I could not comprehend what I was seeing. Above was the rapidly approaching ceiling, 
but beyond it with my psychic sense I could clearly see a dark void with many shining, blinking lights. In the middle of it all was a titanic, blinding ball of light. For the lack of better words, it was like looking at a very large sun in the night sky. My mind quivered at the eerie sight but Serene was unperturbed and continued to climb upwards. Soon her consciousness flew into the solid-looking ceiling and passed through it like a ghost. Layers and layers of rocks, earth and unknown material were soon whisking by, but the strange psychic sight remained in view. Serene continued to climb, getting closer and closer to the still distant radiance until suddenly something barred her way forward. Like hitting an invisible wall on a no-clip flight, something stopped her ascent. This seemed to be within her expectation as Serene showed no signs of being surprised. She looked longingly at the huge ball of light for a few seconds before going the other way, towards the other shimmering but much smaller lights on the other far end. As she moved closer towards those lights in the distance, it felt like deja vu as if I had seen lights like these before. Digging into my memory, a single mental image emerged, it was the astropath when I entered a psychically active state for the first time. So all these are souls of psychers? It was then that I recalled an old lore of this universe, it mentioned that powerful psychers shone like stars in the immaterium. Looking closer, those small shining lights did remind me of Aratus the astropath I had witnessed in my psychically active state. All those shining little lights were psychers in the distance, and they all had a different degree of brightness. Supposedly the more powerful they were the brighter they shone. I then looked back at the huge ball of light in the far distance and had an epiphany. That meant, my mind froze as I realized what, or rather who, the titanic ball of light was all along. Dwarfing all the others by a sheer magnitude of power, glowing like a supernova in the darkness of the psychic space could be only one person, the Emperor, the Master of Mankind, Big E himself. While my mind shuddered at the realization, Sirian had finally moved close enough to the cluster of lights for me to see them properly. Men, women, and even children of all ages were clustered together, their souls flickering in the void. As Sirian flew into the throng of glowing souls, the details of her plan seeped into me. There was a powerful barrier blocking the way forward, so she planned to go through it by attaching herself onto another mind. Looking around, she soon found a target with the correct resonance and dove into the mind of a girl. Instead of taking over, she hid herself behind the host's lethargic mind and waited. The girl whose mind Serene had latched on was unaware of what happened and continued on her journey. She continued to walk for a long time until she approached the barrier. Just when the girl was about to cross the barrier, Serene forgot herself and became. Naloria Jarius, and the memories from the host started pouring over. Naloria, no, I was born on an agricultural world and lived a mundane life. One day I started manifesting weird powers, it started as a silly thing and the local priest took notice. Soon some powerful people arrived and I was picked up by a ship from the sky. Little was said and nothing was explained but I was going off world. It was exciting yet scary at the same time. That was when the nightmare started. Everything was a blur but I knew we traveled for a long time on board a starship. There were others who were like me on the ship but I never saw them. Sometimes in my delirious confinement I could hear whispers. Most were gibberish and curses. Amongst the voices there was one which kept saying we were heading towards Holy Terra. But I doubted it since the throne world was so far away, and even wealthy pilgrims were known to die while waiting for their turn to visit the birthplace of Imperium. Finally the starship arrived at its destination. After making it to the surface of the unknown planet and participating in more tests, I and the others were moved to a featureless facility. It was huge and we had been walking for a while now. My feet ached, my feeble limbs were shaking with exhaustion. The excitement had long since died. I was scared and wanted very much to just go home, but I no longer even remember what home looked like. Barrier passed. It worked. Awakened from my trance, I detached myself from the poor girl's mind and flew away from the throng of fledgling psychers. Ahead was the target destination just a distance away. A great mixed feeling of unease and unparalleled joy rose together on the uncertainties ahead, but I steeled my resolve and before long reached the edge of the titanic glowing globe. The sight was both breathtaking and terrifying. In front of me was a wall of psychic light pulsing with immeasurable intensity, sending otherworldly brightness into the infinite ethereal abyss. Even at this close a distance, when I tried to get hold of his consciousness it was no use, like so many attempts before it felt like he was here but also everywhere at the same time. I stepped forward into the light. The depthless power in this space filled me with unease, it felt like sacrilege just to be here. I gazed into the blinding and pulsing lights and called out in point-blank range. Plus father. Plus. No reply. So I tried again. Plus father. I am here. Plus. Again nothing happened. I was about to attempt a third time when suddenly the pulsing of light stopped for a microsecond before the space around me exploded with psychic wind. With that, an impossible voice spoke. Plus who? Plus. He responded. I shivered with joy upon recognizing the voice that reverberated from everywhere. Before I could respond further, the titanic globe of psychic light snapped into focus and glowed brighter still. It was like witnessing a sentient sun waking up. Immediately my surroundings shook as an ultra-dense psychic pressure hit me like a truck. I was stunned by the impact and got pushed back out into the void. With some difficulties I regained my bearings to witness an impression of a man forming at the core of the blinding radiance. I trembled with equal parts anticipation and astonishment as the visage of an impressive figure started to solidify. It was a tall, towering man encased in an impossibly imperious golden armor. 
Motifs of proud-looking double-headed eagles were edged all over the emerging armored form that was wreathed in a holy aura. There were impressions of long, black straight hair flowing from a head obscured in a blinding halo. I tried to make out the emerging figure's face but could not make out any features. It was like staring into the sun. Plus father, plus. The figure did not reply. Plus father. It is me, Serene. Plus. I called out again while raising my astral arm in a vain attempt to reduce the incoming pressure. An unfathomable amount of psychic power was gathering around the figure. I shuddered at the unimaginable gap between us. The sheer magnitude of power difference was like comparing a light bulb to the sun. I knew the figure was looking at me. His attention alone burned, yet that was nothing compared to what came next. With a voice like a chorus of a million people, he gazed at me without any hint of recognition while dropping a world-shattering statement in an angry tone. Plus, your presence here is not authorized. Plus. B2CH.2 Revelations. My father did not recognize me. The shocking realization plunged me from my ecstatic state about the reunion to utter horror. Up until now, to be able to talk to my father again was the only thing that had kept me going in this strange and twisted world. Plus father, plus. I tried again but in vain to get through to him. The concentration of psychic power around the golden figure had grown, so dense it now caused flashes of arcane lightning to manifest. In the next instance I felt a chill as his gaze became positively hostile. Before I could react the pressure around me suddenly intensified, crushing my astral form. Pinned by his powers, I could not move as the suffocating pressure continued to increase until it became painful, and then the pain became molten hot. Plus father, plus I desperately cried out, but there was no reply. Just as I started to feel like being burned from the inside out, a bright beam shot out from the golden figure and what felt like the combined brightness of a thousand suns bore into me. I screamed soundlessly, and my lonely life flashed before my eyes. For the longest time everything I knew was from that incubation chamber. The learning, the yearning, the waiting and more waiting to be useful, to serve my father and his empire. And now it felt like the end. I believed this was my final moment as the torment became unbearable and felt my very essence begin to melt and disintegrate. But it is fine, without my father's recognition, I. Suddenly the intense brightness subsided and pressure disappeared. I was left floating, dazed and in excruciating agony. Forcing myself to look up, I saw the blinding figure was motionless but observing. This was reminiscent of the first time I met him. Finally, he spoke again. Plus you, number 21. Plus, 21? Unaware of my assigned number, I tried to process the revelation while wincing through the pain. He finally recognized me? Plus I remember now. I had locked you away myself. Plus he continued coldly. Plus father, plus trembling in pain, I only managed to whimper. Plus how are you here? Did you betray me too? Plus? Shocked by a sudden accusation of treachery, my thoughts went blank. Receiving no response, he reached out and in the next instance I felt my mind being pried open by an overwhelming force. Another session of tormenting pain commenced as my life flashed before me again. Every thought, every emotion I ever had was laid bare before the psychic interrogation. Like an unimpressed reader flipping through a book, he saw everything. Finally, the stranglehold on my mind was released and he spoke again. Plus 21. Experimental weapon. Abandoned project. Plus despite being delirious from the mental torture, I flinched at the implications of his statement. Abandoned weapon? Was I just that all along? Plus you are a weapon. A weapon for an era that never arrived. Plus after saying those words, his gaze started to turn, fixated on something beyond the dark void surrounding us. Plus alas if it is any of the loyal ones from the 20, I can do a lot more. So, so much more. Plus the golden figure continued to speak, but alarmingly it felt like he was just monologuing rather than talking to me. It was as though I had immediately been forgotten and ignored. I was finally reunited with my creator, but never felt so lost. Many thoughts went through my shell-shocked mind, but one thing had become apparent. He is insane. Just as a sense of suffocating numbness was taking over, I suddenly recalled the mention of others. Was he referring to my many brothers? Whatever happened to them all? Were they ever treated like this? I wanted to know. I need to know. Seeing a sliver of psychic link that was used for my interrogation still existed, even in my agonizing state a dangerous curiosity took over. I peeked at the towering golden figure, confirmed his attention was still totally elsewhere, and decided to take a risk. Holding on to our connection, I tried to replicate what he did on the mind reading end. The world went blinding white, then came darkness. An incredible sense of omnipotence took over as my view broadened to countless worlds and human souls. I lost myself as my consciousness was stretched thin across a colossal distance and saw everything. I saw a galaxy, his empire, the Imperium of Man. In the depthless void of space millions of great ships traveled. Most were toiling on deliveries but a large number were exchanging city-killing firepower against countless enemies. Enemies of different breeds that surrounded the galaxy-spanning Imperium on all sides, that threatened it from within as well as without. A sense of perpetual suffering permeated throughout the Imperium as dozens of apocalyptic wars could be felt happening this very moment. My consciousness further focused onto the scene. As I got closer, the numberless viewpoints that were too vast for my mind narrowed down. I saw thousands of worlds where humans were fighting other humans, aliens and mutants. Countless armies were waging wars across the galaxy. Repulsed and morbidly curious in equal measures at the carnage on display, I kept getting closer until I immersed myself through the eyes of these people. 
I was a guardsman, frantically blasting green-skinned aliens with my squad in a trench flooded with relentless rain. The lost beams from my weapon hit their mark, but the tide of aliens still pushed through the line. A large brute climbed into the trench near me, cutting down Sergeant Thane with a brutal swing and came at me next. I dodged its attack, but more aliens were pouring into the trench. There was no escape. I rolled on the ground and just managed to pull the pin off my grenade before receiving a slash to my face. I was a citizen caught in the crossfire between the planetary defense force and an insurgency, bleeding out on the battered street of the subsector's capital city. I was a crusader, blocking incoming fire with a raised storm shield as I took my last stand in a besieged temple on a fringe world. I was a mother, holding on to my child as Drakari raiders burst through the door of my apartment, gunning down people while laughing maniacally to begin their slaughter. There were countless defeats, but also innumerable victories. I was an inquisitor, leading my retinues as I charged into the heretical mob and splitting the skull of a cult leader with my thunder hammer in a flurry of fury and lightning. I was a space marine of the White Scars chapter, riding with my brothers. My ivory-colored gauntlet turned, gunning my war bike at full throttle straight into a squad of Eldar warriors, flattening the slender aliens before they could even react. The other aliens in the Xeno's war host turned to us with weapons raised. I screamed my war cry for Jagatai Khan and the Emperor and charged. Jagatai Khan? Jagatai Khan, a Primarch, number five brother, missing. The answers came instantly through my connection with him. Evidence of my sibling's existence jolted my sense of self back from the abyss. Permarks, brothers, where are they? Lost, dead, damned. No more. Only their scions are left, the Astartes, space marines. Instinctively I sought them out, shifting my focus onto more Astartes, more space marines. Signs of Primarchs, legacy of my brothers. I was a grey knight of the Sixth Brotherhood, finishing off a warp monstrosity in a ruined monastery. The nemesis force sword in my hand swung down, beheading the defeated demon in one clean sweep. The foul-horned head rolled on the cracked marble floor, dragging a trail of ichor behind it before disintegrating near the battered body of Justicar Salas. Injured in multiple places, I knelt down and looked around, just in time to notice a pale young chapel girl peeking from behind a row of pew chairs. No witnesses allowed, I raised my storm bolter and fired. My purpose was pure, regardless of who my gene father was. Switch. I was a shadow, a marine of the Raven's Watch chapter. I was gifted and could hide in plain sight like my gene father, Corvus Corux. Corvus Corux, number 19, brother, missing. Utilizing my rare gift, I simply walked into the middle of an army headquarters belonging to the enemy, yet none noticed me as I stood next to the enemy leader. I watched as the fool committed his entire army into our trap. Just as the enemy leader's confident expression turned to horror as the ambush was spraying on his troops, I slit his throat and then proceeded to massacre everyone in the room. Switch. I was. I was wrath. Nothing but rage poured forth in my red tinted vision. Everything was a blur as I charged forward in a battlefield of frenzied slaughter, my blood-soaked, jet-black armored hands outstretched with murderous intent to kill. To kill a lost brother. But why was my armor black instead of golden? No matter. For I, Sanguinius, pre-march of the Blood Angels, swear by our father's name I will end you here, for you are brother of mine no more, Horus Lippercal. Sanguinius, brother number 9, deceased. Horus Lippercal, brother number 16, deceased. My brothers were killing each other. Yet confusion arose as I knew from somewhere that they were long dead. In my heavily distorted vision, like a frenzied predator, I leapt forward, ready to rip into a blurry figure when suddenly the world froze as if time had stopped. Huh? A distinct feeling of something truly massive from the beyond peeking over my shoulder took hold, and I realized what happened. He was here. Or rather, my father's attention was here. My hunch was validated in the next instance when a voice sounding like a million chorus rang out in the space. Plus number nine? Sixteen? Plus. Hunkering down, I did not even dare to think. After a while the voice monologued again. Plus no. Just echoes of shadows. Nine is no more. So is sixteen. Nine died a noble death in sixteen. Oh, sixteen. Plus. Plus I killed him. Plus. My father killed one of my brothers? The revelation almost broke my trance, but I kept at it. After a while the feeling of being spied upon disappeared. He had moved on, and time abruptly resumed like an unpaused movie. In the vision, I plunged into the previously blurred figure, ripping into the body of a panic-stricken mortal man. With brute force I grabbed the man's heart and ripped it out whole from his ribs. The sophisticated temperature sensors in my gauntlet registered the warmth of my victim's blood as the sanguine fluid poured forth like leaks from a ruptured pipe. Watching the copious amount of blood flowing, I regained mental clarity. I was no Primarch, merely a Death Company Marine of the Blood Angels who had failed, failed in my vigil on keeping the Black Rage at bay. This would be my final mission. I looked at the messy flesh that was still beating in my hand, then the rage took over again. Just before the heart was crushed, I decided that I had seen enough. Conjuring all my mental might, I forcefully retracted my astral self. I knew the risk of harsh psychic feedback and it might even trigger a barrier alarm, but I no longer cared. There was a sound of a terrible tear in the psychic space before the sense of a physical body returned. The horrible physical pain soon followed. I proceeded to cough out a huge patch of blood. The feedback was far harsher than expected. My head was spinning from the exertion. Gasping, 
I wondered how long I was out before deciding it didn't matter. The important thing was I needed to get away from here. Away from all this madness. Panting, I struggled to stand up. Sweat and blood were dripping down from my face as indescribable pain took over my body. Yet I had no time to dwell, as tiny trembling on the ground could be felt. Someone, or something was approaching. I looked down and to my horror noticed the mess on the floor. In desperation something took over, I pointed my open palm at the puddle of blood. Inspired by my horrible experience of almost being erased, I compressed the warp energy in my hand until a small beam of light poured forth from my palm, disintegrating every evidence of my existence. That done, I got up again and started my escape. I ran, ignoring the overwhelming aching body pain while dashing towards the designated escape route. My feet carried me over marble stone steps predating the Unification War. Everything from unknown broken statues of forgotten heroes. Artifact pieces that outlasted many empires and memorized death trap locations dashed by in a blur as I moved to avoid the tightening net of my pursuers. As I approached the final escape point, my surroundings became better lit with each passing moment. Finally, one more long and narrow passageway before my freedom was certain. It was then I felt it, heavy footsteps coming from the far end of the passage, quite a distance away but closing in fast. The weight of the steps, this rhythm, no doubt about it, the Golden Guardians were here. The unexpected development made me tremble with fear. No patrol of Golden Guardians was supposed to be here. Did I trigger some unseen new alarms or? Knowing firsthand how sharp the Golden Guardian senses were I immediately turned around and used my newfound ability to burn off the scent trail around and behind me. I then looked around, desperate for a proper hiding place but found none in the confined space. The inhumanly fast footsteps got closer. Any time now, it just needed to turn the corner to see me in plain sight. Cornered, I wished fervently to just disappear. In the last moment when it seemed all was lost, something inside me snapped and suddenly I perceived a very thin layer of shroud had appeared from nowhere and covered me whole. Before I could figure out what just happened, huge figures were turning in from around the corner. I saw them now, golden armor glittering in the dimly lit hallway and marching in pairs. This was the first time I saw the golden guardians at such a short distance away, and it was scary and mesmerizing in equal measures. They were huge beings encased in mastercrafted golden warplates and had a peculiar quality about the way they moved. Their every movement spoke of hyper-efficiency and precision. The crimson plumes on their high helmets fluttered with every step, bouncing in sync with the spears they carried with practiced ease. Like a tide of golden waves the giants swiftly approached, the passages limited with allowed only two of them to march side by side at a time. I shivered internally, just by looking at them I knew to engage them in combat meant certain death. There was no chance of winning even if I was not already wounded. I can't win this. As I resigned to my fate and stood still to give in, a peculiar thing happened. The giants were not slowing down. They didn't notice me? Is it because of this shroud? Snapping back to my senses, I shifted my body to face them sideways, just in time to slip between them. I watched, dumbstruck as the rows of golden giants who were oblivious to my presence marched thunderously past me, my height barely reaching their knees. Then the last giant who wore a great crimson cape came along, looking like a war god. As he passed me the fluttering fabric came within a hair's breadth from my face. I moved my head back slightly and the giant's head seemed to turn in response to my movement. My heart stopped, but he never looked back and soon, they marched off into the distance and were gone like a passing storm. I turned to the cleared corridor, my freedom assured. The strange shroud disappeared as I started to run again. Looking back, the father I knew, the imperial truth, the golden age of humanity, the glorious enlightened empire was an eternity away now. I just wanted to get away from all this. It was then I noticed liquid streaming down my eyes. A scene appeared in my mind, where a breathtaking girl with platinum hair once told me, I am sorry, this is the second time I cried in my life. So, this was the first time? I remembered now, I am not serene. The Emperor was not my father, the Golden Guardians were the Adeptus Custodes, their names were unknown to her at this point in time. And of course, Horus Lupercal the 16th Primarch, the War Master, the favorite son who betrayed his father and started it all was killed by the Emperor at the end of the Great Heresy War. I stopped running, in the vision she detached from me and continued running forward with inhuman speed, her tiny back quivering as she melted into the distance, utterly alone in the wider world. Everything turned to black, then my eyes in the real world snapped open. B2CH.3 Awakened it was like waking up to a calamity. The moment my eyes opened, my senses immediately overloaded. The overwhelming sensation of ultra-intense lights, sounds and smells were somehow amplified by the intense emotion that was still ebbing from that vision. It was so painful I almost screamed, but that shameful act was blocked by my old friend. Regulus, action override. The sensory overload however was hardly the end of my troubles. Inside my head mental alarms were blaring out. Potential threats detected. Defensive measures auto-activated. Without prompting, a command pulse burst forth from me and reached out, it grabbed hold onto the aforementioned threats while I was still struggling to make sense of my surroundings. Caution. Immediate attention required. While I was still dazed by the information overload, a mental feedback prompt pulled urgently at my consciousness, screaming for attention. Outraged, I pushed back with a single directive. Leave me alone. My command latched out, tethering itself with lighting speed to any tangible targets to execute my decree. Potential threat disabled. Potential threat disabled. 
Potential threat disabled. Potential threat disabled. Further attention required. All that happened in the blink of an eye. Just like that, all the prompts went away. Released from the mental pressures but still suffering from sensory overload, I slowly regained my bearing and looked around. I found myself in a huge, dimly lit chamber surrounded by a myriad of devices. The chamber gave the vibe of a religious gothic setting mixed with futuristic elements, a theme which I was dead familiar with due to my countless hours of diving into books and video games of this universe. It was like witnessing concept arts come to life. The ceiling was high and church-like with numberless religious figures painted on it, whereas the walls and floor had a few gigantic stylized flirtalist symbols. No mistake about it, I must be in a Sororita's monastery. Eerily, no one was around in this huge chamber. The air was pleasantly cool, the tranquility of the place was broken only by the muted beeping of machines. At least it should be, but I was still battling with my hypersensitive senses. My vision was saturated with flashing psychedelic colors, traces of medicine and chemicals in the air assaulted my nostrils while the world rumbled with a deafening low hum. I winced and sniffed from the suffocating stimulus until the intensity eventually died down. Finally relieved from the sensory torment, I touched my face and to my surprise, felt some wetness. Blood? I pulled my hand back in shock. This is... I didn't even notice I was still crying. Breathing heavily, I mentally conceded she was correct to forewarn me. The vision was indeed unpleasant and also confirmed what was widely acknowledged in my hobby community, that the emperor of mankind can be a total jerk at times. After taking another breath and wiping off my tears, I started observing my surroundings and was immediately stunned by the clarity of my senses. Everything was looking even more real than before. Compared with this vividness, it felt like the past few days when I was active my then super healthy body was actually under the weather the whole time. Was it really? The shocking answer came quickly. Looking back, I finally realized during the days leading up to the battle with the rebels and the greater demon, my body might have been running on fumes. It was so ridiculous. I must have been like a village bumpkin who got hold of a damaged supercar and felt proud of myself for going 150 miles, without realizing the car can easily go 300 miles in top form. My god, I am still such a bloody noob. After some self-loathing, it was time for information gathering. I reached out but there was no machine spirit around. Nearby, the dimly lit space was illuminated by what seemed to be my vital readings on huge digital displays. I tried to read the information, but to my horror I could not understand them. For a split second, I was rudely reminded of being an intruder of this universe before something kicked in, and abruptly the meaning of the gothic characters came to me perfectly. What the hell was that? I thought whatever instant low gothic translation mechanism inside my head should be seamless by now? Slightly unnerved, I peeled my eyes from the displays to check on my body and found I was wearing a patient's outfit with a tube inserted into my left arm. Everything seemed fine, all my limbs were accounted for, and I could move all my fingers and wiggle my toes freely. From this point of view, laying down and looking at my body was just like that time I was on that muddy field. Suddenly I was on that miserable rainy field again, pain and cold gnawing at me. I looked down to see an atrocious amount of blood flowing out from my nose and mouth. The warm sanguine liquid filled my mouth with a choking taste of iron. I could not breathe, started panicking and grabbed onto my neck. I blinked and suddenly found myself back on my bed again. No muddy field, no rain, no blood but my hands were still around my neck. While my mind rallied, I touched my neck and realized my rosette was missing. The possibility of losing such a crucial item jolted my focus back, but a hunch told me it was nearby. I sat up from my bed to look around and true to my feelings, quickly located it. Just a few steps away, glittering in the dim light on top of a small table was my rosette. Beneath it was my then outfit, cleaned and neatly folded. Relieved, I climbed down from my futuristic-looking bed to retrieve my stuff. The marble floor was stone cold and a nice chill crept up my feet as I walked over. Just before I was about to reach for my pendant, a nagging sensation grabbed my attention. Intrigued, I looked around as information seeped into my head. It was only then that I realized the place was rigged with a myriad of contraptions that my mind was trying to warn me about. Hanging from the ceiling and aiming at my bed was a brainwave monitor. Mounted high on the walls were multiple motion detectors, and the bed I slept on even had a weight sensor. I could even perceive the infrared anti-theft measures covering my stuff on the table. Everything seemed to be rigged to alert the administrators of the place the moment they detected I had regained consciousness but nobody was running over to me. Why? Looking closer, I was enlightened by the transcendent intelligence residing in me. All the notification functions on the devices were intercepted by my command poles from earlier. They were all currently running in a loop pinning for my further instructions. That meant my countermeasure's ability was activated even before my mind was clear. You are a weapon. The chilling answer in the emperor's voice jumped at me. Feeling conflicted at that notion and not wishing to alert any one of me waking up at the moment, I terminated all the command loops. With all the security measures disabled, I slowly picked up my rosette that was in the shape of a golden twin-headed eagle pendant. It was as light as a feather, but I felt the symbolic weight it carried. The pendant shone brightly even in the dim light, bouncing illumination off its exorbitant finishing in a complex and spellbinding manner. The vision never did show how Syrene got the possession of this item, which made me question if her action here was sanctioned by the Emperor. What if this is a case of running away from home but on a galactic scale? The ramification of such a possibility was no joking matter. 
I suddenly had the mental image of a few Adeptus Custodes guards materializing beside me with their weapons raised. I had seen the legendary Custodes in my vision. The way they moved, the shine on their burnished gold armor, and the sheer intimidating pressure they exuded was still fresh in my mind. Even knowing beforehand that these were imaginary specters, I was taken aback by the intensity of it. I blinked and the mirages of golden giants were gone, leaving me with a heightened pulse. Flustered, I cursed myself for jumping at shadows and decided to change my clothes. I pulled the tube that was still attached to my wrist. It came off with a light sensation and my vital readings on the huge display went flat. Before the built-in alarm started beeping, I made sure to disable its administrator notification function before switching it off with a flick of my mind. I then proceeded to take off my patience's gown. Looking down I came face to face with heavenly curves. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. I... I am a girl, in one of the most brutal sci-fi universes known no less. My brain froze and I wanted to cry because of my predicament, but this time the tears were not forthcoming. Feeling distressed, I panted for air despite not feeling out of breath. The reality check on me playing the part of a questionable heiress of a failing galactic empire hit me like a truck. I was just a normal white-collar worker in my previous life. This is too much. Can I run away from all these like Serene did? While my mind raced, a small voice rose from inside my head. Weren't you always frustrated about the lack of position, power, and resources in life? Here, have everything you always wanted and go make a difference. I looked down at the chained golden eagle pendant that was still on my right hand and slowly clenched it. A short while later, I had cleaned myself, all dressed up, and arrived at a sturdy-looking door. The door was decorated with, of course, a myriad of skulls and other common imperial motifs. It seemed to be the only way in and out of this place. Curious about what was on the other side, I fired up, auspex, and blasted forth a sensor wave, but no readings came back. What the? I tried a second time and received the same result, but this time, I noticed my detection waves disappeared as soon as they hit the door and walls. I realized these were made of either psychic or sensor-dampening materials. This chamber has some serious setup. I approached the door and pushed it, finding it locked as expected. A sensation informed me the door was merely locked by a sophisticated digital mechanism, which was weird but made things easy for me. Using my innate ability, I bypassed the security measures, deactivated the digital lock and gingerly pushed the door. The massive door swung open silently, a testament to its supreme craftsmanship, and I was greeted by a dimly lit narrow hallway. I quietly exited the chamber and closed the door, reactivating its lock. Murmurs of prayers mixed with the low hums of power armor backpacks could be heard in the distance, and there was the smell of incense in the air. I fired up another, Auspex, wave and immediately detected people not too far in front. From the readings I could tell there was a line of Sororitas blocking another group of people. While the presence of the sisters was expected, I was taken aback by the second group, some of whom seemed to be prostrating towards my direction. Who are these freaks? I slowly walked forward while taking a closer look at the readings, recognized the symbols of haloed skulls and held back a gasp. These people must be from the Ecclesiarchy, the official church of the Imperium. From my understanding these guys were usually just bad news, think ultra-corrupt, super self-righteous religious organizations and conservative trappings with the full backing of a supremely fascist state. As I was wondering what to do next, more people approached. Judging by the weight of the steps and the growing hums of power armor, a new group of sisters had arrived. Sister Palatine, good morning. A male voice echoed from the hallway, addressing the newcomers. Good morning, esteemed Archdeacon, replied a female voice which I recognized to be Palatine Domini who I had met once. She had a uniquely pitched voice. Your grace is here very early today. How may I serve? While Domini sounded courteous enough, I felt a hint of coldness in her tone. Palatine, this time I will accompany you in the routine inspection of the saint candidate's condition. Archdeacon, I again humbly request your eminence not to be involved in such matters. Should the Holy Daughter regain consciousness, we will notify the church immediately. Please retire and wait for our notification. Not possible, the latest astropathic message from the Cardinal has made his orders clear. By his decree as the highest ecclesiarchy office on Nusquam, thus representing the Emperor's will, the church has to have the first word with the candidate when she recovers. It is now my sole and only task. I am to personally monitor her condition closely from this point onward and supervise her inspections. There was a pause before Domini replied, My apologies, Archdeacon. Again, I must refuse your request. Without explicit written order from the church authorized by the cardinal, I cannot overrule the orders of my canonists. I understand. That is why this time I have here with me the written order here with the church's seal, attached together with the transcripts of the cardinal's direct orders. Kindly verify. This is, there was another pause before Domini complied with a flat tone that almost masked her displeasure. Very well, follow me. I then heard the sisters parting, and people started moving, and it was only then I realized my predicament. I am not supposed to be here. Shit, shit, shit. Trapped. I was so trapped. This situation of being cornered in a narrow walkway seemed awfully familiar though. Just as I was seconds away from an embarrassing encounter with a bunch of troublesome people, a line of words showed up like a savior in my vision. Activate shadow walk? Yes slash no. After I made the obvious choice, a thin, almost unperceivable shroud appeared around me just as Palatine Domini came into view. 
her face an icy fortress as she led a few sister hospitalers together, with a whole group of religious-looking people walking forward. For a moment I held my breath but it was soon apparent no one saw me. With my back on the wall, I watched an awkward silence as the ecclesiastical procession walked right past me, their many delicate religious trinkets ringing softly with every step, and a cloud of incense followed them towards the chamber. I felt my head numbing just by imagining what would happen when they found out their holy daughter was no longer inside. I gotta get out of here. In front of me was the path leading outside. With my newfound ability and my transhuman agility, I could probably get out of this place undetected. I looked back at the procession again and found myself absolutely not in the mood to deal with religious bureaucracy. In stark contrast, the promise of a short span of freedom in front was just too tempting. Come hell and high water, I will go for a walk first. Maintaining my shroud, I walked down the hallway, past a line of guarding sisters and ventured into the vast monastery. B2CH.4 Monastery. I moved like a ghost inside the Sororita's monastery. Even with my shroud, at first I was still apprehensive whenever I encountered random groups of sisters. But soon it was clear that no one so much as threw me a glance, I was practically invisible to the human eyes. I proceeded with my walk and felt like a lost tourist visiting a holy site, marveling at the impressive interior of the place. All around me every inch of the floors, walls and ceilings were covered with patterns, carvings and reliefs of religious and imperial motifs and the signature dark gothic theme of the Imperium. Another surprising fact was that while the place was huge, there was little to no electronic security surveillance presence in most areas. I was paying extra attention to look out for security cameras for I highly suspected this shroud of mine could not fool machines, as this should be equal to or the same legendary ability utilized by the stealthy Raven Guard Space Marines. By now the ruse was up, I could feel the increased Vox traffic in the air and an obvious increase in the number of battle sisters marching around with sterner than usual expressions. Curious about what they were talking about on the Vox, I dove into the network for a peek and almost instantly regretted it. It sounded like the whole monastery was freaking out, they were screaming mobilization orders and putting all available sisters into a search. Maybe this accidental stunt of mine went a bit too far. The idea of looking for Alicia or D. Dinah did cross my mind but I had no idea where to even begin. I walked aimlessly, wondering what to do next but seemed to be drawn towards a particular direction. There was something in the air, a residue of something powerful calling out to me like the faintest whisper in a dream. I soon found myself inside a huge service hall of sorts with an eye-catching life-sized statue in the center of it. It was of a lady clad in a standard suit of Sororita's power armor. She wore a fierce expression, standing heroically on top of a high marble slab with an iron halo behind her head, holding a huge shield on her left hand while a blade was raised on the other. The plaque on the marble read, Catherine Eligius, patron saint of the Order of Our Martyred Lady, the original order militant majorities which this tiny order splintered from. There was a tall banner and a table in front of the statue. On the table was an incense dispenser and a forest of burning candles, with a collection of religious trinkets commonly carried by the Sisters of Battle. I noticed some of these trinkets were damaged or broken in places. The banner behind the table had lines upon lines of words written on it. On the very top of the banner written in huge lettering was a single word, Martyrus. As for those lines of words, they were all names. Adelira Genevieve, Lucia Dasamusa, Juliana Nihenta, Sabina Lukiae, Veridica Agathira, Ileana de Serra, Regania de Simagora, Adelina Caramina, Elianiel Genith. On and on the names went, I felt the hair on my arm rising upon realizing these were all the recently martyred sisters. Did they lose their life before I arrived or in the recent battle under my command? I was not sure, but regardless it made my spine crawl. This was the grim darkness of the far future after all, war was eternal and the Imperium itself was built on countless martyrs. I knew. I knew that but still, the transition from hobby memes to reality had an indescribably surreal quality to it. I held my palms together for a silent prayer then left the hall, letting my feet carry me forward to no particular place. Damn, I can use some fresh air. I walked and walked. With my shroud I passed more security checkpoints, avoided random mechanious personnel, dodged security cameras, and walked past more groups of sisters until I was finally out of the monastery wall and got onto a parapet. The cool air outside pleased me, it was refreshing to finally stop breathing air heavily laced with incense. Outside I came upon a starless dark sky with random aircraft lights floating around. I turned around and saw the exterior of the Sororita Monastery for the first time. It was a gigantic structure in the shape of a comically huge gothic church with its main cathedral piercing up into the sky. Around it were multiple lesser towers with many guns protruding from strategic locations. The place was more of a fortress than a monastery. Looking down, I saw a strange sight. Beyond the furthest perimeter wall were what appeared to be a large crowd. There must have been thousands of people near the main gate. With my inhuman eyesight, I was picking details like looking through binoculars. In the center of the crowd was a huge figure which appeared to be a statue. Wait, is that what I think it is? I had to get a closer look. The fastest way to get down from here would be, it was only then that I realized my body was in mid-air, and I was looking down at a straight-down drop of at least three stories in height. In my eagerness to move forward and without realizing my own actions, I climbed over the parapet. Time slowed down, the human side of me screamed internally while the other unfamiliar side was indifferent about the fall. 
Then visions of Syrene's daredevil stunts beneath the Imperial Palace flashed before my mind and the internal conflict was resolved. Yeah, this is nothing. I landed without a hitch and felt no more impact than jumping off a chair. The little landing noise I made attracted the attention of a battle sister from a patrolling squad, but she quickly lost interest seeing no one was around. After my quick recovery from a brief moment of feeling stupor, I looked back at the multiple stories high parapet and immediately gave up on the idea of going back the same way. What now? I teetered between the decisions of getting back inside the monastery or investigating what I saw on the other side of the fence. As I stood in the massive yard feeling totally lost, again my attention was attracted to a powerful yet abstruse force nearby, more intense this time and originated from beyond the fence. This felt weird and eerie, is it a sign? I closed my eyes and tried to look inward for a quick answer. Serene, is this your doing? No response. Well, that was worth a try. My anxiety was starting to rise at this point. This walk had been going on for far too long. I tried looking for a way back into the monastery, but instead felt a sense of suffocating oppression just by looking at the formidable structure. In stark contrast, the prospect of checking what was on the other side of the fence looked so tempting. There lies that mysterious thing I saw from the parapet. A fleeting moment, I soon reached the center of the crowd and my mouth dropped. No doubt about it, standing close to two meters tall with thousands of candles burning beneath it and lighting it up like a gigantic cake in pre-dawn darkness was a statue of my likeness. I gulped while looking at the details. This statue, while slightly crude with hints of being a rush job, matched my clothing and pose from when I did that cringy solo performance. The most noteworthy feature of it was the glowing halo behind the head which was made up of illuminating devices. Around the statue were many erected banners, most had the typical message of the Emperor protects, or faith is our shield written on them, and the largest of them all read pray for our saint. How long was I out cold? When was I a saint? I stood there, invisible to the crowd and having a hard time keeping my mouth closed while taking the ridiculous sight in. By then the sky was starting to brighten up. Dawn was coming. I let out a sigh and decided it was time to end the walk. I turned and was about to go back when a disturbance caught my attention. A few people were arguing around the corner of the statue, and their voices rose steadily. I walked over for a closer look, just in time to witness the start of a fight. A few guys were pummeling an old man while the crowd, including a man who looked like an officer in a carapace armor, simply stood by and watched. Attacked by multiple people, the elder man was having a hard time defending himself from getting punched and kicked from all sides. The old man soon lost his footing and fell to the ground, his possessions scattered around. His assailants did not relent though and kept up their attack. I winced at the barbaric display and wondered why no one intervened. Are the people here this cold? No matter, not my problem. I turned and decided to return to the monastery, but found my steps heavy. Behind me the beating continued. Not my problem. The old man started begging for mercy. Not my, the begging continued, now with a blood-gurgling voice. I quickly turned around. Upon witnessing blood flowing down from the old man's mouth, I snapped. What are you people doing? Stop it. The assault abruptly stopped as I had hoped, but there was a new problem. Everyone was looking at me. Oops, there goes my shadow walk. All around me people went quiet. My sudden appearance, together with my matching appearance with their fabled saint, must have bewildered them. There was no going back now, might as well do what I blew my cover for. I started walking towards the bullies while glaring at them. They got the message and stepped back from their victim. I reached the wounded old man and squatted down to check on him. Are you alright? I asked. I, the old man, started to answer weakly as he looked up. When he saw me his expression turned from despair to shock. It is fine now, I assured him. Surely the sister hospitalers back in the monastery can do something about his injuries. The crowd around started murmuring and my transhuman hearing heard them all. Is that? Where did she come from? I swear no one was there just now. No way. This could get messy. I needed to get back as soon as possible. Can you stand? I can get you some help. I offered the old man my hand. Still shocked, he took it and stood back up shakily. Just as we were about to leave, our path was blocked by the man in carapace armor with his palm raised, signaling us to stop. Being this close, I finally recognized his armor and half mass to be the standard issue war gear of the Adeptus Arbites, the Imperial Law Enforcers of Imperium. While the Arbites were quite a major faction in the lore, they were more brutal Central Bureau Police Force than a military force, as a result they were never a complete playable army by themselves, and I was not familiar with them. The officer first looked me up and down, then talked into his calm, telling his unit he was investigating a possible case of Thrill Seeker before finally turning to me. With an authoritative voice he asked, Mamsel, are you alone? Mamsel? Just as I was starting to get used to being called a lady, he had to hit me with that cringe again, together with the man's inaction when the assault happened right in front of him. I had a very low opinion of him at this point. Still, I had to answer to avoid further troubles, yes. The man nodded before dropping his bombshell statement. Do you have a written permission from any mini-storm representative to dress up like that? Impersonating a saint or a potential saint candidate without proper authorization is a criminal offense under the local code of Lex Imperialis. Wait, what? Is he serious? The Lord did mention about Arbites not caring much about petty crimes instead focusing on central imperial laws, kind of like how the FBI will not bat an eye if you litter in front of them. Even so, assault was considered a petty crime for them? No, I do not have written permission. I answered truthfully. 
then I will have to arrest you. Show me your identity. Well, experiencing the Brun Imperial Law for the first time, I was taken aback. Seeing that I did not respond, the officer drew his baton menacingly and barked his order, Mamsel, I am not going to repeat that order again, but I am not impersonating anyone. I said without thinking, which in hindsight, was obviously the wrong answer for him. The officer's chin under the half-mask visibly tensed up, I could even read what was on his mind. You little twat. I bet you usually have things your way with that pretty face. Wait. I can read minds now? Final warning. Give me your identity. He said with a voice so dangerous it snapped me back and made all the people around, including the wounded old man, step further back. Like an ID card or something? I. I am sorry, I don't have one. As soon as I uttered my answer, his thought came through again. That's it. I will teach you a lesson. Shockingly in the next instance he actually swung his baton at me, someone with the appearance of an unarmed girl. The crowd gasped at the sudden attack, but what was supposedly a very tense moment quickly became weird. I watched in disbelief as the weapon came at me at a snail's pace and dodged it easily by stepping aside. Surprised, the officer quickly collected himself and tried for the second time. Again the baton moved sluggishly through the air. This time, I took a step back and observed the tip of the baton gliding right in front of me at a laughable speed. Is he even trying? I risked a glance at my assailant. The man's expression was far too serious to be fooling around. I even saw a cloud of angry emotions hanging over him. His intention to beat me up was real, but he was just too slow. Wait, is he slow, or am I fast? The officer swung for the third time, again attacking with the same lethargic speed. I was no longer nervous and glanced around to confirm my hunch. To my amazement, from the crowd's movement to the flowing of banners, everything seemed to be moving at less than half speed from my point of view. I was possibly in my peak form for the first time. The mere tightening of my focus seemed to make everything go slower, so there was no need to fire up thought acceleration. The officer was not slow. I am way too fast for him. Confident in the difference of our physical capability, I reached out and grabbed hold of the baton mid-swing easily yanking it off his hand like taking candy from a baby. Not realizing he was disarmed, the man continued his clumsy strike and was fully exposed for counterattack. I felt a strange new sensation and in the blink of an eye, saw a myriad of ways to end his life. A hand chopped to the neck would fatally crush his throat. A direct elbow smash into the back of his head should result in a lethal concussion even with that helmet. A knee jab into his chest would break enough ribcage for the bones to puncture his own lungs, drowning him on land. A quick grab and twist would break his neck, and an extra twist could probably decapitate him with my strength. I had so many options to end him now. He is so fragile. Even wearing that full body armor, to me he looked no more than a defenseless sand castle on the beach. While I looked at him with a newfound perspective, the man finally regained his stance and our eyes met. I have no idea what he saw, but in the next instance he recoiled in horror and took multiple steps back. The crowd around us was getting thicker at this point, and I figured it would be better to de-escalate the situation. Please, stop. I said while flipping the baton and offered the handle to him. The man blinked at the baton, finally noticed his empty hand and looked totally dumbfounded. He panicked, took a few steps back, quickly called into his comms for backup. That done, he drew a pistol, pointed it at me while yelling in a shaky tone, stop resisting. I was flabbergasted. Despite all my attempts to resolve this situation peacefully, it still ended up like this. The human side of me flinched at the sight of a gun, but another part of me seemed to be nonchalant about it as it was merely an auto pistol. Nearly a pistol? Surprised by my own thoughts, I stood still just as two more individuals wearing the same uniform appeared from the crowd with their weapons pointing at me while shouting conflicting orders. One of them was asking me to raise my hands while another was telling me to get down on my knees. The first man was chiming in, asking me to drop the baton that I had offered to him. Such a nuisance. This reminded me of all the horrible incidents made by the less than ideal law enforcement personnel back on my mundane earth. A wrong move here and a normal person would be dead. But I was anything but normal now. A myriad of options flashed before my mind. First I could unleash my halo to intimidate them, but that might create a bigger scene with all the pilgrims around. Otherwise fleeing was also an option, with my speed I could get out of dodge easily, but that would risk the life of bystanders should these guys simply start shooting indiscriminately. Lastly there was the option of going fully on the offensive. If I activated thought acceleration and went all out, taking down all three of them within seconds before leaving the scene was a given. They were just humans after all. Just humans? Startled by my own unfamiliar chilling thoughts, I froze. Meanwhile, emboldened by my inaction and their numbers, with weapons in hand the three officers stepped closer while repeating their contradicting orders. Their aggressiveness vexed me greatly. A nonviolent scenario seemed impossible at this point. My grip on the baton tightened, multiple solutions to incapacitate the three of them flashed before my mind. All right, you guys asked for. Cease your blasphemy. Fortunately, an amplified voice which I recognized stopped me from acting out my plan. The new development had the three officers turning their heads at the direction of a parting crowd. They're a short distance away, graced by the lights of early sun. Sister Wellmana in her usual dialogous attire stepped forth while brandishing a staff topped with a Sororita's icon. The built-in Laud Haler on her robes was again blasting orders. By the order of the Adepta Sororitas, stand down. Upon seeing the arrival of a furious sister, the three officers complied and lowered their weapons. 
After staring down the arbites, Wellmana turned to me. Not expecting to meet up with her under such circumstances, I dropped the baton, smiled to cover the awkwardness, and said the only thing that came to my mind. Good morning, Wellmana. It was then I had a proper look at the scholar. She seemed to have exerted herself coming here. The sweat on her forehead shone like diamonds reflecting the early sunlight. Wellmana struggled to control her ragged breathing, and she had a somewhat stupefied expression while staring straight at me, her lips trembling slightly. On one of her hands was a communication device with a voice calling out from it. Sister Wellmana? Say again, have you located the Holy Daughter? Affirmative, I found her, Wellmana said, but in her haste to reply she had forgotten her Laud Haler was still switched on, so that message was blasted all around us. We both winced at the accident. While she hurriedly turned off her Laud Haler, a message appeared in my vision. Combat detected. B2CH.5 meeting again. Combat detected. Cogitatio acceleratio auto-activated. Auspex auto-activated. My powers activated in response to dangers that I was not even aware of. As the thought acceleration effect took over, the world around me froze in time as my sensor net expanded outwards. I was being attacked? Who? How? I looked around and quickly located some suspicious individuals. First target, one o'clock, three meters behind the first officer, a pilgrim with a gun drawn. Second target, ten o'clock, five meters behind the third officer, another man with his weapon out. Their posture, the position of their weapons, the way they were looking straight at me, no mistake about it, they were targeting me. While the assassin's threat against me was very low, Wellmana was caught between the firing arc from both of them. As an unaugmented human, the risk of her being fatally shot from the crossfire was quite high. Unacceptable. Calculating solutions, calculating. As the time dilation effect wore off, I cranked my concentration to the maximum and executed my plan. Time marked. I kicked a grape-sized pebble next to my right foot and sent it flying at the first assassin. That done, I then snapped the same foot down onto the baton on the ground, launching it upwards and grabbing it with my right hand. Before Wellmana could fully express her surprise, I grabbed her shoulder with my left hand and pulled her into an embrace. I spun around to switch our positions, and halfway during the spin the baton was flung at the second assassin. Time since marked start, below two seconds. The kick pebble flew straight into the face of the first assassin with astonishing speed, knocking him out. The baton also hit its mark, but the second assassin barely blocked it with his gun. The impact knocked the weapon out of his hand, but not before firing a single shot into the air, sending the crowd around into a panic and gaining the attention of the other two officers. Just as the situation was about to get under control, the officer who had called me a mamsel pointed his gun right at me, and in a split second, I could tell he was about to shoot. I flinched, had no choice but to push Wellmana down and covered her with my body knowing full well my transhuman physiology would definitely survive small arms fire. The officer fired twice, people screamed. I expected bullet impacts. Instead bright flashes together with loud cracking sounds erupted twice in quick succession near me. The reinforced refractor field from my pendant did its work and stopped the bullets. A quick mental note on the trajectory of the bullets told me the officer's shots were avoiding Wellmana while another part of my mind analyzed the whole situation. The kick pebble flew right past the officer. He must have confused it as an attack. To avoid further escalation and possible fatal accidents, I reluctantly decided to play the Halo card. I stood back up for the Halo light show, but felt a strange, sudden surge of power when I tapped into the ability. Wait, what is going on? Instead of the expected result, my Halo was unleashed with blinding intensity. I was dumbfounded by the unexpected spectacle and the chaotic scene that was on the verge of losing further control went quiet. The brief silence was broken by one of the pilgrims crying out loud, by the emperor. It, it is the real saint. As soon as those words were exclaimed the crowd erupted into a thunderous cheer. The tangible surge of emotional energy from the ecstatic pilgrims seemed to fuel my already overcharged halo further, and new phenomena manifested. Spectral doves of pure light appeared, the angelic birds flying in and out of existence at the edges of my halo leaving delicate feathers that slowly melted to the air in their wake. The extraordinary sight only served to elevate the pilgrim's exaltation further, and many started religious hymns and knelt down to pray to me. Despite being amazed by the scene, I looked up to assess the situation. Most pilgrims were down on their knees, two of the officers were halfway apprehending the second assassin while the guy who shot me stood still, looking totally shocked. I then heard a shaking voice behind me struggling to overcome the crowd's chorus, it was Wellmana talking frantically into her vox. The holy daughter was shot. Send emergency first aid and a suppression force to my coordinates. Wellmana, you were shot. After dropping a quick death glare at the officer, she stood up, looked at me with unconcealed worriedness. Where did they hit? She asked, her tone bordering on hysterical. I am fine. Look at me. I am fine. I assured her. Under the full illumination of the risen sun and my halo, Wellmana appeared a bit disheveled and rough around the edges. She just stood there and looked at me without blinking, her eyes slightly too red to be natural. She had been crying? Not really knowing what to do, we just stood there exchanging stares, I felt her mind unfold to me like an open book. Underneath that charming face struggling to stay neutral were boiling emotions of disbelief, relief, and veneration. Veneration? I was hit with the realization that while Wellmana was like a friend to me, she viewed me not purely as a person but something bordering divine. 
If this was not managed carefully, it could go down the path of some ugly one-sided personal worshipping, as no normal interhuman relationship could ever be established with one side playing God. So after quickly confirming there were no more immediate threats around, I turned off my halo. Ignoring the sounds of disappointed gasps from the crowd, I asked the still motionless scholar, Wellmana, are you alright? Instead of answering my question, tears started flowing down her cheeks. What the? Now what did I do? She then stepped forward, her arms outstretched to embrace me. Not expecting this from her, time slowed down for me as I automatically ran a short burst of Auspex scans on the seemingly emotionally unstable Wellmana. No signs of chaos taint nor explosive detected. With my speed, I could easily sidestep to avoid her attempt to bear hug me but in the end decided against it. Wellmana caught me and actually started bawling. With all the people surrounding us, this was getting really awkward. It was at this moment the monastery erupted with high-pitched sirens, the sounds of war from the megastructure instantly chased away any last semblance of mourning tranquility. Accompanying the sirens was a message that was broadcasted over the whole field, ordering everyone to stay put. Up in the skies I noticed many flyers quickly appearing, and the air itself was filled with Vox transmissions. Much further away, I heard the sound of the gates opening, followed by the distinct trembling of tracked vehicles rumbling forward. Soon a few flyers zoomed past high above us. I looked up and saw many shiny things dropping down. Reflecting the morning light and shining like silver angels, the armored form of many Sororita's seraphims descended from the heavens. To the awe of everyone present the seraphims dropped down at breakneck speed before expertly firing up their jump packs retro boosters at the very last minute. The white livery under their silver-colored power armor fluttering gloriously to the roar of jump packs as they gracefully descended all around us. A seraphim superior skillfully touched down right in front of us just seconds before a whole squad of the elite sisters landed to form a protective circle around me and Wellmana. Many more seraphims descended around the pilgrims with weapons drawn. As if on cue a few emulator tanks entered the area, their massive twin heavy bolter turrets turning menacingly while their lod haulers repeated the order of telling everyone to stay still. Yeah, my out for a walk stunt definitely went too far. Internally, I was sweating bullets at how the events had escalated. Externally, thanks to Regulus, I looked calm and was cool as a cucumber. Despite the arrival of a whole detachment of battle sisters, Wellmana was still sobbing away on my shoulder. The seraphim superior eyed me up and down. After seemingly satisfied with my unscathed condition, she knelt down to me. Holy daughter. Her voice was distorted by the decorated helmet, but still recognizable. I gently pried the crying scholar away from me and said softly, Wellmana, Sister Superior Zarfia is here. Zarfia stood up, sent a brief report on her vox before taking off her helmet and tucking it under her right arm. She gave Wellmana an incredulous stare before saying, Sister Dialogus, I was around the area and rushed over after receiving news of an emergency. But never in a million years I would have guessed it was one of our own who was assaulting Lady Serene. While I was utterly amazed by how the stern-looking Zarfia could deliver such a joke with a straight face, her just worked as Wellmana quickly retorted with her still jerking voice. That was not funny. There was an ambush and Lady Serene was protecting me when she got shot twice by that Arbites over there. She then pointed accusatorily at the now hapless-looking officer, and in response a few seraphims immediately pointed their weapons preemptively at the man. While I snickered internally at the officer's expression through his half-mask, two hovering open-topped speeders similar to the ones utilized by the Space Marines entered the scene. This was new to me as the Sororitas did not employ such units in my knowledge. The color scheme and emblems on the speeders indicated they were ambulances. Hovering easily across all obstacles, the speeders soon reached us. On the leading speeder were a few familiar faces. Alicia, Verita, and Kira with a skull probe orbiting her got off from their speeder just as squads of battle sisters freshly disembarked from the emulator tanks joined in. The place was now filled with the familiar low humming of power armor backpacks. The skull probe floated over and communication was established with a familiar voice speaking in my head. My princess, I see your lengthy reboot is completed. Crypto, while my initial scans revealed you to be in perfect health, are you still suffering from any malfunctions? Hmm, you once told me my brainwave had changed. Any further changes this time? A moment, please. This is interesting. From my records, the deviance of your brainwave has dropped from 70.865% to 49.734%. So did you regain further memories? Some really ancient memories did came back to me, but none of it shed more information on my original plan here. I see. We should stop our conversation here and continue after a final vetting by the Inquisitor. I believe he will be with you soon. While I was having a quick chat with Crypterer, Verita and Kira were checking on my condition while Alicia started securing the area. Being the highest ranking Sororitas in the field, Alicia gave a quick glance at the situation and started giving out orders. She was efficient and clear-cut. Her no-nonsense demeanor with an air of militaristic authority were completely at odds with her appearance of a young lady who was just slightly over half my mental age. Alicia had always been cordial when interacting with me and the fact that she was a palatine of the Sororitas, an elite military order in a universe always at war, had not properly registered on my mind until this point. This was the first time I saw her in this light and it made me grimace inside. What the hell was I doing with my life when I was her age? When Alicia was done she turned to me, looking stunning in her polished silver war plate and practically glowing in the morning sun. When her eyes met, 
An almost unperceivable smile formed on her face and she bowed respectfully. Her unconcealed thought came through to me. Thank the Emperor you are finally back. Just then a third speeder appeared and quickly approached from the distance. My eyes picked up two of its passengers to be Palatine Domini with that Archdeacon dude. The latter seemed to be struggling to keep his hi-hat staying put in the open-topped vehicle. As the third speeder reached us and the Archdeacon disembarked, there was another small uproar from the pilgrims. Apparently he was an important figure to the religious folks. In his elated state the Archdeacon was babbling away while approaching me. Thank the Emperor. You have finally awakened. Such a miraculous day, such joy. Come my lady. We must speak of his revelations, and there is much great work to be done. I winced inside at the incoming headaches. A quick peek at the non-reaction of Alicia and Domini told me they could not help me with this. The Ecclesiarchy was supposedly the civilian organization their order served after all. It was then Verita who was talking to her Vox turned and took out an inquisitorial rosette. She held it high and announced, by the order of the Inquisition, no one is to further bother Lady Syrian before her final clearance by medical examination. I was saved for now. The two CH.6 examinations. It sounded like a war was raging on the other side. Thank the Emperor. It fills my heart with a new level of zeal just to hear you speak again. Canonist Diadino's voice came through. The distinct sounds of mass bolter rounds cracking in the background did little to douse her enthusiasm. She was currently leading a sizable Sororita's force directly hitting the uncovered heretical cults following the investigation leads recovered from the ritual site. I am fine. It is good to hear from you. I replied to the Vox unit, just in time for my enhanced hearing to pick up the half-muted roars of flammers accompanied by the screams of death. I recoiled from the carnage, but the canonist spoke again with a total disregard of what was happening around her. I should be back as soon as these sectors are done. I have to go now. There are heretics to be purged. Hope to see you soon. Please take care. I ended the call and turned my attention to those around me. A few sister hospitalers were wrapping up my final medical examination. Strangely, the whole procedure was done under the supervision of a mechanicus tech priest. Marvelous, simply marvelous. Magos Balpratus, the tech priest who I just met, was canning in binary to himself. Like many of his kind who were heavily augmented, his current post-human form was completely devoid of facial features. Instead of having a face, a pair of large lenses glowed with blue lights in the Mugos' hooded head, illuminating an explosion of cables dangling from where his mouth would be. Despite maintaining the basic human form, the Mugos was completely immune to the art of body language reading, but somehow a distinct feeling of happiness could be perceived from the cold exterior of the tech priest. Such fine, amazing, and delicate work. While already mentioned in my previous logs, it is worthy to emphasize again that the subject is beyond any specimen I have ever come across. Even the most advanced transhumanism exhibited by the Astartes pales in comparison. Just by observing her has allowed me to catch rare glimpses of the magnificence of true Primarchs. Valpratus was rapidly pacing around while his two servo skulls orbited me. One moment he looked like a seasoned connoisseur appraising a piece of fine art. The next instance he reminded me of a paleontologist studying a supposedly extinct species, constantly switching his attention between observing me, reading instruments, and making record locks. To behold the complexity of the subject's physiology functioning in her awakened state is truly a fascinating sight. Fascinating. Fascinating indeed. Eh? Valpratus stopped his pacing, turned to look straight at me and asked, Excuse me, do you understand binary? Yes, I can communicate in binary too. I can it back via my connection with one of his own servo skulls. The tech priest remained motionless for a moment before asking, Did you just utilize one of my servo skulls? Eh? I had been doing that all the time with Crypterus stuff for a while now and got used to it. Now that Valpratus mentioned it, accessing functions on his drone without consent did seem to be quite rude. I quickly apologized for my transgression. Oh, that. I should have asked for your permission first. I am sorry. When thou desire to discourse purely, use binary. It pleases and surprises me that you can converse in our holy code. But how did you gain access to my drone without me granting you user privilege? I have no idea. Again, I am very sorry for that. Inconceivable. Did I accidentally deactivate the security protocol? Belpratus then started checking on one of his many data slates. Settings verified. Kindly attempt accessing my drone again. Like this. I moved my finger up and down and commanded both his drones to climb and dive, mirroring my motion. By the machine god. It is like my thrice-blessed barrier is not even there. I see now why Dominus Cycle called you the Omniscient Princess. The tech priest then went quiet. I next felt what could only be described as a sense of primal fear flashed for the briefest of moments in his mind. Fear? Why fear? Wait. If I could so easily hijack his drone, that also meant I could technically take over his senses and even his body function, like that of a cyborg body snatcher in those cyberpunk stories? The notion of being a weapon jumped at me again, but the very idea of taking over someone's body sent revulsion down my spine. Before I could sort out my thoughts about Praetis Canada again. O oh, glorious Omnisia, this one have again underestimated thine boundless capabilities. Then to the amazement of everyone present, he bowed down and prostrated to me before starting to speak in his heavily augmented synthetic voice. My deepest apologies, I have been rude and forgot my position. Please stop, I don't mind. Are you working under Dominus Cycle? I asked while gesturing for him to stand. Somewhat assured, he stood back up and answered, I happen to have the dubious title of the most achieved Muggos biologist on Nusquam, 
the field of transhumanism is one of my areas of expertise. I was summoned by the Dominus to help treat your injuries. I see. For that I thank you. I'm not worthy of gratitude from one such as you. For all my knowledge, I could do little but nudge the healing process in the correct direction. The miracle of Omnisia's grand design did the rest. If I recall correctly, Magos Biologus are something of a distinct breed of tech priests since one of the Adeptus Mechanicus main creed being the flesh is weak. Specializing in biology of all things was more than often looked down upon by their ranks. Curiosity got the better of me and I asked, as a biologist, do you suffer any prejudice from your peers for specializing in this field? He seemed surprised by my question but answered, while it is unfortunate some of my colleagues treat biology as a subject beneath their attention, all knowledge is equal before the omniscia. Valpratus then paused slightly before continuing, that said, may I ask how are you aware of such information? Oh, it was written in the lore webpage. I almost said it out loud before stopping myself. Just a hunch, with the common mechanic is saying the flesh is weak, and all that. I answered, oh yes. There is no truth in flesh, only betrayal. There is no strength in flesh, only weakness. There is no constancy in flesh, only decay. There is no certainty in flesh but death. So say the credo omniscia. Valpratus chanted almost reflexively to the uneasy expressions of the sister hospitalers nearby, but he seemed either totally unaware of it or paid them no heed. That said, he continued, in you, I witnessed the level of perfection attainable only in machines derived from the divine source. How you could achieve cybernetic attunement without any implant is beyond me. Tell me, can you access the noospheric network? Newsphere. Now that was a really obscure piece of lore, supposedly an information and communication technology system developed during the closing years of the Great Crusade. I was quite sure no way Syrian could. A line appeared in my vision. Activate new sphere connection? Yes slash no. Eh? Dumbfounded. I selected yes from the options and in the next instance a never seen before interface appeared in my vision. Eh? I sat alone in a room, aware of the stringent security arrangements just outside the door. They were not taking any chances of me going missing again. After my examinations, I was brought here to wait for Inquisitor Thabarus and had the time to reflect on various matters. In front of me were many noospheric information windows, floating in augmented reality only visible to me. I was at a total loss on how this technology worked. In essence, it was an information network without the need of infrastructure. The network was utilized almost exclusively by the Mechanicus. To me, it looked like a strange internet without any advertisement. If that was not weird enough, somehow I was able to access it without having any cybernetic implant. You are a weapon for a different era that never arrived. That statement from Big E struck me again as I pondered its implications. The main question for me was, what type of weapon? Definitely not a warlord like the actual Primarchs. Otherwise, I would be another giga chat of uber stature. Instead, I was slightly vertically challenged compared to even the common folks here, that, in my own reflections, reminded me of those social media models with their carefully crafted pictures. Say, Serene can definitely make a killing as a media influencer back on Earth. So, an era where the Great Crusade had successfully concluded then? If, if the Emperor's initial plan had worked as intended, peace and order would be achieved in the entire Milky Way by the might of the Primarchs and their legions. Running low on tangible enemies that could directly threaten the Imperium, the Emperor should then turn his energy to his other biggest hobby, science. Unshackled by dogmas and superstitions, scientific research will march with such speed the armies of Imperium would continue to advance until they reach or surpass even the fabled age of technology. Then the critical webway project would have been finished. The Imperium could then in theory move its inexhaustible, hyper-advanced armies anywhere at any time around the whole Milky Way. In this new era, humanity would flourish and reach new heights. Instead of spending endless amounts of resources grinding on the eternal wars, we would have terraformed many more worlds, increasing our population in the countless trillions. In return, the number of armies we could raise would reach an unfathomable quantity. By then, the Imperium would be so resource-rich and technologically advanced that your average guardsman would be equipped with power armor. Whereas the current rare resources like Terminator Plate and Artificer Armor would become standard issue for all Astartes and other elite troops. In theory, humanity would be able to deploy what would now be considered arcane-grade weaponry like Phosphex, Vortex Ordinances and others in unimaginable numbers. The Imperium would become so powerful that nothing in the galaxy, not Orcs, not Necrons, not Tyranids, not even all of them combined could stand in our way. Given time, we would Dyson up all the suns in our galaxy and attain powers rivaling that even the fabled old gods. As I was daydreaming about the glory of an enlightened Imperium, something tagged at my attention. What is this peculiar feeling? I had a distinct feeling that someone, or something was trying to contact me psychically. The source of this calling was weak, or weaker than me. I could easily refuse the communication like turning down an unsolicited phone call, but something about it felt familiar. I took a moment to measure it, tasting its meager power. A distinct texture of apprehensiveness mixed with a sense of urgency was seeping over and a figure popped into my mind. Astropatheratus. I weighed the possibility of it being a masked psychic attack, but decided the odds of that were very unlikely. Taking the risk, I steeled myself and accepted the communication. Plus hello. Plus. Plus my, my lady. Plus. Yup, it was the astropath. I could even picture him clearly being half-soaked with perspiration from the level of anxiety of his voice. Plus a it has been a while. Plus. Plus I. 
I heard the news. After sensing your active powers, I could not help but attempt contacting you. Plus, plus it is good to hear from you again. How is my favorite astropath doing? Plus I replied, somehow naturally talking to him like bantering with one of my old pals. Plus please, my lady, I am beneath your praise. Anyway, you are not in any trouble, are you? The Inquisitor had collected that scary old lady a while ago, and is probably heading your way. Plus, scary old lady? Plus no idea who you were talking about, and no, I am not in any sort of trouble at the moment. Plus I replied. Plus good to hear that. Plus Aratus then hesitated for a moment before almost whispering the rest of his message in a hushed tone. Plus and, erm, um, while it might be not my place to say this, but please, be careful of the Cardinal. He is rushing back from off-world. Plus, his words reminded me of the Archdeacon who mentioned an astropathic message in that hallway. Being officially the sole astropath on the planet, all astropathic messages had to go through Aratus, that meant. Plus Aratus, aren't you breaking the rule or taking a risk by telling me this? Plus I asked. He hesitated again for a while before replying. Plus well, sort of, maybe. But between a to be canonized living saint and a known corrupted priest, it is easy for one such as me to place my loyalty for the throne. Plus, the current cardinal has such a bad reputation? I sighed internally on the foreshadowing of more troubles ahead before sending back. Plus thank you, Aratus. Your advice is appreciated, but please do not risk yourself unnecessarily in the future. Plus, plus will do. That's it for me for now. The emperor protects. Plus he sent and ended the psychic communication. That left me alone to ponder upon the revelation. So this cardinal's reputation was terrible enough it preceded him. While I was not sure of the extent of influence he had on the planet, with the current backing of two dependable power brokers in the form of the Inquisition and the Mechanicus, in theory I should be fine. After a short while, I could tell Thabris had arrived at the monastery by the increase of highly encrypted Vox messages in the air and the presence of psychers. Some more waiting later, the door finally opened and the Inquisitor stepped in with his retinue of six people. Neandra and the psychic duo aside, there were three new faces. Among the newcomers there was an old lady who wore round shades and a psychic hood. The psychic might radiating from her was on another level above the psychic duo. She was probably the same person Aratus was referring to as the scary old lady. Then came a bald elderly man whose physique seemed too muscular with his supposed age. On his scarred and weathered face was a bush of graying beard. Above that was a big nose accompanied by a pair of green eyes that looked at me with a steely gaze. A dark brown priestly robe together with a huge mini storm emblem hanging down from the man's neck completed his stereotypical holy man look. The only thing that looked out of place for him was the massive eviscerator on his back. The final addition was the strangest of all, a little boy with light orange hair looking no older than six years old. The boy was in front of the group and eyeing me curiously. Appearance-wise, he seemed totally unremarkable if not for the huge Inquisition emblem displayed on his simple gray tunic. Neandra was as cold and pretty as I remembered, looking a bit tired yet somehow giving off the impression of a loaded spring, standing beside the Inquisitor. Fulton and Salee were in the back row, trying to appear chill, but I couldn't help but notice they looked somewhat nervous. There was this uneasiness in the air which was beyond my grasp. I tilted my head a bit, activated thought acceleration to analyze the situation and soon figured out the gist of it. This is a test. Fabris was being careful, just in case I was tainted and became twisted by the warp with my close encounter with the greater demon. What if I was really compromised? Do we start a deathmatch here and now? While that notion gave me the chills, it must be nerve-wrecking for them. These new people must be some previously hidden big guns. Here was a more powerful, probably Primaris-grade psyker, while the pious-looking old man must be a higher fan who specialized in demonic threats. It reminded me of what I read in an old book titled Codex, Witch Hunters. Then there was this weird case of a little boy who looked kind of emotionless as the vanguard. Why would Thabris bring a child? Unless. Curious about the small kid and having nothing to hide, I smiled and walked towards my final test. Thabris bowed slightly while pulling down his hat with his left hand, then drew a deep breath and exhaled slowly while his right hand hovered discreetly close to an inferno pistol before addressing me. Serene. Inquisitor. I appreciate that you are still honoring my request. So, who are these new people? And why is this kid here? A peculiar new feeling hit me as I got closer to my visitors. I noticed the slight increase of gravity drag and the feeling that something was being drained away from me. The weird sensation increased in its intensity the closer I got to the unsmiling boy. What is happening? Is he a... Resorting to a familiar skill, I ran Analytica on the little boy but no text appeared. I knew it. Being this close to the boy, I became aware some of my powers were being drained away, however the replenishment rate seemed to outpace the stripping. In the tugging between energies, a familiar and nostalgic feeling emerged, the sense of normality. Every time when psychic energy was pulled away from me, for a microsecond it felt as if I was a normal person again, feeling the mortal mundaneness and a stronger pull of gravity on my body. I found myself captivated by the sheer nostalgia of it and reached my hand out to the boy, savoring the familiar feeling. Upon seeing my action the boy hesitated and stepped back with fear in his eyes, but I distinctly felt he was afraid of hurting me, not the other way around. What is your name? I asked. He seemed surprised, raised his head and stammered. I am Zaki. Zaki, nice to meet you. I am Serene. Tell me, are you? A carrier of the pariah gene? 
The boy's eyes widened, he then looked down and slowly nodded. It kind of broke my heart. Poor kid must have had it hard. All his life being repulsed by the people around him due to the anti-psychic field generated by his rare genetics, making everybody around him uneasy and practically a walking bane to all psychers and warp entities. Judging by the fact that the trio of psychers were still functioning this close to the boy probably meant his pariah's nullifying effect range should be quite small and weak, he was still a small boy after all. That said, to me for the moment, Zaki was a precious gateway for a brief taste of normalcy. I reached out and lightly touched the boy's hand. That was an action that would have been painful for a typical psyker, but I only felt an increase in the false sense of mortality. While my action surprised everyone present, the boy practically looked stunned. Then it dawned on me this might be the first time in a really long while since someone had actively sought out to touch him. That probably explained why the kid looked perpetually sad. His life so far probably consisted of mostly social isolation and episodes of being shunned by other people. Humans are social creature after all, growing up like that would be mental torture. You poor thing. Zaki, let's be friends. Not waiting for a response, I knelt down and pulled the cute little boy into an embrace to comfort him, while simultaneously enjoying the nostalgic illusion of being a mortal human again. The trio of psychers practically flinched at my action but I couldn't care less. This feeling of normality, it has been too long. For a moment, I was my old self again, being that geek back on earth with my normal self, a mortal, a nobody in society. Someone who would leave no trace on the history, utterly mundane but human. Emotionally, I was hit so hard a familiar message appeared in my vision. Regulus, action override. I welcomed it, for it had blocked tears from flowing. It is alright, it is alright. Everything is fine. I said softly, more to myself than Zaki. The little boy tensed up at first, gradually he relaxed and finally embraced me back before starting to cry while hugging me tighter. Already I could feel my powers had completely neutralized Zaki's pariah effect. Like the flow of a river being temporarily obstructed, my suppressed psychic might push through the obstacles, triggering Psychana Activa. Powering up, a sensory world unique to psychers opened up to me. I no longer had the illusion of being a mortal human, but was grateful to Zaki for the brief experience. Nearby, three psychic resonances flared into existence, two of which I was familiar with while the third, despite being the strongest of the three, flickered unstably as if in fear. I looked up at my visitors and wondered for a moment why the old lady was shaking uncontrollably before remembering this was the first time she witnessed my active state. Ignoring the trembling Primara Psyker, I held the crying boy up, pinched his chubby cheek slightly while turning to the inquisitorial gang. It is all right, Zaki. Tell me, did any of these people bully you by calling you Solus? The trio of psychers were unable to hide their grimaces at the sight of me holding up the boy. I imagine if they were to do it the experience would probably be akin to hugging a molten stone. Zaki stopped weeping and answered in his childish voice, No, but no one ever played with me. Neandra slightly raised an eyebrow while the elderly man visibly relaxed and formed the sign of Aquila. Thabaris sighed softly, his right hand pulled away from the holster to reach into his trench coat and pulled out a flask. Ignoring Neandra's full glare, the Inquisitor took a big gulp from the flask and said his greetings. Good to see you up and well again, princess. B2CH.7 Overview Taking a walk? Taking a walk. We were in another private one-on-one -on -one meeting and Mr. Straight to the Point was at it again. He even stood up from his chair to emphasize the point. Who do you think you are? Thabaris snarled at me, the Inquisitor's displeasure at my antics written all over his face. The whole planet. Nay, the whole subsector might be turned upside down should you get yourself hurt or killed out there. Lest you forget, there is a psychic beacon that might be tied to your well-being. Thabaris looked more ragged than before. He must have been overworked during the days when I was in a coma. Utterly clueless on how to appease him, I resorted to cheating by expressing my regrets with a signature move only performable by girls. Casting my sight down holding both my hands up and extending only my index fingers so they touched each other. I am very sorry. I mumbled. Thabaris continued to glare at me for a while before sitting back down, silently conceding there was not much he could do to punish me. There was a short moment of awkward silence before I spoke. It was just outside the monastery. I had no idea it could be dangerous. He scoffed and replied. A lot has happened. After the heretical cults on the planet were exposed, all imperial forces were mobilized to hunt them down, and in return the heretics retaliated where they could. Why were the heretics near the monastery gate? I asked. Nusquam is crawling with a sizable number of these previously hidden heretics. Those you met near the gate were the loose agents of these cults. As for what they have been doing here is a long story. Tell me first, how did you get out of the monastery without anyone noticing? He asked. I looked down again while replying, I had a dream, regained some memories and abilities that helped me to get out unnoticed but would rather not share them. He cast me a side glance. Keeping secrets now? So say the man who visited with a psyker, a hierophant, and a null who I never met before. Still feeling slightly betrayed by him showing up with hidden aces for my final clearance, I retorted for the sake of it but kept the spite out of my tone. Fair point. Surprisingly, Thabris conceded with a nod. He then took down his capitaine, placed it on the table next to a delicate tea set before saying, both the psyker and hierophant were semi-retired while the boy was a recent addition. I would not have deployed them if there were other options. Sorry, but we had to be sure. I understand. I said with a nod. So what happened? How and why were you outside? He asked. 
I offered a half-truth. I woke up surrounded by monitoring devices with no one around. It was so strange I decided to take a walk and look around. It was only natural he did not fully buy my words. Fabris shot me a wary look before saying, the reason you were left alone was because of an incident. Do you have any recollection? I stared blankly at him in response. He let out a sigh before continuing. When we tried to contact your mind via psychic means for the second time, a manifestation of the emperor appeared. Say what? What happened? I asked, shocked. Fabris did a double take on my reaction before continuing. According to testimonies, when my psychers failed to make any progress on contacting your mind, they attempted brute force and that triggered a psychic feedback. A misty form of the emperor manifested, shimmering in holy light and all. It was just for a very short time, but he gave a warning about messing with you. Pausing only to verify my expression, the inquisitor continued with a whisper. This happened right in the heart of a Sororita's monastery and was witnessed by a palatine and a whole squad of Celestian sisters who later testified, swearing by the sanctity of their souls. You could only imagine, pardon my expression, the shitstorm that soon followed. What exactly did he say? I asked with all the seriousness I could muster. Care to take a guess? Thabris asked back. A traumatic scene flashed before my mind, heightening my pulse. Was it, your presence here is not authorized? His eyes widened for a fraction of a second, and he nodded grimly before looking into my eyes. My agents confided to me it was probably a protective measure or residual memory rather than a true manifestation. Was it though? I gulped, betting on Regulus, to hide my true feelings. No one must find out I might be a runaway from home. I returned his gaze without flinching and said, No comment. Please ask no further on this. Fabris held his gaze for a while longer before looking away. Anyway, the incident resulted in fierce debates that raged for a full day. In the end, the sisters accepted no arguments. Doing what they thought was their best to follow his decree, they evicted most of Cryptifer's personnel from the monastery and even severely restricted the presence of their own people around you except for routine inspections. Hence why you woke up alone. I was speechless. After a short while, the Inquisitor started to make himself a hot drink. You want one? He asked casually. Yes, please. I accepted his offer, figuring it might be unwise to refuse the gesture twice. While Fabris started on the drinks, I looked at his capitaine on the table and noticed scorch marks that were not on it before. What happened? I asked while pointing at it. Those. Fabris answered while continuing to prepare our drinks. I was in the northern region and managed to locate some of the people who were partially responsible for ambushing us on board the Flame Raven a while back. They were less than cooperative upon confrontation. I watched as the Inquisitor distributed meticulously measured portions of brown decoff powder into two delicate ceramic teacups. He then poured boiling hot water from a space-age kettle into them before continuing his story. Naturally, we liquidated them. Do you want one or two servings of sugar? I trust your judgment. One it is. Cream. Yes, please. As Thabris continued to make our drinks, I could not help but notice his every action seemed so purposeful and precise. What is going on in the mind of such a person? Curious, I attempted to read his mind discreetly but nothing was forthcoming. Either I was still new at this or he was trained and protected by the serious mental fortitude that Inquisitors were famous for. Alternatively, some protective measures might be present. What happened to the war? I asked away. About that, while the rebel army was defeated, their leader Kai then escaped and returned to his stronghold in the north, taking shelter behind fortresses and his people. Thabris said while passing me a steaming drink on a saucer. Careful, it is still hot. Thank you. I reflexively touched the cup with my index finger to test its temperature, but the feeling came off weird. While I could tell the cup was very hot, the spiking flash of pain that should have occurred on contact did not occur. Feeling curious, I put my whole palm on the cup and was rewarded only with a more intense version of the sensation. This temperature would have hurt for a human. While I mused over another newly discovered transhuman oddity, Thabris continued. A direct attack would lead to another drawn-out bloody affair with many forces involved, something we wanted to avoid with the threat of cults and renegade Astartes still present. Thabris then paused and took a sip from his drink, prompting me to do the same. It tasted like premium instant coffee with a twist. This might be the first time I properly consumed a drink after coming to this world. While my mind dwelled on such triviality, the Inquisitor continued his tale. Meanwhile, despite our best efforts to control information, tales and picked feeds of your performance were soon leaked and transmitted around the whole planet. W.A.? So much for wanting to keep as low profile to the public as possible. Wait, hold on. What was I thinking? They had already built a statue of me. I suddenly had a bad feeling of where this was going as Thabris spoke again. Obviously, the initial plan of keeping your presence a secret from the public was no longer feasible. Since the Holy Daughter prophecy had long been propagated on Nasquam, everyone quickly connected the dots. After some discussion, we decided to use the situation to our advantage by openly admitting that the prophecy had come to pass. As per our agreement, please remember your current status now. Oh yeah, that agreement. It had been a pivotal point of discussion back then at the fortress, to announce my true identity to the world or not. After a lengthy discussion between the pros and cons, it was decided to leave it in ambiguity. As Thabaris put it, the weight of my status meant I could not afford being looked upon in a dodgy light by the higher powers, as that would bring unwanted complications in the future. 
On the other hand, to brandish my status as a mini Primark without proper powers to back it up would be utterly foolish, bordering suicidal. All that was even before considering the extra layer of muddy issue of my personal relationship with the Emperor. So personally, I would like to delay this becoming public knowledge as long as possible. In the light of that it was decided that if I became widely known to the populace during the war, our side would cover up my true identity with the declaration of an emerging imperial saint. Well, that solo live performance of mine just sealed that deal for good. Thinking about that, I pushed down the urge to face balm. So, to the people in the upper echelons in the know, I am the emperor's daughter. To the commoners, I would be the holy daughter, the prophesied imperial saint. That was the setup which hopefully bought us enough time to gain a proper footing. Luckily for us, this incident also provided the best cover-up story for your loss of memory. Blame it on the coma. Please remember that going forward. By the way, I only know this after the battle, but do you know how many versions of your prophecy are out there on Nusquam? He asked. Stumped, I shook my head. Thabris continued. There are about half a dozen versions of these prophecies on the planet. And guess what? As far as I can tell, none of them are true, and not even the ecclesiarchy knows the extent of the full story. Huh? Dumbfounded, I asked to confirm. Wait, you were telling me the church did not know the full details? Thabaris took another sip from his drink before answering. From what canonist D. Dina had revealed to me, only the highest-ranking Sororitas of the local order and the designated Dialogus Lorekeeper were aware of the true prophecy. So even the church was kept out? Is that even possible? Thabaris shrugged. Think about it. The whole Adeptus Sororitas was founded upon the hubris of a single delusional man who almost destroyed the Imperium from within by hijacking religion. So despite serving as its military arm, the church itself rarely earned the sisters' full trust. Oh yeah, it did appear that way in the lore. In fact, most imperial factions were more often than not portrayed as mired with internal power struggles and double crossings all the time. So as far as most folks are concerned, legend has it there will come a time when this world and its region would face calamities beyond reckoning. In its darkest hour, a holy daughter of the emperor, probably a living saint with connections to the Sororitas, will appear to turn the tide of darkness. Other than that, all details are vague except for contradicting theories of origin. Huh, bloody convenient if you ask me. He said and paused for a while before continuing. Anyway, since the northern region has a more conservative and religious population, we devised a narrative that worked against Kaiyan. A quick propaganda campaign was launched, blaming the ritual and breach incident on Kaiyan. We accused him of being used as a proxy by the great enemy, subsequently nearly damning the whole planet and grievously wounding their saint. With countless pick feeds and testimonies from troops on both sides, the narrative successfully turned most of the people against Kaithan, severely eroding his local support until he was all but abandoned by his people. Even the previously silent ecclesiarchy had come out to formally condemn Kaithan while acknowledging your status as a saint candidate. Cornered, Kaithan holed up in the most secure part of his personal fortress. By the time our strike force breached the final defense, he was found dead in an apparent suicide. The rest of his faction unconditionally surrendered soon after. Thabaris said before taking another swig from his cup. The images of Kaithan's profile pictures surfaced in my mind. He was a handsome man with an air of aristocratic grace that would charm most ladies, hardly the type people would associate with an upstart planetary lord with a grisly end. With that the uprising came to an abrupt end. We turned our focus on cleaning up and going after the hidden cults while your mugos friend busied himself with treasure digging. The cults of course would not take this lying down, their agents retaliated where they could against exposed high-priority targets. He said while glaring at me again, I smiled awkwardly in return. So the civil war has ended. If you are interested in the final numbers of casualties, I have a report here, Thabris concluded while handing me a data slate. I took the device and glimpsed at the report, feeling a sense of numbness at the numbers. Why the long face? Thabris' words made me look up from the report. How did he? The poker face provided by Regulus should have been perfect. You can tell. I needed to know. The Inquisitor rewarded himself with another half smirk. No, you took too long to read. I felt like doing another face bomb for giving that much away. Internally, I lamented at my inexperience in dealing with a true professional. A sense of uneasiness informed me if I continued to operate carelessly and carried on like this he might eventually figure out I was but a useless civilian on the inside. The thought of that gave me chills as I passed the device back to him. If your primary aim was to cut down casualties, it was a massive success. He said while putting the data slate away, put it this way, you managed to turn what should have been hundreds of thousands of casualties into localized episodes of tragedies. By the throne, I have seen industrial accidents resulting in more deaths. You were correct. I just dislike these unnecessary loss of human lives. I confessed with a nod. He gave me another glance before asking, can you elaborate on that? I was stunned by his question and silently cursed myself for slipping my tongue. Am I supposed to explain 21st century humanitarian ethics to an imperial inquisitor? No, I need to repackage my reason. After organizing my thoughts, I gave him an answer. This is a wanton waste of trained personnel. I despise wastage of precious resources. Thabris said nothing, but maintained his steely gaze on me for a moment before looking away and commenting, for your information, more than half of the casualties were caused by either friendly fire field accidents, or belated medical attention. So, that concludes the uprising. Done with the war report, Thabris finished his drink with a large gulp. 
prompting me to catch up with my own drink. While I drank in silence, Thabris switched topics. So, about what you did today at the monastery in the gate, you knew? About what? Taken totally out of my depth, I played the only card in hand, strategic ambiguity and replied vaguely, which exact part were you referring to? Either about the state of ecclesiarchy on this planet or the implications of helping that man near the gate. He said with another shrug. Wait, implications? Let us start with the ecclesiarchy. You might have picked it up already, but I need you to be informed on this. Thabris said, somehow sounding more serious than before. I gulped, readied myself for whatever was to be revealed. For now, be wary of the church, especially the cardinal. He whispered, going full conspiracy mode. Huh, but that was kind of expected. As an atheist in heart who had witnessed countless deeds of misguided religious folks, people who proclaimed to be representing an almighty enigmatic being with a straight face were not exactly on my most trustworthy list. As that thought crossed my mind, the Inquisitor whispered again. He might have something to do with the uprising. Covert investigations are underway. Eh? This sounds even more serious. Can you tell me more? I asked. The details are sketchy, but Kaithen might have received secret blessings from the Cardinal to take over the planet. Now, the real question of whether he was compromised by Chaos Cults is not clear at this point. The sisters were wise to keep their distance from the church during this ordeal. This was not the first time I heard bad stuff about this Cardinal. Understood. Then what about the man I helped at the gate? I switched topics. Thabaris took out his data slate again and conjured a report. Citizen Ritabor Sermerd, just discharged from the monastery infirmary. A retired general of the Planetary Defense Force, his children are listed in the surrendered ranks. For days he had been petitioning in front of the monastery for an official pardon for his children and the others. Due to his ranking before retirement, he had become a sort of de facto spokesperson for people in the same situation. Why here? It became the focal point once everyone knew you were being treated here. That statue outside? It was rushed out and delivered to the spot within a day by the devotees. The mere mention of that statue made me involuntarily cringe again while he continued. Tensions have been brewing between kin of the surrendered rebels like Rudabor and the others who could not forgive their actions. They insisted every person who participated in the uprising be punished with the harshest sentence possible for the demonic incursion and getting their prophesied saint, you, hurt. Thabaris suddenly paused at the beeping of a vox call. Speaking of getting you hurt, you should hear this, he said while putting a small device on the table and switched it on. Lord Thabaris? A deep and strong man's voice burst forth. Speaking, Marshal. My lord, I just heard about the incident. On behalf of all the Arbites, I formally apologize for the actions of my subordinates. Is this saint candidate hurt in any way? By the emperor's grace, not at all. It might have gotten ugly otherwise. There were a few hundred devotees at the scene plus a whole detachment of battle sisters that arrived soon after. For their own safety, your subordinates are temporarily being held inside the monastery. Thank the throne. Lord Thabaris, please let me know of your decision on how to deal with this. Kindly convey our deepest regret to the saint candidate. Very well, I will contact you later. Thabaris said and ended the conversation. That was the top Arbites here, Marshal Galliano Svendel. You heard him. So what to do with the Arbites trooper who shot you? He asked casually. I was hit with a sudden implication that with but a word from me, someone could disappear forever, and that the old saying of everyone being equal before the law was forever a pipe dream. Thinking back on what happened, while at times that Arbite sure felt like an arsehole, I was not sure if that warranted final judgment. Not liking the idea of deciding someone else's fate due to an interaction gone awry, I made up my mind. Please let the marshal decide on his punishment. Is that so? Thabris said, despite his flat tone, he seemed a bit surprised I was not asking for anything heavier. Yes. By the way, what were the Arbites doing during the Civil War? I asked, seriously curious. Thabris started to make himself more comfortable on the chair before replying. They were completely caught off guard by the whole event and were about to launch a series of suicidal operations to apprehend Kai than when I arrived. Since then, they had been operating under my directive, using their fortress as the main staging point. Fortress? I was about to ask before realizing the obvious, it was Fortress Endurance Sigma. The fact that I had stayed inside a supersized Arbites precinct fortress without realizing it made me face bomb internally again. The Inquisitor continued, back to the topic of Citizen Rudabor, your timely aid might be viewed upon as a direct stance to pardon the surrendered troops. I am sure the word is spreading on the street right now. I am also sure your actions have further tarnished the church's dubious local reputation, considering your first appearance was with the devotees rather than the representatives of the church. The sudden realization that everything I do might carry some symbolic weight dawned on me. I definitely went overboard with my stunt and have to be really careful about my actions in future. Thabaris concluded, Now that you are being updated of the recent events, I would like to inform you that my promise to you is kept and it is time for you to fulfill yours. My mind played back my conversation with him on that fateful day when I promised him to look for a solution. It is about what to do with the soldiers that got too close to the demon? Yes, all 20,000 of them. Currently kept in a temporary tent city. 20,000? Thabaris waited a bit before asking. Am I supposed to be worried when the Holy Daughter is giving me a thousand-yard stare? I replied to his taunt with a heavy-lidded stare, and he laughed. So, it is time for the newly anointed saint candidate to work on her third miracle, Thabris said with another smirk. Third, not keeping score? First was your song that stopped the war, 
the banishment of the demon being the second. He replied without batting an eye and continued. The third would be on sorting out the troops who might be compromised by the breach. 20,000 people might be a small number in the grand scheme of things, but the political implications would be huge. He paused a bit before concluding. Should you succeed in this arduous task, it should put enough pressure on the church to expedite their process and formally canonize you as a living saint, giving you the much-needed public political legitimacy to do a lot of things. I would appreciate it if you could look into this quickly. A hunch is telling me complications might arise if this is not resolved soon. Let's go then. I stood up and declared. Thabaris was startled for a second before regaining his composure. While I appreciate your enthusiasm, you are not going anywhere. Stay put here for at least a day or two for observation. In my professional opinion, dragging the holy daughter around after she just woke up from days of coma will result in the whole Adepta Sororitas revolting against me. Oh, right? My shoulders slumped. The Inquisitor continued, Besides, do you know anything about the vetting process against Warp Taint? I will arrange the psychers to brief you as part of their break. They are currently overworked as it is. I realized I would have to savor a short, precious breather before being swamped by whatever was thrown my way again. One last thing, about the insidious heretical cults, Thabra spoke again just as I thought we were done here. From what we uncovered, I believe they all hail to a single leader at the very top. This person, an archheretic with vast forbidden knowledge, should have been at the ritual site during the breach and might have survived. Didn't you mention only finding dead people at the site? I asked while recalling what was mentioned. Yes, more like chunks and debris of dead people, Thabaris nodded. We later found a fresh set of footprints leading out of the site and disappearing into the wilderness. Since we could not find anything of significance on other human remains, I suspect this single survivor might be the archheretic. So, a very dangerous person might be on the loose, another plus one for my countless worries ahead. B2CH.8 Candidate Someone was humming that song again. Malin Hadmeyer was on her break when she heard the familiar melody from somewhere in the sea of military tents. The young preacher was soon humming along when a voice called out to her. Sister Preacher Malin. That song again. Malin turned and saw a young man who wore a similar preacher's outfit like her own walking over. Brother Preacher Xavier. How are things on your side? Like herself, Xavier was one of many newly sanctioned preachers hastily recruited as part of a massive faith validation endeavor for the surrendered masses. It surprised me, but the people here exhibit more faith than I expected. Xavier said with a satisfying nod. I have the same observation. The emergence of a living saint must have rekindled their faith in the emperor. She is still a saint candidate at the moment, right? For the moment, that is true. But in my opinion, considering what we have witnessed, it would be outrageous if she doesn't qualify for her contributions. Agreed. Xavier said before asking, so any new development on her condition? Nothing. Malin said with a sigh before switching topics on other news, some linguistics experts have been cracking at the lyrics of that song. Most now agree that it was made up of multiple ancient Terran languages. Really? For real, the current most trending topic was guessing its title. From what little they had translated, it's only love and beautiful world are leading the poll. Xavier smiled. I can always count on you for any latest news on our mysterious savior. Another sermon session is coming up for me. I'll see you around. Malin watched as Xavier left, leaving her alone with that song in the air. That song, that mysterious song in ancient human tongues that stopped the war. The very song that was credited by many for saving their lives, and later that of the whole planet after the heretical scheme came to light. Everything felt so surreal. There was an old saying, there are centuries where nothing happens, and there are weeks where centuries happen. Malin was definitely living on that latter part as the centuries-old stability enjoyed by her world disappeared with the recent happenings. The Holy Daughter Prophecy, a local legend with many variants that even Malin herself had deemed silly, had actually come to pass. Prompted by the recent earth-shattering events, Malin started doing her own research on the legend's history whenever she had time to spare. From what she was able to discover, records mentioning the Holy Daughter Prophecy started appearing about a thousand years ago, coinciding with the time the local miner Sororita's order was established on the planet. Digging further, for the first time Malin noted the Adeptus Ministorum, commonly known as the Ecclesiarchy, or simply the church, seemed to have a standing policy of localizing its teachings and subverting any local legends to become its own. When the church encountered the Holy Daughter prophecy, it simply took it under its wings to be listed amongst the countless other imperial legends and prophecies. In a galaxy mired with endless war, unrest, and despair, no one paid heed to another story that provided a glimmer of hope. Then it actually came to pass, a mysterious girl arrived and saved the planet from the brink of disaster. If the news was to be believed, she ended the largest battle of the Civil War while preventing massive casualties, narrowly averted Nusquam's damnation, and possibly martyred herself to stop a rampaging demon. It all sounded so outlandish. Nusquam had not seen a major war in 300 years, let alone witnessing a demonic incursion. Personally for Malin, the notion that a living saint could have emerged and passed away before anyone noticed in this backwater imperial world was more outrageous than all the ridiculous events combined. It even made the young preacher wonder for a moment if her homeworld was abandoned by the god emperor to have their saint taken away so quickly. Triggered with a sense of melancholy, Malin took out her data slate and conjured a picture on its display. It was a picture she had viewed countless times, but still struck her with a sense of awe whenever she laid her eyes on it. 
It was a picture of a Sorita's Rhino armored transport tank, and sticking out of its open hatch was the breathtaking sight of a regal-looking girl glowing with a blinding halo. Illuminating a backdrop of a dark and rainy sky, the glowing girl held a sword in one hand, pointed forwards. Malin recognized the sword to be the priceless relic of the local Sorita's order. She had only seen it once in person from a distance. In the picture, the relic sword was covered in bright blue flames and appeared slightly too large on the outstretched arm of its petite user. They said the picture was taken before the entire army and the front lines confronted a towering monstrosity that shook off enough firepower to level a city. Details on what happened was sketchy, but supposedly in the end the warp entity was banished and the girl greatly injured in the process. As the news spread, it soon became a point of public contention and an embarrassment for the church. People could not get over the fact that the church was silent and unaware that the Holy Daughter prophecy had come to pass while its cardinal was off-world on yet another dubious pilgrimage. The church generally had a standard approach for power struggles between the nobility for planetary governorship. Any such local disputes were tolerable as long as the winner maintained their loyalty to the Imperium and the God Emperor. However, recent events with the dark ritual and demonic incursion had led many to suspect that the uprising was being instigated by agents of the Great Enemy, leading the church to finally speak up. Breaking their silence, the ecclesiarchy quickly started a series of propaganda campaigns with their signature self-righteousness, demanding the harshest punishment possible by executing all the surrendered troops. However, their blunt proposal was rejected by the planetary governor Catalina von Cleus, and her stance was backed by the various powerful imperial factions that secured the victory. Even the church's own military arm, Order of the Shining Beacon of the Adeptus Sororitas, which contributed a lot to the victory, objected to the proposal as the Holy Daughter herself had promised leniency for the surrendered troops. Then there was the Inquisition that appeared out of nowhere. The all-powerful branch of the Imperium took control of the situation and quoted in a statement saying, This world can ill afford such a senseless loss of trained personnel in these trying times. Such actions could potentially aid the hidden enemy. Behind the scenes, the Ecclesiarchy also suffered severe backlash from the pious population in the North who had a lot of family members within the surrendered ranks. Holding little true power in the local political landscape, the Church's demands went nowhere. It was then the Inquisition reached out and requested aid for validating the integrity of faith for the surrendered troops. Desperate to prove its worth, the Ecclesiarchy recruited many preachers for the task. Employed as part of the massive effort, Malin had been working tirelessly on her assigned tasks for the past days. Between the sermons she was giving, Malin had been doing intensive interview sessions with random individuals, looking for the slightest trace of heresy. The overall results had surprised her. Instead of the typical Nusquamese laid-back attitude towards religion, most of the interviewees exhibited a renewed sense of faith. The emperor gave us a second chance. I felt reborn and have no intention of wasting it this time, one said. We had all been fooled. Can't wait to get back at the heretics, declared a soldier fuming with righteous fury. I caught a faraway glimpse of the demon and need no further convincing. The Emperor is the only reason humanity still exists in this world, an officer confessed with a thousand-yard stare. I saw the light of the saint with my own eyes, preacher. She was at the forefront of the forces that came to vanquish the demon. The sight alone was worth a thousand sermons. I wish you were there to see it yourself. Viewing it from a blurry picked feed did it no justice, a young trooper said to her. To witness a living saint doing the God Emperor's work in her lifetime. Oh, what she would do to witness such a sight. Malin began daydreaming as she walked back to work when a cultured voice called out from behind, breaking her thoughts. Preacher Malin? Yes. Malin looked back and was surprised to see an individual she never expected to meet in this place. There at a short distance away was a man wearing the distinct garment of an ecclesiarchy deacon, flanked by two robed crusaders. Malin blinked. The exquisite details on the deacon's garment, together with the glittering of his many magnificent ecclesiastical trinkets, informed her she was not seeing things. Why was a deacon directly addressing a lowly preacher? Then to Malin's shock, instead of asking her to come forwards, the deacon with his bodyguards made a beeline for her. As they approached, the Crusaders' sheer intimidating presence along with their towering storm shields kept everyone else at a respectable distance, scattering the crowd in their way. Having no idea what she had done to attract the personal attention of such a high-ranking individual, an ominous feeling descended on Malin. Making the matter worse, she struggled to recall the name of the deacon in front of her. Malin had never fancied her chance of meeting the few active deacons due to her lowly status, and thus never committed their details to memory. Esteemed deacon, it is such an honor. I did not expect to meet you in a place like this. Malin formed the Aquila sign while bowing, silently praying for the man to not notice her skipping his name. Luckily for her, formality seemed to be the last thing on the man's mind. We go wherever the emperor's work demands, replied the deacon with a politician's smile before revealing the purpose of his visit. Malin Hamayer, you have been summoned. Pardon? Summoned? Yes, you are to drop everything and come with me now. But my work here. Pay it no heed. Arrangements have been made. May I inquire who exactly had summoned me? Malin asked, her mind a messy blank with the sudden development. She looked at the deacon begging for an answer. A hint of frustration flashed on the man's face for an instant before he indulged her curiosity. You were being summoned by the archdeacon himself. And so, Malin soon found herself inside the mini-storm Grand Cathedral. 
After walking through many heavy doors leading to the second highest tower, Malin entered an office with a mind-bogglingly luxurious interior. In the center of the office was a huge desk cut from a single slab of marble, its delicately carved surfaces decorated with many golden and platinum elements. Behind said desk sat the second most powerful religious figure on the planet, Archdeacon Rysine Veneran himself. Malin remembered the man to be nearing a hundred years old, yet he looked barely fifty and was still quite handsome with all the Dejan treatments. The Archdeacon appeared to be deep in thought and merely nodded to acknowledge his visitors before signaling the others to leave with a wave. After her escorts bowed and left, Malin quickly performed her greeting to the Archdeacon and knelt. It took a while before Rysine broke the silence. Preacher Malin, welcome and please rise. Tell me, have you dedicated your further studies to any of the Orthodox creeds yet? Upon hearing his words, Malin rose but kept her head bowed respectfully. Venerable Archdeacon, to answer your question, I have yet to master my fundamental studies to decide on my dedication to a particular creed. The man behind the huge desk nodded before asking, Do you know why you were summoned? Pardon my ignorance, your grace, I have no idea. Rysine stayed silent for a moment before saying, As of this morning, the saint candidate has awakened and seemed healthy. She even showed the emperor's light at the gate of the Sorita's monastery fortress in front of hundreds of devotees. The news has been suppressed for now, but not for long. Upon hearing the shocking development, Malin involuntarily gasped and looked up. Venerable Archdeacon, that, that is marvelous news. The throne be praised. Did you get to speak to her? It took a second before the overly excited young preacher realized she had interrupted the archdeacon, so she quickly lowered her head again. To her relief, Rysine did not appear to be offended, instead he answered with a hint of excitement. Yes, while it was unfortunately short, I spoke with her. May I ask what was your impression of the saint candidate? Malin asked, unable to contain her excitement. By the throne, she had an otherworldly spiritual presence that is difficult to define, Rysine replied before trailing off, lost in memory. It took a moment before he spoke again with a tone of wonder. How do I put it? She radiates warmth and calmness, but what really captivated me was her quiet confidence. Combining those qualities with her unearthly beauty, she reminded me of everything wonderful in this world. When she is around, I find it hard to take my attention off her. You will understand the moment you meet her in person. Malin was slightly taken aback by the excessive statement. Surely the archdeacon did not just confess to gawking at the saint candidate? And why was she here again? Venerable archdeacon, while that was most enlightening and I thank you for your insight, may I inquire about the purpose of my visit? Malin asked. Realizing he might have gone overboard, Rysine awkwardly cleared his throat. Ah, yes, the ecclesiarchy needs a representative operating beside the saint candidate immediately. Due to the past few, unfortunate blunders, we cannot afford to be excluded from her future actions. Since his holiness is off-world, the task of selecting a representative falls to me. But alas, this is no simple matter. Naturally, almost everybody wants to work beside a saint candidate and get the chance to witness the god emperor's miracles up close. The choice, however, is far from simple. Give any senior clergyman the position and all his rival peers would scream favoritism, plus it will be viewed as patronage to the individual's particular creed. Rysine explained with a sigh. Malin stayed silent, not sure why she was hearing the archdeacon complaining about the difficulties of his position. So for the sanity and stability of the church, the representative in question needs to be freed from such burdens and preferably a female due to obvious reasons of propriety. When the archdeacon finally finished his rambling, he gave Malin a long thoughtful look before coming to a decision. This is where you come in, preacher Malin. Do you know that due to the presence of the Sororita's order, there are but a handful of preachers in this world deemed suitable for this honor I am about to bestow on to you? Rejoice, you are very lucky. Malin did not believe what she was hearing and felt her head going numb just by thinking about the conclusion of that logic train. She could not help but look up to see Archdeacon Rysine smiling somewhat self-deprecatingly as he slowly walked over to her. If I were any younger and in a suitable position, I would do anything for this. Junior preacher Malin had mayor, heed your new duty, the archdeacon said while handing her a delicate letter with an official Adeptus Mini Storm seal. I, Rysine Venerin, archdeacon of the Adeptus Mini Storm on Nusquam, hereby officially assign you as the representative of the ecclesiarchy to the saint candidate. Praise the Lord, praise the God Emperor, our Savior. Somewhere on Nusquam, a man awakened from his restless slumber and groaned. He found himself inside a shadowy room, his pitch black surroundings broken only by the flickering of multiple monitor displays nearby. Every so often, the flickering streams on the displays temporarily lit up the room, illuminating a man with an impressive physique yet looking absolutely miserable. A long, unkempt beard hung from a face etched with lines of exhaustion. His skin was rough and weathered while his once piercing eyes constantly darted around wearily, as if searching for something. After failing to locate whatever horrors haunted his dreams, he put up a hand to shield his eyes from the flickering lights. Calming down slightly, the man groaned again as painful memories of his life's work burning flooded back to him. Everything had fallen apart. While he knew his supposed masters were fickle beings, he could not fathom what had transpired. He was close, so close to becoming one of them. The muffled pain on his head grew more pronounced, as it did every time the idea of losing his shot for ascendancy crossed his mind. Just days ago, his many decades of scheming and meticulous planning was coming to fruition. Even with the surprise activation of a psychic beacon that came out of nowhere, 
everything was on track. He was but a step away from his ascension, this close to achieving immortality and made eternal. His masters on the other side had promised, they even marked him out as one of their favorite servants. The man had all he needed to reach the apex of existence. By his design the dim-witted imperials were tricked into fighting amongst themselves, and their deaths would be the sacrifice to fuel his ritual. From a hidden site secured with careful use of his vast resources, he and his followers created a breach in reality, opening up the planet for a demonic invasion. According to his plan, the summit demons would assault the populace, further fueling the ritual to allow even more demons into reality, from there the cascading nature should do the rest. But then things started to go awry. The ongoing civil war between the governor and her half-brother was strangely not providing enough casualties to feed his ritual. Just as doubts began sinking in, something in the Sea of Souls answered his calls, something huge and powerful. It was so enormous that the breach expanded as it tore through the opening in space-time and wriggled itself into reality. The thing he summoned, or the thing that had summoned itself, was beyond his understanding. Unlike any known servants of the Holy Great Four, what came through from the breach was at first a huge lump of shadow. Everyone was puzzled until it started to solidify, its shadowy form materializing into bones, sinews, muscles and more until eventually a towering black-winged demon rose into reality. A greater demon. They had summoned a greater demon on their first attempt. Seeing the magnificence of their success, everyone cheered. The man was ecstatic to say the least. While many questions lingered, like why the possession offerings were not taken and no one recognized what type of demon it was, the fact that it did not immediately attack meant the ritual worked as intended. With this magnificent being leading the charge, the downfall of this world was all but assured. While the cultists were ecstatic, the newly formed monstrosity that barely fit in the massive underground storage hall paid no attention to the puny mortals around it. It raised its muscular hand and observed it, as if tasting and experiencing its new existence. The man approached the imposing warp spawn to initiate communication. Greetings, great one. I am Grigeri Morvich, the one in charge of this congregation that brings forth your blessed existence. May I ask which of the holy great four do thou hail from? The thing slowly turned its head to face the cult leader, surprising everyone as it communicated via telepathy. Plus the holy great four? Take a guess then. Which of the holy four? Plus it asked. Suddenly feeling pressured, Grigeri blinked and managed a response. I. I am totally lost, great one. My apologies but my studies seem totally inadequate. Plus take a guess. Plus it insisted with a non-negotiable tone, the malicious bale lights in its eyes glowed with increasing intensity. Cornered, Grigeri I thought for a moment before deciding this was a trick question. He gulped, betting it all on his intuition. My answer is that thou do not hail from any of the great four. There was a short moment of silence before the warp monstrosity started to laugh, or it tried to. What came out was a poor imitation of laughter, a terrible bestial sound that was out of this world. Despite its eldritch nature, the inhuman sound was clearly laced with malevolence and mockery. The demon then silently raised its hand to the air where a colossal axe materialized. After grabbing the weapon, it announced, Plus correct. For your reward, you shall be the last person I kill in this world. Plus. Then the massacre began. Grigeri I found himself at the door of one of his many hideouts some time later. He had no recollection of how he arrived covered in bruises and wounds, but he remembered losing everything. That thing. That cursed thing he summoned disregarded his status as a marked one and took all from him. His many devout followers slaughtered, his precious artifact taken, and worst of all, his powers were stripped away. It had somehow denied him the connection to the ether and made him a normal man. Confused and scared out of his wits, Grigeri had been hiding in the hideout ever since. While he was keeping a tab on the outside world via the newsfeed, emotionally he was utterly devastated, barely coping with his fall from the peak of existence straight down to the gutters. Anyone else with a lesser mental fortitude would have gone insane, Grigeri was sure of that. The fact that he was still alive proved he was made of sterner stuff. Slightly reassured, Grigeri turned on his bed and his hand touched something wet. Jolting to his senses he quickly switched on the lights and what he saw petrified him. On top of the pillows of his massive bed was a mess of blood and organic matter. It looked like a crime scene where someone's brain was blown off. Wait. Grigeri suddenly recalled what had really happened. He was not as stern as he imagined. Faced with an impossible scenario, after days of soul-shattering despair, in a moment of weakness he finally put a gun to his own head. Or did he imagine his suicide? Grigeri turned around and saw the used pistol on the bedside. Slowly he picked up the weapon and checked its ammunition count. Upon finding out a single shot was missing, he felt every strand of hair on him standing on their end. But how? Grigeri was about to give in to insanity when an inhuman voice sounded in his head. Plus the ether is much bigger than you think. Plus. It was that thing. Realizing what was residing in him, Grigeri screamed, something he had not done for more than a century. Before he could do anything else his body froze, then a searing headache hit him as his memories were read by the entity. After a while, the thing inside him came to a conclusion. Plus my splinter and the target annihilated each other? Hmm. So be it. Plus it said while slowly holding up the pistol and pointed it at Grigeri's own head, seemingly about to finish what he had attempted once. No. Wait. Grigeri screamed desperately but was unable to control his body. Plus I had kept my promise and made you whole once. Plus. Please. I beseech thee. I offer thee everything. 
Rogeri I begged as tears rolled down uncontrollably and he wetted himself. While he knew better than anyone about the futility of appeasing to such an entity, he had to try. Just when Grigeri I believed he would die for real this time, his gaze became fixated on something. There on one of the many flickering monitors was a news update with bold letterings, Saint Candidate Awakened. The news flash was accompanied by a series of pictures, one of which depicted a glowing girl on top of a rhino tank hatch, her arms stretched out, holding a flaming blue sword that pointed forward. The thing inside Grigeri I went quiet, and then he felt a series of intense emotions bubbling over him. It started with flashes of anger mixed with amusement and then fascination. The thing pondered for a moment before finally deciding on a course of action. Plus, Grigeri Imorovich, I will make you an offer. Plus, some time later in another hidden location, a group of people were whispering their worries in a meeting room. It was a gloomy event, the somber atmosphere of the gathering amplified by the news featured on the wall-mounted main display. So, she has awakened. But our master is still missing. We need effective leadership now. Our brothers and sisters are being hunted on all fronts. Shouldn't we be appointing a new leader at this point? Who should it be? Surely not you. Careful of your tone. I, Stellar Clamor, second in command to the master until his unfortunate disappearance, am the most qualified around here to lead. You wish to lead us? Over my dead body. As the meeting was heating up, there was a commotion at the door and a runner came in without knocking. Panting, the runner made an exciting announcement. Everyone. The, the master is back. What? Where is he? Before anyone could get a proper answer, a figure barged into the meeting room uninvited, a figure everyone here knew well. It was the missing leader Grigeri himself, looking sharp and alert. Master, rejoice, my disciples. The wait is over, Grigeri said. What happened? Where were you this whole time, Master? Grigeri raised a palm to calm the gathering and said, There were setbacks, but I have returned. Master, what happened to you? Asked Stellar, the person who had suggested electing a new leader just then. Brother Stellar, why such a question? Grigeri asked. You feel different. I can no longer sense your powers. The room of acolytes quieted down upon hearing one of them utter such a question. Rogeri, I, however, did not immediately answer. Instead, his attention became fixated on the main display on the wall where another news about the saint candidate was streaming. It became so quiet one could hear a pin drop. Eventually, Stellar broke the silence. Master. Oh, excuse me. But to answer you, yes, I still have my powers. Rogeri, I turned his attention back to the gathering. In fact, I am stronger than ever. Allow me to demonstrate. He smiled and gestured with his hand as if forming a fist. In the next instant, Stellar screamed as his head was slowly crushed by an invisible force. He grabbed his aching cranium with both hands, wailed and fell over, rolling on the ground. Then Grigeri's hand closed into a fist and Stellar's head popped, spilling blood and brain matter everywhere. While the rest of his acolytes became petrified, Grigeri asked casually, Anyone else wishes to usurp my position? None dared to reply. Good. Listen to what I have to say carefully. Grigeri said, the smile disappearing from his face. We have encountered setbacks but the path forward is still open to us. Grigeri proclaimed, his eyes brimming with unnatural powers. Didn't my prediction of the Astronomicans' light fading come to pass? I have since received further revelations from the ether. I tell you all now, no slaves of the corpse god, no governor, no inquisition, not even that upstart false saint can deny us our destiny. Gather our people, heed my instructions and we shall take back what is rightfully ours. To the promised world, the cult leader concluded with his fist held high. The master is back. To the promised world, his followers cried out enthusiastically. Promised world. Promised world. Promised world. B2CH.9 A New Day. A twin of Terra in the middle of nowhere. Legend has it the planet was discovered during the height of the Great Crusade, when legions of Astartes were claiming much of the galaxy for the Imperium of Man, a fabled era when the Emperor still walked among mortals. By then the Imperial Expeditionary Forces had claimed so many planets they only bothered to name the significant ones and simply tagged the rest with denominations. As an unassuming planet orbiting a far-off, non-strategic star system, this then newly discovered world would have been assigned a generic label and faded for obscurity if not for a discovery. That its basic parameters were uncannily similar to the throne world. The planet was of similar size to Terra with almost equal amount of gravity and revolution length around its sun, and it even came with a single relatively large moon of similar size to Luna. In an administrative council meeting whose official records had long been lost, a member of the attendees had playfully proclaimed the lost twin of Terra had been found. That unusual statement prompted others to do a double take and ask, where? Nusquam. Someone replied, Planet Nusquam? Oh, wait. Literally meaning nowhere in High Gothic, the incident provoked a rare round of haughty laughter in an otherwise routinely dull meeting, and the name stayed till this day. It was early morning in the Nusquamese capital city of A.C. Eslix, and I was entranced by its sight. On a busy street of the Megapolis, I stood as an observer as a tsunami of people flowed like human waves around me. Many thousands of light years away from the cradle of humanity, people made up of ethnicities I neither knew nor recognized flourished under an alien sky. Over many thousand years of additional continuous evolution had subtly changed humanity in ways I could not properly pinpoint. Every face around me seemed more defined and sharpened in features than the crowd from old Earth. 
Despite the slight difference in appearance, like their ancestors these people busied themselves with the hustling and bustling of daily life beneath the shadows of super skyscrapers, a scene I was familiar with. While the cityscape of A.C. Eslix would put every modern city I knew to shame, it was considered underdeveloped compared to the notoriously ridiculous hive cities of the Imperium, where each literally housed billions of people. The rowdy city center at the ground level was crawling with endless streams of mundane vehicles, while the rich and powerful zipped around on levitating speeders overhead. The streets were dotted with countless business establishments, each filled to the brim with their patrons. Holographic-sponsored messages looped endlessly at prime locations while floating advertising contraptions of all kinds dominated the overhead airspace. Every usable space was either an advertisement or an imperial propaganda message, and I was dazzled by the whole ultra-metropolitical site. In a way, I felt like a medieval person who was suddenly introduced to a modern 20th century city. Yet in this overwhelming spectacle I found myself attracted to a particular scene. In the sea of flowing humanity was a little girl who wore a bright jacket piggybacking on the shoulders of her supposed father. My attention was glued to her carefree smile until the pair disappeared around a corner. Then it dawned on me that my old self would never care for such a scene. Just who was looking at that, me or... It is me, or you. It is complicated. Serene's words rang again in my head. I felt a sense of nausea just thinking about that and recalled my psychic projection from the city center to a place closer to my body. The ground below me shifted and the crowd changed from workers rushing to work to pilgrims gathered near the Sororita's monastery's gate. I walked around and saw a bandaged Ritabor giving a speech to a huge crowd beneath my statue. A squad of battle sisters provided basic security nearby. I stayed for a while and listened to his story about how my random act of kindness had validated his actions, but soon decided to end the surveillance session after experiencing embarrassment from hearing his over-exaggerated praises. The sensation of having a body returned and I opened my eyes to my current lodging, a nice room attached with a small living quarters inside the monastery cathedral located at one of the top towers. Beep. A servo skull floated over. My own personal servo skull, a gift from Crypterer passed to me by Kira. I was given the choice between a brand new, fully synthetic drone or one made with a real human skull, whose cranium was said to be retrieved from a favorite valet of his who had died gloriously in service to the Omnisia. No prize for guessing my choice here, I named it Solace, the synthetic skull probe sidekick. With a flick of my mind, I connected to Solace and was updated on all the headlines of the major news channels. As the old saying goes, truth is the first casualty of war, and here was a world enslaved to a regime that was at war for 10,000 years. I was not even sure what I expected but the truth spoke for itself. There were multiple major news channels and information portals but none were telling the full or real story. The Imperium's information control machine was way ahead and in full control of the narrative, misdirecting and compartmentalizing events while dropping smoke screens over crucial details. There was no mention of the missing astronomical light nor the appearance of a new psychic beacon anywhere, despite the fact a huge silver beam on the horizon could be perceived whenever I went psychically active. Next I turned my attention to Cryptor's excavation progress updates. The process had turned out to be more difficult than he anticipated. From the report it seemed like it would need another few days for his teams to reach the buried entrance of the hidden vault. Progress had been severely hampered by complications of moving heavy breaching drills into position while complying to the demands of the Sororitas on working on their sacred ground in the inner sanctum, the place that started it all. While I was very curious about the contents of the vault myself, deep down another part of me was dead worried of what we would, or would not find inside. I had tried to send my astral projection over. But this skill was still very new to me and the sight proved too far from my amateurish control. In the end, I could only wait for the result. Would Cryptor withdraw his support for me if we found little to nothing useful inside? How should I navigate this messy and potentially cutthroat imperial politics now that the immediate threat was no more? You could say I am a worrywart, but my mind could not help but wonder about the future. It was still early in the morning, so I redid a mental recap of what happened yesterday. I became acquainted with the senior Primaris Psyker Yahai Mei. The way she sort of freaked out when I imitated the psychic duo by bowing and calling her mage yeah, or elder sister Mei was low-key hilarious. We got along fine, and I learned about her story of almost dying to a sudden surge of psychic powers after arriving here. She was saved by a medically induced coma and the help of having Zaki, the no boy, being nearby to stabilize her symptoms. I never knew you could use a pariah like that. After that the rest of the day was spent on learning about the chaos taint vetting and purification processes. It was a mixture of theories, practices, rituals, and pseudoscience which I was able to distill into a simpler, more efficient process with insights that came to me naturally. At the end of the day, I was confident enough to request for trial runs. If everything went smoothly on the back end, I should be able to put my theories to the test later today. Feeling restless, I sat up from my bed and looked at the mirror on the wall. With my enhanced eyesight, the dim light of the room did little to obscure the reflection of a breathtaking girl staring back. My sight was locked onto the enchanting scene, but I soon felt like being judged by a demigoddess and had to look away. The Sororitas had provided me with the best stuff in their powers. Everything from accommodations to food was top quality. But truth be told, my life since waking up has been a total mess. Knowing neither hunger, thirst nor fatigue in the human sense, my daily life's rhythm went totally out of whack. Baseline, fundamental questions like should I eat and drink normally was a mystery. 
I was also dead worried about the non-existent need to frequently visit a toilet. The necessity to examine all these mundane issues closely made me feel like a newborn with an incredible sense of uneasiness. I got up from my bed and walked towards my only possessions in the room, a collection of huge luggages in a corner which was brought over from the fortress. I had since been taking stock of their contents in order to find out more information about myself. As far as I could tell, simple-looking white robes were the most abundant item in the collection, more than enough for me to wear daily on a washing rotation. Guess these would be my default attire, like the black turtleneck sweatshirts for a certain infamous billionaire in my time. There was a set of God-tier quality self-grooming tools that was identified by Analytica to be made of adamantium alloy, one of the strongest substances known to the Imperium and typically used to produce high-grade military gear like the Space Marine Terminator plates. I reckon these tools might outlast some unfortunate empires. Then there were some tubes of ultra-concentrated food that looked like toothpaste, some space-age toiletries, bottles of perfumes, random trinkets, and pairs of footwear. As I was going through my stuff a familiar sensation crept up, it was the feeling of an acquainted psyker trying to contact me via telepathy. I accepted the request to converse. Plus morning, Lady Serene. Plus. Plus good morning, Salih. Plus. Plus my lady. Sorry to disturb you this early in the morning, but Throne Agent Herlindia will like to see you shortly for an urgent briefing. ETA 40 minutes. Plus. Plus noted. Thank you. Plus. Herlindia Winson, the quiet and nice-looking brunette who more or less functioned like a secretary to Inquisitor Thabarus, would be arriving soon. While she always looked professional and reserved, I remembered seeing her go bat hit crazy when interrogator a male got killed in a vision. It got me curious as I was not sure how far one could trust information glimpsed from a simulated scenario. I hurriedly washed up and prepared myself, which admittedly was little to no work thanks to the passive ability of Regulus. Even with my superhuman perception I struggled to find minute flaws from my reflection in the washroom mirror. Herlindia arrived soon after, looking tactical yet elegant in her dark inquisitorial attire. She was flanked by two people, one was a professional-looking gunman armed with a loss gun while the other a hooded scribe. The scribe held up a device and did some scanning around before nodding to her Lindia. She nodded back, left her escorts behind, and walked into my room, her heels clicking sharply on the marble floor. Lady Serene, morning. Her Lindia smiled and bowed, as she did so a pleasant and uplifting scent drifted over. Perfume? As I wondered about it a flurry of information appeared in my mind. Scent analysis. Aldehydes. Narrowly. Bergamot. Lemon. Iris. Jasmine. Rosa. Orris root, lily, civet, sandalwood, musk, amber, vetiver, vanilla, patula, ethanol, androstenone. Just when I thought that was way too much information, further details were still coming in. Wait, was that the sin of a man hidden beneath all the layers? Is she really having a relationship with the interrogator as suggested by the vision? Morning, Herlindia. I said while doing a double take on the pretty throne agent, and she eyed me back curiously. While I normally would never busy myself with the personal life of others, in this case I yearned to learn if the vision was correct. I decided to probe and casually asked, by the way, where is interrogator mail? Caught off guard, her Lindia's thoughts leaked for a fraction of a second, and I caught glimpses of her memories about the passionate session she had with a male from yesterday night. It was so abrupt I almost broke character but was saved by an old friend. Regulus, action override. From my deadpan surface reaction, it took an instance for her Lindia to dismiss the notion that I had any interest in her lover. She put her professional smile back on and said, the interrogator is on another mission to root out the cults. Why the sudden interest in his whereabouts? My dear, I am so, so, so sorry about the privacy intrusion. Let me make it up to you by making your day. I shook my head and smiled. Nothing in particular. I had an epiphany because you looked extra charming today. It just dawned on me that you and the interrogator would make a nice looking couple together. Herlindia looked shocked for a second before breaking into a hearty giggle. Lady Serene, I never knew you could be such a sweet talker. Unfortunately, time is scarce and we have to get down to business. By the Inquisitor's order, I am here to quickly brief you on the latest developments. I nodded and she started her briefing. Your request for the test candidates for purification trials have been expedited. For security purposes, we had prioritized those who are exhibiting extreme withdrawal symptoms after their metaphysical exposure. They will be arriving here later today. Can you tell me more about these symptoms? While individual reactions with sudden exposure to warp entities in close proximity vary a lot from one another, these are the individuals who practically became vegetables due to extreme shock. Such patients will usually just wither away if left alone but more often than not be administered with the emperor's peace to prevent possession risks. The Emperor's Peace is a fancy term for euthanasia. So basically they're just people waiting to die. I nodded, somewhat relieved by a selfish notion that I could do no worse for them. We have the means and methods to treat cases like these, just not the capacity to handle this many people. Herlindia clarified. I was briefed on the method yesterday. I nodded in reply. On paper the Inquisition had three psychers versus the workload of 20,000 people. That was even before considering the slow and archaic procedures involved if we do it by the book. Even a humanist like me had to admit mass execution looked like a logical solution for such a hopeless-looking scenario. There might be a way out of this, but I had to test my theory first. Up next, the church is sending their representative over. Herlindia said while passing me her data slate. 
Junior preacher Malin Hamayer, a local citizen of 20 Terran standard years old, recently sanctioned as a preacher. We had gone through her background and found little notes of interest. A new preacher? I looked at the profile picture on the device. Defying my expectation, she was surprisingly decent looking. It appears so, her family was of average standing without powerful connections. You could say the church had sent over a nobody, which is unexpected considering this is a very sought after position. Why do you think that is the case? We had gone through various theories. In conclusion, either the church wanted to avoid heavy infighting or they are sending over a sacrificial pawn. Due to the extremely high profile nature of your case, it should be the first. Internally, I shivered at the unspoken implications on the latter. What will happen if I decline their representative? I asked while handing back her Lindia her data slate. She shrugged. They probably will just elect a new person. Huh. I got a hunch if I refuse this candidate, they might fall back to their usual demographic of grumpy or saintly old men. By the way, Governor Catalina will be visiting shortly. May I act as your assistant in the meantime? Herlindia asked. It felt strange, and I was still very new to being a big deal. But obviously, I needed all the help when it came to real imperial politics, so I nodded. Much obliged. Please take care of me. Catalina arrived soon after. The impeccable timing solidified my impression that all the VIPs on the planet were under tight inquisitorial surveillance. I was seated in a meeting room when Catalina stepped through the door. The governor was led in by Wellmana and flanked by multiple advisors of her own, looking immaculate in her highly ornate and decorative formal outfit. Catalina wore a mainly purple regalia made from the finest looking materials, lined with golden embroidery and embellished with precious metals and gems. A golden sash on her body acted as placeholder for various metals. Highly tailored, the regalia fit her perfectly. Meanwhile, I was back on my comfortable, simple looking sleeved white robe, and the contrast between our attire stuck out like a sore thumb. Not sure about protocols, I simply stood up as she entered the room. I really need the help of an etiquette expert. My lady. The governor greeted. Her eyes widened upon seeing me after all these days. She looked a bit pale and I sensed a mix of intense emotions bubbling beneath her controlled visage. Governor, how are you doing? I asked. By the throne's blessings I am doing great. Pardon me, what I am about to request is against standard protocol but may I have a private moment with you? Totally at a loss of what would be appropriate. I glanced over at her Lindia and she returned to do as you see fit. Look. Well at least Catalina was not considered to be a threat to me by the Inquisition. Very well. Please give us some space. Everyone else complied. Soon it was only the two of us left inside the meeting room. So, Catalina? Instead of replying, to my surprise, Catalina knelt down before me before stating what was on her mind. By his blessings and your holy work, my world, my home, and the homes of countless Nusquamis were saved from the brink of damnation. No words can convey my gratitude and the gratitude of my people to the throne and you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Catalina said, her voice cracking with raw emotions. Before I could say anything, she continued, and finally thank you for being alive, and well, it worried me to death that you may never wake up from your injuries. Then she started crying. While Catalina looked like a fine lady in her prime, I knew she was well over 70 years old and could not push the mental image of a crying grandmother out of my mind. This is embarrassing. On the other hand, I was reminded of the fact my actions did save a whole world, a fact that I seemed to be trying to forget for some reasons. Then I sensed her thoughts on how she viewed me. Savior. The governor was viewing me like she was a desperate damsel in distress, hanging from the edge of a failing skyscraper and looking at a superhero flying in. Being a ruler of a planet and all, I guessed it was very rare for her to come face to face with any peers, let alone a person who could potentially solve her problems. I let her cry for a while before leaning down to hold her hands. On skin contact more of her emotions ran through me. I sensed her anxiety about the future, her shame on losing the control of her domain, and the pain of losing family members. Was she ever close to Kaiden? Catalina, please rise. My lady, before that, can I ask some questions? What do you want to know? Why has the Emperor's light ceased reaching us? What was that psychic beacon you lit, and what will happen to my world? Catalina asked. By now her tears were running like waters burst forth from a failed dam. I felt the shivering of her smooth hands. This was a person who stood at the apex of an imperial world, almost losing everything twice and now faced a future of uncertainties. I can't answer all your questions and have no plans to do any changes beyond the necessary. In truth I had no plans at all, but that was beside the point. So what comes next for Nusquam? She asked again. For a moment I considered telling her about my memory loss but decided against burdening her with more reasons to be anxious. As for what comes next, I guess it depends on what we will find inside the vault. Vault? Well, I can't tell you much but… After that we continued to talk and chatted away. Well it ended up with her talking most of the time while I avoided giving out any critical information. The topics changed from the state of the planet to seemingly random personal stuff. It felt like a mix between a friendly chat between friends and a therapeutic session for her. Eventually we stopped and Catalina freshened up her makeup and expressed her gratitude again before leaving. As soon as the governor left the room, her Lindia joined me again. She eyed me inquisitively and I shrugged. Seemed like she needed someone to talk to. I told her about the vault. Was that wise? Hmm. Considering the governor will know about that sooner or later, it is fine. Please consult us beforehand on revealing important information to anyone in the future. It was then her Lindia's calm beeped and she answered it. 
Through my transhuman hearings, I heard the conversation. Perlindia. It was Tsali the Psyker. Yes. That new preacher from the Ecclesiarchy is here. I lightly probed her mind. No issues found. Affirmative. Perlindia turned to me. That preacher is here. Should I meet her? I asked. It is up to you. If you do, please remember to keep confidential information from her. I remembered her Lindia mentioning that rejecting Malin here might result in the Ecclesiarchy replacing her with a random old man. That cardinal or not, even when Robot Gilliman became the Lord Commander of the Imperium with all his legit powers and legions of space marines, he also had to entertain and keep the church around. Yes, I had little choice in this matter unless I preferred to swap the new lady priest with an old man. Send her in. I nodded. A while later, Wellman led a young lady and preacher attire into the meeting room. She matched the profile I saw earlier. The newcomer's face lit up the moment she saw me. I effortlessly picked up her thoughts that were broadcasting like an open-air concert. So beautiful. Malin's mind screamed while she froze still. Eyes locked onto me. Wellman awaited for the young preacher to introduce herself, and when it was not forthcoming, she lightly cleared her throat, snapping Malin out of it. Blessings of the throne upon you. I am Malin Hammeyer, designated representative of the Adeptus Ministorum. She said nervously, formed her Aquila sign with her hands and bowed. Did the Ecclesiarchy really just send a total noob over? B2CH.10 Purification. Amnesia from injury. Malin exclaimed her outrage, raw emotions of surprise and shock boiling over from her loud mind. Not even a few minutes into our first meeting, and the new Adeptus Mini Storm representative was already showing herself to be an unorthodox candidate. By the throne, is that true, sister? Breaking what I suspected to be standard etiquette, the young preacher stood up and directly eyed Wellmana while demanding validation of my condition. Yes, that much is true. The scholar replied reluctantly with her eyes downcast. I sensed Wellmano's mind leaking sentiments of guilt and shame for the Sororita's apparent shortcomings. In truth, it was not their fault. The sisters were taking one for me to conceal my great secret, one that I could never share with anyone. As for me, I was keeping my mouth shut. The less I talked, the less holes there would be in our story. As far as the matter was concerned, Malin as the representative of the church was on a need-to-know basis, and we did not even tell her my supposed memory loss was from a previous injury. Malin turned to me, her expression a mix of pity and mortification. Then she slowly walked towards me which should be another breach of etiquette, before reaching out to grab onto my hands. Now this was definitely a breach of etiquette as I noticed her Lindia raising an eyebrow. This will not stand. I will notify the church and we will find the best treatment to rectify this. Malin proclaimed, emotions of righteous protectiveness pouring out like an erupted volcano. In her eyes I had become a victim of tragic circumstances. We have sought the best treatment available and there have been improvements to her condition. Wellmana replied defensively. But Lady Syrian still has not regained her memories, right? I want, nay. I demand a detailed report on how it all happened. If it was due to the negligence of the Adepta, I will petition to move the saint candidate into our care due to incompetence on your side. Malin released my hands to point an accusatory finger at Wellmana. That statement hit a spot, and the two of them soon got into a heated argument. I watched helplessly from the sidelines as the verbal warfare escalated. Then Herlindia, who was reading her data slate, leaned over and whispered, The test candidates have arrived. Palatine Alicia is handling the transfer. Just in time. I looked at the quarreling ladies and decided it was better to just get on with my plans for today. Thank you. Let's go. I said and stood up, surprising the spatting pair. My lady, where are you going? Wellmana asked, to test if my theory could work to save some people. The test candidates we mentioned before have arrived. I answered. But your condition, Malin stammered but was unable to complete her sentence. I looked at the astonished preacher and suddenly thought of a cool response. I smiled and said, while I may have lost most of my memories, I have not forgotten my duties. On that fateful day, Trooper Ignatham's worldview collapsed on the battlefield. The trooper first saw the supposed invincibility of the mighty Northern Grand Army he belonged to getting totally humiliated. Then after a day of twists and turns he witnessed Supreme Commander Lord General Luther turned into a mist of blood and gore by a gargantuan creature from out of this world. Ignatham was in the front row seats when it all went down. The trooper saw the nightmarish warp spawn up close. Like a prehistoric man who suddenly encountered a legendary apex predator, it was an overwhelmingly shocking experience. Being a trooper... Ignatham was conditioned for combat shock, but this time the threat he perceived had extended to his entire species, and it proved too much. As a resident of a fringe civilized world far away from most of the galactic horrors, demons were but vague concepts to him until that very moment. The demons are real. Ignatham's terrified mind was taken to the edge, all training failing him. While the gigantic demon never showed him the slightest attention, for a microsecond Ignatham saw its eyes, and it shook his soul. The sheer level of hatred and malice pouring forth from those glowing orbs convinced him they needed supernatural help. Ignatham did not raise his trusted loss gun nor did he attempt to flee. What was the point? Throne preserves us. This foe is beyond us. His mind searched frantically for any possible solution. Silly but plausible notions flashed before his mind, looking for a way out. The god emperor was too far away on holy terra and confined to his golden throne. His angels of death were not around. Hold on. If demons are real, then those stories about saints must be real too. Maybe if they had an anointed saint blessed with his power. Wait, was that singing lady a saint? 
but she was on the other side and might not extend a helping hand. We are doomed. Ignatham's jumbled mind concluded. He lost his mental strength, dropped to his knees, and began laughing uncontrollably as the pandemonium of madness continued around him. That was where his conscious memory ended that day. For a while now, the young trooper could not remember anything nor focus his mind. His name, his life, his aspirations and everything else about him felt like a barely perceivable whisper in the air. Everything was hazy, in his altered state of mind he found himself floating in space. At first numberless unblinking stars surrounded him, but soon they started disappearing, leaving an unsettling dark void. Surrounded by total darkness he came to the realization he was not alone, there in the lightless depths a feeling of something truly colossal stirred. The trooper's terrified consciousness was sinking towards the darkness, deeper and deeper his mind dove until it was hanging at the very edge of the abyss. An eternal void was staring at him, and he sensed a disturbing resonance coming from an unimaginable distance away. When he listened hard enough, it sounded a lot like cruel laughter. Feeling trapped in the worst case of sleep paralysis, he wanted to scream, to wake up from this living nightmare. His consciousness hung helplessly at the edge of sanity while staring at the beckoning void. After holding on for an indeterminable amount of time, he felt the final reserves of his inner strength dissipating, his feeble mental fortitude unable to hold against the darkness forever. Finally, his last ounce of strength left him, and he screamed in his mind as he was about to drop into the proverbial cosmic abyss. He felt the prospect of facing an eternity of damnation. A lifetime of conditioning kicked in, and he instinctively cried out to the one and only entity in the galaxy who could offer salvation. Throne. Emperor. Have mercy on my soul. The void replied in silence as he cried in despair. Just as the young trooper was about to totally lose it, a bright light burst into existence. He watched in bewilderment as the surrounding darkness was chased away by a warm golden light. Ignatham. Someone called from a distance. Ignatham? That sounded so familiar. Wait, that's my name. I am Ignatham. Suddenly the heavy mental fog was lifted and he remembered everything. Stunned and surrounded by the bright light, he sensed a presence nearby and turned to it. Ignatham could not believe his eyes as a girl emerged from the brilliance. She wore a robe of the purest white, her face obscured by a blinding halo of divine radiance. Ignatham. The girl called his name again. Her soft and gentle voice seemed to echo to eternity in this strange space. Ignatham struggled to pick out facial features as her impression shifted every time he focused on it. For a fleeting moment, he caught glimpses of his long-deceased mother, but she looked so young and beautiful here. Ignatham felt no fear. A feeling from the bottom of his heart informed him the shining figure meant no harm. So this is the afterlife? Ignatham was sure of it. He started crying and reached out with his hand. Show me, he thought. Show me the afterlife. It was working. I felt a deep sense of relief as what seemed to be warped taint residue was burnt away from the patient by my halo's intensity and close proximity. While I was still totally clueless on how any of this worked, there was no arguing with the result. The patient, a young trooper from the rebel faction, was seated across me with our faces less than two feet apart. My halo was on full blast, the psychic energy holding a hint of the Emperor's unique version of divinity driving away the corruption. Welmina, Herlindia, Malin, Salih, Alicia, and a small squad of sisters were watching attentively nearby. Earlier when Malin saw my halo in person for the first time she lost her composure and was moved to tears. This, this light is so divine. Her mind screamed while the Sororitas only emitted deep silent reverence. Why is her mind so loud? I wondered for a second before deciding to focus on finishing the task at hand. Ignatham. I called his name. The trooper started moaning softly like a person waking from a deep sleep. His once totally off-focus eyes started training on me. A hint of comprehension showed on his face as tears started flowing down his cheek. He was coming around. Ignatham. I called again. Instead of answering me, he feebly raised his right hand. Trooper Ignatham. Still no reply, but someone had definitely come back home in that previously listless body. His hand slowly started to reach out as if trying to caress my face. From my perspective his speed might as well be a bean sprouting so I ignored it. The majority of my attention was spent closely observing the retreating darkness in his body. My theory and method needed to be confirmed. Thousands of lies were riding on this. I looked closer, engrossed in the incredible sight of the minuscule warp residue inside him dissolving like dew meeting the afternoon sun. That would do it. With this therapy we can. It was then something entered into my peripheral field at high speed. By the time I realized what was happening there were few good options left. Wham. The sound of a solid strike rang out in the room as Ignatham's face was hammered by the back end of a bolter. The trooper was still falling back from his chair when two battle sisters rushed over to him. In the next second Alicia had stepped in front of me while the poor trooper was about to be pummeled further. Stop it. He was just coming around. I called out. The sisters froze on my command. Two of them were midway of laying into him with the butts of their bolters. A third sister had just switched off the safety of her bolter and was likely a moment away from discharging her weapon. That was close. It was partly my fault. I did not realize how serious the Sororitas were about my protection. They must have taken the trooper's attempt to touch me as a form of assault. Sisters, please stand down. Thank you. Alicia, it is fine. I gently pushed away the palatine who was blocking my path and walked over to the down trooper. He was in shock, holding up his hands to block further blows while breathing heavily from a bruised face. 
If it was not for me subtly pushing him at the last second to avoid maximum impact, he would have suffered at least a few broken teeth on top of that. I turned my halo off and squatted down for a better look at the trooper. He was glancing around nervously, looking confused. Imagine waking up from the worst hangover ever to a bunch of angry battle sisters gumbutting you. A part of me wanted to laugh out loud at the absurdity of his situation, but I kept my straight face and asked, Have you awakened, trooper? He nodded quickly. Kindly introduce yourself. I asked for confirmation. He hesitated for a second before starting to talk, his voice weak and dry with insufficient hydration. Trooper First Class Ignatham Heron of Squad Gerhard, 2nd Platoon, 1st Battalion of the Northern Great Army, reporting for duty. Ma'am, he said with a forced gusto before forming the Aquila sign while on the ground. He seems fine now, please check on him. I said, well, we happen to have an expert here. Herlindia said before turning to Malin. Preacher, you were involved in the faith validation process, correct? Could you do a preliminary check on this trooper? Malin, who was still in a kind of trance upon witnessing what happened, snapped to attention after being addressed by an agent of the Inquisition. Right, pass me his information and I can do that. As Malin started working, I went on a discussion with the others. So how was that? I asked. Splendidly done, my lady. It would not have worked without your level of powers. Silly commented. Is this sustainable? Are you feeling drained? Herlindia asked. I think I can do it all day. I said after testing my reserves. That is frankly absurd. Silly remarked pensively, making me wonder about my own psyker level. If we are going to continue, I would suggest tying up the rest to prevent them from attempting anything. Alicia chipped in, looking fiercely protective. A while later, Malin reported that aside from feeling confused about his situation, everything seemed fine with the first test candidate. We went ahead with the rest and tied them up beforehand as Alicia suggested. One by one, the test candidates were freed from their vegetative state. The interesting bits were their myriad of reactions. Most nervously looked around while asking what had happened. A few cried out for their mothers. One asked if I was an angel to lead his soul to the emperor. I pressed on, learning a little bit more about the process with each candidate and was gaining confidence until one uncooperative case. For this particular individual, the residual taint inside him seemed extraordinarily stubborn and did not dissipate with the same treatment process. I tried and tried until I decided to increase intensity by moving closer to the candidate. With our faces about one feet apart, my halo was practically engulfing him as I observed his condition. The last bit of warp residue retreated further but still did not dissolve, and just when I decided to move even closer to finish the job, the trooper suddenly lashed out with a blood-curdling scream and came biting at me with extraordinary speed. Time slowed down just enough for me to get a proper look at everything, including the young man's eyes. In the windows to his soul I saw an abyss, nothing but madness glinted in his iris. Startled and propelled by self-preservation, I reacted by jerking back while delivering a hand chop with maximum force at his throat. While the man seemed deadly fast in his altered state, I proved to be faster and my attack connected first despite striking out later. In slow motion I saw my hand sink into his neck and cut right through, pushing through layers of elastic skin, flesh, nerves, arteries and bones. I experienced each layer's distinct texture and density as my hand crushed into them, until a jumbled up organic mess formed and stopped me from decapitating him outright. The brutal momentum flung the crazed trooper like a rag doll to the side, splattering the room with a shower of crimson blood before he dropped to the floor in a literal bloody mess. In the next moment Alicia was shielding in front of me again, shouting orders while another sister dragged me back, a way to suppose safety. While I could have easily freed myself from the feeble human restraint, mentally I was in a shock and just went with the flow. Already two more sisters had stepped forward, their bolters trained at the fallen man. But the trooper remained motionless, the only movement was the spreading of his blood on the floor and the dripping of the same blood from my hand. Alerted by the commotion, Malin who was working next door appeared, her expression turned to horror upon witnessing the gruesome scene. For some reason the only thing on my mind was my first encounter with the grimdark universe as a classic computer game I picked up. On the back of its box was a quote printed in a large and thick font stating, Thou shalt kill. While my mind became a numbing mess, the expected adrenaline rush from such an event did not occur. Instead the sense of utter calmness I felt, as if I just swatted an annoying insect, shocked me. The dripping of warm blood from my hand eventually refocused my jittering attention. I held up my hand for a closer look, found it covered in blood but otherwise unscathed despite cutting through a man's neck. I am sorry for the mess. Please excuse me while I go clean up. Not waiting for a response, I departed and headed towards the nearest washroom that was registered in my memory. Luckily for me, hand sanitizing liquid was still a common enough feature in the grim darkness of the far future. Alone in a water closet, I stood and watched like a zombie as the last traces of blood on my hand was washed away by running tap water. I just killed someone with my hand. Yes, I killed people before. In the final battle of the Civil War, some of my actions had directly led to the demise of rebel personnel. But those kills had been done remotely, using machines from far, far away. This was my first melee kill, up close and personal. Thanks to my Primark-level memory retention, I could still clearly recall how my dainty hand went through the man's muscular neck as if human flesh had the consistency of tofu while neck bones were little more than brittle, hollowed-out twigs. For some reason I also could not help but notice that despite the massive spillage of blood, 
Not a single drop of the sanguine liquid managed to cling onto my rope. Just what sort of cloth is this? I ran analytica on my own rope. The reading came back. Material, superior eternal silk. Totally no idea what material was that. After washing my hand for the third time, I rinsed it dry and muttered a silent curse as the faint smell of blood still lingered. Then I realized that probably only transhumans could detect such low levels of the scent. It was like that time when I, no, not me, Serene escaped from beneath the Imperial Palace. What did she do back then to get rid of scent trails when cornered by the custodes? I raised my hand for a closer inspection while recalling the memory, then almost reflexively my psychic energies flexed for the briefest moment and a minuscule amount of power was discharged onto my hand. In the next moment invisible warp fire fluttered and burned through the surface of my hand, ionizing everything on top of the skin and obliterating any last hint of the blood. I was stunned by the immediate result. It seemed I just discovered another weird application of my powers. As I left the water closet and opened the door to the outside, two battle sisters guarding nearby snapped to attention. It took a moment for me to comprehend that even just for going to the sink to wash my hands I had elite bodyguards armed with bolters looking over me. When I returned to the room, it was filled with people doing some sort of crime scene investigation. Everyone turned to me as I stepped in, and the atmosphere felt extremely tense. Some of the people's surface thoughts even came through to me. Throne, this is bad. One of them was thinking. Heads might roll for this. Another person echoed mentally. That made me nervous. Technically, I just committed murder in front of everyone despite the fact that the man attacked first. As I pondered on the situation, Alicia approached me with a grave face. That felt extra strange as she seldom displayed such an expression towards me. That alone and the grim resolve I felt emanating from her made me even more nervous. Wait, really? Am I in trouble for this? Just as I was contemplating what to say, to my surprise Alicia knelt down in front and started apologizing. Holy daughter, we are extremely sorry for our inefficient vetting process that let a heretic get so close and attack you. I will be personally taking responsibility for this transgression. The palatine said softly, and despite her neutral tone I could feel the intense emotions of regret and shame she was keeping a tight leash on. Heretic? The sight of Alicia, a well-mannered, pretty, and extremely capable girl deep in remorse kneeling in front of me broke my male-centric heart. I reached down held on to her shoulders and said, don't say that. Show me what you have discovered. She obliged and walked me to the mess I had created, the small crowd parting before us. There, in a pool of dried blood, was the almost decapitated corpse, his head turned to the side on the floor, eyes lifeless and mouth opened wide by a squatting sister hospitaler next to him. At first, I was not sure what was being shown to me, but then my spine chilled upon seeing what Alicia had meant. Inside the right cheek of the dead man was a sizable scar of sorts that formed the shape of eight arrows in a radial pattern. It was the mark of chaos, symbol of the great enemy. This was the first time I saw this symbol in this universe, and it occurred in such a gruesome manner. Back in my world, the symbol of chaos served little more than a mark of rebellion or the dedication to a fandom. Here, it looked like it had a life of its own, with real tangible powers. It took a moment before I deduced stopping our work here was akin to conceding to the enemy. I turned to the throne agent, Herlindia, how many more candidates to go? Seven. Please guide the sisters on what to do with this. We will continue to work with the rest. I said. After getting a glimpse of what was at stake, I fully intended to finish the job. B2CH.11 Interrogation So the Chaos Cult had infiltrated the local military. Energized by the incident, we proceeded with the rest of the test candidates quickly with more stringent measures, like tying them down to heavy chairs during the procedures and checking their inner cheeks. Nothing extraordinary happened with the rest of them, and by the time we were done I was informed by Herlindia that Thabaris had arrived and wished to meet me at the crime scene. Through some persuasion I managed to drop all the girls to meet the Inquisitor alone. Neandra was guarding the sealed-off room when I arrived. I nodded while passing and she bowed. Like her boss, I noted the assassin's surface thoughts were totally unreadable. Inside the room, the Inquisitor was studying the remains of my victim while squatting down, looking every bit like an overworked homicide detective. Serene. He nodded. Inquisitor. I see you made a mess of this heretic. Sorry, I reacted with too much force. Should have kept him alive for information gathering. I believe we aren't missing much. He shook his head. Remember the gunman at the gate? As expected, nothing much came up during their interrogation. The insidious cult we are dealing with are too careful for such amateurish mistakes. A professionally operated chaos cult? My own impression of such cults was that they were usually just loud and semi-unorganized, but this insidious version seemed a lot more dangerous. I have ordered all of the detained rebel troops to be double-checked for this. The cult's infiltration was way worse than anticipated, Thabris said while standing up before dropping a surprising praise. Your rapid pace of work is truly commendable. You didn't come all the way just to compliment me, right? I asked jokingly. He returned a side stare and scoffed. Of course not. My interest in the result of your work aside, there is a person I would like you to meet. Who? You have seen him before. He has been a guest here since the day we met. He said cryptically. It took a moment before I realized who he was referring to. You meant the space marine? Correct. Accompanied by Neandra, I followed Thabaris' lead and we headed downstairs. So the Sororita's monastery had fortified underground levels where they housed their dungeons. I lamented my decision of not exploring the place yesterday night with my projection. 
Back then, after learning to project for the first time, my instinct was to fly towards the shining city on the horizon instead of checking out what was literally beneath me. The deeper we went, the grimmer the atmosphere became. Most of the walls were carved out from solid, obsidian rock, and the passages were barely lit by flickering torches and some eerily glowing illumination technology. The air was thick with the scent of decay and despair, and the only sounds were the echoes of our footsteps. Eventually, we reached a heavy gate leading to the actual dungeon. You could tell they were not fooling around as it was guarded by sisters armed with storm bolters. These ridiculous things were double-barreled version of the standard bolter, usually found mounted on top of rhino armored transports, or wielded by elite Astartes terminators. As we entered the final door to a reinforced prison chamber, I smelled the Astartes way before he came into view. I remembered reading in a novel about some humans complaining about the body odor of space marines in real life. That was sort of expected, as gigantic genetically altered muscular humans, they were already more beast than baseline human in terms of body mass. And that was before considering their usual routine of wearing fully sealed power armor for extended periods of time. But all things considered the stink was not too bad. I could tell the scent was similar to that of normal humans, just a lot more intense and complex. My mind was filled with such triviality when the massive figure we came to visit came into view. He was imprisoned in the last cell of the chamber. The Marine was not alone. Two figures who I recognized, Sister Hospitaller Verita and Mugos Balpratus, stood beside the subdued transhuman. Both bowed as we entered. As for the Marine, he was stripped of his armor and missing all his limbs like I remembered. Secured with heavy chains, he was pinned onto the wall in a crucified pose. A myriad of tubes of unknown functions were inserted into his body in various places. His eyes were closed and a half-mask was placed over his mouth, probably to prevent more acid-spitting attacks. The Marine was in a bad shape. Illuminated by the harsh artificial lights inside the cell, countless scars could be seen running like angry centipedes on his hypermuscular body. Inquisitor. We inspected the prisoner as requested. Everything was within expected parameters. Valpratus reported. Thank you, Mugos. Thabarus said. Is he sleeping? I asked, curious. The prisoner is in a self-induced deep meditative state, one of the standard Astartes approaches to conserve energy while being imprisoned. It can also be used to ignore standard physical torture during interrogations. Valpratus explained. The Mugos' words made me do a double-take on the Marine's condition. Now that I got a closer look, it became clear some of the wounds on him were quite fresh, and I winced internally at the implication of recent tortures. Eager to get this over with, I turned to Thabris. What do you need me to do? I was hoping with your powers you could double-check if he was compromised by chaos corruption. We need to know how big a threat he and his kin are to this world. The Inquisitor said softly, but his explanation only raised many more questions. May I ask why are you asking me to do it? Shouldn't this be better handled by seasoned professionals like your psychers? I asked bluntly. We have already tried it. And that got me more curious. The results were inconclusive. While my psychers being overworked might have been a contributing factor, we suspect this individual was trained to resist psychic interrogation. That could only be achieved if they have psyker in their rank. Thabris remarked grimly. A rogue librarian or a sorcerer? That sounded troubling indeed. All right, what do I need to do? I conceded. Try reading his mind for their objectives here and check for any signs of chaos corruption. Thabris instructed. Huh? I never told anyone about my ability to read minds yet. Who said I could read minds? I asked, testing the water. He shrugged. I thought it should be natural for a psyker of your caliber. Do what you can to gather any information. Is this another test? I could do nothing but to proceed with his request. Standing this close to a real Astartes, the human side of me experienced for the first time the full impact of what it meant to come face to face with an absolute physical superior of your species. Being this close, the Marine looked much bigger and imposing from my point of view. Even while seemingly totally incapacitated, I felt the raw power residing in his over-exaggerated chiseled form and it filled me with a deep sense of uneasiness. It was akin to being in close proximity with a huge predator. The human part of my mind went hyperactive and kept nagging me about the present danger. But, I am the bigger threat here, right? I quieted down my mind and considered what I had learned so far. My interaction with Kathalina seemed to imply that skin contact amplified my mind-reading ability. I decided on my approach, raised my hand up to reach for the Marine's gigantic bald head before realizing I had severely underestimated the difference of our stature. Slightly flustered, I pointed to a readily available tool to remedy the situation. Pass me the chair, please. No one commented about my vertically challenged status and Verita moved to help. Soon I was standing on top of a chair, and my hand finally reached the Astarte's smooth cranium and touched the skin of his forehead. It felt surprisingly smooth but cold. I willed myself to read his surface thoughts but sensed resistance. Not only was I unable to read the Marine's mind, his mental wall was actively repelling my attempts. Going nowhere, I closed my eyes and upped my game. Psychana Activa, activated. Instinctively, I synced my breathing with the Marine while my powers engulfed him. At first, the resistance of his mind held, but as I started pumping more and more power, it began to wane. Come on, let me see your mind. Come on, come on, come on. Simulatio, activated, huh? Suddenly, I entered an altered state and found myself in a void. Immediately, I came to an innate understanding. My mind was sinking with the Marine, and this vision was a placeholder for us to meet. 
At first there was nothing, then slowly, I heard some voices and saw a figure illuminated by dim lights in the distance. As I moved towards the light, the surroundings changed and morphed into a grassy field with a starry night sky. I moved closer to the figure and sure enough it was the Marine. Here he was whole again with all his limbs intact. For some reason, in this vision, he wore a set of scout armor instead of power armor. Seated on the ground in a meditative posture, he was chanting away while a small campfire, the source of illumination I saw earlier, flickered in front of him. Hello. I greeted the Marine but he just continued his chanting, which turned out to be some space Marine mantra. In the furnace of war we are forged. We are his finest warriors. We give ourselves to his will. We are his bulwark against the terror. We are the tip of his spear, the edge of his sword. We are defenders of humanity and we shall know no fear. On and on he murmured with practiced ease. I looked at his solemn expression and listened to his words for a while before coming to a conclusion. The only way he could be a traitor was that he was an Alpha Legion operative, an unlikely scenario. Greetings, Space Marine. I said, but he just continued to ignore me while chanting. I thought for a moment on what could break the ice and said, I would like to talk to you about your brothers on the Shadow Talon. It was the name of the Thunderhawk gunship I glimpsed with my very brief interaction with its machine spirit. After hearing the gunship's name, he finally stopped chanting and slowly opened his eyes. Just when I thought we could start a conversation, he just checked on his hands and refused to look at me. While I had no idea on how any of this worked, in the real world he no longer had his hands so I just let him have his moment. After a while he finally spoke. Which? This vision is your doing. The Marine asked with an accusatory tone. He had a deep and powerful voice yet there was a hint of unmistakable youthfulness. Not keen on being labeled by that term, I replied with a question. I am a psyker, not a witch. Would you call the Emperor a witch? His massive body twitched almost unperceivably after hearing my words, but he remained silent after that. Seeing the window to talk was rapidly closing again, I tried to stir up conversation. For real, I have no idea why you are made whole here. You might be just, missing your limbs. I stated the truth, being quite a bad liar all my life. I had decided to be truthful whenever possible as a standard policy. The Marine seemed surprised by my answer and finally looked at me. While we exchanged stares, I finally had a good look at his face. Is he, still a kid? Superficial Astarte's features aside, his face, his posture, his eyes... Everything about him made me feel like I was dealing with a youngster who was barely 20 years old. Now that I have answered your question, it is only fair that you answer one of mine. I said, wanting to make him talk before he walled up again. Tell me, why did your brothers on the Shadow Talon spare my life when they had the chance to eliminate me? He looked at me in disbelief, and I pressed my advantage. They had their chance with the Turbo Laser Destructor. I was fighting a greater demon. Your brothers shot the demon, not me. His eyes widened further but still his lips were sealed. I waited for an answer that never came and even since he was withdrawing again. Seemed like expecting straight answers just like that was asking too much. I needed to take a step back. All right, if you do not wish to talk about your brothers, what about just telling me where this place is? I asked, looking at the eerily quiet alien landscape around me with its unfamiliar vegetation. Three small moons were in the night sky, and the star constellations were totally different from Earth's. This is my home world. Surprisingly, he talked. It is really different from mine. I remarked. Show me yours. He asked. Since this vision was created by my power, it should be within my ability to change it. I started envisioning a beautiful summer night on old earth. My primark level of cognitive ability constructed the overall setting before rendering the finer details in my head. Satisfied with the vision, I then willed what was in my mind into existence and our surroundings suddenly changed. This is so cool, like playing as a virtual director in real life. The three small moons were no more, replaced by a single large moon on the night sky while the star constellations became familiar. A nice breeze brushed against my face, making my hair flow while carrying the sound of crickets chirping in the distance. Instead of the previous quietness, the air became filled with the gentle hum of nature, and then a sea of fireflies appeared. I sat down on the soft patch of grass across the marine and watched in amazement as the fireflies began their mesmerizing dance. Their tiny lights flickered in the darkness, creating soft glows that illuminated the surrounding foliage as they moved gracefully around each other, forming intricate patterns and shapes in the night sky. I gazed up at the constellations above and was struck by their sheer beauty. For reasons unknown I recognized the constellations from old earth even though I was never a stargazer. The Orion constellation was definitely the most recognizable, that other one was Canis Major with Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, then there was the Ursa Major, often used as a navigational tool before the global positioning system became common. Were they in my memory from the countless documentaries I watched or? Regardless, I had never seen stars this clearly before. Pre-March grade senses together with psychic sorcery had brought the constellations to life in this vision, and they twinkled and shone like diamonds in the sky. I sat quietly in the idyllic setting and was reminded that back on my earth the light pollution had made it almost impossible to pick out the stars from the night sky. Then there was my severe case of myopia. Many decades of excessive gaming and questionable lifestyle had deteriorated my eyesight significantly in my old self. Such a sight was out of the question in my old life. Surrounded by the magical scenery, warm glow of the fireflies with the soft chirping of the crickets as soothing ambience, I lost myself in the simulated tranquility. Well, you were certainly enjoying yourself. The Marine brought my focus back to him. 
a hint of frustration in his deep voice. I looked at him and smiled. It is not as if you were talking much. This looks amazing, no. He looked around and finally nodded. Where is this? I thought of the current state of humanity's cradle where the oceans were long gone and sighed in response. The place looks a lot different now. This scene exists only in memory. Is that so? He replied flatly. We stayed silent for a while, just enjoying the relaxing atmosphere with the soft crackling of his campfire. Looking into the fire, I noticed an unusual item. What is that? I asked, pointing at the thing in the flames. To me, it seemed to be a personalized Inquisition rosette, a stylized eye held by dragon claws. When the Marine saw the rosette, his previously impassive face flashed with anger and disgust for a microsecond before he closed his eyes, refusing to interact further. Hello? I asked, but he remained silent like a statue. I considered my options and realized in this false world my powers had fully engulfed him. A brute force approach to accessing his memories was possible, leaving him at my mercy. I don't want to do this, cooperate, or you will leave me with no choice. I warned him, hoping he would play nice but received silence. Reluctantly, I powered up and began pushing into his mind. He resisted. While his willpower was as strong as steel, as I gradually increased my output it became clear he would not last forever. Soon he was sweating profusely under intense pressure. I could tell it was only a matter of time before his mind or something else would break. As the Marines suffered in silence, I noticed the campfire that had been burning brightly only moments before had dimmed considerably. I looked at the strange fire and felt its connection with the Marine. This fire is a representation of his life force? Curious to see what would happen, I reduced my output and observed the campfire brightening up as if it was responding to the release of pressure. To further test my theory, I eased up further and was validated in the next moment as it flared up immediately. Looking at the intensity of the fire, I came to a grim conclusion. He would have died if I had pressed on. I looked at the Marine again. He carried no signs of corruption and was ready to die for his brothers. He never relented and I did not want to kill him. We had reached an impasse. I released my power over him and immediately found myself back in the cell again, my hands still on the Marine's head. Unlike before, the Marine's forehead was warm like he was having a fever, and he was sweating heavily just like in the vision. Feeling disorientated, I looked around and found Verita behind me, ready to catch me in case I fell off the chair. How long did I close my eyes? About half a minute. Thabaris replied. 28.3 seconds to be exact. Belpratus remarked. What the hell? Time dilation. I had read about scenarios like this in the novels, characters experiencing lengthy otherworldly visions only to return to their reality where not much actual time had passed. How was it? Thabaris asked. I could push through his mental barrier, but he might die. Let's talk outside. We left the cell, went to a secured room next door and sat down to talk. A while later I finished my story, I found no trace of chaos corruption on him. Lastly he seems to have a distinct distaste for the Inquisition. Please elaborate. Before that, could you tell me what you know about this Marine and his chapter? Thabaris took a long look at me before offering his opinion. No offense, but I think it is unwise to involve you in such matters at this moment. Unconvinced, I was about to argue with the Inquisitor before realizing my own shortcomings. Despite having some amazing abilities and the baseline of a demigoddess, I was still hopelessly dependent on the people around me to navigate this world. I had no access to money, no concept of the norms of daily life inside the Imperium nor do I possess any basic life skills like operating mundane vehicles in this world. Heck, I did not even understand the basics of my body and could not even properly control my own physical strength. Wait, am I currently close to being a useless goddess level of meme existence like Aqua the Water Goddess in Konosuba? Mentally pummeled by a series of sudden critical self-reflections, I was just looking down at the ground and lost in my thoughts when Thabaris broke my stupor. Psychic exertion catching up? I think that is enough power usage for you today. I have a few places to visit and will be going soon. Please give a more detailed report on the interrogation session to Herlindia. He said with a hint of concern. I thought for a moment before asking, are you going anywhere dangerous today? Why? Thabaris looked up with a glint in his eyes, no doubt second guessing my motive. Pointing to the wall where my senses easily detected the presence of Neandra, I smiled and replied, if it is possible, I would like to borrow her for half a day. Again, why? After listening to my reasons, Thabaris consented to my request, but only agreed to lend me the Imperial Assassin for a few hours. He made the arrangements and soon left, leaving me alone to deal with his most deadly operative. Looking lethal as ever, Neandra approached me with the grace of a prowling predator. She knelt down respectfully and said, Lady Serene, you need my service? Neandra, I heard from the others that it was you who carried me to the Black Star from that muddy field. For that you have my thanks. As for now, I have a request. Being the only transhuman I could talk to, you could say she might be the most relatable person I had in this world at this moment. Neandra looked up from her kneeling position, her expression telling me to go on. Teach me how to access my transhuman strength and on top of that, some basic fighting skills. I said. Upon hearing my request, a subtle expression of hesitation flashed on her ice-cold pretty face, but she didn't reply immediately. So I pressed on. You are free to withhold any technique you do not wish to share. I just need the basics. As you command. She relented. There's also this thing I need to ask you. My apologies to you in advance, it is quite an intimate question. I bent down, putting a hand up to whisper my question. 
Neandra looked confused for a second before she leaned over. I had many questions to ask, but decided to go with the very fundamental issues first. How many times do you need to go to the washroom a day? B2CH.12 training. The seemingly simple subject I asked ended up being an in-depth topic of its own right. Between genetically engineered organs with a more efficient digestive and waste management system, there were many factors that could muddle the frequency of a transhuman's need to visit the bathroom. From Neandra's limited knowledge on the subject matter, a few standard Terran days of not needing to visit the loo was normal for most transhumans. On the extreme end of example, the Vindicare assassins of the Officio Assassinorum, the ultra-elite snipers who trained their art of marksmanship to near perfection, were known to stay still for many days in a single position just to get a chance to eliminate their quarry with a single gunshot. Another issue to consider were the extra layers of cybernetic enhancements and built-in waste management plus recycling systems and advanced suits. For example, the Astartes power armor had built-in systems that could sustain a marine's metabolism without needing to stop to eat or drink while taking care of waste management. No one had ever heard of a space marine looking for a washroom in the middle of a war zone, and they were known to be confined in their power armor for months in brutal void warfare where taking one suit off for a leak was out of the question. Then there was my case where my physiology was practically state secret. I really have no idea. Neandra said while shaking her head, her long ponytail swinging from side to side. The level of engineered organs aside, I have heard of rumors about psychers who can alter bodily functions with the deeper mastery of their powers. When it comes to you, both aspects are of unknown quantifiers. She looked dead serious when delivering her conclusion. We returned to the upper floor just as our conversation wrapped up and was received by her Lindia and the rest. Preacher Malin has gone through all the remaining test candidates and the initial results are promising. Her Lindia reported. While that was certainly good news, the sample size was too small and the progress too slow for what we needed. Very well. Kindly arrange a fresh batch for tomorrow, add some variety, and increase the number of candidates by half. Please look into methods that can increase the efficiency of the whole process. I said, My lady, you are doing this again tomorrow? We have to show it to the world. Malin exclaimed, hardly able to contain her excitement. I am sure the archdeacon and the rest of the senior clergy would be honored to witness you performing the emperor's miracle. May I invite them over? Bringing the hi-hat fella and his gang to watch me work? I had mixed feelings about Malin's suggestion. The notion of turning my work into religious propaganda just did not sit right with me. But as an outsider I had to concede due to my limited knowledge of the local politics, the pros and cons of such an action was beyond me. It was time to consult the professionals. I looked at her Lindia with puppy eyes, she quickly got the hint and dropped the conditions for Malin's request. Esteemed members of Adeptus Mini Storum are welcome to witness Lady Syrian performing her work, but due to special circumstances every visitor has to be vetted by the Inquisition beforehand and no recordings will be allowed. Against my expectation, Malin did not protest about the imposed conditions, instead she quickly sorted out the details with her Lindia and promptly excused herself to inform the church. I had Neandra talk to Alicia on the arrangements needed for our little training session later, and before I knew it, lunchtime had arrived. Non-militant members of Adeptus Sororitas usually eat two meals a day, lunch around noon, and dinner in the evening. Not feeling hungry at all. I declined the offer of lunch and ended up killing time at the library inside the monastery with Welmina by my side while waiting for Neandra to get ready. Like almost everything in the Imperium, the monastery library was huge, imposing, and a sight to behold. Made up of two floors, the library was housed in a grand ornate chamber complete with high ceilings, wall murals, intricate carvings, and stained glass windows that cast a natural glow on the many shelves of manuscripts and heavy tomes. The air inside was cool and thick with the scent of aged parchment and leather bindings. Sounds of rustling pages mixed with cogitator stations muted beeps and whispered conversations created a serene, scholarly atmosphere. Well, it would have been perfectly serene if not for the presence of many cherubs. Goddamn creepy cherubs. These things were, basically undead and genderless babies with decorative feathery wings. Their primary means of movement was by floating around with their build-in anti-grav generators, the same principle utilized by servo skulls. Despite knowing the existence of these bio-sculpted homunculi beforehand, I had severely underestimated their grotesqueness in real life. With my typical civilian worldview from the 21st century, coming face to face with these constructs proved to be deeply disturbing, like witnessing a Halloween joke that went too far. Whoever thought of having these things hovering around in a place of study was a good idea really possessed a skewed sense of morbid aesthetics. It took me a while to get used to and ignore the many creepy cybernetic undead infants that were randomly floating about. A glance of the shelves informed me most of the books here were about topics of religious, historical, and cultural significance. In essence, none of them looked interesting to me. But since I was already here, I might as well make my time productive. I reached out, retrieved a tome titled Chronicles of Nusquam, and started flipping. To my surprise, I was able to thoroughly read and comprehend the contents just by casually glancing at the pages while turning them. Amazed, I continued to flip through the pages thinking this incredible instant information absorption would stop at some point. But I was sorely mistaken. It just went on and on, page after page of text was fully read and comprehended at a supernatural speed until I freaked out and slammed the thick book shut. My sudden action made Welmina, who had been following me around like a lost puppy, look over with curiosity in her eyes. Did I read half the book just like that? 
Time to put that strange notion to the test. I passed the tome to her. Help me test something. Try reading any line in this book before page 150. Wellman obliged, she opened the book to a random page and started reading. The discovery of Nusquam as an exoplanet with Holy Terra's almost exact specifications is nothing short of a miraculous occurrence. That is on page 10, first paragraph. Am I correct? Let me see. You are correct. Try another page. Please hold on. All right, here we go. May we always remember the miracle of this discovery that founded our home and marvel at it. I held up a hand stopping her before continuing where she let off on the page, the divine plan laid down by the God Emperor that guides us all. Praise be to the Master of Mankind. Page 83, fifth paragraph. Correct again. Wait, did you memorize all that just by flipping through it? Wellmana asked, astonished. A Primarch's baseline abilities are IMBA as hell. Seems so. If only I could recall my lost memories like that. I managed a vague response. So the saying of a Primarch never forgets was true. In the lore Horus the War Master once noticed there was a strange lapse in his memory, leading him to investigate and later discovering a big secret. On the note of never forgetting, I recalled promising Wellmana a piece of my wardrobe after the war was over. It seemed like that promise was overdue. Note to self on sorting that out later today. Speaking of Wellmana, I had been detecting a weird sense of nervousness in her mind, plus the scholar's subtle fidgeting around me had become too obvious to hide. Something on your mind? I asked, sounding my best to be casual. Well, Malin had passed some questionnaires to me and wished that you could answer them as soon as possible for her to report to the church. Wellmana answered timidly while taking out her data slate. Speaking of Malin, I believe she just entered the library. Her recognizable footstep was approaching fast from the other end. All right, I think Malin is here. Let's answer them when she arrives. I said. At that moment a floating cherub got too close for my comfort. Annoyed, in my mind I asked the cyborg baby to bugger off. Shockingly, the cherub turned its head and looked at me before sending me a binary prompt. Plus plus administrative level directive received. Please clarify the distance or destination for this unit to relocate. Plus plus it. Surprised, I simply pointed to the far end of the library. Just move along. Instead of floating away immediately, the cherub landed onto the floor before giving me a deep bow. Plus plus acknowledged, administrator. Plus plus. After completing its flamboyant gesture, it started running towards the spot I pointed with the grace of a three-year-old and ran past Malin like a playful child, giggling creepily all the way. So just like that I discovered the cherubs here, like most servo-skulls, responded to my thought commands unquestioningly. Both the scholar and the preacher had their eyes glued onto the running homunculus. Then Malin turned to me with a puzzled face and a question. Lady Serene, how did you get a cherub to obey you? What do you mean? I had visited this library multiple times, they never obey anyone except for the librarians and the tech priests. Oops. As I was wondering how to talk my way out of this, Wellman has stepped in and explained with a straight face. As the Holy Daughter, Lady Syrene's divinity is recognized even by the cherubs residing here. Is that so? Malin gasped. Can you kindly demonstrate again? I need to verify such claims to the church. That should not be a problem. Am I correct, my lady? Wellman has smiled and gave me a quick wink. I could even read what was on her mind. This is nothing compared to Bane Blade tanks. As one of the inner circle people in the know, Wellmana was present all the way from the planning through the execution of the final civil war battle and witnessed it all. Since this was my screw up, I might as well put up a small show to complete the white lie. Very well. I said and mentally ordered another nearby cherub to come over while doing a beckoning gesture to complete the act. The cherub I targeted immediately dropped its routine, hovered over and landed in front of me. Do a proper greeting. I commanded. It complied, to the delight of both girls and some random sisters peeking from the corners of the library the cherub formed the Aquila hand sign to the best of its ability and bowed. Have a seat. I ordered again, and it did as commanded, dropping its tiny back on the floor while looking at us with its unnerving eyes. Fascinating. Is it possible to ask it to do something that we have never seen before? Malin asked excitedly. She had the energy of a pilgrim witnessing a miracle and could not wait to see more. It was then I had a proper look at the cyborg baby. Through the transcendent level of intellect residing in me, I got a better understanding of these constructs. These cherubs were controlled by cybernetically augmented biological cortexes and nervous systems which allowed them to perform simple tasks. You could say they were a more complex version of servitors with some allowed perimeters for pre-programmed self-expressions. The cherubs here were programmed with some preset tasks but otherwise reverted to a sort of holding pattern until they received overriding commands from an accepted figure of authority. I looked at the girls with their faces of expectation and wondered for a moment what would impress them. Then a ridiculous idea crossed my mind. Many, many years ago when Holy Terra was a happier place, in the primordial days of its internet, a video featuring an animated dancing baby had once become a trending phenomenon. Activating thought acceleration, I first analyzed the rough movements of the dancing baby in the video inside my mind. That done, I imprinted the movement sequence to the cherub via my connection to it and let its internal system sort out the details. Movement sequence achievable, I prompted it. Plus plus affirmative. Plus plus, it replied. All right, little fella, what is the best dance routine you've hidden from the world? Show them what you got. I said to the cherub, which was a purely theatrical display for my audience, then dropped my mental command. Execute movement sequence. 
plus plus complying. Plus plus, the cherub stood up and started the whimsical dance sequence. Just like the viral video, it was soon swinging its arms back and forth with its head bobbing up and down. Moving to the beat of an unheard music, it also bounced up and down on its toes, occasionally taking a step or two to the side while rotating on the spot. The chubby little bugger spun and twirled, dipped and bounced with all the unbridled enthusiasm a homunculus could muster. For a moment the dancing cherub had become a tornado of motion on the library floor. Completing the package were the cherub's uncanny facial expressions, its eyes were wide open with artificial excitement, its mouth opened in a toothless grin while it repeated the dancing sequence on the spot again and again to the uproar of everyone present. It still looked darn creepy to me but my audience seemed to disagree with that notion. Their reaction spoke of visceral excitement and joy, like some fangirls witnessing their idol's live performance. Even the previously peeping sisters on corners of the library had come out to check out the little bugger's performance up close. It was becoming a ruckus and the noise was fast getting out of hand, so I clapped my hands and ordered the cherub to stop. It complied by finishing a last spin before taking a bow and sat down again like nothing ever happened, to the applause of all the ladies nearby. That was amazing! Malin exclaimed and the others agreed. Some random sisters even went up to the cherub, teasing it to dance again to no avail. The atmosphere was getting lively here. Won't the librarian get angry if we made too much noise? I asked while looking around. A librarian is right here, said a sister, pointing at Wellmana. Eh? I looked at Wellmana. She returned my inquisitive stare with an apologetic smile. All members of the Order's dialogous share responsibility in maintaining the monastery library. She then bent down to the cherub and talked to it like speaking to an old friend. Ada, 55, resumed standard routine. The cyborg baby nodded, stood back up and floated away, ending our little show. Huh, sisters of the dialogous Order maintaining huge monastery libraries. How did I miss something so obvious? It was just as the small crowd started to disperse. Wellmana's communicator sounded. Speaking. Yes, she is with me. Very well. Wilmina turned to me. Your training session venue is ready. Would you like to go now? Yes, please. Please follow me. Upon knowing I was attending a private training session, Malin could not hide her disappointment of being unable to attend and observe. Soon, in a small training hall where only three people were present, my training with the Imperial Assassin started under the supervision of Rita. Strangely, on a table beside us were two egg trays. One was empty while the other had a dozen eggs on it. Neandra was demonstrating what she could do with her strength by bending an extra thick metallic rod into a huge shape. She made it look so easy, without knowing better one would think the rod in question was a piece of modeling clay. She then straightened the rod back effortlessly before passing it to me. Here, you try it. I held onto the metal rod, felt its significant gravity pull and was suddenly unsure if I could do it. Holding each of the rod's ends with my hands, I imitated her stance and pressed hard. The rod bent but did not go all the way. I pressed and pressed but the piece of stupid rod stubbornly refused to bend further. Hold on a second. Where did my strength go? Didn't I just cut through human flesh with a hand chop? Neandra cocked her head and crossed her arms, silently observing my helplessness for a while before commenting. You have to go all the way. All the way? I breathed deep, increased my strength output and pressed again. The rod bent slightly further, but far from forming a huge shape. More. Neandra said flatly. Flustered, I summoned more power and in my frustration, crossed an unseen line. A scary level of strength I normally had no access to poured forth and the metal rod gave way. It was so sudden my hands almost hit each other and the rod was bent into a teardrop shape. Good, remember how that feels. Now bend it back. Neandra said. Won't it eventually break from metal fatigue? I was curious. Not for this material. I did as told but was conscious of my crossing of the human threshold this time. The rod was easily stretched back to its straightened form and Verita gave a small applause. Very good. Now do this to see how much control you have over your strength. Neandra said while taking back the rod and started demonstrating a new sequence. First she bent the rod again. As soon as it became, you, shape she put the rod aside and moved an egg from one container to the next. Then she unbent the rod and proceeded to move another egg. Now you try. I bent the rod as easily as before but when I touched an egg it popped the moment my hand touched it. Well, be always conscious of the amount of strength you're exerting. Neandra lectured. Without proper control you might accidentally kill someone if you mixed up different strength usages. She explained without further elaborating but I was already imagining a possible gruesome scenario. One moment I might be lifting something super heavy when a random person got too close. Forgetting my current strength output, I moved a hand to push the person away, and that's how you get human goo. I wiped my hand on a prepared towel and went at it again, popping two more eggs before succeeding with the rest. Neandra nodded in approval. Excellent control. Do this training again in the future whenever you need a refresher. That was faster than expected. We still have some time left. What do you want to do next? I looked at the Imperial Assassin, remembering from the games I knew their combat prowess supposedly rivaled if not surpassing even most Space Marine captains. While I was never into real fighting, would I be able to beat her in mock combat with my raw baseline stats alone? Can we do hand-to-hand -hand combat duels? I asked. Nothing that risks injuries, please. Verita chipped in quickly. Neandra just looked at me with a hint of interest until an almost impossible to perceive smirk appeared on her face. She then nodded, held up a few fingers while starting to lay down ground rules. You heard the sister. 
we have to make it a safe and civilized affair. First, no usage of strength above the human threshold, something you just mastered. Second, certain techniques are off limits. No striking to the back of the head or spine, no eye gouging, no fish hooking, no biting, no hair pulling, no groin strikes. And that was how I got my first chance to test myself against a real deal. I was excited. This was the ultimate theory test of nature versus nurture. Pitting raw demigod stat lines against a seasoned and hardened assassinorum operative would be interesting, right? Even with the low odds, I got a chance at winning this, right? Under the supervision of a worried-looking Verita, I adopted a stance dug out from memories of my internet trawling days, raising my hands up before me as I crouched on solidly planted feet. Neandra in contrast relaxed herself, standing casually with her hands hanging loosely. We exchanged silent stares for a few seconds before I decided to move. I launched my body onwards, covering the distance between us in a blink of an eye. My right arm locked back, chambered and ready to whip out once I got close enough. As fast as I was with my transhuman abilities, Neandra was just as fast, if not faster. My feet barely touched the ground again when she took a step towards me and raised a hand that greeted my hurtling body. My sternum ran into her fist with a loud crack, and I was sent crashing into the ground. While I reflexively winced for the impact, defying my mortal expectation both the hit and the harsh landing did not hurt much at all. Since this body could withstand jumping from a few floors and land with contemptuous ease, this level of impact was literally nothing. Standing up, I tried again by leaping to the left to flank Neandra. The assassin replied by dashing past me and lashing her leg out. Her shin caught the back of my knees and in the next instant I was tumbling face first to meet my new friend, the ground, again. Thinking fast, I rolled into the fall, my face only briefly smashing into the floor before I pushed myself up on my feet. Before I could even regain my bearings, Neandra was suddenly right in front of me. I barely twisted away from a jab to my face, just in time to register a protest from Verita, but that only left me exposed to a rising knee into my guts. Instinctively, my hands came out to try and catch the attack, but Neandra then took the opportunity to slam her forehead into mine, soliciting another loud objection from the sister hospitaler. Once more I fell, and I was grateful that my body did not feel pain so keenly. Nien, no hitting on the face. Verita berated her colleague. Relax, these levels of attacks won't leave any marks, Neandra replied calmly. Even if it did, with her physiology she would heal in no time. After catching my breath, I decided to refine my attack. I lunged straight at her for the third time, my senses tuned to the max for this focused attack. Things slowed down. In time dilation I saw how Neandra moved and could not stop myself from marveling at the sheer fluidity of her movements. Like a ghost she once more slipped past my effective fighting range, but I was ready for her. Or I thought I was. I sent a ready punch to intercept her approach, but she simply ducked under it and replied with a quick jab into the armpit of my swinging arm. Powering through the numbing impact, I used my other arm to deliver an uppercut into her body that was sure to hit. Neandra battered aside the strike with such force that I was spun about, and then I was struggling as her arms were suddenly wrapped around my neck in a tight chokehold. I futilely tried to struggle free or hit her in an effort to break her grip, but all that got me was a slow descent into the embrace of my old friend, the ground. With Neandra's legs wrapped around my arm and body, I tapped out. After being released, I voiced my objection. No fair, why am I always doing the attacking? Let me try defending for a change. Neandra almost smirked again. That can be arranged. Ouch. I got trashed. Laying on the floor looking at the ceiling, my mind was running back at how the Imperial Assassin proved her lethality with expertly executed combat moves done with inhuman grace. While they say you never knew until you tried, in hindsight it was kind of expected. Despite having the body and agility of a mini demigodling, I was overcome by Neandra's ferocity and unparalleled combat experience. The Imperial Assassin displayed no fixed discernible fighting style. Her moves reminded me of various martial arts, a hint of kung fu here, a bit of karate there, flashes of judo, hints of Krav Mega and dashes of Muay Thai. The only real emphasis of all her moves was brutal efficiency and effectiveness, the whole package delivered with lightning-fast precision strikes. The fights, if you could call them that, were brief affairs that ended so fast I did not even have time to work up a sweat. The later sessions of our mock battles had become so one-sided I became frustrated and was forcing a slight resemblance of a win to no avail. My little tricks and thought acceleration proved to be little help. Neandra was always a few steps ahead, whereas momentary time freezing was just like pressing the pause button in a losing game to look around, providing little but a slight delay to the inevitable. In this ultra-tight close-quarter melee, speed and strength with precision triumphs everything. It ended with me being body slammed onto the floor, prompting Verita to call out in protest against possible injuries. Aware that Neandra's time with me was running out and yielding to her prowess, I stayed on the floor as Verita hurried over to check on me. Silly girl, such level of body slamming can't hurt an apex transhuman. I am fine. Only my self-confidence is hurt. I whimpered as Neandra entered my view with her usual unreadable expression. That was bad, huh? I lamented. You telegraphed your moves too much. Your movements were fast but rigid and slightly restrained by your attire. She said matter-of-factly. Can I have more sessions like this with you? We will see. Throne be damned. I hated the idea of being in a state comparable to a useless goddess so much. Starting from now, I will do whatever I can to gain daily life proficiencies and combat prowess. 
Me too ch.13 First Communion. After thoroughly trashing me, Neandra left soon after. Accompanied by Verita, I was on my way returning to the library when her Lindia intercepted us before we got onto the lift. I heard Malin had prepared questionnaires for you. The throne agent said to me and then she turned to Verita. I am taking over and joining the session, just in case. Verita nodded and so I returned to the library with her Lindia. We found Welmina and Malin having a discussion in a corner. Both girls stood up the moment they saw me and I was soon dragged over to answer their questionnaires. I provided little information about myself other than arriving via a Mechanicus ship on a divine mission, forsaking all other details using the excuse of memory loss, and just went with the flow under the supervision of Verlindia. Unable to gain much on my personal nor important information, to my annoyance Malin started asking about the details of my song. What is the title of the song? Is it true that its lyrics are in ancient Terran languages? Malin asked with an unhealthy level of enthusiasm without noticing Welmina giving her a quick side eye. The scholar's surface thought was clear to me. Of course it is. I worked on the translation for days, then verified it with multiple other experts. Wow, Welmina could understand English and Japanese. I had totally forgotten that sisters of the Order Dialogus were usually linguistic experts. Do you remember your singing on Miracle Day? Hold on. I have it here, Malin said and reached for her data slate. No need. I stopped her. No way was I going to let her repeat that painful memory. I had seen the recordings and knew the song, but Miracle Day? That's the unofficial name people had started using for the day when Nusquam narrowly escaped damnation, Wellmana chipped in. Then can you please confirm its title? People have been guessing for a while now, Malin said excitedly and handed me her data slate. On it was a news article discussing my solo performance and a number of speculated titles to go along with it. I looked through the article and the proposed title list, caught a glimpse at the accredited translator's names and saw Wellmana Mayer was listed as one of the primary contributors. I then read into the details, gasping internally at how close they came to guessing and before finding Beautiful World, amongst the top contenders for proposed title, they had nailed it. I pointed with a finger at it. Yes, it is in ancient Terran languages. Whoever did the translation and guessing of its title did a great job. This is the correct title. I knew it. Malin exclaimed while Welmanoa's face lit up upon receiving my indirect praise for her hard work. Looking at the happy preacher and scholar, I thought for a moment before deciding to properly honor the song's creator. It is not my song though, I have no idea why I remember this, but I knew for a fact the original artist is from Holy Terror a real long time ago. Malin's eyes widened upon hearing my explanation. How long? She asked. Should I give a proper date? Nah. I thought for a moment before giving her a vague but truthful response. When Holy Terra was still known as Earth and the Seven Oceans were still around, I answered and watched as her expression went from ecstatic to blank, unsure of what to make of my comment. Ignoring a speechless Malin, I activated the notepad function of her data slate and wrote down the name, Hikaru Yutada, before passing the device back to her. Please properly attribute credit to the real artist. It was the least I could do for cross-dimensional piracy. It was near the evening when they booted Malin out of the monastery with the excuse of visitors' hours being over and they could not provide accommodation on such short notice. In truth, I knew the Sororitas were just messing with the new preacher. I was having another round of checkup done by Verita, supervised by Muggos Balpratis and oddly just another senior-looking sister hospitaler who I had seen a few times. Usually there were more of them around. I remembered seeing a few of them during my previous sessions. Just you two today? I asked Verita, trying to jumpstart a conversation in the silence. From now on, probably so. Verita replied. All the others except Sister July here had voluntarily submitted themselves to partial memory wipe. Mind wipe? Volunteer. I stood up, a mixture of shock and outrage washing over me as I instantly understood what had happened. As my caretakers during my rehabilitation, most of the personnel involved would have known what I really am. But without a high enough security clearance, they were forbidden to keep their memories of that information. So that was why the psychers were here too. In the grim darkness of the far future, serving the Imperium meant not even your memories belonged to you. Viewing this as a private citizen from a mostly democratic country of the 21st century, such infringement was sacrilege to the basic human rights of the highest order. Who do you think you are? Thabarus words echoed in my mind as I stood still, contemplating the impact on the lives of people around me with my existence alone. What I didn't anticipate was the effect of my response. In front of me both sister hospitalers had knelt down while the muggos had become completely motionless like a statue. From the reflection of his lens I saw myself, icy face and eyes gleaming with power. I was angry. It showed, and people got scared. I could see while Verita who knew me better was still relatively calm, the senior hospitaler was trembling slightly. Throne please, I am no Aron. I let out a soft sigh and sat back down. My apologies, I am not angry at any of you. It is just. I find it difficult that people are losing their memories because of me. Mugos Balpratis took a deep bow before he spoke. As expected of the one who was created by the Omniscia and is closer to the Divine Source, your vexation is comprehensible. Denying the sisters of their recollections of your true identity is equivalent to theft of their knowledge robbing them of a portion of divinity's manifestation, thus rendering the memory wipe an act of sacrilege. Nonetheless, I assert that the compromise for improved information security is advantageous and well worth it. Did this guy just do a runabout version of Susuga bootlicking? 
Nonetheless, the Muggos did provide me with a nice exit ramp, so I nodded in acknowledgement. I am sorry for my emotional display, but it was upsetting. Personally, I view all personal memories as sacred. No one had any further comment, so I then turned to the senior hospitaler, Sister Julia. We have met, but never been introduced. Yes. The senior hospitaler quickly lowered her head as she introduced herself. I am Hospitaler Superior Julia Pometh, ranking sister for the Order Hospitaler on Nusquam. I am beyond blessed to be making your acquaintance, holy daughter. I will be in your care. I nodded and tried to be approachable but felt only religious veneration on Julia's surface thoughts. I realized it would be very difficult if not impossible for me to establish an interpersonal relationship with her at this point. We concluded the checkup and Balpratus gave me the report. While I am far from able to divine the grand design created by the Omniscia, but even with my limited knowledge it is my belief that you are as healthy as can be. Daily checkups would not be necessary from this point. Finally it was official, I was fit for duty. Later that day, I received news that Canonist D. Dinah had delayed her scheduled return, chasing after more heretic nests. It was around dinner time when I noticed some news about the heretic hunts. Due to newly uncovered leads, hundreds of people had been arrested and many more executed. I wondered if that had anything to do with what happened today as my eventful second day of living in the monastery was coming to an end. Dinner was a dull solo. I don't feel like eating the nice food in front of me, a fair. I had solace, my servo skull, skin the food for poison and toxin beforehand, a procedure Verita had insisted that I should make into a habit. Speaking of dinner, I just realized having eggs around meant that chicken, our poultry friends back from Earth, had made it to the stars with us. I wondered if they were still considered the most abused domesticated species around at this time. Soon after dinner Herlindia visited to get a detailed report of the psychic interrogation on the space marine. She was also staying at the monastery for the time being. I was halfway narrating my story when it occurred to me. Can I fully trust the Inquisition? As much as my natural inclination to just leave everything to people like Thabaris and Herlindia, something was bugging me. The way the Inquisitor had asked me not to dig too much into their business was a dead giveaway that I was not fully trusted by them either. Then that vision of an Inquisition rosette held by dragon claws burning in a fire flashed before my mind, and I decided on my course of action. I need to look into this myself. I skipped the most crucial parts, finished the report, and was left alone after that. Finally free, I was going to sort out my gift for Wellmana when a scene outside the window caught my attention. My room had some large curtain windows directly overlooking the gated entry of the monastery compound, where a crowd much bigger than the one I saw had gathered. Religious fanatics. I shivered and closed the curtains. I then took the time to pick an outfit as the promised gift. Totally clueless on fashion, I selected a ceremonial gown which looked formal enough for most occasions. I remembered Wellman and did pause for a second longer when she came across this particular piece the last time. Fingers crossed that she really did like it. Talking about fashion, I was wondering where to get a sample of the mundane life on this planet when the television unit in the room caught my sight. Huh, why didn't I think of that? After some fumbling with the remote control, I managed to operate the ultra-high-resolution TV and spent some time watching their programs. The first program I came across was a documentary called The Glory of Humanity, celebrating the achievements and accomplishments of humanity. It showcased the technology, culture, and warfare that have made the Imperium of Man the current greatest power in the galaxy. In pure propaganda fashion, it could not stop singing praises to the Emperor the whole time. Flipping through the channels, I next came across another show called Loyalty Unto Death. It highlighted short stories of incredible feats of known ordinary soldiers and citizens during trying times to showcase their unbreakable loyalty and dedication. Only a few featured figures survived their ordeal to personally tell their tales. Feeling uneasy about watching a show about martyrs, I changed the channel again and landed on an interesting show called Imperial Justice. It followed a local law officer on his adventures of dealing with crimes on Nusquam while working with the Arbites, literally a space-age, grimdark cop show. That said, these programs were not subtle in their pushing for the themes about loyalty, self-sacrifice and dedication to the Imperium. My initial impression was that for the average citizen, their way of life was very rigid. There was an emphasis on class status and how people need to know their places. Suddenly my servo skull, Solace, signaled an incoming call with Wellmana shown as the caller. I picked it up with a flick of my mind. Hello, Wellmana? My lady, sorry to disturb you at this time. I just received confirmation on the list of ecclesiarchy visitors tomorrow and, uh, even through the voice chat, her tenseness and hesitation was apparent, so I decided that I might as well ask her to come over. Something to discuss? Just come to my place. Wellmana arrived soon after. I recognized her footsteps and unlocked the door remotely as she reached the entrance. Then Solace welcomed her into my living quarters. It was far easier to read the mind of others when the other party was willing and wanted to share. Even before Wellmana was seated, I was already receiving information by casually skimming her surface thoughts. Tomorrow, important ecclesiarchy big shots are visiting. Archdeacon, deacons, prominent priests and preachers. Seemed like the whole elite hi-hat gang would be coming. We have some very important guests from the church coming tomorrow, yes? I asked preemptively, not wanting to waste time nor make her job difficult. Oh, yes. Wellmana answered happily, truly glad that I opened the topic for her. His Grace Archdeacon Rycine will head a prominent delegation for a visit tomorrow. Then I sensed multiple worries that hung heavily on her mind, 
presentation and arrangements. I played along. Thank you for handling all the red tape and formalities. Should I wear something more formal for the occasion? Would you like to pick an outfit for me again? That would be great. Wellman bowed and smiled from the bottom of her heart as almost all her hurdles were immediately solved. We dug into my luggage again and went through the collection quickly, eventually settling on an outfit. I tried it on and the scholar sister nodded approvingly, satisfied that I looked formal enough for the important guests tomorrow. Speaking of outfit, I believe I still owe you a gift. I said while taking out the folded ceremonial gown. Wellmana went pale upon seeing her gift, and she raised a hand to cover her mouth. I am sorry it is overdue. Please accept it. I pushed it to her. Wellmana grabbed hold onto the garment respectfully with both hands. Her dizzied mind eventually blossomed into a spring of gratitude, and she finally said, I will treasure this greatly. She even lowered her head slightly to hide her teary eyes. Ah. Anyway, I should use this opportunity to ask questions about some issues that were bugging me. Wellmana. I was informed that some of the sister hospitalers who oversaw my recovery had their memories wiped. Who exactly in the Sororitas currently knows of my true identity? About that, as far as I know, beside me and all the Palatines, only the Canonists and her retinue, plus sister hospitaler Julia, knows the whole truth. Not even Zarfia? Well, technically she won't be in the list. But I am not sure if Canonist D. Dinah had kept up with the code of secrecy with key figures like sister Zarfia. Why? The true prophecy foretold the danger about proclaiming your identity to the world, and we had kept the number of people in the loop as low as possible. However, it is not beyond the canonist to disclose such information to trusted individuals to boost morale. At times I could tell she couldn't wait to inform the whole world that the emperor had sent his hidden daughter here for something truly massive. I winced internally, silently praying whatever was in that vault would be worthy of such high expectations. Tell me about the cardinal. I switched topics, hoping to know more about this infamous individual from a local. Wellmana's expression became visibly grimmer with the mention of the cardinal. She gave off the impression of talking about a black sheep in the family. Well, His Holiness Potanif IV might be too ambitious for his own good as the cardinal of Nusquam. Why is that? You see. It was a fascinating story. In essence, a nearby shrine world, Sanctitas Primus, was the primary religious hub of the subsector. A long time ago, after a particularly savage power struggle for the cardinal throne on Sanctitas Primus, the losing faction who were on friendly ties with the nobles of Nusquam fled to the planet with the victors high on their tails. Caught in the middle, the Nusquamese leadership then made a deal with the church. It was agreed that Nusquam would remain a secular world permanently, forever keeping the church out of its central political power structure to prevent the rise of a competing shrine world. And thus the exiles were allowed to live the rest of their lives in peace and a unique political structure was born. Podanith IV is a man who has great interest in power but is stuck in the impossible local political landscape to expand his influence. Wellmana explained, so at times he vented his frustration in an unruly fashion. I see. We went quiet after that. In the ensuing silence, I felt something slowly building up in Wellmana's mind. A while later, she finally built enough resolve to ask her question. Please, can you tell me about the God Emperor? Surprised, I took a closer look at Wellmana. The Dialogous sister exchanged stares with me without flinching but her pupils had dilated from the sheer mental pressure she must have experienced just to bring out the question. She really did want to know. As for me, for the briefest of moments, I felt like a person who just discovered my new best friend was way more interested in my celebrity dad than myself. Not very cool, but totally understandable. What do you want to know? I finally asked after a while. Anything and everything. Hmm. I am sorry, my only memory of him is beyond words. I started saying and sensed Wellmanoa's mood dipped sharply upon hearing my words, but she did a good job on keeping a neutral face. What was I supposed to tell her? That for a psyker the emperor looked like a sentient son and his current mind was too shattered to hold a simple conversation? I only had second-hand memory about seeing the actual Big E, and it was quite a traumatic experience. It would be so much easier to show than to tell. Hold on, this could be done just like that psychic interrogation, right? I can do that. I became excited by the idea. It felt like discovering a new world. In theory, I just needed to create a virtual vision and guide her synapses into my simulation. It should be a much easier process since she was a totally willing subject in comparison to the space marine. The very notion of being able to give visions to others was utterly intriguing to me, so I decided to give it a chance. There might be a way. Would you like to try? To do what exactly? For you to see him yourself. Wellmano's face tightened up just by my mere suggestion but she nodded eagerly and consented. I do not understand, but if it can deepen my connection with the god emperor, I am willing. Well, in that case I need to prepare the scene first. All right, give me a moment. Psychana Activa, activated. Cogitatio Acceleratio, activated. Simulatio, activated. Gathering my powers, I closed my eyes and began the massive internal calculations on recreating the mind-blowing psychic impression of the emperor inside my mind. The work was not easy. To do this I had to push into the deep recesses of my memory which were heavily entangled with emotions. From there I painstakingly reconstructed my impression of the emperor in that fateful reunion. Running thought acceleration on overdrive, I tweaked and adjusted, then modified and improved the scene thousands of times inside my head. It was a doubly difficult process as most of the involved elements were not even physical in nature. 
Nevertheless, I persevered with brute computation strength and pushed forward many adjustments until finally, a satisfactory level of closeness of what I remembered was achieved in vivid three-dimensional information. Then it occurred to me I did not catch a glimpse of the actual golden throne in Serene's memory. That darn throne was so prevalent in all the lore, an emperor sighting experience would be incomplete without it. Luckily, I had seen the throne on the cover of an official novel and went to work with the sanctioned source. As usual, there were many blanks to fill, but these were much easier work when compared to the reconstruction of the emperor in his full psychic glory. Soon with the throne settled, I just needed to put the virtual emperor onto the throne in a seated position and everything was good to go. It is ready. I opened my eyes, happy with the preparation, but nevertheless felt the need to lower Welmanoa's expectation with some disclaimers beforehand. I smiled and extended a hand to her. No promises, but I will do my best. Hold on to my hand. What am I doing? Asking the emperor's daughter to provide glimpses of the master of mankind? Is this not an act of sacrilege and an abusive position of the highest order? Welmana had been asking herself such questions a lot in the past minutes. Her pulse quickened just by reviewing her own actions. Surely this was bordering on blasphemy. But this might be the only chance she will ever have. Plus Lady Syrian has been so kind and accommodating. Welmana had an idea of what was coming in the near future. This rare event of being alone with the emperor's daughter probably might never happen again. So when she finally built up her courage and made her request, Welmana watched in mortification as Syrian abruptly went silent. Just as the sister believed a grave mistake had been made, to her surprise Serene had turned around and agreed to her selfish petition. More shockingly Serene even spoke of a way to let her see the master of mankind. Not knowing what to expect but obviously unwilling to miss out on this, Welmana eagerly agreed to whatever Serene had in store. Serene then spoke of having to prepare for the experience and closed her eyes while the sister waited with bated breath. A while later when the holy daughter opened her eyes again, her once depthless silver pupils glowed gold with divine light. Welmana had seen this phenomena a few times now, however this was the first time she was witnessing it up close. In the next instant Serene extended a hand to her and Welmana took it without hesitation. There was an explosion of light, and suddenly, Welmana found herself in a strange place. It was foggy all around, like a scene in a dream but her senses were vivid. As she battled with the incongruity, a childlike voice called out to her. Welmana. Startled, the sister looked up and saw a small figure appearing from the dense fog. To her relief, it was Serene, except strangely, she was a child here. Both her appearance and attire were the same, just that she had shrunk and looked to be no more than five years of age in this impossible place. Can you hear me? The little Syrian asked as she approached. Her tone and mannerism was as Wellmana remembered, full of warmth and friendliness. Relieved, she bowed and answered. Yes, my lady. Where is this and why are you, a child? The little Syrian smiled and looked kind of embarrassed about her situation, patting her own head while dropping a statement. Sorry, I am new to this vision thing and might have overlooked certain issues. Vision. So this is one of the many divine visions Welmana had read about. To think she was experiencing it herself, and the idea that she was about to receive divine revelation shocked the sister. Hold on, I just wanted to know more about the emperor. Anyway, let's proceed. Oblivious to her inner struggles, Serene pushed forward before she could protest. Suddenly an explosion of light burst into existence as Welmana felt like a sun had materialized behind her. Accompanying the intense illumination was the rising heat on her back, and an overwhelming presence indescribable with words. Is that... Welmana had a hunch of who had appeared behind her and started to shake uncontrollably. Wanting to confirm with her own eyes, she was about to turn around but found her legs unable to move. Confused, she tried again but found her shaking body refusing any directive. Feeling helpless, she turned to Serene, only to see the latter glowing like an adorable little angel under the intense light, though she was no longer smiling. Slowly the little Serene started walking forward, her sight locked into the far distance behind Welmana. With every step Serene took, the suffocating pressure from the unknown presence intensified. Up and up the pressure climbed until eventually it became difficult for Welmana to even breath. She was about to cry out for help when Serene spoke again. Welmana, turn around. That broke the petrifying spell and Welmana found herself able to move again, but only barely. Trembling, the sister started to turn, feeling the intense heat climbing onto her face as she did so. With a final colossal effort, Welmana spun around to face what was behind her. The scene awaiting the sister was beyond her imagination and Welmana struggled to make sense of what she was seeing. At an indeterminable distance away was a pyramid shimmering in golden light. It was huge, clearly occupying a space far away, yet it stretched and swelled to fully occupy her vision. On top of the pyramid was a colossal throne covered with impressions of golden filigree that weaved through intricate circuitries, pulsating with a subtle energy hinting at the immense psychic forces that swirled within. Countless banners with powerful symbols and glyphs hung from the heavens atop of the throne. While the overall scene was out of this world, it all paled in comparison to the illuminating figure that was seated in the middle of it all. Welmanoa's mind went into overdrive, she simultaneously could not get enough of looking at everything, yet at the same time she found herself lacking the courage to look directly at the shining entity who she believed to be the master of mankind. But this was what she had asked for, and Welmanoa resolved to not let this miracle go to waste. Under suffocating pressure, she steeled herself and forced her eyes to focus upon the figure that dominated the entire space, the source of all the intense lights in this strange place. 
And finally, she saw him. Seated atop the golden throne was an awe-inspiring glowing figure that transcended her mortal comprehension. Fully clad in an ornate golden armor that was embellished with intricate patterns, was a vision of divine majesty that radiated an impossibly regal aura. Obscured by the radiance of a titanic halo that was many times larger than the one Syrian ever manifested, the figure's facial features were impossible to define. Yet paradoxically a distinct mixture of sternness and compassion could be felt with the weight of a million lifetimes. Surrounding the figure was an ethereal storm of divine energy that danced in spellbinding patterns. The very air itself crackled with raw power, casting an otherworldly glow upon the entire space. As the sister's eyes darted all over the unfathomable sight, she traced where the outgoing lights were heading and noticed for the first time the vast darkness surrounding him. The entire scene felt like a glimpse into the unimaginable scale of the emperor's existence, a testament to his sacrifice for humanity, a monument to his psychic might that protected all his people from the malevolent forces, and a symbol of defiance against the encroaching darkness that threatened to consume all. Witnessing the whole divine spectacle, Welmina could not nor dare not move. Her heart hammered like silent thunder. Even the act of breathing felt like a sacrilege. Then the little Syrian who Welmina had all but forgotten until now uttered a single word. Father. Welmina felt every fine hair on her stood on their end as her god in the distance seemed to turn to the calling, and she herself was in the spot where his attention would land. A feeling of an all-knowing, all-powerful force settled on her, and the pressure Welmina had been feeling until now intensified many times over. Utterly petrified and having nowhere to hide, she stared back, and felt herself immolating from the sheer intensity. His divinity, it burns. Welmina wanted to scream, just as she opened her mouth a sensation that could not be anything else but being struck by lightning hit her and. Welmina, please wake up. The fainted sister's head was resting on my lap while I gently slapped her face. She had a rapid pulse and last I checked, in large pupils. I screwed up. Except for the unforeseen situation of me turning into a child in the vision due to the impression from Syrian's memory, my little experiment was going smoothly and everything was working as intended when disaster struck. The simulated vision was so realistic, without realizing it I uttered, Father, like how the Horus Heresy audiobooks always played with the word, only for me to witness Wellman a dropping like a sack of potatoes moments later in the vision. Our little sightseeing psychic tour had flopped hard as Wellmana suddenly fainted from shock. After I hurriedly ended the simulation, I found a fainted Wellmana back in real life. It was my fault, I should have anticipated this. While for me it was like a fun virtual tour, for the sister it must have felt like the ultimate communion with her god. I even did some on-the-fly adjustments to let her experience the sheer presence Biggie exuded, and it proved too much. Just as I was about to bite the bitter pill and summon medical assistance, to my relief Wellmana finally opened her eyes. Wellmana, I... I'm really sorry. Are you feeling all right? I asked, sensing the jitters on her mind which could mean that I might have caused some unknown damage. Welmina turned her eyes on me as she struggled to speak. At first it was all gibberish, but eventually her words came through. I saw him, she said, sniffling as tears started streaming down from her eyes, but smiling as she repeated her statement softly. I saw him. That was enough adventure for today. B2CH.14 Confessions It was late into the night when Welmina finally calmed down, promised to keep our little psychic adventure between us, and left. Thankfully, she appeared to have suffered little lasting damage done from her communion. So much had happened just a day alone. Despite being far from tired, after taking a bath, I laid down on my bed and tried to have a semblance of normality by aiming to rest for six hours. Instead, I quickly got bored and inevitably thought of today's events. Oh, right? I killed someone with my bare hands. Strangely, I did not feel much regret, but that was probably due to my victim being lost to chaos. Looking back, those flashes of lethal inspirations I witnessed when that Arbites trooper charged me two days ago were no fluke. I could have easily killed the officer with the same contemptuous ease of smashing up some tofu pieces. After moving past the unsettling vast difference in the happenings of this life compared to my old self, my focus quickly zoomed onto reviewing the sparring I had with Neandra. No fair. For the first time after coming to this world, I was finally having some fun, but it was so short-lived. The way I could move with this body was an unattainable dream in my old self as an unathletic couch potato. In my mind I replayed the melee sequence again and again, reliving those intense moments with my vivid recall while reviewing all my actions and mistakes. I realized that while my body could replicate every martial arts movement with ease, there was no way for me to directly compete with the Imperial Assassin, the gap between our skills. Lethal instinct and actual combat experience was simply too vast to be immediately bridged by any amount of raw talent. It was like having a running contest between a super toddler who just barely learned to walk against the reigning Olympic champion. After many sessions of reviewing our fights, I eventually came up with multiple different ways to improve my odds for future matches. As I was simulating melee bouts inside my head late into the night, I sensed an increase of activity outside and got up to have a look. Peeking through one of the windows, I saw a convoy of vehicles entering the monastery compound. Curious, I laid back down on my bed and closed my eyes. A moment later, I successfully sent out my projection to have a closer look. With my consciousness floating above many parked armored vehicles, I witnessed many prisoners being rushed into the lower levels of the monastery, under heavy security provided by groups of battle sisters. 
For a moment, I contemplated on following the stream of prisoners to further investigate before remembering the unpleasant dungeon located in the area. In the end, I decided against probing any further for my own mental health. This relentless transition from a normie who once lived an oblivious civilian life to a position of always looking at secret governmental activities proved a bit too much for my sanity. I returned to my body, feeling the incoherent sensation of being in peak physical condition, but mentally exhausted. I pulled the blanket over my head and wished morning would come faster. Eventually, morning did arrive. After washing up, I went through the news updates and saw more reports of Imperial forces led by the Soritas doing their thing. Apparently, Canonist D. Dinah and her girls had been kicking arses, busted a major cultist hive. The powers that be on the planet seemed eager to lift the spirits of its people after the near calamity by capitalizing on the success of the heretic hunts, as the raids enjoyed major coverage. Sanctioned reporters were on site providing every bit of detail and one of them even briefly interviewed D. Dinah herself. Flanked by her retinue, the canonist looked lively, praising the god emperor and dedicating her new victories to the recently awakened holy daughter. Wait, that's me. Hey, stop shoveling attention here. I lamented internally, suddenly desperately missing my old days of having little to no drag on the world around me. Outside of my room, the world continued to grind on and through solace, I was constantly being updated on the preparation status of today's events. After Wellman a call to confirm both the second batch of test candidates and that the guests had arrived at the expected time, I put on the outfit selected by the sister and checked myself in front of the mirror. Time to go to work. I exited my quarters with solace, then started walking down a long corridor to a common area where a secured elevator was located. All around me were high rising walls adorned with intricate religious gothic carvings and delicate arches that reached toward the high ceiling. The floor was paved with polished marble tiles and laid with exquisite designs that resonated with gentle echo with every step I took. In front of me, the corridor was illuminated by a soft radiance of an ethereal glow. Rays of golden morning sunlight pierced through the richly colored stained glass towering above, casting a kaleidoscope of hues upon the marble floor where shades of vibrant colors competed for attention. Solace the servo skull cruised ahead in the air a few steps in front of me, scattering the minute dust particles that were floating lazily in the light, adding a touch of serenity to the scene. For a moment, I had the illusion of being inside a six-star hotel of sorts, that I was on a long vacation on Earth visiting a holy site of a faraway land. Walking down the corridor, I was captivated by the interplay of light and shadow that casted dramatic silhouettes on the marble floor. Each step I took revealed new details on the towering stained glass windows, each of them depicting important local historical scenes and many imperial saints in vivid, jewel-toned hues. At the end of this short but magnificent journey stood Wellmana. Illuminated, she glowed with a shimmering sense of spirituality. I could not help but do a double take on the scholarly sister. Something seemed different about her today, something profound but so elusive that even my superhuman senses could not properly pinpoint. Wellman about deeply. Good morning, Lady Serene. Morning, how are you? I asked, still feeling a bit worried about the incident yesterday. She smiled before answering in a completely calm voice. Never been better. We took the lift down and as we approached the meeting level, I detected Yehai's presence even while being psychically passive. The senior psyker was using her formidable powers and the psychic resonance reached me even while she was quite a distance away. Psychana Activa, activated. As my senses opened to the beyond I saw what was happening. Yehai was probing the minds of the delegates. As soon as Yehai sensed my powers, she greeted me with subtle telepathy, like a light nod to a friend that cut through physical barriers, knowable only between psychers. Mimicking her mannerism, I greeted the elder psyker back and then turned off my active state. Turning around, I noticed Wellman eyeing me. Yes. I smiled and asked. I am sorry. She quickly bowed and explained. It could be nothing. But, did my lady use your powers just now? Huh? How did you know? I felt something. The scholar said sheepishly. Hey, hey, this got nothing to do with yesterday's accident, right? As I wondered about the issue, the elevator door opened to reveal her Lindia who was waiting for us. Lady Serene, Sister, Morning. The throne agent bowed, looking professional as always but with a distinctive note of, strangely enough, happiness this time. Morning, her Lindia. You look extra sunny today. I said, dropping a probing statement. The throne agent smiled before saying, thanks to you, a somewhat troublesome situation has been painlessly solved. While her words revealed nothing, I was able to glimpse what was on her mind. Praise from Thabris. Good job on getting the upper echelons of the Ecclesiarchy to voluntarily submit for mind probes. I have laid the ground rules for the church's guests. Herlindia said cheerfully, I told them you were under the direct protection of the Holy Inquisition. It is forbidden to ask questions about your background or anything related to the active psychic beacon. They knew about the psychic beacon? I was about to raise that question before remembering that the Cardinal was currently rushing back from Offworld, probably with the guide of the very beacon, and he had been keeping in contact with his underlings via astropathic messages. Of course the church knew. Besides, there must be other sanctioned psychers active on the planet. There was no hiding the beacon from the rich and powerful, it was just not public knowledge for the commoners. Holy daughter, said a familiar, uniquely pitched voice arriving along with the approach of armored footsteps. Looking behind her Lindia I saw the owner of that voice, Palatine Domini Zeal, walking up to me. 
Unlike Alicia, Domini's attire as a full-fledged palatine was more decorated. Her power armor was edged with silver highlights. A sizable iron halo rose from the top of the power pack on her back while many solid-looking religious trinkets hung together with a sheathed power sword on her waist. The flowing white tabard under her power armor was subtly emblazoned with many repeating symbols of both the Sororitas and the Ecclesiarchy, adding a hint of ranking to her appearance. Domini did not wear a helmet. Her exposed face was a vision of youthful determination decorated with a few blemishes and scars that spoke of her martial lifestyle, but did little to diminish her overall charm. Spotting a modified version of the classic battle sister haircut with her dark blonde hair, she exuded a serene confidence despite looking to be in her late twenties. Her pair of bright green eyes shimmered with the lights of intelligence and zeal, hinting at the potent blend of compassion and righteous fury unique to the Sororitas. Hello, Domini. I replied, purposely skipping her title like I did with Alicia and silently hoping she would not treat me like a divine doll. Despite being one of few ranking sisters who knew my real identity, I never had the chance to know her better. Greetings. I will be in charge of overseeing your events for today. Domini said as she greeted me with the full compliments of an Aquila hand sign and a deep bow. Huh? Where is Alicia? She is supposed to be here today. Is this prearranged? Why is Alicia not present? I decided to ask, but kept my voice as neutral as possible. Alicia is currently repenting in the cabin of solitude as punishment from her dereliction of duty for letting a heretic get close to you. She will be present in the afternoon. Domini answered with a hint of nervousness. What happened yesterday was not. I almost protested out loud before remembering something about how people in power should never display obvious favoritism. Despite how much I like Alicia as a person, my protest might actually hurt her standing in the order. So instead I simply nodded. I see. I will be in your care. Seeing I did not react negatively, Domini smiled, brimming with enthusiasm as she answered. I am honored. Together we walked towards the meeting area where Malin was waiting outside. Her presence pulled my wandering mind back to reality. I was about to meet the Ecclesiarchy dignitaries. That notion made me somewhat nervous and I breathed in deeply, drawing in the cool air that carried with it a faint scent of incense. I must confess, meeting with the elite hi-hat gang was not as horrible as I had imagined. With but a few exceptions, the colorful collection of influential clergy members adorned in their various ecclesiastical vestments were mostly elderly men. Malin stuck out like a sore thumb in the crowd of graying elders and late middle-aged individuals, being the only young person in the church's contingent. As the official representative assigned to me, Malin also had the honor of introducing the most respected spiritual leaders on Nusquam, making her stand out even more. Starting from Archdeacon Rysine Venerin, who I had met briefly before, I was introduced to Deacon Octavius Mortimer, Deacon Maximal Varos, Deacon Lacerius Dornan, Deacon Celestia Veritas, High Confessor Malachi Dravian, High Confessor Caius Valerius, High Abbot Marcus Aurelius, Abbot Ignatius Cromwell, Abbot Benedictus Simeon, High Abbot Seraphina Valerius, Reverend Mother Octavia Sinclair, and Lady Amorous Ravencroft. I met their gazes and nodded as each name was announced. Judging by the trepidation and awe etched on their faces, my guess was that I was as unsettled as them while we traded first impressions. These were the elite of the elite the church had to offer. They certainly looked the part. Every individual was a living image of a monolithic priesthood, though some members were clearly better fed than the others with their pristine silky robes and pricey-looking trinkets. I whispered silent, grateful thanks for my photographic memory, for I knew my old mortal self would have forgotten most of their names by the time the introduction was done. Unlike them, my true feelings were masked away by Regulus, while all their expressions were plain to read, and their unguarded thoughts flashed like roadside billboards before my mind. So breathtaking. She is like a living doll. Absolutely stunning. Unbelievable presence. On the other side of the hall were the new batch of candidates in vegetative states, all neatly seated and tied down, ready for the proven procedure from yesterday. With little else to say to everyone present, I conjured my halo to start my work. As the divine radiance filled the hall for the first time today, the ecclesiastical guests' eyes widened in awe and disbelief, their mouths agape as they witnessed the tangible manifestation of their God's power for the first time in their lives. No tricks. No illusion. From the corner of my sight, I caught glimpses of their reaction. After overcoming the initial shock, some of the dignitaries bowed their heads, their lips moving soundlessly in silent prayer. Others were overcome by the weight of the moment, their hands trembling as tears streamed down from their weathered faces. The archdeacon, while rendered speechless, was still able to keep a dignified demeanor, but his trembling mind was leaking loud thoughts which I picked up easily. Thrown on Terra. This light. If we show this to the masses, we would instantly restore the church's reputation and the number of faithful will explode. Ignoring the church's elite, I started working with the now familiar motion by stopping briefly in front of every candidate and blasting them with my powers, scrubbing away any trace of residual warp taint. Repeating the results from yesterday, one by one I released the candidates from their vegetative state. Behind me, hushed whispers rippled through the assembly as the guests, each trying to comprehend the significance of the moment. In front of me, the recurring theme of reactions repeated themselves with many of the candidates looking around nervously after being freed from their condition. A few recognized me and asked to confirm if I was the one singing on the battlefield. The cured were then taken away to be further inspected by the people under the ecclesiarchy station next door for final verification. As the process continued, 
I felt an increasing amount of frantic thoughts from some of the dignitaries behind me. Even without trying, many of their thoughts effortlessly leaked through. One was questioning what he was seeing. What in the name of throne, this is real. A living saint is here. Another mind echoed, full of sudden existential crisis. A living saint? In this inconsequential backwater world? Why? Why? I ignored them and continued on with my work. The process went on until one of the candidates, a trooper just like many others, started panicking and asked questions after regaining consciousness. Did, did we lose? What will happen to me? His voice was weak and cracking. That depends, are you still loyal and faithful to the emperor? I asked and received only blank stares in response. I tried to read his mind but only detected a confused mess. This fellow looked suspicious as hell and his silence was deafening. It got awkward and I took note of the closest battle sister tightening the grip on her bolter ever so slightly. I got a feeling a world of hurt was coming towards this confused individual if this was not resolved immediately. Thinking fast, it occurred to me that this might be a good time to test a technique I learned from yesterday. Flexing my powers, I quickly flashed the mental image of a stern-faced emperor in his full psychic glory into the man's mind while demanding a response. Answer me. Echoes of my question rang out in the hall, only to be answered by a commotion behind me. I turned around and saw a plump middle-aged clergyman, who I recognized to be Abbot Benedictus, stumbling on the floor, his high hat on the ground. Did he trip? As everyone's attention fell on the fallen abbot, the chubby man suddenly started wailing in distress as tears started streaming from his eyes. In the next moment he was shouting towards heaven. God Emperor. Lord. I. I confess. I have sinned. What the hell? Abbot, what in the throne's name are you doing? Archdeacon Rysine called out, his usual sagely bearing disappeared, taken over by an outrage triggered by the sudden shameful display of his subordinate. My lord. My light. I beg for your forgiveness and mercy. Ignoring his superior, with everyone watching in disbelief, the weeping abbot continued to blubber out unbelievable words. More alarmingly, he started crawling towards me like a landed seal, his face an unhealthy shade of red and contorted with duress. Stop. Come no closer. Palatine Domini ordered and placed herself between me and the crawling clergyman, her bolt pistol drawn. She then raised a fist, and immediately a few nearby battle sisters formed a small protective circle around me while switching off the safety on their bolters with practiced ease. Seeing the sudden escalation, I activated thought acceleration and blasted out aspects to check around for safety concerns. I quickly determined none of the ecclesiarchy guests, including the one on the floor, were armed, nor carried anything resembling explosives. The sisters got jumpy because of what happened yesterday. It is fine, he is not armed. I whispered to Domini and turned to the abbot on the floor. Dear father, I wasn't addressing you. The sorry-looking clergyman on the floor froze, then behind him came more commotions as two more guests dropped to their knees. The hall went into an uproar and in the chaos Archdeacon Rysine lost all his composure and started ordering the sisters to remove the three clergy members prostrating on the floor. Looking around, I noticed Malin covering her mouth with a hand, pure shock and disbelief on her face while most of the sisters, including Welmina, were silently observing the scene with cold disdain. I turned my attention to the three people on the floor and saw what was going on inside their minds. They were afraid. Deathly afraid. You would think as the top peddlers of institutionalized religion, they would have unshakable faith and would be elated to see any sort of emperor's miracle for themselves. Instead, I distinctly felt they were shaken to their core. Why? If it is not as if they were tainted by chaos. Thinking my halo had somehow caused these people to act out, I turned it off and felt the charged state of the hall immediately went down by a notch. High Confessor Malachi, one of the individuals who knelt down earlier, shakily got back on his feet. Clearly unstable, he pointed a trembling finger at me and shouted with an emotionally charged voice. What was that? Who exactly are you? As the High Confessor of the Mini Storm, I demand you to provide irrefutable proof that you are blessed by the God Emperor himself. Most people gasped, a lot more cringed at the High Confessor's clearly deranged action. Even the Archdeacon looked totally stunned by the development. It was at this moment Wellmana silently walked over to the Confessor. I could tell she was furious, an angry cloud of emotion floating over her head. As she stopped in front of the Confessor, the elderly clergyman looked at her, confusion on his face. With everyone looking, Wellmana delivered a swift hefty slap on the Confessor's cheek. The resounding fleshy clap resonated loudly in the hall. Oh my god. Everyone went quiet, and Wellmana spoke in a frighteningly calm voice. How dare you talk to Lady Syrian with such insolence? Her actions saved countless Nusquamese and she has saved our world from damnation by facing down a greater demon. Even now she is saving more of our people. Where were you during those trying times? Recovering from the shock of being slapped in front of the whole crowd, Malachi angrily pointed an accusatory finger at Wellmana and continued his tirade. You dare to hit me? Assault. She committed assault. Sisters. Abide your duties as members of our chamber militant. Arrest this woman for striking a senior member of the church. He looked frantically at the surrounding battle sisters, urging them to take action, but nobody moved. That's enough. An elegant voice called out with an authoritative tone, ceasing the frantic standoff. Pulling all the attention in the hall, Herlindia appeared with a wolfish grin on her pretty face, Psyker Yehai by her side and a squad of inquisitorial stormtroopers behind her back. Tactical boots clicking sharply on the marble floor, the throne agent walked slowly towards the center of the hall as she made an announcement. 
thrown on Terra as our witness, everyone here including our saint candidate, sisters of Sororitas and esteemed members of the church all witnessed what just happened. Herlindia then paused, letting black-cladded stormtroopers fan out behind her as she raised a small inquisitorial rosette. As the ranking agent of the Holy Inquisition present, I find the behavior of these individuals to be highly suspicious. With the authority conferred to me by Inquisitor Thabrus Thorn of the Ordo Hereticus, I hereby order an immediate arrest on these three individuals for further investigation. She then turned to the Archdeacon. Your Grace, do you object to this? Archdeacon Rising had no reply. He was busy facepalming himself with a hand and was looking down at the floor. The other clergy members exchanged glances with grim faces, a shared understanding passing between them on the pending fallout that would follow. What a mess, all this because I misfired my powers. I thought as my attention turned back to the initial target of my test, the young man who was still tied to the chair. He looked to be in some sort of shock and had tears forming around his eyes. He was whimpering so softly that probably only I could hear his words. I am loyal. I am loyal. I am loyal. I got a feeling this was going to be a long day. B2CH.15 Disturbance Two days after the incident with the Ecclesiarchy delegates, we were finally done with a sizable test batch of people. All that was left to do was to wait for the relevant authorities to verify the results. It was lunchtime, and I was reading instead of eating. In my old life, I was a creature of habit, holding on to the same job longer than my contemporaries would advise, and content on eating the same food in predictable cycles. Just like in my previous life, I began adopting new habits in this new world. For now, the main routine I established was to skip lunch and use that time to flip through books in the monastery library, hastily building my knowledge of this world. Abusing my recently discovered ability to process parallel thoughts, I pondered on the recent events even as another part of my mind simultaneously absorbed information from the flipping pages. On the first day things had gone smoothly after the three disgraced guests were taken away. We proceeded to conduct the cleansing procedure until we ran out of people who were stuck in vegetative state. We then went on to process candidates who were still conscious and functional. Things got a bit messy as many new procedures were adjusted or created on the fly to let my cleansing halo go through the rotating crowd safely and smoothly. In between each cleansing session, I was being dragged around to meet and have small talks with the visiting Ecclesiarchy big shots. Most of the time it was Wellmana who handled the interactions, with Malin acting as intermediary as I talked as little as possible. In contrast to my poker face game, the other parties usually could hardly conceal their awe, it was awkward and suffocating for a not-so-social person like me. Fortunately from what I was able to glimpse from their mind, most of them bought my semi-divine status. I had expected the church to be more cautious about their contact with me after what happened, but instead on the second day the new batch of Ecclesiarchy delegation almost doubled in number, as if the incident on the previous day did not happen at all. In a short span of time, I had seen enough people reacting to my halo in various unique ways to last a lifetime. Judging from the observed details, I highly suspected the reaction of each individual was directly proportional to their beliefs and devotion to the Emperor. In short, the halo might only be good for unnerving people who believed in the God Emperor's divinity. So in theory if an orc charged towards me, blasting my halo should do little to stop the alien since it never gave a flying fuck about humanity's biggest boss in the first place. We also took the chance to disclose my amnesia to the attending dignitaries of the church. The disclosure genuinely shocked most people and garnered a lot of sympathy points for myself. It also provided the perfect cover for my eccentricity, an aspect which was unavoidable during my interaction with the dignitaries since I was not from this universe in the first place. Meanwhile, progress on the vault excavation was steady, but slower than expected as Cryptora ran into more complications. I could almost feel the frustration in the Archmago's voice despite his totally flat tone while reporting his status. Outside the monastery, even with a supposed gag order in place, news of my activity seemed to have been leaked. Rumors about the awakened saint candidate having started performing miracles inside the Sororita's monastery was going around and was even discussed in the mainstream news networks. Since neither the Inquisition nor the Church seemed to kick up a fuss over it, I assumed that the leak was done on purpose, part of the Imperial propaganda campaign. In other news, Canonist D. Dinah and her strike force were finally scheduled to return later today after an extended period of heretic hunting. Silently, I hoped that the return of many battle sisters could disperse the ever-increasing amount of pilgrims gathering at the monastery gate. That was how the two days went by in a blur with zero progress in my martial training goal. As for now, back in the library, Solace had temporarily joined the cherubs on their eternal air patrol while I continued my quest on devouring knowledge. Exploding my transhuman ability, I was going through the books with astonishing speed, reading one after another like clockwork. Every time I was almost done with my current book, I would mentally order a random cherub to fetch the next predetermined tome as a replacement to continue the flow. People were watching. To the curious onlookers, I must have looked the part of a supernatural scholar, flipping through one book after another while the cherubs kept bringing over new copies and placing back the finished ones. In truth, I was playing catch-up, gathering information as fast as possible, hastily building my knowledge reservoir of this world and beyond to face the many challenges ahead. I was enjoying the serenity of the moment when sounds of a rumbling stomach shattered my peace. I peeled my eyes from the pages and looked to the source of hunger, Wellmana, who was sitting across from me, her face a deep shade of red. 
She had been shadowing me for the past days, even foregoing her own lunch just to stay by my side, but she was clearly reaching her limit. You should go eat, I suggested. But, there is no point in torturing yourself. Besides, I whispered, you know that I am different. Wellmana did not refute my point, yet she stubbornly refused to move and was beginning to look every bit like a child in a not-eating-her-vegetables rebellion. I almost heaved a sigh at her silliness when the faint echoes of a pair of heavy boots marching across the marble floor tugged at my mind. My attention shifted, superhuman-level senses automatically filtering out all the miscellaneous sounds to focus on the incoming footsteps. They were familiar to me, stern and purposeful, repeated at almost precise intervals. Even by the rhythm alone I knew who was coming. Wellmana, I said with a neutral tone, Inquisitor Thorn will be here soon. Go have your lunch. The sister scholar flinched before she bolted upright from her chair and started to turn around, just in time to catch the sight of Thabris entering from the far end of the library. Flanked by her Lindia and Neandra, the Inquisitor with his signature trench coat continued his stride without slowing, making a beeline towards my position. Go, or he might invoke insufficient clearance to get you going anyway. I pushed. For a moment Wellmana wanted to say something, but eventually she gave me a deep bow before leaving. Right on cue, as soon as the sister turned a corner, the Inquisitor arrived with her Lindia. No sign of Neandra, she had slipped into the shadow somewhere. Serene. Inquisitor. Sorry to interrupt your reading session, you were looking mighty casual today. The usually stern Thabris dropped an unusual comment before walking over and sat down on the chair Wellmana had vacated a moment earlier. Casual? For a split second, I wondered whether he was referring to my attire or activity. I was in my default white robe again since there were no more church people to impress today. The look had been growing on me. I appreciated its simple yet timeless appeal, plus it suited my laziness of not needing to think about what to wear every day. If this was back in the 21st century, casual wear probably implied a tank top and hot pants. Wait, wait, wait. I could never live with that. It was a line my inner guy soul simply would not cross. Hold on, what am I doing? An inquisitor is waiting for me. Not wanting to keep Thabris waiting any longer, I quickly flipped through the last few pages of my book before passing it to a waiting cherub nearby. The cyborg baby received the book respectfully before bowing and took off, carrying the hefty tome with an exaggerated struggle towards its designated shelf space. Thabris watched the cherub go before reaching into his trench coat and took out a scroll. Without a word he passed it to me. I used to think the omnipresence and usage of medieval-looking scrolls were a ridiculous notion in a futuristic galactic empire. Not anymore. Unlike data slates, these things required no batteries, were totally unhackable and more often than not, made of durable materials that would survive most rough handling. I received the space-age parchment while examining Thabris' expression for any clues of his unusual action. As always, beside the slight hint of amusement at how serious I must have looked, he was mostly inscrutable and his mind remained an impenetrable fortress. I gingerly opened the scroll and quickly saw that it was a report. A very serious report. The document was prefaced by an inquisitorial logo with all its disclaimers, starting with huge letters stating for your eyes only. I glimpsed through its contents and was updated on some of the events that were going behind the scenes. Firstly, preliminary results of my halo cleansing were excellent with all the candidates passing their purity inspection tests. While detecting minute warp taint was not an exact science mastered by the Imperium, it was reported for the first time in a long while not one test candidate woke up screaming during their sleep after receiving my cleansing light. Huh, some good news. Technically that would push my public miracles count to three and fully qualify me for the title of Living Saint. Next, fresh off the press on a very recent report, about an hour ago, a huge church congress attended by the many important religious figures from around the globe was concluded. Quite possibly why Malin was not around today. Sources indicated a sizable number of church representatives wanted to immediately formalize my sainthood in their eagerness to boost the church's local reputation. But that notion was opposed by the major faction belonging to the cardinal, citing that such an important declaration should only be made by the cardinal himself. After fierce debates were held and some punches were thrown, in the end the motion was successfully delayed, and they would wait for the cardinal's return. Besides, the main bulk of the 20,000 troopers were still waiting for the cleansing procedure. Following that, the Inquisition had concluded their initial investigations of the three suspicious individuals from two days ago. Apparently the three of them were known proxies of the Cardinal and had been providing specialized whitewashing services to cover the Church's shady activities for many years. As for their reactions that day, I suspected it was due to them being affected more than the rest by my misfired power due to, hopefully, a sense of guilt. The Inquisition was now moving on to interrogating the three individuals to dig up more dirt on the local Church. The next point in the report stated that the Cardinal had been sending many astropathic messages to his subordinates while en route to Nusquam. These contain encrypted instructions. Since the only available official astropath on the planet was still under the direct access of the Inquisition, they helped themselves with the suspicious messages and had since cracked the hidden code. It seemed like an anticipation of formalizing my status as living saint. The Cardinal had ordered his underlings to kickstart and promote multiple cults in my name. Thabra's people had theorized that the fellow might have planned to use these cults to gather more political power for himself. 
my guess was that he would be claiming my emergence as a sign of more incoming apocalyptic events and that the only hope for salvation was to obey the church, aka himself, or face the typical damnation and eternal suffering, blah blah. I would not be surprised if his end game was to convert Nusquam into a shrine world that rivaled, if not outright surpassed, Sanctitas Primus as the primary religious hub of the subsector with him as its first pope. This shrewd fellow is already counting on cashing me in. The final point, and to me the most surprising part, of the report stated that the people at the subsector's capital world had managed the titanic feat of rerouting most of the warp traveling in the region. Using the psychic beacon I lit up as a fixed reference point in warp space, they had mobilized an untold amount of resources and successfully created a workable system for the imperial starships in the region to navigate the local warp space. Most of the starships that were heading towards Nusquam had since been redirected to their original destinations or other more developed imperial worlds nearby. Being a relatively backwater world, Nusquam had neither the infrastructure nor the capacity to handle the influx of starships, so it was for the best. A few starships did end up here in the Nusquamese, with the help of the Inquisition, had been trying to recruit off-world astropaths. While this was done to remedy our desperate lack of such specialists, whether such recruitment process was done voluntarily or otherwise I had no idea. On the appendix, it was mentioned that talks were underway to mobilize resources from nearby Forge Worlds to urgently upgrade Nusquam's dingy starport and related facilities. Done with the scroll, I took my eyes off it and asked the Inquisitor, your reason for showing me this? I heard about your incredible reading ability, he said. Rather than spending so much time briefing you verbally, this would be more efficient. No arguing with that. I pointed to the word cardinal on the scroll. Any update on his investigation? We found something, he nodded, and thanks to you, we managed to dig out more from the three. However, they were mostly typical cases of corruption, embezzlement, exploitation of the faithful, manipulation of religious texts, cults creation plus many rumors of deplorable vices. Terrible as it seems, there was nothing nefarious enough to be on the level of damnation yet. Deplorable vices? I asked, noting his pause before the statement. He shrugged and replied simply, bad stuff. But since these are mostly unsubstantiated at this point, I will elaborate no further. The more I heard about this cardinal, the more it felt like he was a cookie-cutter type of bad guy. To make matters worse, his appearance did not help either. From all the pictures I could find of him, the cardinal looked every bit like a comically overweight villain. He even mirrored Baron Vladimir Harkonnen from the Dune movie in body size, just not as muscular. Could such a caricature exist in real life? While lost in thought, I was suddenly hit by a peculiar sensation of unexplainable unease. Something was in the air, something that felt wrong. My transhuman heart rate quickened ever so slightly while my fingertips vibrated with micro shivers even though I was positive about sensing no immediate threats around me. It felt as though the fabric of reality itself had been disturbed, like the placid surface of a still lake rippling by flying sand. Without warning I saw flashes of people who I did not recognize suffering, their flickering faces laced with desperation, and I felt their pain almost physically. The episode felt like the glimpses of inner thoughts I read from random people around me, but a lot more intense. Totally new to this, I struggled to pinpoint the source of this unknown upheaval, but it eluded me. All I could be certain of was that it originated from the direction somewhere behind Thabarus. Unaware of my experience, the Inquisitor started speaking again. That said, recently there is another more disturbing rumor going around. Receiving no response, he looked at me and quickly picked up that something had gone awry. What? He asked, his tone turning serious. I'm not sure. I felt a disturbance, a distance away. I pointed past him in an approximate direction, after forcing myself not to utter the famous phrase to avoid a cliché no one here would even know about. Thabris took my words seriously. Can you elaborate? Before he even finished his sentence, a beep sounded from the Inquisitor's earpiece at the same time a notification ping chimed from Herlindia's data slate. I watched as both Thabaris listened to a report and Herlindia consulted her data slate with serious expressions and knew that this was no coincidence. Something big must have happened. Understood, Thabaris out. After a while the Inquisitor finally ended his conversation with an unknown party, by now going into his full serious mode. Sir, the Scholastica Psychona dash, Herlindia said urgently but was interrupted by Thabaris with a wave of his hand. I know, under attack by armed cultists as we speak. Scholastica Psychona? Psyker school? What do we have for quick response assets? Thabris demanded with a low and dangerous voice. Herlindia referred to data she conjured on her slate and replied without skipping a bit. Arbites and local law enforcement units are en route, but they might be outgunned. Currently, there are no idle flyers available for immediate aerial insertions except for Flame Raven. Estimated time for any units from here to reach the Scholastica via roads is about 45 minutes, if traffic conditions are ideal. Zaki is at that place, talk about bad timing, said Neandra who appeared like a manifesting ghost. Her sudden appearance did not surprise me for a part of my mind had been tracking her whereabouts since she got close, but her words shocked me. Zaki is at the Scholastica Psychana at this moment? I asked, not bothering to conceal my concern. Probably just plain bad luck, he was there to retrofit his null dampener. Speaking of which, the Scholastica is roughly where you pointed just now, Thabris said while looking behind him, revealing his remarkable sense of direction. He then said grimly, 45 minutes is too slow. To think they would strike at a time like this, 
Just when most of our flyers were out to retrieve Diodino's forces, this timing couldn't be a coincidence. Sir, I just logged into the security system of the Scholastica, said Herlindia as she passed over a data slate to Thabris. The Inquisitor viewed it with a stern expression before putting it down on the table for all to see. On the slate screen were many split displays showing what I assumed was live footage from the security cameras of the facility. On some of the tiny divided screens, panicked people could be seen running for their lives. On other displays, armed assailants were giving chase, their assault weapons blazing. Many bodies, of both adults and children alike, could be seen lying bleeding and motionless on the floor. As the gunmen pushed forward, they shot and destroyed all the security cameras they encountered. One by one the picked feeds were killed off, leaving most of the mini split screens in blazing static. I watched, petrified as the atrocity unfolded. A numb sense of incongruity took hold as the carnage before me overlapped with my memory of meeting Zaki, the little knoll boy with the cutest smile. Now he is somewhere inside there, in that place where this is happening. At this point, Thabaris had contacted the active Palatine on duty and started discussing sending an elite strike force into the fray with Flame Raven. I remained seated and mentally stunned while listening to the Inquisitor putting up a plan, but soon felt my own anger rising. It was strange. The truth was I didn't get to know Zaki well as we only met briefly once. That brief moment we had together was short but sweet, our joyful encounter a distinct contrast from most of the grotesque and horrible things crawling in this world. And now that kid was in mortal danger, it felt like what little I had cherished was being ruthlessly trampled and stepped over. Slowly at first, but like a flame sparked on a dry grassy field, the anger within me took over. As my fury grew, another part of my mind was coldly calculating the odds. From the brief glimpses I counted, no less than thirty armed cultists present in the assault. What if it was myself they're facing these people? I was sure we all did something like this before, imagining ourselves as the people who were caught in terrible events that appeared on a news flash, and wondered if we could beat the odds in their shoes. Only this time, I was not looking at the situation as a human, but from the perspective of a semi-awakened godling. Working with thought acceleration, I took my transhuman baseline together with my pseudo-invisibility into the equation and quickly ran some combat simulations. I wanted to see how far I could push my advantage when it came to mortal combat with this crowd. Before long, I believed. No, I knew I could do it. By going all out and using the environment with zero reservations in the application of lethal force, not as if any of those bastards deserved mercy in the first place, even with my current limited capabilities and combat experience. I was confident in taking down the entire Chaos Strike team by myself. All of them. Every single one of those heretical terrorist scums. After all, they were just humans with assault rifles. Between my impressive strength and reflexes, projectile protection from a reinforced refractor field and having an apex-level transhuman physiology for being a discount primarch, nothing short of serious anti-tank weaponry would pose a real threat to my life and well-being. Even so, realistically speaking between the Inquisition and the sisters, I imagine no one would ever allow me to charge in like a corn berserker. I was simply too precious for the establishments to take risks like that. At any rate, I was not going to stand idle in the face of such atrocities. My mind was made up. I stood up, immediately becoming the focal point of everyone around as I firmly declared my attention to Thabris. I am coming along. The Inquisitor was about to rebuke me until he saw the look in my eyes. He quickly wrapped up his conversation with another party on his calm bead and turned to me. Palatine Alicia is gathering twenty battle sisters as we speak. The strike force is leaving in five minutes. You have two minutes to convince me why I should let you tag along. B2CH.16 Strike Force. Not for the first time, I stepped into the inquisitorial gunship Flame Raven, but I had never used its side door before. Upon entering the familiar gunship with Thabris, Neandra closed the door behind us as I was instantly connected to the gunship's machine spirit. Plus plus authority level administrator connected. Plus plus. Flame Raven, you doing well? I asked reflexively. Plus plus fully operational and ready to serve. Authority. Plus plus. On my right, I was greeted by the sight of Alicia standing in her full plate, her face visible thanks to the helmet's visor being pulled up. Our eyes met, and she looked surprised, which was confirmed a split second later from what I glimpsed from the Palatine and her sister's minds. Lady Serene is joining the mission? Throne be praised, she is with us on this. The Holy Daughter is here. Behind Alicia were two full rows of seated battle sisters, their dull silver armor glinting in the darkened gunship's interior. There was that familiar low humming sound from all the active power backpacks, singing in unison with the low howling of the gunship's engine. Soritas, salute. Alicia suddenly called out and all the sisters formed the sign of Aquila with such synchrony I surely would have flinched as a mortal, it was an impressive display of martial discipline. Thabris merely nodded and started to speak. Sisters, the heretics are assaulting an imperial installation in broad daylight as we speak. This open challenge will not go unanswered. We have little time to prepare but the mission is simple, purge all heretics at the Scholastica. Once we are airborne it will take about 10 minutes to reach the site. In the meantime familiarize yourself with the layout of the mission area as much as you can. That is all. He then turned to me. To the cockpit. We went through the hatch door and came face to face with the lady pilot Tasia, who was looking back from her seat. She was as I remembered, looking chill and sporting her cool shades. Lady Serene, it has been a while, Tasia greeted me. 
Hello Tasia, long time no see. I returned her greetings and went to my designated seat from last time. As I was properly strapping myself in, Tasia's thought came through. Gosh, she still behaves like a model citizen. I better thank her for saving my life with my chance now. Saving her life? When was? I was startled for a heartbeat before remembering the trick I pulled to avoid Flame Raven being crushed by a giant boulder thrown by that huge demon in that fateful fight. Why are such details always escaping my mind? Let's go. Thabaris dropped his order before Tasia could say her thanks. The pilot nodded and took her attention off me, then Flame Raven lifted before roaring into the purple sky with its mighty engines. Despite having done this multiple times already, the geek inside me was still awed by its sheer awesomeness. Once the gunship leveled again, Thabaris turned and passed something small to me. This is made for you. A microbead with built-in inquisitorial level access. You know how to use it? He asked. I accepted the small, unassuming-looking earpiece and was surprised to find it gene-locked to me. Reacting to my touch, the earpiece activated. Unlike a standard user who had to go through the learning curve, the technological marvel that resided in my physiology seamlessly connected myself to all its functions. Looks like I don't need a manual with this cheat. Yes, I know how to use it. I replied. Good. Keep it on for the duration of the mission, Thabris said while handing me a data slate. Here's the layout of the Scholastica. I accepted the device and went through the data within it, finding the location of the Scholastica within the city and a detailed three-dimensional map of the place but nothing else. Suddenly there was a familiar buzz. Thabaris looked at me and pointed to his ear before saying, Join in. Yes, Herlindia. Go ahead. I got what he meant and tuned in with my new earpiece. Due to the lack of seats and the need of an inquisitorial coordinator for all the Imperial forces mobilizing for the mission, Herlindia had stayed behind. From my high-end earpiece, the throne agent's voice came through clear via the Vox network. Sir, reports are coming in. The outer perimeter of the Scholastica is guarded by multiple squads of heretics. The whole attack force is possibly in company strength, and they have heavy weapons. They even have a few heavy weapon teams positioned on top of the building overlooking the whole place. Any idea if they're proficient with those heavy weapons? Thabris asked. Hold on. We just lost an Arbite's Rhino Carrier at the gate to rocket launchers. Yes, it appears they are proficient. Herlindia replied. Darn. We might be heading for a hot drop. Thabris cursed. The professional cultists are at it again by being one step ahead. Now it is up to who shoots first and last. I suddenly had an idea. Closing my eyes, I forced myself into a trance. While initially I was not sure if this could be pulled off under duress, a moment later my consciousness successfully slipped out from my body. Unbounded by any physical barrier, my projection dashed towards the Scholastica with astonishing speed, way faster than the gunship. Below me the cityscape zoomed past in a blur, and I soon reached the huge building that was our destination. Like every serious imperial installation, the Scholastica looked like a small fortress with a perimeter wall surrounding its main building. At the main entrance was a burning vehicle, while a fierce shootout was happening between the cultists guarding the facility and Imperials who were trying to get in, matching what Herlindia had reported. I approached the flat roof of the imposing building and saw teams of armed men with various heavy weapons, raining down hell onto the Imperials below. After locking in their locations I recalled my consciousness and instantly found myself back in my chair. I released a long breath before saying out loud, I saw them in their positions, for weapon teams on the roof. If we can drop from height and approach without them knowing, I should be able to take them out with our heavy bolt response ends before they notice. Thabris, Neandra, and Tasia all turned and looked at me, but no one commented. It was Tasia who broke the silence a moment later. We are reaching soon. If we are doing that, it has to be done now. Sir, do as she says. Thabris consented. Affirmative. Tasia replied before speaking into the intercom. Sisters be advised. Hold on tight. We are going in for an attack run. The flame raven turned and climbed continuously before diving down like a giant raptor on the hunt. I ignored the sudden increase of G-forces and mentally took over the controls of the heavy bolter turrets as individual targeting screens appeared in my vision. I am taking over the turrets, please maintain our approach, I said as the hunting started for the enemy teams on the roof. As we dropped towards the building, the crosshairs before me zoomed in rapidly until all four fire teams on the roof were located and marked as tiny pixels on the same spots I saw earlier. Confident of the firing solution appearing in my mind, I triggered the firing mechanism of the heavy bolters and sent streams of mass reactive shells towards the unsuspecting targets. The cultists didn't even know what hit them, all were blasted into smithereens and ended up as ugly patches of pixels on my vision in mere seconds. Rooftop cleared of hostiles, I reported and disconnected myself from the targeting system. Roger that. Tasia replied and engaged the hovering system, bringing the gunship from a dive into horizontal approach for a swift landing on the roof. Going in hot, the side and back doors of Flame Raven opened up even before we fully landed. As soon as the gunship touched down, the battle sisters stormed out and secured the landing zone. Following Thabris and Neandra, I exited the gunship right behind Alicia who was waiting on the side door. We stepped onto the roof and were instantly greeted by the smell of blood and a scene of utter carnage. Hitting humans with heavy bolters that fired solid fuel rocket propellant and mass reactive fuse rounds the size of small cans generated extremely messy results, as evidenced by the chunky organic remains and destroyed war gear that splattered across the whole roof. 
As soon as everyone got out from the gunship, Flame Raven pulled away with a roar and dove towards the outer perimeter wall of the Scholastica. There the gunship unloaded another salvo of carnage onto the entrenched enemies before speeding away to pick up reinforcements, not giving the heretics any chance of retaliation. After watching the awesome display of firepower of Flame Raven and its speeding away, I charged up my power and fired a huge Auspex sensor wave, spreading it wide to cover the whole building. Except for the areas shielded by unknown materials, I saw everything. What I did not anticipate was the presence of so many psychers. In the brief moment when my powers were activated to blast out the wave, a few dozen souls with psychic resonance lit up, registering like heat signatures on a thermal sensor. They were all hiding and cowering from the cultists. I saw all of them, and in turn, all of them saw me. In an instance I tasted all their desperation, their fear, and their awe of my power. Compared to me, they were like tiny embers looking at a blazing bonfire. A lot of them flinched. Most of them were stunned. Some were faster than others and realized I might be their salvation. They turned to me in slow motion, but before they could ask for help, my connection with the psychic world was abruptly cut off. Still, the experience startled me. Wait, 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 wait. I can't help everyone immediately. I steadied myself and went through on what I saw. Mixed within the influx of psychic emotions was the solid information I glimpsed from inside the building. I saw dead bodies littered throughout the place, the main entrance on the ground floor was guarded by a few teams of armed cultists, while the majority of them were congregating in the lowest levels of the building where a fierce firefight was raging. That was when I realized my total newness to all these things. So much information, such urgency, and so little time to explain. Leading a counter-terrorism close-quarter assault mission? What the hell was I thinking by coming here? I looked at Alicia, she returned my gaze with hot anticipation. I suddenly felt the weight of responsibility on my shoulders. Oh throne, what should I do? Without thinking I raised my right hand, before belatedly realizing no one would answer my many immediate questions. Thinking fast, an idea came to me and I reached over to the waiting palatine. Your hand please. I said. Alicia did as ordered and extended her gloved hand. I rested my palm on it, sensing her total open acceptance. Through manipulation of my powers, I attempted my best effort to imprint what I saw onto her mind while hoping feverishly this would work, otherwise we would be in for an awkward session of briefing. The process took but a heartbeat. Alicia fidgeted slightly and her eyes lost focus, and my heart jumped at that. Did I screw up again? Fortunately a renewed focus soon returned to Alicia's eyes. She steadied herself, and a single thought solidified in her mind. This needs to be brought onto the field command's tactical interface. I immediately understood what she meant and fired up thought acceleration for the work. In the span of another heartbeat, I connected with the field command system that was built into her helmet. With the built-in access I had over most imperial systems, I set myself up as admin and marked the known location of every cultist on the tactical interface. This felt like that time with the podium of cables I used in the last battle against the rebel army, but on a much smaller scale. Alicia gasped in surprise as she witnessed the locations of enemies popped up over the tactical display of her helmet. That was as far as an amateur like me could give in terms of giving solid support for now, it was time to leave the rest of it to the professionals. Please commence the operation. I said. Alicia bowed deeply. Acknowledged, holy daughter. She then turned to the Inquisitor. Lord Thabarus, kindly look after Lady Syrian while we do the Emperor's work. After receiving a nod from Thabarus, the Palatine spoke to her sisters through the Vox. The holy daughter has revealed the enemy's location to us. Most of the heretics are at the lower levels, with a small number of them guarding the ground entrance. Double speed to the ground floor entrance and hold position. Move out. Amidst the acknowledgments the battle sisters moved as one, their armored boots echoing sharply as they charged full speed down the stairs with all their gear, having total faith on what was revealed. Quick and precise to the point. Watch and learn, watch and learn. I mumbled to myself upon seeing the example set by Alicia and hurried after the sisters. Thabris appeared beside me, keeping his pace easily despite being a man of his age, with Neandra shadowing a pace behind him. While running, the Inquisitor took a look at his data slate which was updated with the position of the enemy since it was connected to the field command system. What did you do just now? He asked. I quick and precise to the point. I scouted the area with my ability and mentally transferred what I saw to the tactical system. Now that's convenient. So the heretics are concentrated on the lower levels. Thabris asked. That is what I saw. Why? I replied while we chased after the mass of armored women running in front. There is a plasma power generator beneath the building for self-usage in case of power cuts. Thabris remarked grimly. Then we better hurry up. I answered. The unspoken implication of it added to the urgency of the situation. We soon reached the end of the staircase on the ground floor where the sisters were holding their position. Mirroring the information I glimpsed, no one was around here except for a few fallen victims nearby. It is as you predicted. Thabaris remarked with a hint of being impressed before dropping a crucial question. While highly unlikely, do you sense any powerful individual nearby? I was startled for a moment before realizing the Inquisitor was referring to the Arch Heretic, the supposed cult leader who most probably was a potent Warpcraft user. I quickly checked my memory and concluded there was no presence of that sort in my brief glimpse of the psychic world. Nothing. I will keep an eye for it. I said. Please do. So, how do we proceed from here? Thabaris replied. Hey, you are the pro here. 
I almost snapped at him before noticing the subtle look on his face. The bugger is testing me. Well, all Primarchs were known to be natural-born generals, so maybe he was expecting the same from me despite being a discounted version? Still, he has a point as the sisters would naturally look to me for leadership. Between an Inquisitor and a semi-sanctioned living saint, it was kind of obvious who bore the greater command authority for the Sororitas. Luckily for me, with thought acceleration I had a lot of time to slow down and take stock of the situation, essentially turning a real-time strategy game into a turn-based command phase. I checked the sisters in the strike force closely and for the first time had a proper look at them. With my connection to the tactical interface, I became aware that virtual name tags could be summoned at will to display each sister's name over their heads like a typical first-person shooter game. There were the two Dominion squads of five women each led by sister superiors Sarai's and Mariah, all armed with their massive storm bolters that was the standard armament for Space Marine Terminators. I remember this as a typical power gaming setup in one of the many editions of the table game, so to see it in person was a bit both nostalgic and horrifying at the same time. No human will fancy being on the receiving end of their barrage. Then there was a four-women squad of elite Celestians led by Sister Superior Lethica, acting as a command squad for Alicia. These ladies were armed with all types of lethal weapons, sporting a few combi weapons and a heavy bolter carried by a bulky-looking Sister Lysandra. Let the big girl carry the big gun. Lastly, a five-women squad of standard battle sisters led by Sister Varian with one of them carrying the other heavy bolter. After having a good look at our people and the current tactical situation, my gamer sense kicked in. The enemies outnumber us but they are split up between the lower levels and outer perimeter while we have the advantage of surprise and firepower. We should move forward to stop whatever they are up to while leaving a squad to cover our back, in case the other half of the enemies on the outside fall back and get us pincered. I offered. Both Alicia and Thabris nodded, giving my gamer instinct a passing grade. Squad Varian, hold this choke point while we move forward. Fall back to us if you're overwhelmed. Alicia ordered, putting her least lethal squad on covering duty. Suddenly her Lindia's voice cut in from my earpiece, this time she sounded choppy from a weak connection. Sir, Sororita's convoy reports ETA in roughly 20 minutes. Roger that. We are about to make contact and should soon lose connection with you. Thabaris out. The Inquisitor said. Why the sudden loss of connection? I asked. Thabaris looked at me with amusement before saying, Combead's range is only good for about 10 kilometers. We had been boosted by Flamer Ravens on board systems that allowed direct communication with her Lindia back at the monastery. With the gunship getting further away and interference from inside this building, she won't even be able to reach us just now if not for our cutting edge gear. Oh, my noobness is showing again. Thabris then looked to Neandra and dropped his own directive. Locate and eliminate the commanders of the outer group, then aid our reinforcements in. The assassin nodded and dashed away like a ghost, producing little to no sound as she disappeared down the corridor. Wordlessly, Thabris took out an ornamental-looking bolt pistol from one of his holsters. I noted the huge inquisitorial emblem on the side of what must be a mastercrafted weapon. He then squatted down to pull up another small arm from one of his boots and passed its handle to me. I recognized the weapon to be a shredder auto pistol. Tempted as I was to pick up and use the cool-looking gun, there was the problem that I had never used a firearm before in my life. I currently have no idea of how to use a gun, I reported truthfully. Thabris had a for-real look on his face for a fraction of a second before seemingly coming to the conclusion that a single auto pistol would not make much difference in terms of our current firepower. The Inquisitor nodded, put back the weapon, and stood up. Turning off the safety of his bolt pistol, he exuded the air of a man who was about to do a routine which he had done thousands of times before and asked casually, Ready? It was finally time to fight the cultist head on.